The Corrections by Jonathan Franzen Narrated by George Guidel After almost fifty years as a wife and mother, Enid Lambert is ready to have some fun. Unfortunately, her husband is losing his sanity to Parkinson's disease, and their children have long since flown the family nest to the catastrophes of their own lives. Desperate for some pleasure to look forward to, Enid has set her heart on an elusive goal, bringing her family together for one last Christmas at home. And now, the corrections. St. Jude The madness of an autumn prairie cold front coming through. You could feel it. Something terrible was going to happen. The sun low in the sky, a minor light, a cooling star. Gust after gust of disorder. Trees restless, temperatures falling, the whole northern religion of things coming to an end. No children in the yards here, shadows lengthened on yellowing zoysia. Red oaks and pin oaks and swamp white oaks rained acorns on houses with no mortgage. Storm windows shuddered in the empty bedrooms, and the drone and hiccup of a clothes dryer, the nasal contention of a leaf blower, the ripening of local apples in a paper bag, the smell of the gasoline with which Alfred Lambert had cleaned the paintbrush from his morning painting of the wicker love seat. Three in the afternoon was a time of danger in these gerontocratic suburbs of St. Jude. Alfred had awakened in the great blue chair in which he'd been sleeping since lunch. He'd had his nap, and there would be no local news until five o'clock. Two empty hours were a sinus in which infections bred. He struggled to his feet and stood by the ping-pong table, listening in vain for Enid. Ringing throughout the house was an alarm bell that no one but Alfred and Enid could hear directly. It was the alarm bell of anxiety. It was like one of those big cast-iron dishes with an electric clapper that sends schoolchildren into the street in fire drills. By now it had been ringing for so many hours that the Lamberts no longer heard the message of bell ringing, but, as with any sound that continues for so long that you have the leisure to learn its component sounds, as with any word you stare at until it resolves itself into a string of dead letters, instead heard a clapper rapidly striking a metallic resonator. Not a pure tone, but a granular sequence of percussions with a keening overlay of overtones. Ringing for so many days that it simply blended into the background except at certain early morning hours when one or the other of them awoke in a sweat and realized that a bell had been ringing in their heads for as long as they could remember. Ringing for so many months that the sound had given way to a kind of meta-sound whose rise and fall was not the beating of compression waves but the much, much slower waxing and waning of their consciousness of the sound, which consciousness was particularly acute when the weather itself was in an anxious mood. Then... Enid and Alfred, she on her knees in the dining room opening drawers, he in the basement surveying the disastrous ping-pong table, each felt near to exploding with anxiety. The anxiety of coupons in a drawer containing candles and designer autumn colors. The coupons were bundled in a rubber band, and Enid was realizing that their expiration dates, often jauntily circled in red by the manufacturer, lay months and even years in the past. That these hundred-odd coupons, whose total face value exceeded sixty dollars, potentially one hundred twenty dollars at the Chiltsville supermarket that doubled coupons, had all gone bad. Tylex, sixty cents off. Excedrin PM, a dollar off. The dates were not even close. The dates were historical. The alarm bell had been ringing for years. 
She pushed the coupons back in among the candles and shut the drawer. She was looking for a letter that had come by registered mail some days ago. Alfred had heard the mailman knock on the door and had shouted, Enid! Enid! so loudly that he couldn't hear her shouting back, Al, I'm getting it! He'd continue to shout her name, coming closer and closer, and because the sender of the letter was the Axon Corporation, 24 East Industrial Serpentine, Schwenksville, Pennsylvania, and because there were aspects of the Axon situation that Enid knew about and hoped that Alfred didn't, she'd quickly stashed the letter somewhere within fifteen feet of the front door. Alfred had emerged from the basement, bellowing like a piece of earth-moving equipment, There's somebody at the door! And she'd fairly screamed, The mailman! The mailman! And he'd shaken his head at the complexity of it all. Enid felt sure that her own head would clear, if only she didn't have to wonder every five minutes what Alfred was up to. But try as she might, she couldn't get him interested in life. When she encouraged him to take up his metallurgy again, he looked at her as if she'd lost her mind. When she asked whether there wasn't some yard work he could do, he said his legs hurt. When she reminded him that the husbands of her friends all had hobbies, Dave Schumpert, his stained glass, Kirby Root, his intricate chalets for nesting purple finches, Chuck Meisner, his hourly monitoring of his investment portfolio, Alfred acted as if she were trying to distract him from some great labor of his. And what was that labor? Repainting the porch furniture? He'd been repainting the love seat since Labor Day. She seemed to recall that the last time he'd painted the furniture, he'd done the love seat in two hours. Now he went to his workshop morning after morning, and after a month she ventured in to see how he was doing, and found that all he'd painted of the love seat was the legs. He seemed to wish that she would go away. He said that the brush had got dried out, that that was what was taking so long. He said that scraping wicker was like trying to peel a blueberry. He said that there were crickets. She felt a shortness of breath then, but perhaps it was only the smell of gasoline and of the dampness of the workshop that smelled like urine, but could not possibly be urine. She fled upstairs to look for the letter from Axon. Six days a week, several pounds of mail came through the slot in the front door. And since nothing incidental was allowed to pile up downstairs, since the fiction of living in this house was that no one lived here, Enid faced a substantial tactical challenge. She didn't think of herself as a gorilla, but a gorilla was what she was. By day, she ferried materiel from depot to depot, often just a step ahead of the governing force. By night, beneath a charming but too dim sconce at a too small table in the breakfast nook, she staged various actions, paid bills, balanced checkbooks, attempted to decipher Medicare co-payment records and make sense of a threatening third notice from a medical lab that demanded immediate payment of 22 cents, while simultaneously showing an account balance of zero dollars, carried forward and thus indicating that she owed nothing and, in any case, offering no address to which remittance might be made. It would happen that the first and second notices were underground somewhere, and because of the constraints under which Enid waged her campaign, she had only the dimmest sense of where those other notices might be on any given evening. She might suspect, perhaps, the family room closet, but the governing force in the person of Alfred, would be watching a network news magazine at a volume thunderous enough to keep him awake. And he had every light in the family room burning, and there was a non-negligible possibility that if she opened the closet door, a cascade of catalogues and house beautifuls and miscellaneous Merrill Lynch statements would come toppling and sliding out, incurring Alfred's wrath. There was also the possibility that the notices would not be there, since the governing force staged random raids on her depots, threatening to pitch the whole lot of it if she didn't take care of it. But she was too busy dodging these raids to ever quite take care of it, 
and in the succession of forced migrations and deportations any lingering semblance of order was lost. And so the random Nordstrom shopping bag that was camped behind a dust ruffle with one of its plastic handles semi-detached would contain the whole shuffled pathos of a refugee existence, non-consecutive issues of good housekeeping, black and white snapshots of Enid in the 1940s, brown recipes on high-acid paper that called for wilted lettuce, the current month's telephone and gas bills, the detailed first notice from the medical lab instructing co-payers to ignore subsequent billings for less than 50 cents, a complimentary cruise ship photo of Enid and Alfred wearing lays and sipping beverages from hollow coconuts, and the only extant copies of two of their children's birth certificates, for example. Although Enid's ostensible foe was Alfred, what made her a gorilla was the house that occupied them both. Its furnishings were of the kind that brooked no clutter. There were chairs and tables by Ethan Allen, Spode and Waterford in the breakfront, obligatory ficuses, obligatory Norfolk pines, fanned copies of Architectural Digest on a glass-topped coffee table, touristic plunder, Enamelware from China, a Viennese music box that Enid, out of a sense of duty and mercy, every so often wound up and raised the lid of. The tune was Strangers in the Night. Unfortunately, Enid lacked the temperament to manage such a house, and Alfred lacked the neurological wherewithal. Alfred's cries of rage on discovering evidence of guerrilla actions a Nordstrom bag surprised in broad daylight on the basement stairs, nearly precipitating a tumble, were the cries of a government that could no longer govern. He'd lately developed a knack for making his printing calculator spit columns of meaningless eight-digit figures. After he devoted the better part of an afternoon to figuring the cleaning woman's social security payments five different times and came up with four different numbers and finally just accepted the one number, $635.78, that he'd managed to come up with twice, the correct figure was $70, Enid staged a nighttime raid on his filing cabinet and relieved it of all tax files, which might have improved household efficiency had the files not found their way into a Nordstrom bag with some misleadingly ancient good housekeepings concealing the more germane documents underneath. Which casualty of war led to the cleaning woman's filling out the forms herself, with Enid merely writing the checks, and Alfred shaking his head at the complexity of it all. It's the fate of most ping-pong tables in home basements eventually to serve the ends of other, more desperate games. After Alfred retired, he appropriated the eastern end of the table for his banking and correspondence. At the western end was the portable color TV on which he'd intended to watch the local news while sitting in his great blue chair, but which was now fully engulfed by good housekeepings and the seasonal candy tins and baroque but cheaply made candle holders that Enid never quite found time to transport to the nearly new consignment shop. The ping-pong table was the one field on which the Civil War raged openly. At the eastern end, Alfred's calculator was ambushed by floral print potholders and souvenir coasters from the Epcot Center and a device for pitting cherries, which Enid had owned for thirty years and never used, while he, in turn, at the western end, for absolutely no reason that Enid could ever fathom, ripped to pieces a wreath made of pine cones and spray-painted filberts and Brazil nuts. To the east of the ping-pong table was the workshop that housed Alfred's metallurgical lab. The workshop was now home to a colony of mute, dust-colored crickets, which, when startled, would scatter across the room like a handful of dropped marbles, some of them misfiring at crazy angles, others toppling over with the weight of their own copious protoplasm. They popped all too easily, and cleanup took more than one Kleenex. Enid and Alfred had many afflictions which they believed to be extraordinary, outsized, shameful, 
and the crickets were one of them. The grey dust of evil spells and the cobwebs of enchantment thickly cloaked the old electric arc furnace, and the jars of exotic rhodium and sinister cadmium and stalwart bismuth, and the hand-printed labels browned by the vapors from a glass-stoppered bottle of aqua regia and the quad-ruled notebook in which the latest entry in Alfred's hand dated from a time fifteen years ago before the betrayals had begun. Something as daily and friendly as a pencil still occupied the random spot on the workbench where Alfred had laid it in a different decade. The passage of so many years imbued the pencil with a kind of enmity. Asbestos mitts hung from a nail beneath two certificates of U.S. patents, the frames warped and sprung by dampness. On the hood of a binocular microscope lay big chips of peeled paint from the ceiling. The only dust-free objects in the room were the wicker love seat, a can of rust-oleum and some brushes and a couple of Uban coffee cans, which, despite increasingly strong olfactory evidence, Enid chose not to believe were filling up with her husband's urine. Because what earthly reason could he have, with a nice little half-bathroom not twenty feet away, for peeing in a Uban can? To the west of the ping-pong table was Alfred's great blue chair. The chair was overstuffed, vaguely gubernatorial. It was made of leather, but it smelled like the inside of a Lexus, like something modern and medical and impermeable that you could wipe the smell of death off easily with a damp cloth before the next person sat down to die in it. The chair was the only major purchase Alfred had ever made without Enid's approval. When he'd traveled to China to confer with Chinese railroad engineers, Enid had gone along, and the two of them had visited a rug factory to buy a rug for their family room. They were unaccustomed to spending money on themselves, and so they chose one of the least expensive rugs with a simple blue design from the Book of Changes on a solid field of beige. A few years later, when Alfred retired from the Midland Pacific Railroad, he set about replacing the old cow-smelling black leather armchair in which he watched TV and took his naps. He wanted something really comfortable, of course, but after a lifetime of providing for others, he needed more than just comfort. He needed a monument to his need. So he went, alone, to a non-discount furniture store and picked out a chair of permanence. An engineer's chair, a chair so big that even a big man got lost in it. A chair designed to bear up under heavy stress. And because the blue of its leather vaguely matched the blue in the Chinese rug, Enid had no choice but to suffer its deployment in the family room. Soon, however, Alfred's hands were spilling decaffeinated coffee on the rug's beige expanses, and wild grandchildren were leaving berries and crayons underfoot, and Enid began to feel that the rug was a mistake. It seemed to her that in trying to save money in life, she had made many mistakes like this. She reached the point of thinking it would have been better to buy no rug than to buy this rug. Finally, as Alfred's naps deepened toward enchantment, she grew bolder. Her own mother had left her a tiny inheritance years ago. Interest had been added to principal, certain stocks had performed rather well, and now she had an income of her own. She reconceived the family room in greens and yellows. She ordered fabrics. The paper hanger came, and Alfred, who was napping temporarily in the dining room, leaped to his feet like a man with a bad dream. You're redecorating again? It's my own money, Enid said. This is how I'm spending it. And what about the money I made? What about the work I did? This argument had been effective in the past. It was, so to speak, the constitutional basis of the tyranny's legitimacy. But it didn't work now. That rug is nearly ten years old, and we'll never get the coffee stains out, Enid answered. Alfred gestured at his blue chair, which under the paper hanger's plastic drop cloths looked like something you might deliver to a power station on a flatbed truck. 
He was trembling with incredulity, unable to believe that Enid could have forgotten this crushing refutation of her arguments, this overwhelming impediment to her plans. It was as if all the unfreedom in which he'd spent his seven decades of life were embodied in this six-year-old but essentially brand-new chair. He was grinning, his face aglow with the awful perfection of his logic. And what about the chair, then? he said. What about the chair? Enid looked at the chair. Her expression was merely pained no more. I never liked that chair. This was probably the most terrible thing she could have said to Alfred. The chair was the only sign he'd ever given of having a personal vision of the future. Enid's words filled him with such sorrow. He felt such pity for the chair, such solidarity with it, such astonished grief at its betrayal, that he pulled off the drop cloth and sank into its arms and fell asleep. It was a way of recognizing places of enchantment, people falling asleep like this. When it became clear that both the rug and Alfred's chair had to go, the rug was easily shed. In it advertised in the free local paper and netted a nervous bird of a woman who was still making mistakes and whose fifties came out of her purse in a disorderly roll that she unpeeled and flattened with shaking fingers. But the chair? The chair was a monument and a symbol, and could not be parted from Alfred. It could only be relocated, and so it went into the basement, and Alfred followed. And so, in the house of the Lamberts, as in St. Jude, as in the country as a whole, life came to be lived underground. Enid could hear Alfred upstairs now, opening and closing drawers. He became agitated whenever they were going to see their children. Seeing their children was the only thing he seemed to care about anymore. In the streaklessly clean windows of the dining room there was chaos. The berserk wind, the negating shadows. Enid had looked everywhere for the letter from the Axon Corporation, and she couldn't find it. Alfred was standing in the master bedroom, wondering why the drawers of his dresser were open, who had opened them, whether he had opened them himself. He couldn't help blaming Enid for his confusion, for witnessing it into existence, for existing herself as a person who could have opened these drawers. Al, what are you doing? He turned to the doorway where she'd appeared. He began a sentence... I am. But when he was taken by surprise, every sentence became an adventure in the woods. As soon as he could no longer see the light of the clearing from which he'd entered, he would realize that the crumbs he'd dropped for bearings had been eaten by birds. Silent, deft, darting things which he couldn't quite see in the darkness, but which were so numerous and swarming in their hunger that it seemed as if they were the darkness, as if the darkness weren't uniform, weren't an absence of light, but a teeming and corpuscular thing. And indeed, when as a studious teenager he'd encountered the word crepuscular in Mackay's Treasury of English Verse, the corpuscles of biology had bled into his understanding of the word, so that for his entire adult life, He'd seen in twilight a corpuscularity as of the graininess of the high-speed film necessary for photography under conditions of low ambient light, as of a kind of sinister decay, and hence the panic of a man betrayed deep in the woods, whose darkness was the darkness of starlings blotting out the sunset, or black ants storming a dead opossum, a darkness that didn't just exist, but actively consumed the bearings that he'd sensibly established for himself, lest he be lost. But in the instant of realizing he was lost, time became marvelously slow, and he discovered hitherto unguessed eternities in the space between one word and the next. Or rather, he became trapped in that space between words and could only stand and watch as time sped on without him, the thoughtless, 
boyish part of him crashing on out of sight blindly through the woods, while he, trapped, the grown-up Al, watched in oddly impersonal suspense to see if the panic-stricken little boy might, despite no longer knowing where he was or at what point he'd entered the woods of this sentence, still manage to blunder into the clearing where Enid was waiting for him, unaware of any woods. Packing my suitcase, he heard himself say. This sounded right. Verb, possessive, noun. Here was a suitcase in front of him. An important confirmation. He'd betrayed nothing. But Enid had spoken again. The audiologist had said that he was mildly impaired. He frowned at her, not following. It's Thursday, she said louder. We're not leaving until Saturday. Saturday, he echoed. She berated him then, and for a while the crepuscular birds retreated. But outside, the wind had blown the sun out, and it was getting very cold. The Failure Down the long concourse they came unsteadily, Enid favoring her damaged hip, Alfred paddling at the air with loose-hinged hands and slapping the airport carpeting with poorly controlled feet, both of them carrying Nordic Pleasure Line's shoulder bags and concentrating on the floor in front of them, measuring out the hazardous distance three paces at a time. To anyone who saw them averting their eyes from the dark-haired New Yorkers careering past them, to anyone who caught a glimpse of Alfred's straw fedora looming at the height of Iowa corn on Labor Day, or the yellow wool of the slacks stretching over Enid's outslung hip, it was obvious that they were Midwestern and intimidated. But to Chip Lambert, who was waiting for them just beyond the security checkpoint, they were killers. Chip had crossed his arms defensively and raised one hand to pull on the wrought iron rivet in his ear. He worried that he might tear the rivet right out of his earlobe that the maximum pain his ears and nerves could generate was less pain than he needed now to steady himself. From his station by the metal detectors, he watched an azure-haired girl overtake his parents, an azure-haired girl of college age, a very wantable stranger with pierced lips and eyebrows. It struck him that if he could have sex with this girl for one second, he could face his parents confidently and that if he could keep on having sex with this girl once every minute for as long as his parents were in town, he could survive their entire visit. Chip was a tall, gym-built man with crow's feet and sparse, butter-yellow hair. If the girl had noticed him, she might have thought he was a little too old for the leather he was wearing. As she hurried past him, he pulled harder on his rivet to offset the pain of her departure from his life forever and to focus his attention on his father whose face was brightening at the discovery of a son among so many strangers. In the lunging manner of a man floundering in water, Alfred fell upon Chip and grabbed Chip's hand and wrist as if they were a rope he'd been thrown. Well, he said, well. Enid came limping up behind him. Chip, she cried, what have you done to your ears? Dad, Mom, Chip murmured through his teeth, hoping the azure-haired girl was out of earshot. Good to see you. He had time for one subversive thought about his parents' Nordic Pleasure Lines shoulder bags. Either Nordic Pleasure Lines sent bags like these to every booker of its cruises as a cynical means of getting inexpensive walkabout publicity or as a practical means of tagging the cruise participants for greater ease of handling at embarkation points. Or as a benign means of building esprit de corps. Or else Enid and Alfred had deliberately saved the bags from some previous Nordic Pleasure Lines cruise and, out of a misguided sense of loyalty, had chosen to carry them on their upcoming cruise as well. And in either case, Chip was appalled by his parents' willingness to make themselves vectors of corporate advertising. Before he shouldered the bags himself, 
and assumed the burden of seeing LaGuardia Airport and New York City and his life and clothes and body through the disappointed eyes of his parents. He noticed, as if for the first time, the dirty linoleum, the assassin-like chauffeurs holding up signs with other people's names on them, the snarl of wires dangling from a hole in the ceiling. He distinctly heard the word motherfucker. Outside the big windows on the baggage level, two Bangladeshi men were pushing a disabled cab through rain and angry honking. We have to be at the pier by four, Enid said to Chip. And I think Dad was hoping to see your desk at the Wall Street Journal. She raised her voice. Al? Al? Though stooped in the neck now, Alfred was still an imposing figure. His hair was white and thick and sleek, like a polar bear's. And the powerful long muscles of his shoulders, which Chip remembered laboring in the spanking of a child, usually Chip himself, still filled the gray tweed shoulders of his sport coat. Al? Didn't you say you wanted to see where Chip worked? Enid shouted. Alfred shook his head. There's no time. The baggage carousel circulated nothing. Did you take your pill? Enid said. Yes, Alfred said. He closed his eyes and repeated slowly, I took my pill, I took my pill, I took my pill. Dr. Hedgepath has him on a new medication, Enid explained to Chip, who was quite certain that his father had not, in fact, expressed interest in seeing his office. And since Chip had no association with the Wall Street Journal, the publication to which he made unpaid contributions was the Warren Street Journal, a monthly of the transgressive arts. He had also, very recently, completed a screenplay, and he'd been working part-time as a legal proofreader at Bragg, Neuter, and Spey, for the nearly two years since he'd lost his assistant professorship in textual artifacts at D College in Connecticut, as a result of an offense involving a female undergraduate which had fallen just short of the legally actionable and which, though his parents never learned of it, had interrupted the parade of accomplishments that his mother could brag about back home in St. Jude. He told his parents that he'd quit teaching in order to pursue a career in writing. And when, more recently, his mother had pressed him for details, he'd mentioned the Warren Street Journal, the name of which his mother had misheard, and instantly begun to trumpet to her friends Esther Root and B. Meisner and Mary Beth Schumpert. And though Chip and his monthly phone calls home had had many opportunities to disabuse her, he'd instead actively fostered the misunderstanding. And here, things became rather complex, not only because the Wall Street Journal was available in St. Jude, and his mother had never mentioned looking for his work and failing to find it, meaning that some part of her knew perfectly well that he didn't write for the paper, but also because the author of articles like Creative Adultery and Let Us Now Praise Scuzzy Motels was conspiring to preserve in his mother precisely the kind of illusion that the Warren Street Journal was dedicated to exploding. And he was thirty-nine years old, and he blamed his parents for the person he had become. He was happy when his mother let the subject drop. His tremor's much better, Enid added in a voice inaudible to Alfred. The only side effect is that he may hallucinate. That's quite a side effect, Chip said. Dr. Hedgepeth says that what he has is very mild and almost completely controllable with medication. Alfred was surveying the baggage claim cavern while pale travelers angled for position at the carousel. There was a confusion of tread patterns on the linoleum, gray with the pollutants that the rain had brought down. The light was the color of car sickness. New York City, Alfred said. Enid frowned at Chip's pants. Those aren't leather, are they? Yes. How do you wash them? They're leather. They're like a second skin. We have to be at the pier no later than four o'clock, Enid said. The carousel coughed up some suitcases. Chip, help me, his father said. Soon Chip was staggering out into the wind-blown rain with all four of his parents' bags. 
Alfred shuffled forward with the jerking momentum of a man who knew there would be trouble if he had to stop and start again. Enid lagged behind, intent on the pain in her hip. She'd put on weight and maybe lost a little height since Chip had last seen her. She'd always been a pretty woman, but to Chip she was so much a personality and so little anything else that even staring straight at her he had no idea what she really looked like. "'What's that?' "'Wrought iron?' Alfred asked him as the taxi line crept forward. "'Yes,' Chip said, touching his ear. "'Looks like an old quarter-inch rivet.' "'Yes.' "'What do you do, crimp that? Hammer it?' "'It's hammered,' Chip said. Alfred winced and gave a low, inhaling whistle. "'We're doing a luxury fall color cruise.' Enid said when the three of them were in a yellow cab speeding through Queens. We sail up to Quebec, and then we enjoy the changing leaves all the way back down. Dad so enjoyed the last cruise we were on, didn't you, Al? Didn't you have a good time on that cruise? The brick palisades of the East River waterfront were taking an angry beating from the rain. Chip could have wished for a sunny day, a clear view of landmarks and blue water with nothing to hide. The only colors on the road this morning were the smeared reds of brake lights. This is one of the great cities of the world, Alfred said with emotion. How are you feeling these days, Dad? Chip managed to ask. Any better I'd be in heaven, any worse I'd be in hell. We're excited about your new job, Enid said. One of the great papers in the country, Alfred said, the Wall Street Journal. Does anybody smell fish, though? We're near the ocean, Chip said. No, it's you. Enid leaned and buried her face in Chip's leather sleeve. Your jacket smells strongly of fish. He wrenched free of her. Mother, please. Chip's problem was a loss of confidence. Gone were the days when he could afford to épater les bourgeois. Except for his Manhattan apartment and his handsome girlfriend, Julia Vrace, he now had almost nothing to persuade himself that he was a functioning male adult. No accomplishments to compare with those of his brother, Gary, who was a banker and a father of three, or of his sister, Denise, who at the age of thirty-two was the executive chef at a successful new high-end restaurant in Philadelphia. Chip had hoped he might have sold his screenplay by now, but he hadn't finished a draft until after midnight on Tuesday, and then he'd had to work three fourteen-hour shifts at Bragg, Neuter, and Spey to raise cash to pay his August rent and reassure the owner of his apartment, Chip had a sublease, about his September and October rent, and then there was a lunch to be shopped for and an apartment to be cleaned, and finally, sometime before dawn this morning, a long-hoarded Xanax to be swallowed. Meanwhile, nearly a week had gone by without his seeing Julia or speaking to her directly. In response to the many nervous messages he'd left on her voicemail in the last forty-eight hours, asking her to meet him and his parents and Denise at his apartment at noon on Saturday, and also, please, if possible, not to mention to his parents that she was married to someone else, Julia had maintained a total phone and email silence from which even a more stable man than Chip might have drawn disturbing conclusions. It was raining so hard in Manhattan that water was streaming down facades and frothing at the mouths of sewers. Outside his building on East Ninth Street, Chip took money from Enid and handed it through the cab's partition, and even as the turbaned driver thanked him, he realized the tip was too small. From his own wallet he took two singles and dangled them near the driver's shoulder. That's enough, that's enough, Enid squeaked, reaching for Chip's wrist. He already said thank you. But the money was gone. Alfred was trying to open the door by pulling on the window crank. Here, Dad, it's this one, Chip said and leaned across him to pop the door. How big a tip was that? Enid asked Chip on the sidewalk under his building's marquee as the driver heaved luggage from the trunk. About fifteen percent, Chip said. More like twenty, I'd say, Enid said. Let's have a fight about this, why don't we? Twenty percent's too much, Chip, Alfred pronounced in a booming voice. It's not reasonable. You all have a good day now, 
the taxi driver said with no apparent irony. The tip is for service and comportment, Enid said. If the service and comportment are especially good, I might give 15%, but if you automatically tip... I've suffered from depression all my life, Alfred said, or seemed to say. Excuse me? Chip said. Depression years changed me. They changed the meaning of a dollar. An economic depression we're talking about. Then when the service really is especially good or especially bad, Enid pursued, there's no way to express it monetarily. A dollar is still a lot of money, Alfred said. Fifteen percent of the service is exceptional, really exceptional. I'm wondering why we're having this particular conversation, Chip said to his mother. Why this conversation and not some other conversation? We're both terribly anxious, Enid replied, to see where you work. Chip's doorman, Zoroaster, hurried out to help with the luggage and installed the Lamberts in the building's bulky elevator. Enid said, I ran into your old friend Dean Driblet at the bank the other day. I never run into Dean, but where he doesn't ask about you. He was impressed with your new writing job. Dean Driblet was a classmate, not a friend, Chip said. He and his wife just had their fourth child. I told you, didn't I? They built that enormous house out in Paradise Valley. Al, didn't you count eight bedrooms? Alfred gave her a steady, unblinking look. Chip leaned on the door close button. Dad and I were at the housewarming in June, Enid said. It was spectacular. They'd had it catered, and they had pyramids of shrimp. It was solid shrimp in pyramids. I've never seen anything like it. Pyramids of shrimp, Chip said. The elevator door had finally closed. Anyway, it's a beautiful house, Enid said. There are at least six bedrooms, and you know, it looks like they're going to fill them. Dean's tremendously successful. He started that lawn care business when he decided the mortuary business wasn't for him. Well, you know, Dale Driblet's his stepdad, you know, the Driblet Chapel, and now his billboards are everywhere, and he started an HMO. I saw in the paper where it's the fastest-growing HMO in St. Jude. It's called DD Care, same as the lawn care business. And there are billboards for the HMO now, too. He's quite the entrepreneur, I'd say. Slow elevator, Alfred said. This is a pre-war building, Chip explained in a tight voice. An extremely desirable building. But you know what he told me he's doing for his mother's birthday? It's still a surprise for her, but I can tell you. He's taking her to Paris for eight days. Two first-class tickets, eight nights at the Ritz. That's the kind of person Dean is, very family-oriented. But can you believe that kind of birthday present? Al, didn't you say the house alone probably cost a million dollars? Al? It's a large house, but cheaply done, Alfred said with sudden vigor. The walls are like paper. All the new houses are like that, Enid said. You asked me if I was impressed with the house. I thought it was ostentatious. I thought the shrimp was ostentatious. It was poor. It may have been frozen, Enid said. People are easily impressed with things like that, Alfred said. They'll talk for months about the pyramids of shrimp. Well, see for yourself, he said to Chip, as to a neutral bystander. Your mother's still talking about it. For a moment it seemed to Chip that his father had become a likable old stranger. But he knew Alfred underneath to be a shouter and a punisher. The last time Chip had visited his parents in St. Jude, four years earlier, he'd taken along his then-girlfriend, Ruthie, a peroxided young Marxist from the north of England, who, after committing numberless offenses against Enid's sensibilities, she lit a cigarette indoors, laughed out loud at Enid's favorite watercolors of Buckingham Palace, came to dinner without a bra, and failed to take even one bite of the salad of water chestnuts and green peas and cheddar cheese cubes in a thick mayonnaise sauce which Enid made for festive occasions. 
had needled and baited Alfred until he pronounced that the blacks would be the ruination of this country. The blacks were incapable of coexisting with whites. They expected the government to take care of them. They didn't know the meaning of hard work. What they lacked above all was discipline. It was going to end with slaughter in the streets, with slaughter in the streets. And he didn't give a damn what Ruthie thought of him. She was a visitor in his house and his country, and she had no right to criticize things she didn't understand. Whereupon Chip, who'd already warned Ruthie that his parents were the squarest people in America, had smiled at her as if to say, You see, exactly as advertised. When Ruthie had dumped him, not three weeks later, she'd remarked that he was more like his father than he seemed to realize. Al, Enid said as the elevator lurched to a halt, You have to admit that it was a very, very nice party and that it was very nice of Dean to invite us. Alfred seemed not to have heard her. Propped outside Chip's apartment was a clear plastic umbrella that Chip recognized with relief as Julia Vrace's. He was herding the parental luggage from the elevator when his apartment door swung open and Julia herself stepped out. Oh, oh, she said as though flustered, you're early. By Chip's watch it was 11.35. Julia was wearing a shapeless lavender raincoat and holding a DreamWorks tote bag. Her hair, which was long and the color of dark chocolate, was big with humidity and rain. In the tone of a person being friendly to large animals, she said, Hi, to Alfred, and hi, separately, to Enid. Alfred and Enid bayed their names at her and extended hands to shake, driving her back into the apartment where Enid began to pepper her with questions in which Chip, as he followed with the luggage, could hear subtexts and agendas. Do you live in the city? Enid said. You're not cohabiting with our son, are you? And you work in the city, too? You are gainfully employed. You're not from an alien, snobbish, moneyed Eastern family. Did you grow up here? Or do you come from a trans-Appalachian state where people are warm-hearted and down-to-earth and unlikely to be Jewish? Oh, and do you still have family in Ohio? Have your parents perhaps taken the morally dubious modern step of getting divorced? Do you have brothers or sisters? Are you a spoiled only child? Or a Catholic with a zillion siblings? Julia, having passed this initial examination, Enid turned her attention to the apartment. Chip in a late crisis of confidence, had tried to make it presentable. He'd bought a stain removal kit and lifted the big semen stain off the red chaise long, dismantled the wall of wine bottle corks with which he'd been bricking in the niche above his fireplace at a rate of half a dozen Merlots and Pinot Grigios a week, taken down from his bathroom wall the close-up photographs of male and female genitalia that were the flower of his art collection, and replaced them with the three diplomas that Enid had long ago insisted on having framed for him. This morning, feeling as if he'd surrendered too much of himself, he'd readjusted his presentation by wearing leather to the airport. This room is about the size of Dean Driblet's bathroom, Enid said. Wouldn't you say, Al? Alfred rotated his bobbing hands and examined their dorsal sides. I'd never seen such an enormous bathroom. Enid, you have no tact, Alfred said. It might have occurred to Chip that this, too, was a tactless remark, since it implied that his father concurred in his mother's criticism of the apartment and objected only to her airing of it. But Chip was unable to focus on anything but the hairdryer protruding from Julia's DreamWorks tote bag. It was the hairdryer that she kept in his bathroom. She seemed actually to be heading out the door. Dean and Trish have a whirlpool and a shower stall and a tub, all separate, Enid went on. The sinks are his and hers. Chip, I'm sorry, Julia said. He raised a hand to put her on hold. We're going to have lunch here as soon as Denise comes, he announced to his parents. It's a very simple lunch. Just make yourselves at home. It was nice to meet you both, Julia called to Enid and Alfred. To Chip, in a lower voice, she said, Denise will be here. You'll be fine. She opened the door. Mom, Dad, Chip said. Just one second. He followed Julia out of the apartment and let the door fall shut behind him. This is really unfortunate timing, 
he said. Just really, really unfortunate. Julia shook her hair back off her temples. I'm feeling good about the fact that it's the first time in my life I've ever acted self-interestedly in a relationship. That's nice. That's a big step. Chip made an effort to smile. But what about the script? Is Eden reading it? I think maybe this weekend sometime. What about you? I read, um... Julia looked away. Most of it. My idea, Chip said, was to have this hump that the moviegoer has to get over. Putting something off-putting at the beginning, it's a classic modernist strategy. There's a lot of rich suspense toward the end. Julia turned toward the elevator and didn't reply. Did you get to the end yet? Chip asked. Oh, Chip, she burst out miserably. Your script starts off with a six-page lecture about anxieties of the phallus in Tudor drama. He was aware of this. Indeed, for weeks now, he'd been awakening most nights before dawn, his stomach churning and his teeth clenched, and had wrestled with the nightmarish certainty that a long academic monologue on Tudor drama had no place in Act I of a commercial script. Often it took him hours, took getting out of bed, pacing around, drinking Merlot or Pinot Grigio, to regain his conviction that a theory-driven opening monologue was not only not a mistake, but the script's most powerful selling point. And now, with a single glance at Julia, he could see that he was wrong. Nodding in heartfelt agreement with her criticism, he opened the door of his apartment and called to his parents, "'One second, Mom! Dad, just one second! As he shut the door again, however, the old arguments came back to him. You see, though, he said, the entire story is prefigured in that monologue. Every single theme is there in capsule form, gender, power, identity, authenticity. And the thing is, wait, wait, Julia? Bowing her head sheepishly, as though she'd somehow hoped he wouldn't notice she was leaving, Julia turned away from the elevator and back toward him. The thing is, he said, the girl is sitting in the front row of the classroom, listening to the lecture. It's a crucial image, the fact that he is controlling the discourse. And it's a little creepy, though, Julia said, the way you keep talking about her breasts. This, too, was true. That it was true, however, seemed unfair and cruel to Chip, who would never have had the heart to write the script at all without the lure of imagining the breasts of his young female lead. You're probably right, he said, although some of the physicality there is intentional because that's the irony, see, that she's attracted to his mind while he's attracted to her. But for a woman reading it, Julia said obstinately, it's sort of like the poultry department, breast, 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 thigh, leg. I can remove some of those references. Chip said in a low voice. I can also shorten the opening lecture. The thing is, though, I want there to be a hump right for the moviegoer to get over. That's a neat idea. Please come and have lunch. Please, Julia. The elevator door had opened at her touch. I'm saying it's a tiny bit insulting to a person somehow. But that's not you. It's not even based on you. Oh, great. It's somebody else's breasts. Jesus, please, one second... Chip turned back to his apartment door and opened it, and this time he was startled to find himself face to face with his father. Alfred's big hands were shaking violently. Dad, hi, just another minute here. Chip, Alfred said, ask her to stay. Tell her we want her to stay. Chip nodded and closed the door in the old man's face. But in the few seconds his back had been turned, the elevator had swallowed Julia. He punched the call button to no avail and then opened the fire door and ran down the spiral of the service stairwell. After a series of effulgent lectures celebrating the unfettered pursuit of pleasure as a strategy of subverting the bureaucracy of rationalism, Bill Quaintance, an attractive young professor of textual artifacts, is seduced by his beautiful and adoring student, Mona. Their wildly erotic affair has hardly begun, however, when they are discovered by Bill's estranged wife, Hilaire. In a tense confrontation representing the clash of therapeutic and transgressive worldviews, Bill and Hilaire struggle for the soul of young Mona, who lies naked between them untangled sheets. 
Hilaire succeeds in seducing Mona with her crypto-repressive rhetoric, and Mona publicly denounces Bill. Bill loses his job but soon discovers email records proving that Hilaire has given Mona money to ruin his career. As Bill is driving to see his lawyer with a diskette containing the incriminating evidence, his car is run off the road into the raging Dee River, and the diskette floats free of the sunken car and is borne by ceaseless, indomitable currents into the raging, erotic-slash-chaotic open sea, and the crash is ruled vehicular suicide. And in the film's final scenes, Hilaire is hired to replace Bill on the faculty and is seen lecturing on the evils of unfettered pleasure to a classroom in which is seated her diabolical lesbian lover, Mona. This was the one-page précis that Chip had assembled with the aid of store-bought screenwriting manuals and had faxed one winter morning to a Manhattan-based film producer named Eden Procuro. Five minutes later, he'd answered his phone to the cool, blank voice of a young woman saying, Please hold for Eden Procuro, followed by Eden Procuro herself, crying, I love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. But now a year and a half had passed. Now the one-page precy had become a 124-page script called The Academy Purple. And now Julia Vrace the chocolate-haired owner of that cool, blank personal assistant's voice, was running away from him, and as he raced downstairs to intercept her, planting his feet sideways to take the steps three and four at a time, grabbing the newel at each landing and reversing his trajectory with a jerk, all he could see or think of was a damning entry in his nearly photographic mental concordance of those 124 pages. Three. Bee-stung lips high round breasts, narrow hips, and three, over the cashmere sweater that snugly hugs her breasts, four, forward raptly, her perfect adolescent breasts eagerly, eight, eyeing her breasts, nine, eyeing her breasts, nine, his eyes drawn helplessly to her perfect breasts, eleven, eyeing her breasts, twelve, mentally fondling her perfect breasts, thirteen, eyeing her breasts, fifteen, eyeing and eyeing her perfect adolescent breasts, twenty-three, clinch, her perfect breasts surging against his, twenty-four, the repressive bra to unfetter her subversive breasts, twenty-eight, to pinkly tongue one sweat-sheened breast, twenty-nine, phallically jutting nipple of her sweat-drenched breast, twenty-nine, I like your breasts. Thirty. Absolutely adore your honeyed, heavy breasts. Thirty-three. Hilaire's breasts, like twin Gestapo bullets, can be. Thirty-six. Barbed glare, as if to puncture and deflate her breasts. Forty-four. Arcadian breasts, with stern puritanical terry cloth, and. Forty-five. Cowering, ashamed, the towel clutched to her breasts. Seventy-six. Her guileless breasts, shrouded now in militaristic... Eighty-three. I miss your body. I miss your perfect breasts. I... One-seventeen. Drowned headlights, fading like two milk-white breasts. And there were probably even more. More than he could remember. And the only two readers who mattered now were women. It seemed to Chip that Julia was leaving him because the Academy Purple had too many breast references and a draggy opening, and that if he could correct these few obvious problems, both on Julia's copy of the script and, more important, on the copy he'd specially laser-printed on twenty-four-pound ivory bond paper for Eden Procuro, there might be hope not only for his finances— but also for his chances of ever again unfettering and fondling Julia's own guileless milk-white breasts. Which by this point in the day, as by late morning of almost every day in recent months, was one of the last activities on earth in which he could still reasonably expect to take solace for his failures. Exiting the stairwell into the lobby, 
he found the elevator waiting to torment its next rider. Through the open street door he saw a taxi extinguish its roof light and pull away. Zoroaster was mopping up inblown water from the lobby's checkerboard marble. Goodbye, Mr. Chip, he quipped, by no means for the first time, as Chip ran outside. Big raindrops beating on the sidewalk raised a fresh, cold mist of pure humidity. Through the bead curtain of water coming off the marquee, Chip saw Julia's cab break for a yellow light. Directly across the street, another cab had stopped to discharge a passenger, and it occurred to Chip that he could take this other cab and ask the driver to follow Julia. The idea was tempting, but there were difficulties. One difficulty was that... By chasing Julia, he would arguably be committing the worst of the offenses for which the general counsel of D. College, in a shrill, moralistic lawyer's letter, had once upon a time threatened to countersue him or have him prosecuted. The alleged offenses had included fraud, breach of contract, kidnap, Title IX sexual harassment, serving liquor to a student under the legal drinking age, and possession and sale of a controlled substance. But it was the accusation of stalking, of making obscene and threatening and abusive telephone calls and trespassing with intent to violate a young woman's privacy that had really scared Chip, and scared him still. A more immediate difficulty was that he had four dollars in his wallet, less than ten dollars in his checking account, no credit to speak of on any of his major credit cards, and no prospect of further proofreading work until Monday afternoon. Considering that the last time he'd seen Julia, six days ago, she'd specifically complained that he always wanted to stay home and eat pasta and always be kissing her and having sex. She'd said that sometimes she almost felt like he used sex as a kind of medication, and that maybe the reason he didn't just go ahead and self-medicate with crack or heroin instead was that sex was free, and he was turning into such a cheapskate. She'd said that now that she was taking an actual prescription medication herself, she sometimes felt like she was taking it for both of them, and that this seemed doubly unfair because she was the one who paid for the medication and because the medication made her slightly less interested in sex than she used to be. She'd said that if it were up to Chip, they probably wouldn't even go to movies anymore, but would spend the whole weekend wallowing in bed with the shades down and then reheating pasta. He suspected that the minimum price of further conversation with her would be an overpriced lunch of mesquite grilled autumn vegetables and a bottle of Sancerre for which he had no conceivable way of paying. And so he stood and did nothing as the corner traffic light turned green and Julia's cab drove out of sight. Rain was lashing the pavement in white, infected-looking drops. Across the street, a long-legged woman in tight jeans and excellent black boots had climbed out of the other cab. That this woman was Chip's little sister, Denise, that is, was the only attractive young woman on the planet whom he was neither permitted nor inclined to feast his eyes on and imagine having sex with, seemed to him just the latest unfairness in a long morning of unfairnesses. Denise was carrying a black umbrella a cone of flowers, and a pastry box tied with twine. She picked her way through the pools and rapids on the pavement and joined Chip beneath the marquee. Listen, Chip said with a nervous smile, not looking at her, I need to ask you a big favor. I need you to hold the fort for me here while I find Eden and get my script back. There's a major, quick set of corrections I have to make. As if he were a caddy or a servant, Denise handed him her umbrella and brushed water and grit from the ankles of her jeans. Denise had her mother's dark hair and pale complexion and her father's intimidating air of moral authority. She was the one who'd instructed Chip to invite his parents to stop and have lunch in New York today. She'd sounded like the World Bank dictating terms to a Latin debtor state because, unfortunately, Chip owed her some money. He owed her whatever ten thousand and fifty-five hundred and four thousand and a thousand dollars added up to. See, he explained, Eden wants to read the script this afternoon sometime, and financially, obviously, it's critical that we... You can't leave now, Denise said. It'll take me an hour, Chip said, an hour and a half at most. 
Is Julia here? No, she left. She said hello and left. You broke up? I don't know. She's gotten herself medicated, and I don't even trust... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you wanting to go to Eden's or chasing Julia? Chip touched the rivet in his left ear. Ninety percent going to Eden's. Oh, Chip. No, but listen, he said. She's using the word health like it has some kind of absolute, timeless meaning. This is Julia? She takes pills for three months. The pills make her unbelievably obtuse, and the obtuseness then defines itself as mental health. It's like blindness defining itself as vision. Now that I'm blind, I can see there's nothing to see. Denise sighed and let her cone of flowers droop to the sidewalk. What are you saying? You want to follow her and take away her medicine? I'm saying the structure of the entire culture is flawed, Chip said. I'm saying the bureaucracy has arrogated the right to define certain states of mind as diseased. A lack of desire to spend money becomes a symptom of disease that requires expensive medication, which medication then destroys the libido, in other words, destroys the appetite for the one pleasure in life that's free, which means the person has to spend even more money on compensatory pleasures. The very definition of mental health is the ability to participate in the consumer economy. When you buy into therapy, you're buying into buying. And I'm saying that I personally am losing the battle with a commercialized, medicalized, totalitarian modernity right this instant. Denise closed one eye and opened the other very wide. Her open eye was like nearly black balsamic vinegar beading on white china. If I grant that these are interesting issues, she said. Will you stop talking about them and come upstairs with me? Chip shook his head. There's a poached salmon in the fridge, a creme fraiche with sorrel, a salad with green beans and hazelnuts. You'll see the wine and the baguette and the butter. It's good fresh butter from Vermont. Has it occurred to you that Dad is sick? An hour is all it's going to take, hour and a half at most. I said... Has it occurred to you that Dad is sick? Chip had a vision of his father trembling and pleading in the doorway. To block it out, he tried to summon up an image of sex with Julia, with the azure-haired stranger, with Ruthie, with anyone. But all he could picture was a vengeful, fury-like horde of disembodied breasts. The faster I get to Eden's and make those corrections, he said, the sooner I'll be back, if you really want to help me. An available cab was coming down the street. He made the mistake of looking at it, and Denise misunderstood him. I can't give you any more money, she said. He recoiled as if she'd spat on him. Jesus, Denise, I'd like to, but I can't. I wasn't asking you for money, because where does it end? He turned on his heel and walked into the downpour and marched toward University Place, smiling with rage. He was ankle-deep in a boiling, gray, sidewalk-shaped lake. He was clutching Denise's umbrella in his fist without opening it, and still it seemed unfair to him. It seemed not his fault that he was getting drenched. Until recently, and without ever giving the matter much thought, Chip had believed that it was possible to be successful in America without making lots of money. He'd always been a good student, and from an early age, he'd proved unfit for any form of economic activity except buying things. This he could do. And so he'd chosen to pursue a life of the mind. Since Alfred had once mildly but unforgettably remarked that he didn't see the point of literary theory, and since Enid, in the florid bi-weekly letters by means of which she saved many dollars on long-distance dialing, had regularly begged Chip to abandon his pursuit of an impractical doctorate in the humanities. I see your old science fair trophies, she wrote, and I think of what an able young man like you could be giving back to society as a medical doctor. But then, you see, Dad and I always hoped we'd raise children who thought of others, not just themselves. Chip had had plenty of incentives to work hard and prove his parents wrong. By getting out of bed much earlier than his grad school classmates who slept off their Gaulois hangovers until noon or one o'clock, 
he'd piled up the prizes and fellowships and grants that were the coin of the academic realm. For the first fifteen years of his adult life, his only experience with failure had come second-hand. His girlfriend in college, and long after, Tori Timmelman, was a feminist theorist who'd become so enraged with the patriarchal system of accreditation and its phallometric yardsticks of achievement that she refused, or was unable, to finish her dissertation. Chip had grown up listening to his father pontificate on the topics of men's work and women's work and the importance of maintaining the distinction. In a spirit of correction, he stuck with Tory for nearly a decade. He did all the laundry and most of the cleaning and cooking and cat care in the little apartment that he and Tory shared. He read secondary literature for Tory and helped her outline and re-outline the chapters of her thesis that she was too throttled by rage to write. Not until D. College had offered him a five-year tenure-track appointment, while Tory, still minus a degree, took a two-year non-renewable job at an agriculture school in Texas, did he fully exhaust his supply of male guilt and move on. He arrived at D., then, as an eligible and well-published 33-year-old to whom the college's provost, Jim Leviton, had all but guaranteed lifelong employment. Within a semester, he was sleeping with the young historian Ruthie Hamilton, and had teamed up at tennis with Leviton and brought Leviton the faculty doubles championship that had eluded him for twenty years. D. College, with an elite reputation and a middling endowment, depended for its survival on students whose parents could pay full tuition. To attract these students, the college had built a thirty million dollar recreation center, three espresso bars, and a pair of hulking residence halls that were less like dorms than like vivid premonitions of the hotels in which the students would book rooms for themselves in their well-remunerated futures. There were herds of leather sofas and enough computers to ensure that no prospective matriculant or visiting parent could enter a room and not see at least one available keyboard, not even in the dining hall or field house. Junior faculty lived in semi-squalor. Chip was lucky to have a two-story unit in a damp cinder block development on Tilton Ledge Lane on the western edge of campus. His back patio overlooked a waterway known to college administrators as Kuiper's Creek and to everybody else as Carparts Creek. On the far side of the creek was a marshy automotive boneyard belonging to the Connecticut State Department of Corrections. The college had been suing in state and federal courts for twenty years to preserve this wetland from the eco-disaster of drainage and development as a medium-security prison. Every month or two, for as long as things were good with Ruthie, Chip invited colleagues and neighbors and the occasional precocious student to dinner at Tilton Ledge and surprise them with langoustines or a rack of lamb or venison with juniper berries and retro joke desserts like chocolate fondue. Sometimes late at night, presiding over a table on which empty Californian bottles were clustered like Manhattan high-rises, Chip felt safe enough to laugh at himself, open up a little, and tell embarrassing stories about his Midwestern childhood, like how his father not only had worked long hours at the Midland Pacific Railroad and read aloud to his children and done the yard work and home maintenance and processed a nightly briefcase full of executive paper, but had also found time to operate a serious metallurgical laboratory in the family basement, staying up past midnight to subject strange alloys to electrical and chemical stresses, and how Chip, at the age of thirteen, had developed a crush on the buttery alkali metals that his father kept immersed in kerosene, on the blushing crystalline cobalt, the buxom heavy mercury, the ground glass stopcocks and glacial acetic acid, and had put together his own junior lab in the shadow of his dad's. How his new interest in science had delighted Alfred and Enid, and how, with their encouragement, he'd set his young heart on winning a trophy at the regional St. Jude Science Fair how at the St. Jude City Library he'd unearthed a plant physiology paper both obscure enough and simple enough to be mistaken for the work of a brilliant eighth grader, 
how he'd built a controlled plywood environment for growing oats and had photographed the young seedlings meticulously and then ignored them for weeks, and how, by the time he went to weigh the seedlings and determine the effects of gibberellic acid in concert with an unidentified chemical factor, the oats were dried out blackish slime. How he'd gone ahead anyway and plotted the experiment's correct results on graph paper, working backward to fabricate a list of seedling weights with some artful random scatter and then forward to make sure that the fictional data produced the correct results. And how, as a first-place winner at the science fair, he'd won a three-foot-tall silver-plated winged victory and the admiration of his father. And how, a year later, around the time his father was securing his first of two U.S. patents, despite his many grievances with Alfred, Chip was careful to impress on his dinner guests what a giant in his own way the old man was. Chip had pretended to study migratory bird populations in a park near some head shops and a bookstore and the house of a friend with foosball and a pool table. And how in a ravine at this park he'd uncovered a cache of down-market porn, over the weather-swollen pages of which... Back home in the basement lab, where, unlike his father, he never performed a real experiment or felt the faintest twinge of scientific curiosity, he'd endlessly dry-chafed the head of his erection without ever figuring out that this excruciating perpendicular stroke was actively suppressing orgasm. His dinner guests, many of them steeped in queer theory, took special delight in this detail and how, as a reward for his mendacity and self-abuse and general laziness, he'd won a second winged victory. In the haze of dinner-party smoke, as he entertained his sympathetic colleagues, Chip felt secure in the knowledge that his parents could not have been more wrong about who he was and what kind of career he was suited to pursue. For two and a half years, until the fiasco of Thanksgiving in St. Jude, he had no troubles at D College. But then Ruthie dumped him, and a first-year female student rushed in, as it were, to fill the vacuum that Ruthie left behind. Melissa Paquette was the most gifted student in the intro theory course, consuming narratives that he taught in his third spring at D. Melissa was a regal, theatrical person whom other students conspicuously avoided sitting close to, in part because they disliked her, and in part because she always sat in the first row of desks, right in front of Chip. She was long-necked and broad-shouldered, not exactly beautiful, more like physically splendid. Her hair was very straight and had the cherry wood color of new motor oil. She wore thrift store clothes that tended not to flatter her, a man's plaid polyester leisure suit, a paisley trapeze dress, gray Mr. Goodwrench coveralls with the name Randy embroidered on the left front pocket. Melissa had no patience with people she considered fools. At the second meeting of consuming narratives, when an affable dreadlocked boy named Chad, every class at D had at least one affable dreadlocked boy in it, took a stab at summarizing the theories of Thorstein Webern. Melissa began to smirk at Chip complicitly. She rolled her eyes and mouthed the word Veblen and clutched her hair. Soon Chip was paying more attention to her distress than to Chad's discourse. Chad, sorry, she interrupted finally. The name is Veblen? Webern, Veblen, that's what I'm saying. No, you were saying Webern. It's Veblen. Veblen, okay. Thank you very much, Melissa. Melissa tossed her hair and faced Chip again, her mission accomplished. She paid no attention to the dirty looks that came her way from Chad's friends and sympathizers. But Chip drifted to a far corner of the classroom to dissociate himself from her, and he encouraged Chad to continue with his summary. That evening, outside the student cinema in Hillard Roth Hall, Melissa came pushing and squeezing through a crowd and told Chip, that she was loving Walter Benjamin. She stood, he thought, too close to him. She stood too close to him at a reception for Marjorie Garber a few days later. 
she came galloping across the lucent technology's lawn, formerly the South Lawn, to press into his hands one of the weekly short papers that consuming narratives required. She materialized beside him in a parking lot that a foot of snow had buried, and with her mittened hands and considerable wingspan, she helped him dig out his car. She kicked a path clear with her fur-trimmed boots. She wouldn't stop chipping at the underlayer of ice on his windshield until he took hold of her wrist and removed the scraper from her hand. Chip had co-chaired the committee that drafted the college's stringent new policy on faculty-student contacts. Nothing in the policy prevented a student from helping a professor clear snow off his car. And since he was also sure of his self-discipline, he had nothing to be afraid of. And yet, before long, he was ducking out of sight whenever he saw Melissa on campus. He didn't want her to gallop over and stand too close to him, and when he caught himself wondering if the color of her hair was from a bottle, he made himself stop wondering. He never asked her if she was the one who'd left roses outside his office door on Valentine's Day or the chocolate statuette of Michael Jackson on Easter weekend. In class, he called on Melissa slightly less often than he called on other students. He lavished particular attention on her nemesis, Chad. He sensed without looking that Melissa was nodding in comprehension and solidarity when he unpacked a difficult passage of Marcuse or Baudrillard. She generally ignored her classmates, except to turn on them in sudden hot disagreement or cool correction. Her classmates, for their part, yawned audibly when she raised her hand. One warm Friday night, near the end of the semester, Chip came home from his weekly grocery run and discovered that someone had vandalized his front door. Three of the four utility lights at Tilton Ledge had burned out, and the college was apparently waiting for the fourth to burn out before investing in replacements. In the poor light, Chip could see that somebody had poked flowers and foliage, tulips, ivy, through the holes in his rotting screen door. What is this? he said. Melissa, you are jailbait. Possibly he said other things before he realized that his stoop was strewn with torn-up tulips and ivy, a vandalism still in progress, and that he was not alone. The holly bush by his door had produced two giggling young people. Sorry, sorry, Melissa said. You were talking to yourself. Chip wanted to believe she hadn't heard what he said, but the holly wasn't three feet away. He set the groceries inside his house and turned a light on. Standing beside Melissa was the dreadlocked Chad. Professor Lambert, hello, Chad said earnestly. He was wearing Melissa's Mr. Goodwrench coveralls, and Melissa was wearing a free mumia T-shirt that might have belonged to Chad. She'd slung an arm around Chad's neck and fitted a hip over his. She was flushed and sweaty and lit up on something. We were decorating a door, she said. Actually, Melissa, it looks pretty horrible, Chad said as he examined it in the light. Beat-up tulips were hanging down at every angle. The ivy runners had clods of dirt in their hairy feet. Kind of a stretch to say decorating. Well, you can't see down here, she said. Where's the light? There is no light, Chip said. This is the ghetto in the woods. This is where your teachers live. Dude, that ivy is pathetic. Whose tulips are these? Chip asked. College tulips, Melissa said. Dude, I'm not even sure why we were doing this. Chad turned to allow Melissa to put her mouth on his nose and suck it, which didn't seem to bother him, although he drew his head back. Wouldn't you say this was sort of more your idea than mine? Our tuition pays for these tulips, Melissa said, pivoting to press her body more frontally into Chad. She hadn't looked at Chip since he turned the outdoor light on. So then Hansel and Gretel came and found my screen door. We'll clean it up, Chad said. Leave it, Chip said. I'll see you on Tuesday. And he went inside and shut the door and played some angry music from his college years. For the last meeting of consuming narratives, the weather turned hot. The sun was blazing in a pollen-filled sky, 
all the angiosperms in the newly rechristened Viacom Arboretum blooming hard. To Chip the air felt disagreeably intimate, like a warm spot in a swimming pool. He'd already queued up the video player and lowered the classroom shades when Melissa and Chad strolled in and took seats in a rear corner. Chip reminded the class to sit up straight like active critics rather than be passive consumers, and the students sat up enough to acknowledge his request without actually complying with it. Melissa, usually the one fully upright critic, today slumped especially low and draped an arm across Chad's legs. To test his students' mastery of the critical perspectives to which he'd introduced them, Chip was showing a video of a six-part ad campaign called You Go, Girl. The campaign was the work of an agency, Beat Psychology, that had also created Howl with Rage for G Electric, Do Me Dirty for C Jeans, Total Effing Anarchy for the W Network, Radical Psychedelic Underground for E.com and Love and Work for M Pharmaceuticals. You Go Girl had had its first airing the previous fall, one episode per week on a primetime hospital drama. The style was black and white cinema verite. The content, according to analyses in the Times and the Wall Street Journal, was revolutionary. The plot was this. Four women in a small office, one sweet young African-American, one middle-aged technophobic blonde, one tough and savvy beauty named Chelsea, and one radiantly benignant gray-haired boss, dish together and banter together and by and by struggle together with Chelsea's stunning announcement at the end of episode two that for nearly a year she's had a lump in her breast that she's too scared to see a doctor about. In episode three, the boss and the sweet young African-American dazzle the technophobic blonde by using the W Corporation's global desktop version 5.0 to get up-to-the-minute cancer information and to hook Chelsea into support networks and the very best local health care providers. The blonde, who is fast learning to love technology, marvels but objects. There's no way Chelsea can afford all this. To which... The angelic boss replies, I'm paying every cent of it. By the middle of episode five, however, and this was the campaign's revolutionary inspiration, it's clear that Chelsea will not survive her breast cancer. Tear-jerking scenes of brave jokes and tight hugs follow. In the final episode, the action returns to the office where the boss is scanning a snapshot of the departed Chelsea and the now rabidly technophiliac blonde is expertly utilizing the W Corporation's global desktop version 5.0. And around the world, in rapid montage, women of all ages and races are smiling and dabbing away tears at the image of Chelsea on their own global desktops. Spectral Chelsea in a digital video clip pleads, Help us fight for the cure. The episode ends with the information offered in a sober typeface that the W Corporation has given more than $10 million to the American Cancer Society to help it fight for the cure. The slick production values of a campaign like You Go, Girl could seduce first-year students before they'd acquired the critical tools of resistance and analysis. Chip was curious and somewhat afraid to see how far his students had progressed. With the exception of Melissa, whose papers were written with force and clarity, none of them had persuaded him that they were doing more than parroting the weekly jargon. Each year, it seemed, the incoming freshmen were a little more resistant to hardcore theory than they'd been the year before. Each year, the moment of enlightenment, of critical mass, came a little later. Now the end of a semester was at hand, and Chip still wasn't sure that anyone besides Melissa really got how to criticize mass culture. The weather wasn't doing him any favors. He raised the shades and beach light poured into the classroom. Summer lust came wafting off the bared arms and legs of boys and girls alike. A petite young woman named Hilton, a chihuahua-like person, offered that it was brave and really interesting that Chelsea had died of cancer instead of surviving like you might have expected in a commercial. Chip waited for someone to observe, 
that it was precisely this self-consciously revolutionary plot twist that had generated publicity for the ad. Normally, Melissa, from her seat in the front row, could be counted on to make a point like this, but today she was sitting by Chad with her cheek on her desk. Normally, when students napped in class, Chip called on them immediately. But today he was reluctant to say Melissa's name. He was afraid that his voice might shake. Finally, with a tight smile, he said, In case any of you were visiting a different planet last fall, let's review what happened with these ads. Remember that Nielsen Media Research took the revolutionary step of giving Episode 6 its own weekly rating, the first rating ever given to an ad. And once Nielsen rated it, the campaign was all but guaranteed an enormous audience for its rebroadcast during the November sweeps. Also remember that the Nielsen rating followed a week of print and broadcast news coverage of the revolutionary plot twist of Chelsea's death, plus the Internet rumor about Chelsea's being a real person who'd really died, which, incredibly, several hundred thousand people actually believed. Beat Psychology, remember, having fabricated her medical records and her personal history and posted them on the web. So my question for Hilton would be, how brave is it to engineer a surefire publicity coup for your ad campaign? It was still a risk, Hilton said. I mean, death is a downer. It could have backfired. Again, Chip waited for someone, anyone, to take his side of the argument. No one did. So, a wholly cynical strategy, he said, if there's a financial risk attached, becomes an act of artistic bravery? A brigade of college lawn mowers descended on the lawn outside the classroom, smothering discussion in a blanket of noise. The sunshine was bright. Chip soldiered on. Did it seem realistic that a small business owner would spend her own money on special health care options for an employee? One student averred that the boss she'd had at her last summer job had been generous and totally great. Chad was silently fighting off the tickling hand of Melissa while, with his free hand, he counterattacked the naked skin of her midriff. Chad, Chip said. Chad, impressively, was able to answer the question without having it repeated. Like that was just one office, he said. Maybe another boss wouldn't have been so great but that boss was great. I mean, nobody's pretending that's an average office, right? Here Chip tried to raise the question of art's responsibilities vis-à-vis -vis the typical. But this discussion, too, was DOA. So, bottom line, he said, we like this campaign. We think these ads are good for the culture and good for the country, yes? There were shrugs and nods in the sun-heated room. Melissa, Chip said, we haven't heard from you. Melissa raised her head from her desk, shifted her attention from Chad, and looked at Chip with narrowed eyes. Yes, she said. Yes, what? Yes, these ads are good for the culture and good for the country. Chip took a deep breath, because this hurt. Great, okay, he said. Thank you for your opinion. As if you care about my opinion, Melissa said. I beg your pardon? As if you care about any of our opinions unless they're the same as yours. This is not about opinions, Chip said. This is about learning to apply critical methods to textual artifacts, which is what I'm here to teach you. I don't think it is, though, Melissa said. I think you're here to teach us to hate the same things you hate. I mean, you hate these ads, right? I can hear it in every word you say. You totally hate them. The other students were listening raptly now. Melissa's connection with Chad might have depressed Chad's stock more than it had raised her own, but she was attacking Chip like an angry equal, not a student, and the class ate it up. I do hate these ads, Chip admitted, but that's not... Yes, it is, Melissa said. Why do you hate them? Chad called out. Tell us why you hate them, the little Hilton yipped. Chip looked at the wall clock. There were six minutes left of the semester. He pushed a hand through his hair 
and cast his eyes around the room as if he might find an ally somewhere, but the students had him on the run now, and they knew it. The W Corporation, he said, is currently defending three separate lawsuits for antitrust violations. Its revenues last year exceeded the gross domestic product of Italy. And now, to wring dollars out of the one demographic that it doesn't yet dominate, it's running a campaign that exploits a woman's fear of breast cancer and her sympathy with its victims. Yes, Melissa? It's not cynical. What is it if not cynical? It's celebrating women in the workplace. Melissa said. It's raising money for cancer research. It's encouraging us to do our self-examinations and get the help we need. It's helping women feel like we own this technology, like it's not just a guy thing. Okay, good, Chip said. But the question is not whether we care about breast cancer. It's what breast cancer has to do with selling office equipment. Chad took up the cudgels for Melissa. That's the whole point of the ad, though, that if you have access to information, it can save your life. So if Pizza Hut puts a little sign about testicular self-exams by the hot pepper flakes, it can advertise itself as part of the glorious and courageous fight against cancer? Why not? Chad said. Does anybody see anything wrong with that? Not one student did. Melissa was slouching with her arms crossed and unhappy amusement on her face. Unfairly or not, Chip felt as if she'd destroyed in five minutes a semester's worth of careful teaching. Well, consider, he said, that You Go Girl would not have been produced if W had not had a product to sell. And consider that the goal of the people who work at W is to exercise their stock options and retire at 32, and that the goal of the people who own W stock... Chip's brother and sister-in-law, Gary and Caroline, owned a great deal of W stock, is to build bigger houses and buy bigger SUVs and consume even more of the world's finite resources. What's wrong with making a living? Melissa said. Why is it inherently evil to make money? Baudrillard might argue, Chip said, that the evil of a campaign like You Go Girl consists in the detachment of the signifier from the signified that a woman weeping no longer just signifies sadness, it now also signifies desire office equipment. It signifies our bosses care about us deeply. The wall clock showed 2.30. Chip paused and waited for the bell to ring and the semester to end. Excuse me, Melissa said, but that is just such bullshit. What is bullshit? Chip said. This whole class... She said, it's just bullshit every week. It's one critic after another wringing their hands about the state of criticism. Nobody can ever quite say what's wrong exactly, but they all know it's evil. They all know corporate is a dirty word. And if somebody's having fun or getting rich, disgusting, evil. And it's always the death of this and the death of that. And people who think they're free aren't really free. And people who think they're happy aren't really happy. And it's impossible to radically critique society anymore, although what's so radically wrong with society that we need such a radical critique? Nobody can say exactly. It is so typical and perfect that you hate those ads, she said to Chip as throughout Roth Hall bells finally rang. Here things are getting better and better for women and people of color and gay men and lesbians, more and more integrated and open, and all you can think about is some stupid, lame problem with signifiers and signifieds. Like, the only way you can make something bad out of an ad that's great for women, which you have to do because there has to be something wrong with everything, is to say it's evil to be rich and evil to work for a corporation. And yes, I know the bell rang. She closed her notebook. Okay, Chip said. On that note, you've now satisfied your cultural studies core requirement. Have a great summer. He was powerless to keep the bitterness out of his voice. He bent over the video player and gave his attention to rewinding and re-cueing You Go Girl and touching buttons for the sake of touching buttons. He sensed a few students lingering behind him as if they wanted to thank him for teaching his heart out or to tell him they'd enjoyed the class. But he didn't look up from the video player until the room was empty. Then he went home to Tilton Ledge and started drinking. 
Melissa's accusations had cut him to the quick. He'd never quite realized how seriously he'd taken his father's injunction to do work that was useful to society. Criticizing a sick culture, even if the criticism accomplished nothing, had always felt like useful work. But if the supposed sickness wasn't a sickness at all, if the great materialist order of technology and consumer appetite and medical science really was improving the lives of the formerly oppressed, if it was only straight white males like Chip who had a problem with this order, then there was no longer even the most abstract utility to his criticism. It was all, in Melissa's word, bullshit. Lacking the spirit to work on his new book, as he'd planned to do all summer, Chip bought an overpriced ticket to London and hitchhiked to Edinburgh and overstayed his welcome with a Scottish performance artist who had lectured and performed that day the previous winter. Eventually the woman's boyfriend said, Time to be off now, laddie. And Chip hit the road with a backpack full of Heidegger and Wittgenstein that he was too lonely to read. He hated to think of himself as a man who couldn't live without a woman. But he hadn't been laid since Ruthie dumped him. He was the only male professor in D-history to have taught theory of feminism, and he understood how important it was for women not to equate success with having a man and failure with lacking a man. But he was a lonely straight male, and a lonely straight male had no equivalently forgiving theory of masculinism to help him out of this bind, this key to all misogynies. To feel as if he couldn't survive without a woman made a man feel weak. And yet, without a woman in his life, a man lost the sense of agency and difference that, for better or worse, was the foundation of his manhood. On many a morning in green Scottish places splashed with rain, Chip felt close to escaping this spurious bind and regaining a sense of self and purpose only to find himself at four in the afternoon drinking beer at a train station, eating chips and mayonnaise, and hitting on Yankee college girls. As a seducer, he was hampered by ambivalence and by his lack of the Glaswegian accent that made American girls go weak in the knees. He scored exactly once, with a young hippie from Oregon who had ketchup stains on her chemise and a scalpy smell so overpowering but he spent much of the night breathing through his mouth. His failures seemed more funny than squalid, though, when he came home to Connecticut and regaled his misfit friends with stories at his own expense. He wondered if somehow his Scottish depression had been the product of a greasy diet. His stomach heaved when he remembered the glistening wedges of browned whatever fish, the glaucous arcs of lippity chips, the smell of scalp and deep fry, or even just the words, Firth of Forth. At the weekly farmer's market near D, he loaded up on heirloom tomatoes, white eggplants, and thin-skinned golden plums. He ate arugula, rocket, the old farmers called it, so strong it made his eyes water like a paragraph of Thoreau. As he remembered the good and the healthful, he began to recover his self-discipline. He weaned himself off alcohol, got better sleep, drank less coffee, and went to the college gym twice a week. He read the damned Heidegger and did his crunches every morning. Other pieces of the self-improvement puzzle fell into place, and for a while, as cool working weather returned to the Carparts Creek Valley, he experienced an almost Thoreauvian well-being. Between sets on the tennis court, Jim Leverton assured him that his tenure review would be a mere formality, that he shouldn't worry about competing with the department's other young theorist, Vendla O'Fallon. Chip's fall course load consisted of Renaissance poetry and Shakespeare, neither of which required him to rethink his critical perspectives. As he girded himself for the last stage of his ascent of Mount Tenure, he was relieved to be traveling light, almost happy, after all, not to have a woman in his life. He was at home on a Friday in September, making himself a dinner of broccoli rob and acorn squash and fresh haddock, and looking forward to a night of grading papers, when a pair of legs sashayed past his kitchen window. He knew this sachet. He knew the way Melissa walked. 
she couldn't pass a picket fence without trailing her fingertips against it. She stopped in hallways to do dance steps or hopscotch. She went backwards or sideways or skipped or loped. Her knock on his screen door was not apologetic. Through the screen, he saw that she had a plate of cupcakes with pink frosting. Yeah, what's up? he said. Melissa raised the plate on upturned palms. Cupcakes, she said. Thought you might be needing some cupcakes in your life right around now. Not being theatrical, Chip felt disadvantaged around people who were. Why are you bringing me cupcakes, he said. Melissa knelt and set the plate on his doormat among the pulverized remains of ivy and dead tulips. I'll just leave them here, she said. And you can do whatever you want with them. Goodbye. She spread her arms and pirouetted off the doorstep and ran up the flagstone path on tiptoe. Chip went back to wrestling with the haddock fillet, through the center of which ran a blood-brown fault of gristle that he was determined to cut out. But the fish had a starchy grain and was hard to get a grip on. Fuck you, little girl, he said, as he threw the knife into the sink. The cupcakes were full of butter and frosted with a butter frosting. After he'd washed his hands and opened a bottle of Chardonnay, he ate four of them and put the uncooked fish in the refrigerator. The skins of the overbaked squash were like inner tube rubber, cent ans de cinéma érotique, an edifying video that had sat on a shelf for months without making a peep, suddenly demanded his immediate and full attention. He lowered the blinds and drank the wine, and brought himself off again and again, and ate two more cupcakes, detecting peppermint in them, a faint buttery peppermint, before he slept. The next morning he was up at seven and did four hundred crunches. He immersed saint ans de cinéma érotique in dishwater and rendered it, so to speak, non-combustible. He'd done this with many a pack of cigarettes while kicking the habit. He had no idea what he'd meant when he'd thrown the knife into the sink. His voice had sounded nothing like him. He went to his office in Roth Hall and graded papers. He wrote in a margin... Cressida's character may inform Toyota's choice of product name that Toyota's Cressida informs the Shakespearean text requires more argument than you present here. He added an exclamation point to soften his criticism. Sometimes, when ripping apart especially feeble student work, he drew smiley faces. Spell check, he exhorted a student who'd written Trolius for Troilus, throughout her eight-page paper. And the ever-softening question mark beside the sentence, here Shakespeare proves Foucault all too right about the historicity of morals, Chip wrote, rephrase? Perhaps here the Shakespearean text seems almost to anticipate Foucault. Better Nietzsche? He was still grading papers five weeks later, ten or fifteen thousand student errors later, on a windy night just after Halloween, when he heard a scrabbling outside his office door. Opening the door, he found a dime store trick-or-treat bag hanging from the hall side doorknob. The lever of this gift, Melissa Paquette, was backpedaling up the hall. What are you doing? he said. Just trying to be friends, she said. Well, thanks, he said. I don't get it. Melissa came back down the hall. She was wearing white painter's overalls a long-sleeved thermal undershirt, and hot pink socks. I went trick-or-treating, she said. This was like one-fifth of my haul. She stepped closer to Chip, and he backed away. She followed him into his office and circled it on tiptoe, reading titles on his shelves. Chip leaned against his desk and folded his arms tightly. So I'm taking theory of feminism with Vendla, Melissa said. That would be the logical next step, now that you've rejected the nostalgic patriarchal tradition of critical theory. Exactly my thinking, Melissa said. Unfortunately, her class is so bad. People who took it with you last year said it was great, but Vendla's idea is that we should sit around and talk about our feelings, because the old theory was about the head, see, and therefore the new true theory has to be about the heart. I'm not convinced 
She's even read all the stuff she assigns us. Through his open door, Chip could see the door of Vendla O'Fallon's office. It was papered with healthful images and adages, Betty Friedan in 1965, beaming Guatemalan peasant women, a triumphant female soccer star, a bass ale poster of Virginia Woolf, subvert the dominant paradigm that reminded him in a dreary way of his old girlfriend, Tori Timmelman. His feeling about decorating doors was, what are we, high school kids? Are these our bedrooms? So basically, he said, even though you thought my class was bullshit... It now seems like a superior brand of bullshit because you're taking hers. Melissa blushed. Basically. Except you're a much better teacher. I mean, I learned a ton from you. That's what I wanted to tell you. Consider me told. See, my mom and dad split up in April. Melissa flung herself down on Chip's college-issue leather sofa and assumed the full therapeutic position. For a while, it was kind of great that you were being so anti-corporate. And then suddenly it really, really irritated me. Like, my parents have a lot of money, and they're not evil people. Although my dad did just move in with this character named Vicky, who's like four years older than me, but he still loves my mom. I know he does. As soon as I was out of the house, things deteriorated a little. But I know he still loves her. The college has a lot of services, Chip said, arms folded, for students going through these things. Thanks. On the whole, I'm doing brilliantly. Except for having been rude to you in class that time. Melissa hooked her heels on the arm of the sofa, pried her shoes off, and let them drop to the floor. Soft curves and thermo knitwear spilled out to either side of her overalls bib, Chip noticed. I had an excellent childhood, she said. My parents have always been my best friends. They homeschooled me till seventh grade. My mom was in med school in New Haven, and my dad had this punk band, the Nomadics, that was touring, and at my mom's first ever punk show, she went out with my dad and ended up in his hotel room. She quit school, he quit the Nomadics, and they were never apart after that. Totally romantic. See, and my dad had some money from a trust fund, and it was really brilliant what they did then. There were all these new IPOs, and my mom was up on all the biotech and reading JAMA, and Tom, my dad, could vet the numbers part of it, and they just made really great investments. Claire, my mom, stayed home with me, and we hung out all day, you know, and I learned my times tables, etc., and it was always just the three of us. They were so, so in love. And parties every weekend. And finally it occurred to us, we know everybody, and we're really good investors, so why not start a mutual fund? Which we did. And it was incredible. It's still a great fund. It's called the West Portfolio Biofund 40. We started some other funds, too, when the climate got more competitive. You kind of have to offer a full array of services. That's what the institutional investors were telling Tom, at any rate. So he started these other funds, which unfortunately have pretty much tanked. I think that's the big problem between him and Claire. Because her fund, the Biofund 40, where she makes the picks, is still doing great. And now she's heartbroken and depressed. She's holed up in our house, and she never goes out. Meanwhile, Tom wants me to meet this Vicky person, who he says is lots of fun and a rollerblader. The thing is, we all know my mom and dad are made for each other. They complement each other perfectly. And I just think if you knew how cool it is to start a company and how great it is when the money starts coming in and how romantic it can be, you wouldn't be so harsh. Possibly, Chip said. Anyway, I thought you'd be somebody I could talk to. On the whole, I'm coping brilliantly. But I could kind of use a friend. How's Chad? Chip said. A sweet boy. Good for about three weekends. Melissa swung a leg off the sofa and planted a stockinged foot on Chip's leg, close to his hip. It's hard to imagine two people less long-term compatible than him and me. Through his jeans, Chip could feel the deliberate flexing of her toes. He was trapped against his desk, and so, to escape, he had to take hold of her ankle and swing her leg back onto the sofa. Her pink feet immediately grasped his wrist and pulled him toward her. 
It was all very playful, but his door was open, and his lights were on, and his blinds were raised, and somebody was in the hall. Code, he said, pulling free. There's a code. Melissa rolled off the sofa, stood up, and came closer. It's a stupid code, she said. If you care about somebody. Chip retreated to the doorway. Up the hall, by the department office, a tiny blue-uniformed woman with a Taltec face was vacuuming. There are good reasons to have it, he said. So I can't even give you a hug now. That's right. It's stupid. Melissa stepped into her shoes and joined Chip in the doorway. She kissed him on the cheek, near his ear. So there. He watched her slide step and pirouette down the hall and out of sight. He heard a fire door bang shut. He carefully examined every word he'd said, and he gave himself an A for correctness. But when he returned to Tilton Ledge, where the last of the utility lights had burned out, he was swamped by loneliness. To erase the tactile memory of Melissa's kiss and her lively, warm feet, he phoned an old college friend in New York and made a date for lunch the next day. He took cent ans de cinéma érotique from the cabinet, where, in expectation of a night like this, he'd stashed it after soaking it. The tape was still playable. The image was snowy, though, and during the first really hot bit, a hotel room scene with a wanton chambermaid, the snow thickened to a blizzard, and the screen went blue. The VCR made a dry, thin, choking sound. Air, need air, it seemed to say. Tape had leaked out and wound itself around the machine's endoskeleton. Chip extracted the cassette and several handfuls of mylar, but then something broke and the machine spat up a plastic spool. Which, all right, these things happened. But the trip to Scotland had been a financial waterloo and he couldn't afford a new VCR. Nor was New York City on a cold rainy Saturday the treat he needed. Every sidewalk in Lower Manhattan was dotted with the metallic, squared spirals of anti-theft badges. The badges were bonded to the wet pavement with the world's strongest glue, and after Chip had bought some imported cheeses, he did this every time he visited New York to be sure of accomplishing at least one thing before returning to Connecticut, and yet it felt a little sad to buy the same baby Gruyere and Fourme d'Ambert at the same store. It brought him up against the more general failure of consumerism as an approach to human happiness. And after he'd lunched with his college friend, who had recently quit teaching anthropology and hired himself out to Silicon Alley as a marketing psychologist, and who advised Chip now to wake up and do the same, he returned to his car and discovered that each of his plastic-wrapped cheeses was protected by its own anti-theft badge and that, indeed, a fragment of anti-theft badge had stuck to the bottom of his left shoe. Tilton Ledge was glazed with ice and very dark. In the mail, Chip found an envelope containing a short note from Enid lamenting Alfred's moral failures. He sits in that chair all day, every day and a lengthy profile of Denise, clipped from Philadelphia magazine with a slavering review of her restaurant, Mare Scuro, and a full-page glamour photo of the young chef. Denise in the photo was wearing jeans and a tank top and was all muscled shoulders and satiny pecs. Very young and very good, Lambert in her kitchen, the caption read. And this was just the kind of girl-as-object horseshit, Chip thought bitterly, that sold magazines. A few years ago, Enid's letters had reliably contained a paragraph of despair about Denise and Denise's failing marriage with phrases like, He is too old for her, double underlined, and a paragraph festooned with thrills and prouds apropos of Chip's hiring by D. College, and although he knew that Enid was skilled at playing her children off against each other and that her praise was usually double-edged, he was dismayed that a woman as smart and principled as Denise had used her body for marketing purposes. He threw the clipping in the trash. He opened the Saturday half of the Sunday Times and... Yes, he was contradicting himself. Yes, he was aware of this. Paged through the magazine in search of ads for lingerie or swimwear to rest his weary eyes on. 
Finding none, he began to read the book review where a memoir called Daddy's Girl by Vendla O'Fallon was declared astonishing and courageous and deeply satisfying on page 11. The name Vendla O'Fallon was rather unusual, but Chip had been so completely unaware that Vendla was publishing a book that he refused to believe she'd written Daddy's Girl until, near the end of the review, he encountered a sentence that began, O'Fallon, who teaches at D College... He closed the book review and opened a bottle. In theory, both he and Vendla were in line for tenure in textual artifacts, but in practice the department was already over-tenured. That Vendla commuted to work from New York, thus flouting the college's informal requirement that faculty live in town, and that she skipped important meetings and taught every gut she could had been steady sources of comfort to Chip. He still had the edge in scholarly publications, student evaluations, and support from Jim Leviton. But he found that two glasses of wine had no effect on him. He was pouring himself his fourth when his telephone rang. It was Jim Leviton's wife, Jackie. I just wanted you to know, Jackie said, that Jim's going to be okay. Was something wrong? Chip said. Well, he's resting fine. We're over at St. Mary's. What happened? Chip, I asked him if he thought he could play tennis, and you know what? He nodded. I said... I was going to call you, and he nodded. Yes, he was good for tennis. His motor skills appear to be fully normal. Fully normal. And he's lucid. That's the important thing. That is the really good news here, Chip. His eyes are bright. He's the same old Jim. Jackie, did he have a stroke? There'll be some rehabilitation, Jackie said. Obviously, today will be his effective retirement date, which, Chip, as far as I'm concerned, is an absolute blessing. We can make some changes now, and in three years? Well, it's not going to take any three years for him to rehabilitate. When all is said and done, we're going to be ahead of this game. His eyes are so bright, Chip. He's the same old Jim. Chip rested his forehead against his kitchen window and turned his head so that he could open one eye directly against the cold, damp glass. He knew what he was going to do. The same old, lovable Jim, Jackie said. The following Thursday, Chip made dinner for Melissa and had sex with her on his red chaise long. He'd taken a fancy to the chaise back in the days when dropping $800 on an antique store impulse was somewhat less suicidal financially. The chaise's backrest was angled in erotic invitation, its padded shoulders thrown back, its spine arching. The plush of its chest and belly looked ready to burst the fabric buttons that crisscrossed it. Breaking his initial clinch with Melissa, Chip excused himself for one second to turn off lights in the kitchen and stop in the bathroom. When he returned to the living room, he found her stretched out on the chaise wearing only the pants half of her plaid polyester leisure suit. In the dim light she could have been a hairless, heavy-titted man. Chip, who much preferred queer theory to queer practice, basically hated the suit and wished she hadn't worn it. Even after she'd taken off the pants, there was a residue of gender confusion on her body, not to mention the rank B.O. that was the bane of synthetic fabrics. But from her underpants, which to his relief were delicate and sheer, distinctly gendered, an affectionate, warm rabbit came springing, a kicking, wet, autonomous, warm animal. It was almost more than he could handle. He hadn't slept two hours in the previous two nights, and he had a head full of wine and a gut full of gas. He couldn't remember why he'd made a cassoulet for dinner, possibly for no good reason. And he worried that he hadn't locked the front door, that there was a gap in the blinds somewhere, that one of his neighbors would drop by and try the door and find it unlocked, or peer in through the window and see him flagrantly violating sections one, two, and six of a code that he himself had helped draft. Altogether for him it was a night of anxiety and effortful concentration, punctuated by little stabs of throttled pleasure. But at least Melissa seemed to find it exciting and romantic. Hour after hour she wore a big, crinkled U of a smile. It was Chip's proposal 
after a second extremely stressful tryst at Tilton Ledge, that he and Melissa leave campus for the week-long Thanksgiving break and find a cottage on Cape Cod where they wouldn't feel observed and judged. And it was Melissa's proposal, as they departed through Dee's little-used eastern gate under cover of darkness, that they stop in Middletown and buy drugs from a high school friend of hers at Wesleyan. Chip waited in front of Wesleyan's impressively weatherproofed ecology house and drummed on the steering wheel of his Nissan, drummed so hard his fingers throbbed because it was important not to think about what he was doing. He'd left behind mountains of ungraded papers and exams, and he had not yet managed to visit Jim Leviton in the rehab unit. That Jim had lost his powers of speech and now impotently strained his jaw and lips to form words, that he'd become, according to reports from colleagues who'd visited him, an angry man, made Chip all the more reluctant to visit. He was in the mode now of avoiding anything that might make him experience an emotion. He beat on the steering wheel until his fingers were stiff and burning, and Melissa came out of the ecology house. She brought into the car a smell of wood smoke and frozen flower beds, the smell of an affair in late autumn. She put into Chip's palm a golden caplet marked with what appeared to be the old Midland Pacific Railroad logo, Midland Pacific Lines, without the text. Take this, she told him, closing the door. This is some kind of ecstasy? No, Mexican A. Chip felt culturally anxious. Not long ago there had been no drugs he hadn't heard of. What does it do? Nothing and everything, she said, swallowing one herself. You'll see. How much do I owe you for this? Never mind that. For a while the drug did seem as promised to do nothing, but on the industrial outskirts of Norwich, still two or three hours from the Cape, he turned down the trip-hop that Melissa was playing on his stereo and said, We have to stop immediately and fuck. She laughed. I guess so. Why don't I pull over? he said. She laughed again. No, let's find a room. They stopped at a comfort inn that had lost its franchise and now called itself the Comfort Valley Lodge. The night clerk was obese and her computer was down. She manually registered Chip with the labored breathing of someone lately stranded by a system's malfunction. Chip put his hand on Melissa's belly and was about to reach into her pants when it occurred to him that fingering a woman in public was inappropriate and might cause trouble. For similar, purely rational reasons, he suppressed the impulse to pull his dick out of his pants and show it to the wheezing, perspiring clerk. But he did think the clerk would be interested in seeing it. He took Melissa down on the cigarette divoted carpeting of room 23 without even shutting the door. It's so much better like this, Melissa said, kicking the door shut. She yanked her pants down and practically wailed with delight. This is so much better. He didn't dress all weekend. The towel he was wearing when he took delivery of a pizza fell open before the delivery man could turn away. Hey, love, it's me, Melissa said into her cell phone while Chip lay down behind her and went at her. She kept her phone arm free and made supportive filial noises. Uh-huh, uh-huh, sure, sure. No, that's hard, Mom. No, you're right, that is hard, sure. Sure. Uh-huh. Sure. That's really, really hard, she said with a twinkle in her voice as Chip sought leverage for an extra sweet half-inch of penetration while he shot. On Monday and Tuesday he dictated large chunks of a term paper on Carol Gilligan, which Melissa was too annoyed with Vendla O'Fallon to write by herself. His near-photographic recall of Gilligan's arguments, his total mastery of theory, got him so excited that he began to tease Melissa's hair with his erection. He ran the head of it up and down the keyboard of her computer and applied a gleaming smudge to the liquid crystal screen. Darling, she said, don't come on my computer. He nudged her cheeks and ears and tickled her armpits and finally backed her up against the bathroom door while she bathed him in her cherry-red smile. Each night around dinner time, for four nights running, she went to her luggage and got two more golden caplets. Then on Wednesday, Chip took her to a cineplex 
and they sneaked into an extra movie and a half for the price of the original matinee bargain. Back at the Comfort Valley Lodge, after a late pancake dinner, Melissa called her mother and spoke at such length that Chip fell asleep without swallowing a caplet. He awoke on Thanksgiving in the gray light of his undrugged self. For a while, as he lay listening to the sparse holiday traffic on Route 2, he couldn't place what was different. Something about the body beside him was making him uneasy. He considered turning and burying his face in Melissa's back, but it seemed to him she must be sick of him. He could hardly believe she hadn't minded his attacks on her, all his pushing and pawing and poking, that she didn't feel like a piece of meat that he'd been using. In a matter of seconds, like a market inundated by a wave of panic selling, he was plunged into shame and self-consciousness. He couldn't bear to stay in bed a moment longer. He pulled on his shorts and snagged Melissa's toiletries kit and locked himself in the bathroom. His problem consisted of a burning wish not to have done the things he'd done. And his body, its chemistry, had a clear instinctive understanding of what he had to do to make this burning wish go away. He had to swallow another Mexican A. He searched the toiletries kit exhaustively. He wouldn't have thought it possible to feel dependent on a drug with no hedonic kick, a drug that on the evening of his fifth and final dose he hadn't even craved. He uncapped Melissa's lipsticks and removed twin tampons from their pink plastic holder and probed with a bobby pin down through her jar of skin cleanser. Nothing. He took the kit back out to the main room, which was fully light now, and whispered Melissa's name. Receiving no answer, he dropped to his knees and rifled her canvas travel bag paddled his fingers in the empty cups of bras, squeezed her sock balls, touched the various private pouches and compartments of the bag. This new and different violation of Melissa was sensationally painful to him. In the orange light of his shame, he felt as if he were abusing her internal organs. He felt like a surgeon atrociously fondling her youthful lungs, defiling her kidneys, sticking his finger in her perfect, tender pancreas. The sweetness of her little socks, and the thought of the even littler socks of her all-too-proximate girlhood, and the image of a hopeful, bright, romantic sophomore packing clothes for a trip with her esteemed professor, each sentimental association added fuel to his shame. Each image recalled him to the unfunny, raw comedy of what he'd done to her. The jismic grunting butt-oink. The jiggling, frantic nut-swing. By now his shame was boiling so furiously it felt liable to burst things in his brain. Nevertheless, while keeping a close eye on Melissa's sleeping form, he managed to paw her clothing a second time. Only after he'd re-squeezed and re-handled each piece of it did he conclude that the Mexican A was in the big, zippered outer pocket of her bag. This zipper he eased open tooth by tooth, clenching his own teeth to survive the noise of it. He'd worked the pocket open just far enough to push his hand through it, and the stress of this latest of his penetrations released fresh gusts of flammable memory. He felt mortified by each of the manual liberties he'd taken with Melissa here in room 23 by the insatiable lewd avidity of his fingers. He wished he could have left her alone. When the cell phone on the nightstand tinkled, and with a groan she came awake. He snatched his hand from the forbidden place, ran to the bathroom, and took a long shower. By the time he came out, Melissa was dressed and had repacked her bag. She looked utterly uncarnal in the morning light. She was whistling a happy tune. Darling, a change of plans, she said. My father, who really is a lovely man, is coming out to Westport for the day. I want to go be with them. Chip wished he could fail to feel the shame that she was failing to feel. But to beg for another pill was acutely embarrassing. What about our dinner? he said. I'm sorry, it's just really important that I be there. So it's not enough to be on the phone with them for a couple of hours every day. Chip, I'm sorry, but we're talking about my best friends. Chip had never liked the sound of Tom Paquette a dilettante rocker and trust fund baby who ditched his family for a rollerblader. And in the last few days, Claire's boundless capacity to yak about herself while Melissa listened had turned Chip against her, too. Great, 
he said. I'll take you to Westport. Melissa flipped her hair so that it fanned across her back. Darling, don't be mad. If you don't want to go to the Cape, you don't want to go to the Cape. I'll take you to Westport. Good. Are you going to get dressed? It's just that, Melissa, you know, there's something a little sick about being so close to your parents. She seemed not to have heard him. She went to the mirror and applied mascara. She put on lipstick. Chip stood in the middle of the room with a towel around his waist. He felt warty and egregious. He felt that Melissa was right to be disgusted by him, and yet he wanted to be clear. Do you understand what I'm saying? Darling. Chip, she pressed her painted lips together. Get dressed. I'm saying, Melissa, that children are not supposed to get along with their parents. Your parents are not supposed to be your best friends. They're supposed to be some element of rebellion. That's how you define yourself as a person. Maybe it's how you define yourself, she said but then you're not exactly an advertisement for happy adulthood. He grinned and bore this. I like myself, she said, but you don't seem to like yourself so much. Your parents seem very fond of themselves, too, he said. You seem very fond of yourselves as a family. He'd never seen Melissa really angry. I love myself, she said. What's wrong with that? He was unable to say what was wrong with it. He was unable to say what was wrong with anything about Melissa, her self-adoring parents, her theatricality and confidence, her infatuation with capitalism, her lack of good friends her own age. The feeling he'd had on the last day of consuming narratives, the feeling that he was mistaken about everything, that there was nothing wrong with the world and nothing wrong with being happy in it, that the problem was his and his alone, returned with such force that he had to sit down on the bed. What's our drug situation? We're out, Melissa said. Okay. I got six of them and you've had five. What? And it was a big mistake, evidently, not to give you all six. What have you been taking? Advil, darling. Her tone with this endearment had moved beyond the arch to the outright ironic. For saddle soreness? I never asked you to get that drug, he said. Not in so many words, she said. What do you mean by that? Well, a fat lot of fun we were going to have without it. Chip didn't ask her to explain. He was afraid she meant he'd been a lousy, anxious lover until he took Mexican A. He had, of course, been a lousy, anxious lover, but he'd allowed himself to hope she hadn't noticed. Under the weight of this fresh shame, and with no drug left in the room to alleviate it, he bowed his head and pressed his hands into his face. Shame was pushing down, and rage was boiling up. Are you going to drive me to Westport? Melissa said. He nodded, but she must not have been looking at him because he heard her flipping through a phone book. He heard her tell a dispatcher she needed a ride to New London. He heard her say, The Comfort Valley Lodge, room 23. I'll drive you to Westport, he said. She shut the phone. No, this is fine. Melissa, cancel the cab. I'll drive you. She parted the room's rear curtains, exposing a vista of cyclone fencing, stick-straight maples, and the back side of a recycling plant. Eight or ten snowflakes drifted dismally. In the eastern sky was a raw patch where the cloud cover was abraded, the white sun wearing through. Chip dressed quickly while Melissa's back was turned. If he hadn't been so strangely full of shame, he might have gone to the window and put his hands on her, and she might have turned and forgiven him. But his hands felt predatory. He imagined her recoiling, and he wasn't entirely convinced that some dark percentage of his being didn't really want to rape her, to make her pay for liking herself in a way he couldn't like himself. How he hated and how he loved the lilt in her voice, the bounce in her step, the serenity of her amour propre. She got to be her, and he didn't. And he could see that he was ruined, that he didn't like her, but would miss her disastrously. She dialed another number. Hey, love, she said into her cell phone. I'm on my way to New London. I'll take the first train that comes. No, I just want to be with you guys. Totally. Yes, totally. Okay, kiss, kiss. I'll see you when I see you. Yep. 
A car honked outside the door. There's my cab, she told her mother. Right, okay, kiss, kiss, bye. She shrugged into her jacket, lifted her bag, and waltzed across the room. At the door, she announced in a general way that she was leaving. I'll see you later, she said, almost looking at Chip. He couldn't figure out if she was immensely well-adjusted or seriously messed up. He heard a cab door slam, an engine rumble. He went to the front window and got a glimpse of her cherry wood hair through the rear window of a red and white cab. He decided, after five years without, that the time had come to buy some cigarettes. He put on a jacket and crossed expanses of cold asphalt, indifferent to pedestrians. He pushed money through a slot in the bulletproof glass of a mini-mart. It was the morning of Thanksgiving. The flurries had stopped, and the sun was halfway out. A gull's wings rattled and clacked. The breeze had a roughly quality. It didn't quite seem to touch the ground. Chip sat on a freezing guardrail and smoked, and took comfort in the sturdy mediocrity of American commerce, the unpretending metal and plastic roadside hardware. The thunk of a gas pump nozzle halting when a tank was filled, the humility and promptness of its service, and a ninety-nine cent big gulp banner swelling with wind and sailing nowhere its nylon ropes whipping and pinging on a galvanized standard, and the black sans-serif numerals of gasoline prices, the company of so many nines, and American sedans moving down the access road at nearly stationary speeds like thirty, and orange and yellow plastic pennants shivering overhead on guys. Dad fell down the basement stairs again, Enid said, while the rain came down in New York City. He was carrying a big box of pecans to the basement, and he didn't hold the railing, and he fell. Well, you can imagine how many pecans are in a twelve-pound box. Those nuts rolled everywhere. Denise, I spent half a day on my hands and knees, and I'm still finding them. They're the same color as those crickets we can't get rid of. I reach down to pick up a pecan, and it jumps in my face. Denise was trimming the stems of the sunflowers she'd brought. Why was Dad carrying twelve pounds of pecans down the basement stairs? He wanted a project he could work on in his chair. He was going to shell them. Enid hovered at Denise's shoulder. Is there something I can do here? You can find me a vase. The first cabinet that Enid opened contained a carton of wine bottle corks and nothing else. I don't understand why Chip invited us here if he wasn't even going to eat lunch with us. Conceivably, Denise said, he didn't plan on getting dumped this morning. Denise's tone of voice was forever informing Enid that she was stupid. Denise was not, Enid felt, a very warm or giving person. However, Denise was a daughter, and a few weeks ago Enid had done a shameful thing that she was now in serious need of confessing to somebody, and she hoped Denise might be that person. Gary wants us to sell the house and move to Philadelphia, she said. Gary thinks Philadelphia makes sense because he's there and you're there and Chip's in New York. I said to Gary, I love my children, but St. Jude is where I'm comfortable. Denise, I'm a Midwesterner. I'd be lost in Philadelphia. Gary wants us to sign up for assisted living. He doesn't understand that it's already too late. Those places won't let you in if you have a condition like Dad's. But if Dad keeps falling down the stairs. Denise, he doesn't hold the railing. He refuses to accept that he shouldn't be carrying things on the stairs. Underneath the sink, Enid found a vase behind a stack of framed photographs, four pictures of pinkish, furry things, some sort of kooky art or medical photos. She tried to reach past them quietly, but she knocked over an asparagus steamer that she'd given Chip for Christmas once. As soon as Denise looked down, Enid could not pretend she hadn't seen the pictures. What on earth? she said, scowling. Denise, what are these? What do you mean, what are these? Some sort of kooky thing of chips, I guess. 
Denise had an amused expression that drove Enid crazy. Obviously, you know what they are, though. No, I don't. You don't know what they are? Enid took the vase out and closed the cabinet. I don't want to know, she said. Well, that's something else entirely. In the living room, Alfred was summoning the courage to sit down on Chip's chaise longue. Not ten minutes ago he'd sat down on it without incident, but now, instead of simply doing it again, he'd stopped to think. He'd realized only recently that at the center of the act of sitting down was a loss of control, a blind, backwards freefall. His excellent blue chair in St. Jude was like a first baseman's glove that gently gathered in whatever body was flung its way, at whatever glancing angle, with whatever violence. It had big, helpful, ursine arms to support him while he performed the crucial blind pivot. But Chip's chaise was a low-riding, impractical antique. Alfred stood facing away from it and hesitated, his knees bent to the rather small degree that his neuropathic lower legs permitted, his hands scooping and groping in the air behind him. He was afraid to take the plunge. And yet there was something obscene about standing half-crouched and quaking, some association with the men's room, some essential vulnerability which felt to him at once so poignant and degraded that, simply to put an end to it, he shut his eyes and let go. He landed heavily on his bottom and continued on over backwards, coming to rest with his knees in the air above him. "'Al, are you all right?' Enid called. "'I don't understand this furniture.' he said, struggling to sit up and sound powerful. Is this meant to be a sofa? Denise came out and put a vase of three sunflowers on the spindly table by the chaise. It's like a sofa, she said. You can put your legs up and be a French philosophe. You can talk about Schopenhauer. Alfred shook his head. Enid enunciated from the kitchen doorway, Dr. Hedgepeth says you should only sit in high, straight-backed chairs. Since Alfred showed no interest in these instructions, Enid repeated them to Denise when she returned to the kitchen. High, straight-backed chairs only, she said, but Dad won't listen. He insists on sitting in his leather chair. Then he shouts for me to come and help him get up. But if I hurt my back, then where are we? I put one of those nice old ladder-back chairs by the TV downstairs and told him, Sit here but he'd rather sit in his leather chair, and then, to get out of it, he slides down the cushion until he's on the floor. Then he crawls on the floor to the ping-pong table and uses the ping-pong table to hoist himself up. That's actually pretty resourceful, Denise said as she took an armload of food from the refrigerator. Denise, he's crawling across the floor. Rather than sit in a nice, comfortable, straight-backed chair, which the doctor says it's important that he sit in, he crawls across the floor. He shouldn't be sitting so much to begin with. Dr. Hedgepeth says his condition is not at all severe if he would just get out and do a little. Use it or lose it, that's what every doctor says. Dave Shumpert has had ten times more health problems than Dad. He's had a colostomy for fifteen years. He's got one lung and a pacemaker. And look at all the things that he and Mary Beth are doing. They just got back from snorkeling in Fiji. And Dave never complains, never complains. You probably don't remember Jean Grillo, Dad's old friend from Hephaestus, but he has had bad Parkinson's, much, much worse than Dad's. He's still at home in Fort Wayne, but in a wheelchair now. He's really in awful shape. But Denise, he's interested in things. He can't write any more, but he sent us an audio letter on a cassette tape, really thoughtful, where he talks about each of his grandchildren in detail because he knows his grandkids and takes an interest in them, and about how he started to teach himself Cambodian, which he calls Khmer from listening to a tape and watching the Cambodian, or Khmer, I guess, TV channel in Fort Wayne, because their youngest son is married to a Cambodian woman, or Khmer, I guess, and her parents don't speak any English, and Jean wants to be able to talk to them a little. Can you believe... Here Jean is in a wheelchair, completely crippled, and he's still thinking about what he can do for somebody else. While Dad, who can walk and write and dress himself, does nothing all day but sit in his chair. Mother, he's depressed, Denise said in a low voice, slicing bread. 
That's what Gary and Caroline say, too. They say he's depressed and he should take a medication. They say he was a workaholic and that work was a drug which, when he couldn't have it anymore, he got depressed. So drug him and forget him. A convenient theory. That's not fair to Gary. Don't get me started on Gary and Caroline. Golly, Denise, the way you throw that knife around, I don't see how you haven't lost a finger. From the end of a French loaf, Denise had made three little crust-bottomed vehicles. On one, she set shavings of butter, curved like sails full of wind. Into another, she loaded Parmesan shards, packed in an excelsior of shredded arugula. And the third, she paved with minced olive meat and olive oil, and covered with a thick red tarp of pepper. Enid spoke. Mmm, don't those look nice? As she reached, cat quick for the plate on which Denise had arranged the snacks. But the plate eluded Enid. These are for Dad. Just a corner of one. I'll make some more for you. No, I just want one corner of his. But Denise left the kitchen and took the plate to Alfred, for whom the problem of existence was this, that in the manner of a wheat seedling thrusting itself up out of the earth, the world moved forward in time by adding cell after cell to its leading edge, piling moment on moment, and that to grasp the world even in its freshest, youngest moment provided no guarantee that you'd be able to grasp it again a moment later. By the time he'd established that his daughter Denise was handing him a plate of snacks in his son Chip's living room, the next moment in time was already budding itself into a pristinely un- grasped existence in which he couldn't absolutely rule out the possibility, for example, that his wife, Enid, was handing him a plate of feces in the parlor of a brothel. And no sooner had he reconfirmed Denise and the snacks and Chip's living room than the leading edge of time added yet another layer of new cells so that he again faced a new and ungrasped world. Which was why, rather than exhaust himself playing catch-up, he preferred more and more to spend his days down among the unchanging historical roots of things. Something to tide you while I get lunch, Denise said. Alfred gazed with gratitude at the snacks, which were holding about ninety percent steady as food, flickering only occasionally into objects of similar size and shape. Maybe you'd like a glass of wine? Not necessary, he said. As the gratitude spread outward from his heart, as he was moved, his clasped hands and lower arms began to bounce more freely on his lap. He tried to find something in the room that didn't move him, something he could rest his eyes on safely. But because the room was chips, and because Denise was standing in it, every fixture and every surface even a radiator knob, even a thigh-level expanse of faintly scuffed wall, was a reminder of the separate eastern worlds in which his children led their lives, and hence of the various vast distances that separated him from them, which made his hands shake all the more. That the daughter whose attentions most aggravated his affliction was the person he least wanted to be seen by in the grip of this affliction was the sort of devil's logic that confirmed a man's pessimism. I'll leave you alone for a minute, Denise said, while I get the lunch going. He closed his eyes and thanked her. As if waiting for a break in a downpour so that he could run from his car into a grocery store, he waited for a lull in his tremor, so that he could reach out and safely eat what she'd brought him. His affliction offended his sense of ownership. These shaking hands belonged to nobody but him, and yet they refused to obey him. They were like bad children, unreasoning two-year-olds in a tantrum of selfish misery. The more sternly he gave orders, the less they listened and the more miserable and out of control they got. He'd always been vulnerable to a child's recalcitrance and refusal to behave like an adult. 
Irresponsibility and undiscipline were the bane of his existence. And it was another instance of that devil's logic that his own untimely affliction should consist of his body's refusal to obey him. If thy right hand offend thee, Jesus said, cut it off. As he waited for the tremor to abate, as he watched his hands jerking, rowing motions impotently, as if he were in a nursery with screaming, misbehaving infants and had lost his voice and couldn't make them quiet down, Alfred took pleasure in the imagination of chopping his hand off with a hatchet, of letting the transgressing limb know how deeply he was angry with it, how little he loved it if it insisted on disobeying him. It brought a kind of ecstasy to imagine the first deep bite of the hatchet's blade in the bone and muscle of his offending wrist. But along with the ecstasy, right beside it, was an inclination to weep for this hand that was his, that he loved and wished the best for, that he'd known all its life. He was thinking about Chip again without noticing it. He wondered where Chip had gone how he'd driven Chip away again. Denise's voice and Enid's voice in the kitchen were like a larger bee and a smaller bee trapped behind a window screen. And his moment came, the lull that he'd been waiting for. Leaning forward and steadying his taking hand with his supporting hand, he grasped the butter-sailed schooner and got it off the plate, bore it aloft without capsizing it, and then, as it floated and bobbed, he opened his mouth and chased it down and got it, got it, got it. The crust cut his gums, but he kept the whole thing in his mouth and chewed carefully, giving his sluggish tongue wide berth. The sweet butter melting, the feminine softness of baked leavened wheat. There were chapters in Hedgepith's booklets that even Alfred, fatalist and man of discipline that he was, couldn't bring himself to read. Chapters devoted to the problems of swallowing, to the late torments of the tongue, to the final breakdown of the signal system. The betrayal had begun in signals. The Midland Pacific Railroad, where for the last decade of his career he'd run the engineering department, and where, when he'd given an order, it was carried out, Mr. Lambert, right away, sir, had served hundreds of one-elevator towns in West Kansas and West and Central Nebraska, towns of the kind that Alfred and his fellow executives had grown up in or near, towns that in their old age seemed the sicker for the excellent health of the mid-pack tracks running through them. Although the railroad's first responsibility was to its stockholders, its Kansan and Missourian officers, including Mark Jamboretts, the corporation council, had persuaded the board of managers that because a railroad was a pure monopoly in many hinterland towns, it had a civic duty to maintain service on its branches and spurs. Alfred personally had no illusions about the economic future of prairie towns where the median age was fifty-plus, but he believed in rail and he hated trucks, and he knew firsthand what scheduled service meant to a town's civic pride, how the whistle of a train could raise the spirits on a February morning at forty-one degrees north, one hundred and one degrees west, and in his battles with the EPA and various DOTs, he'd learned to appreciate rural state legislators who could intercede on your behalf when you needed more time to clean up your waste oil tanks in the Kansas City yards, or when some goddamned bureaucrat was insisting that you pay for forty percent of a needless grade separation project at Country Road H. Years after the Sioux Line and the great northern and Rock Island had stranded dead and dying towns all across the northern plains, then the mid-pack had persisted in running short, semi-weekly or even bi-weekly trains through places like Alvin and Pisgah Creek, New Charters and West Centerville. Unfortunately, this program had attracted predators. In the early 1980s, as Alfred neared retirement, the mid-pack was known as a regional carrier that, despite outstanding management and lush profit margins on its long-haul lines, had very ordinary earnings. 
The mid-pack had already repulsed one unwelcome suitor when it came under the acquisitive gaze of Hillard and Chauncey Roth, fraternal twin brothers from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, who had expanded a family meat-packing business into an empire of the dollar. Their company, the Orphic Group, included a chain of hotels, a bank in Atlanta, an oil company, and the Arkansas Southern Railroad. The Roths had lopsided faces and dirty hair and no discernible desires or interests apart from making money. Oak Ridge Raiders, the financial press called them. At an early exploratory meeting that Alfred attended, Chauncey Roth persisted in addressing the mid-pack CEO as Dad. I'm well aware it don't seem like fair play to you, Dad. Well, Dad, why don't you and your lawyers go ahead and have that little chat right now? Gosh, and here Hillard and myself was under the impression, Dad, that you're operating a business, not a charity. This kind of anti-paternalism played well with the railroad's unionized workforce, which after months of arduous negotiations voted to offer the Roths a package of wage and work rule concessions worth almost $200 million. With these prospective savings in hand, plus 27% of the railroad stock, plus limitless junk financing, the Roths made an irresistible tender offer and bought the railroad outright. A former Tennessee Highway Commissioner, Fenton Creel, was hired to merge the railroad with the Arkansas Southern. Creel shut down the Midpac's headquarters in St. Jude, fired or retired a third of its employees, and moved the rest to Little Rock. Alfred retired two months before his 65th birthday. He was at home watching Good Morning America in his new blue chair when Mark Jamboretz, the Midpac's retired corporation counsel, called with the news that a sheriff in New Charters, pronounced Charters, Kansas, had had himself arrested for shooting an employee of Orphic Midland. The sheriff's name is Bryce Halstrom, Jamboretz told Alfred. He got a call that some roughnecks were trashing Midpac signal wires. He went over to the siding and saw three fellows ripping down the wire, smashing signal boxes, coiling up anything copper. One of them took a county bullet in his hip before the others made Halstrom understand they were working for the mid-pack. Hired for copper salvage at sixty cents a pound. But that's a good new system, Alfred said. It's not three years since we upgraded the whole new charter spur. The Roths are scrapping everything but the trunk lines, Jamboret said. They're junking the Glendora cutoff. You think the Atchison Topeka wouldn't make a bid on that? Well, Alfred said, it's a Baptist morality gone sour, said Jamboretz. The Roths can't abide that we admitted any principle but the ruthless pursuit of profit. I'm telling you, they hate what they can't comprehend, and now they're sowing salt in the fields. Close down headquarters in St. Jude? When we're twice the size of Arkansas Southern, they're punishing St. Jude for being the home of the Midland Pacific, and Creel's punishing the towns like new charters for being mid-pack towns. He's sowing salt in the fields of the financially unrighteous. Well, Alfred said again, his eyes drawn to his new blue chair and its delicious potential as a sleep site. Not my concern any more. But he'd worked for thirty years to make the Midland Pacific a strong system and Jamboretz continued to call him and send him news reports of fresh cans and outrages, and it all made him very sleepy. Soon hardly a branch or spur in Midpac's western district remained in service, but apparently Fenton Creel was satisfied with pulling down the signal wires and gutting the boxes. Five years after the takeover, the rails were still in place. The right-of-way was undisposed of, only the copper nervous system, in an act of corporate self-vandalism, had been dismantled. And now I'm worried about our health insurance, Enid told Denise. Orphic Midland is switching all the old mid-pack employees to managed care no later than April. I have to find an HMO that has some of Dad's and my doctors on their list. I'm deluged with prospectuses where the differences are all in the fine print, and honestly, Denise... I don't think I can handle this. As if to forestall being asked for help, Denise quickly said, What plans does Hedgepeth accept? Well, except for his old fee-for-service patients, like Dad, he's exclusive now with Dean Driblet's HMO, Enid said. I told you about the big party at Dean's gorgeous, huge new house. 
Dean and Trish really are about the nicest young couple I know, but golly, Denise, I called his company last year after Dad fell down on the lawnmower, and you know what they wanted for cutting our little lawn? Fifty-five dollars a week. I'm not opposed to profit. I think it's wonderful that Dean's successful. I told you about his trip to Paris with Honey. I'm not saying anything against him, but fifty-five dollars a week. Denise sampled Chip's green bean salad and reached for the olive oil. What would it cost to stay with FIFA service? Denise, hundreds of dollars a month extra. Not one of our good friends has managed care. Everybody has FIFA service, but I don't see how we can afford it. Dad was so conservative with his investments. We're lucky to have any cushion for emergencies, and this is something else I'm very, 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 very worried about. In it lowered her voice. One of Dad's old patents is finally paying off, and I need your advice. She stepped out of the kitchen and made sure that Alfred couldn't hear. Al, how you doing? She shouted. He was cradling his second hors d'oeuvre, the little green box car below his chin. As if he'd captured a small animal that might escape again, he shook his head without looking up. Enid returned to the kitchen with her purse. He finally has a chance to make some money, and he's not interested. Gary talked to him on the phone last month and tried to get him to be a little more aggressive, but Dad blew up. Denise stiffened. What was Gary wanting you to do? Just be a little more aggressive. Here, I'll show you the letter. Mother, those patents are Dad's. You have to let him handle it however he wants. Enid hoped that the envelope at the bottom of her purse might be the missing registered letter from the Axon Corporation. In her purse, as in her house, lost objects did sometimes marvelously resurface. But the envelope she found was the original certified letter, which had never been lost. Read this, she said, and see if you agree with Gary. Denise set down the can of cayenne pepper with which she dusted Chip's salad. Enid stood at her shoulder and reread the letter to make sure it still said what she remembered. Dear Dr. Lambert, on behalf of the Axon Corporation, 24 East Industrial Serpentine, Schwanksville, Pennsylvania, I'm writing to offer you a lump sum payment of $5,000 for the full, exclusive, and irrevocable right to United States Patent Number 4934417, Therapeutic Ferroacetate Gel Electropolymerization, for which you are original and sole holder of license. The management of Axon regrets that it cannot offer you a larger fee. The company's own product is in the earliest stages of testing, and there is no guarantee that its investment will bear fruit. If the terms outlined in the attached licensing agreement are acceptable, please sign and have notarized all three copies and return them to me no later than September 30. Sincerely yours, Joseph K. Prigger, Senior Associate Partner, Bragg, Neuter, and Spey. When this letter had arrived in the mail in August, and Enid had awakened Alfred in the basement, he'd shrugged and said, Five thousand dollars won't change the way we live. Enid had suggested that they write to the Exxon Corporation and ask for a larger fee, but Alfred shook his head. We'll have soon spent five thousand dollars on a lawyer, he said, and then where are we? It didn't hurt to ask, though, Enid said. I will not ask, Alfred said. But if he just wrote back, Enid said, and asked for ten thousand. She fell silent as Alfred fixed her with a look. She might as well have proposed that they make love. Denise had taken a bottle of wine from the refrigerator as if to underline her indifference to a matter of consequence to Enid. Sometimes Enid believed that Denise had disdain for every last thing she cared about. The sexual tightness of Denise's blue jeans, as she bumped a drawer shut with her hip, sent this message. The assurance with which she drove a corkscrew into the cork sent this message. Do you want some wine? Enid shuddered. It's so early in the day. Denise drank it like water. Knowing Gary, she said, I'm guessing he said try to gouge them. No, well, see... Enid reached toward the bottle with both hands. Just a tiny drop. Pour me just a swallow. Honestly, I never drink this early in the day. Never. 
You see, but Gary wonders why the company is even bothering with the patent if they're still so early in their development. I guess the usual thing is just to infringe on the other person's patent. That's too much, Denise. I don't like so much wine. Because, see, the patent expires in six years, so Gary thinks the company must stand to make a lot of money soon. Did Dad sign the agreement? Oh, yeah, he went over to the Schumperts and had Dave notarize it. Then you have to respect his decision. Denise, he's being stubborn and unreasonable. I can't... Are you saying this is an issue of competency? No. No. This is fully in character. I just can't... If he already signed the agreement, Denise said, what is Gary imagining you're going to do? Nothing, I guess. So what's the point here? Nothing. You're right, Enid said. There's nothing we can do. Although, in fact, there was. If Denise had been a little less partisan in her support of Alfred, Enid might have confessed that after Alfred had given her the notarized agreement to mail at the post office on her way to the bank, she'd hidden the agreement in the glove compartment of their car and had let the envelope sit and radiate guilt for several days and that later, while Alfred was napping, she'd hidden the envelope more securely at the back of a laundry room cabinet containing jars of undesirable jams and spreads going gray with age, kumquat raisin, brandy pumpkin, Korean barfleberry, and vases and baskets and cubes of florist's clay, too good to throw away but not good enough to use, and that, as a result of this dishonest act... She and Alfred could still extract a big licensing fee from Axon, and that it was therefore crucial that she locate the second registered letter from Axon and hide it before Alfred found out that she'd deceived and disobeyed him. Oh, but that reminds me, she said, emptying her glass. There's something else I really need your help with. Denise hesitated before replying with a polite and cordial, Yes? This hesitation confirmed Enid's long-held belief that she and Alfred had taken a wrong turn somewhere in Denise's upbringing, had failed to instill in their youngest child the proper spirit of generosity and cheerful service. Well, as you know, Enid said, we've gone to Philadelphia for the last eight Christmases in a row, and Gary's boys are old enough now that they might like to have a memory of Christmas at their grandparents' house, and so I thought, Damn! came a cry from the living room. Enid set down her glass and hurried from the kitchen. Alfred was sitting on the edge of the chaise in a somehow penal posture, his knees high and his back a little hunched, and was surveying the crash site of his third hors d'oeuvre. The gondola of bread had slipped from his fingers on its approach to his mouth and plunged to his knee, scattering wreckage and tumbling to the floor and finally coming to rest beneath the chaise. A wet pelt of roasted red pepper had adhered to the chaise's flank. Shadows of oil soak were forming around each clump of olive morsels on the upholstery. The emptied gondola lay on its side with its yellow-soaked, brown-stained white interior showing. Denise squeezed past Enid with a damp sponge and went and knelt by Alfred. Oh, Dad, she said, these are hard to handle. I should have realized. Just get me a rag and I'll clean it up. No, here, Denise said. Cupping one hand for a receptacle, she brushed the bits of olive from his knees and thighs. His hands shook in the air near her head as if he might have to push her away, but she did her work quickly and soon she'd sponged the bits of olive up from the floor and was carrying the dirtied food back to the kitchen where Enid had wanted a tiny extra splash of wine and, in her hurry not to be conspicuous, had poured a rather substantial tiny splash and downed it quickly. Anyway, she said, I thought that if you and Chip were interested, we could all have one last Christmas in St. Jude. What do you think of that idea? I'll be wherever you and Dad want to be. Denise said. No, I'm asking you, though. I want to know if it's something you're especially interested in doing. If you'd especially like to have one last Christmas in the house you grew up in, does it sound like it might be fun for you? I can tell you right now, Denise said, there's no way Caroline's leaving Philly. It's a fantasy to think otherwise. 
So if you want to see your grandkids, you'll have to come east. Denise, I'm asking what you want. Gary says he and Caroline haven't ruled it out. I need to know if a Christmas in St. Jude is something that you really, really want for yourself. Because if all the rest of us are agreed that it's important to be together as a family in St. Jude one last time, Mother, it's fine with me, if you think you can handle it. I'll need a little help in the kitchen is all. I can help you in the kitchen, but I can only come for a few days. You can't take a week? No. Why not? Mother? Damn! Alfred cried again from the living room as something vitreous, maybe a vase containing sunflowers, hit the floor with a cracking open sound, a gulp of breakage. Damn! Damn! Enid's own nerves were so splintery, she almost dropped her wine glass, and yet a part of her was grateful for this second mishap, whatever it was, because it gave Denise a small taste of what she had to put up with every day, around the clock, at home in St. Jude. The night of Alfred's seventy-fifth birthday had found Chip alone at Tilton Ledge, pursuing sexual congress with his red chaise long. It was early January, and the woods around Carparts Creek were soggy with melting snow. Only the shopping center sky above central Connecticut and the digital readouts of his home electronics cast light on his carnal labors. He was kneeling at the feet of his chaise and sniffing its plush minutely, inch by inch, in hopes that some vaginal tang might still be lingering eight weeks after Melissa Paquette had lain here. Ordinarily distinct and identifiable smells, dust, sweat, urine, the day-room reek of cigarette smoke, the fugitive after-scent of quim, became abstract and indistinguishable from oversmelling, and so he had to pause again and again to refresh his nostrils. He worked his lips down into the chaise's buttoned navels and kissed the lint and grit and crumbs and hairs that had collected in them. None of the three spots where he thought he smelled Melissa was unambiguously tangy, but after exhaustive comparison he was able to settle on the least questionable of the three spots, near a button just south of the backrest, and gave it his full nasal attention. He fingered other buttons with both hands, the cool plush chafing his nether parts in a poor approximation of Melissa's skin, until finally he achieved sufficient belief in the smell's reality, sufficient faith that he still possessed some relic of Melissa, to consummate the act. Then he rolled off his compliant antique and slumped on the floor with his pants undone and his head on the cushion, an hour closer to having failed to call his father on his birthday. He smoked two cigarettes, lighting the second off the first. He turned on his television to a cable channel that was running a marathon of old Warner Brothers cartoons. At the edge of the pool of tubal glow, he could see the mail that for nearly a week he'd been dropping unopened on the floor. Three letters from the college's new acting provost were in the pile, also something ominous from the teacher's retirement fund, also a letter from the college housing office with the words, Notice of Eviction, on the front of the envelope. Earlier in the day, while killing some hours by circling in blue ballpoint ink every uppercase M in the front section of a month-old New York Times, Chip had concluded that he was behaving like a depressed person. Now, as his telephone began to ring, it occurred to him that a depressed person ought to continue staring at the TV and ignore the ringing, ought to light another cigarette and, with no trace of emotional affect, watch another cartoon while his machine took whoever's message. That his impulse instead was to jump to his feet and answer the phone? That he could so casually betray the arduous wasting of a day, cast doubt on the authenticity of his suffering? He felt as if he lacked the ability to lose all volition and connection with reality the way depressed people did in books and movies. It seemed to him, as he silenced the TV and hurried into his kitchen, that he was failing even at the miserable task of falling properly apart. He zipped up his pants, turned on a light, and lifted the receiver. Hello? What's going on there, Chip? 
the niece said, without preliminaries. I just talked to Dad, and he said he hadn't heard from you. Denise, Denise, why are you shouting? I'm shouting, she said, because I'm upset because it's Dad's 75th birthday, and you haven't called him, and you didn't send him a card. I'm upset because I've been working for 12 hours, and I just called Dad, and he's worried about you. What's going on there? Chip surprised himself by laughing. What's going on is that I've lost my job. You didn't get tenure? No. I was fired, he said. They didn't even let me teach the last two weeks of classes. Somebody else had to give my exams. And I can't appeal the decision without calling a witness, and if I try to talk to my witness, it's just further evidence of my crime. Who's the witness? Witness to what? Chip took a bottle from a recycling bin, double-checked its emptiness, and returned it to the bin. A former student of mine says I'm obsessed with her. She says I had a relationship with her and wrote her a term paper in a motel room. And unless I get a lawyer, which I can't afford to do because they've cut my pay off, I'm not allowed to speak to this student. If I try to see her, it's considered stalking. Is she lying? Denise said. Not that this is anything Mom and Dad need to know about. Chip, is she lying? Spread open on Chip's kitchen counter was the section of the Times in which he'd circled all the uppercase M's. Rediscovering this artifact now, hours later, would have been like remembering a dream, except that a remembered dream didn't have the power to pull a waking person back into it, whereas the sight of a heavily marked story about severe new curtailments in Medicare and Medicaid benefits induced in Chip the same feeling of unease and unrealized lust, the same longing for unconsciousness that had sent him to the chaise to sniff and grope. He had to struggle now to remind himself that he'd already gone to the chaise. He'd already taken that route to comfort and forgetfulness. He folded the times and dropped it on top of his heaping trash can. I never had sexual relations with that woman, he said. You know, I'm judgmental about a lot of things, Denise said, but not about things like this. I said I didn't sleep with her. I'm stressing, though, Denise said, that this is one area where absolutely anything you say to me will fall on sympathetic ears. And she cleared her throat pointedly. If Chip had wanted to come clean to someone in his family, his little sister would have been the obvious choice. Having dropped out of college and having married badly, Denise at least had some acquaintance with darkness and disappointment. Nobody but Enid, however, had ever mistaken Denise for a failure. The college she'd dropped out of was better than the one that Chip had graduated from, and her early marriage and more recent divorce had given her an emotional maturity that Chip was all too aware of lacking himself. And he suspected that even though Denise was working eighty hours a week, she still managed to read more books than he did. In the last month, since he'd embarked on projects like digitally scanning Melissa Paquette's face from a freshman Facebook and suturing her head to obscene downloaded images and tinkering with these images pixel by pixel, and the hours did fly by when you were tinkering with pixels, he'd read no books at all. There was a misunderstanding, he told Denise dully, and then it was like they could hardly wait to fire me. And now I'm being denied due process. Frankly, Denise said, it's hard to see being fired as a bad thing. Colleges are nasty. This was the one place in the world I thought I fit in. I'm saying it's very much to your credit that you don't. Although, what are you surviving on financially? Who said I was surviving? Do you need a loan? Denise, you don't have any money. Yes, I do. I'm also thinking you should talk to my friend Julia. She's the one in film development. I told her about that idea you had for an East Village Troilus and Cressida. She said you should call her if you're interested in writing. Chip shook his head as if Denise were with him in the kitchen and could see him. They'd talked on the phone months ago about modernizing some of Shakespeare's less famous plays, and he couldn't bear that Denise had taken that conversation seriously, that she still believed in him. What about Dad, though? she said. Did you forget it's his birthday? I lost track of time here. 
I wouldn't push you, Denise said, except that I was the person who opened your Christmas box. Christmas was a bad scene, no question. Which package went to whom was pretty much guesswork. Outside, a wind from the south had picked up a thawing wind that quickened the patter of snow melt on the back patio. The sense that Chip had had when the phone rang that his misery was optional had left him again. So are you going to call him? Denise said. He replaced the receiver in its cradle without answering her, turned off the ringer, and pressed his face into the doorframe. He'd solved the problem of family Christmas gifts on the last possible mailing day when, in a great rush, he'd pulled old bargains and remainders off his bookshelves and wrapped them in aluminum foil and tied them up with red ribbon and refused to imagine how his nine-year-old nephew, Caleb, for example, might react to an Oxford annotated edition of Ivanhoe whose main qualification as a gift was that it was still in its original shrink wrap. The corners of the books had immediately poked through the aluminum foil, and the foil he'd added to cover up the holes hadn't adhered well to the underlying layers, and the result had been a soft and peely kind of effect, like onion skin or phyllo dough, which he'd tried to mitigate by plastering each package with the National Abortion Rights Action League holiday stickers that he'd received in his annual membership kit. His handiwork had looked so clumsy and childish, so mentally unbalanced, really, that he tossed the packages into an old grapefruit carton just to get them out of sight. Then he FedExed the carton down to Gary's house in Philadelphia. He felt as if he'd taken an enormous dump, as if, no matter how smeary and disagreeable it had been, he at least was emptied out now and wouldn't be back in this position soon. But three days later... Returning home late on Christmas night after a twelve-hour vigil at the Dunkin' Donuts in Norwalk, Connecticut, he faced the problem of opening the gifts his family had sent him, two boxes from St. Jude, a padded mailer from Denise, and a box from Gary. He decided that he would open the packages in bed, and that the way he would get them up to his bedroom would be to kick them up the stairs, which proved to be a challenge because oblong objects had a tendency not to roll up a staircase, but to catch on the steps and tumble back down. Also, if the contents of a padded mailer were too light to offer inertial resistance, it was difficult to get any lift when you kicked it, but Chip had had such a frustrating and demoralizing Christmas. He'd left a message on Melissa's college voicemail asking her to call him at the payphone at the Dunkin' Donuts, or, better yet, to come over in person from her parents' house in nearby Westport. And not until midnight had exhaustion compelled him to accept that Melissa probably wasn't going to call him and certainly wasn't going to come and see him. That he was now psychically capable neither of breaking the rules of the game he'd invented nor of quitting the game before he'd achieved its object. And it was clear to him that the rules permitted only genuine sharp kicks, prohibited, in particular, working his foot under the padded mailer and advancing it with any sort of pushing or lofting motion. And so he was obliged to kick his Christmas package from Denise with escalating savagery until it tore open and spilled its ground newsprint stuffing, and he succeeded in catching its ripped sheathing with the toe of his boot and launching the gift in a long, clean arc that landed it one step shy of the second floor. From there, however, the mailer refused to be budged up over the lip of the final step. Chip trampled and kicked and shredded the mailer with his heels. Inside was a mess of red paper and green silk. He broke his own rule and scraped the mess up over the last step, kicked it down the hall, and left it by his bed while he went down for the other boxes. These, too, he pretty well destroyed before he developed a method of bouncing them off a low step and then, while they were airborne, punting them all the way upstairs. When he punted the box from Gary, it exploded in a cloud of white styrofoam saucers. A bubble-wrapped bottle fell out and rolled down the stairs. It was a bottle of vintage Californian port. Chip carried it up to his bed and worked out a rhythm whereby he swallowed one large mouthful of port for each gift that he succeeded in unwrapping. From his mother, who was under the impression that he still hung a stocking by his fireplace, he'd received a box marked Stocking Stuffers containing small, individually wrapped items a package of cough drops, a miniature second-grade school photo of himself in a tarnished brass frame, 
plastic bottles of shampoo and conditioner and hand lotion from a Hong Kong hotel where Enid and Alfred had stayed en route to China eleven years earlier, and two carved wooden elves with sentimentally exaggerated smiles and loops of silver string that penetrated their little craniums so they could be hung from a tree. For placement under this presumptive tree, Enid had sent a second box of larger gifts wrapped in Santa-faced red paper. An asparagus steamer, three pairs of white jockey underwear, a jumbo candy cane, and two calico throw pillows. From Gary and his wife, in addition to the port, Chip received a clever vacuum pump system for preserving leftover wine from oxidation, as if leftover wine were a problem Chip had ever had. From Denise, to whom he'd given the selected letters of André Gide, after erasing from the flyleaf the evidence that he'd paid one dollar for this particularly tone-deaf translation, he received a beautiful lime-green silk shirt. And from his father, a hundred-dollar check, with the handwritten instruction to buy himself something he liked. Except for the shirt, which he'd worn, and the check, which he'd cashed, and the bottle of port which he'd killed in bed on Christmas night, the gifts from his family were still on the floor of his bedroom. Stuffing from Denise's mailer had drifted into the kitchen and mixed with splashed dishwater to form a mud that he'd tracked all over. Flocks of sheep-white styrofoam pebbles had collected in sheltered places. It was nearly 10.30 in the Midwest. Hello, Dad. Happy 75th. Things are going well here. How are things in St. Jude? Chip felt he couldn't make the call without some kind of pick-me-up or treat, some kind of energizer, but TV caused him such critical and political anguish that he could no longer watch even cartoons without smoking cigarettes, and he now had a lung-sized region of pain in his chest, and there was no intoxicant of any sort in his house, not even cooking sherry, not even cough syrup. And after the labor of taking his pleasure with the chaise, his endorphins had gone home to the four corners of his brain like war-weary troops so spent by the demands he'd made of them in the last five weeks that nothing, except possibly Melissa in the flesh, could marshal them again. He needed a little morale booster, a little pick-me-up. But he had nothing better than the month-old times, and he felt that he'd circled quite enough uppercase M's for one day. He could circle no more. He went to his dining table and confirmed the absence of dregs in the wine bottles on it. He'd used the last $220 of credit on his visa card to buy eight bottles of a rather tasty Fonsac, and on Saturday night he'd thrown one last dinner party to rally his supporters on the faculty. A few years ago, after Dee's drama department had fired a popular young professor, Kali Lopez, for having claimed to have a degree she didn't have, Outraged students and junior faculty had organized boycotts and candlelight vigils that had forced the college not only to rehire Lopez, but to promote her to a full professor. Granted, Chip was neither a lesbian nor a Filipina, as Lopez was, but he'd taught theory of feminism, and he had a hundred percent voting record with the queer bloc, and he routinely packed his syllabi with non-Western writers and all he'd really done in Room 23 of the Comfort Valley Lodge was put into practice certain theories, the myth of authorship, the resistant consumerism of transgressive sexual transactions that the college had hired him to teach. Unfortunately, the theories sounded somewhat lame when he wasn't lecturing to impressionable adolescents. Of the eight colleagues who'd accepted his invitation for dinner on Saturday, only four had shown up. And despite his efforts to steer the conversation around to his predicament, the only collective action his friends had taken on his behalf had been to serenade him as they killed the eighth bottle of wine with an a cappella rendition of Non, je ne regrette rien. He hadn't had the strength to clear the table in the intervening days. He considered the blackened red leaf lettuce, the skin of congealed grease on an uneaten lamb chop, the mess of corks and ashes. The shame and disorder in his house were like the shame and disorder in his head. Kali Lopez was now the college's acting provost, Jim Leviton's replacement. Tell me about your relationship with your student, Melissa Paquette. 
My former student? Your former student. I'm friendly with her. We've had dinner. I spent some time with her at the beginning of Thanksgiving break. She's a brilliant student. Did you give Melissa any help with a paper she wrote last week for Vendla O'Fallon? We talked about the paper in a general way. She had some areas of confusion that I was able to help her clear up. Is your relationship with her sexual? No. Chip, what I think we'll do is suspend you with pay until we can have a full hearing. That's what we'll do. We'll have a hearing early next week, and in the meantime, you should probably get a lawyer and talk to your union rep. I also have to insist that you not speak to Melissa Puckett. What does she say? That I wrote that paper? Melissa violated the honor code by handing in work that was not her own. She's facing a one-semester suspension, but we understand that there are mitigating factors. For example, your grossly inappropriate sexual relationship with her. That's what she says? My personal advice, Chip, is resign now. That's what she says? You have no chance. The snow melt was raining down harder on his patio. He lit a cigarette on the front burner of his stove, took two painful drags, and pressed the coal into the palm of his hand. He groaned through clenched teeth and opened his freezer and put his palm to its floor and stood for a minute smelling flesh smoke. Then, holding an ice cube, he went to the phone and dialed the ancient area code, the ancient number. While the phone rang in St. Jude, he planted a foot on the section of times in his trash and mashed it down, for got it out of sight. Oh, Chip, Enid cried, he's already gone to bed. Don't wake him, Chip said. Just tell him. But Enid set the phone down and shouted, Al, Al, at volumes that diminished as she moved farther from the phone and up the stairs toward the bedrooms. Chip heard her shout, It's Chip! He heard their upstairs extension click into action. He heard Enid instructing Alfred, Don't just say hello and hang up. Visit with him a little. There was a rustling transfer of the receiver. Yes, Alfred said. Hey, Dad, happy birthday, Chip said. Yes, Alfred said again in exactly the same flat voice. I'm sorry to call so late. I was not asleep, Alfred said. I was afraid I woke you up. Yes. Well, so, happy 75th. Yes. Chip hoped that Enid was motoring back down to the kitchen as fast as she could, ailing hip and all, to bail him out. I guess you're tired and it's late, he said. We don't have to talk. Thank you for the call, Alfred said. Enid was back on the line. I'm going to finish these dishes, she said. We had a party here tonight. Al, tell Chip about the party we had. I'm getting off the phone now. She hung up. Chip said, You had a party. Yes. The Roots were here for dinner and bridge. Did you have a cake? Your mother made a cake. The cigarette had made a hole in Chip's body through which he felt painful harms could enter and vital factors painfully escape. Melting ice was leaking through his fingers. How was the bridge? My typical terrible cards. That doesn't seem fair on your birthday. I imagine, Alfred said, that you are gearing up for another semester. Right, right. Although, actually not. Actually, I'm deciding not to teach at all this semester. I didn't hear. Chip raised his voice. I said I've decided not to teach this semester. I'm going to take the semester off and work on my writing. My recollection is that you are due for tenure soon. Right, in April. It seems to me that a person hoping to be offered tenure would be advised to stay and teach. Right. If they see you working hard, they will have no reason not to offer you tenure. Right. Right, Chip nodded. At the same time, I have to prepare for the possibility that I won't get it, and I've got a, uh, a very attractive offer from a Hollywood producer, a college friend of Denise's who produces movies, potentially very lucrative. A great worker is almost impossible to fire, Alfred said. The process can get very political, though. I have to have alternatives. As you wish, Alfred said. 
However, I've found that it's usually best to choose one plan and stick with it. If you don't succeed here, you can always do something else, but you've worked many years to reach this point. One more semester's hard work won't hurt you. Right. You can relax when you have tenure, then you're safe. Right. Well, thank you for the call. Right. Happy birthday, Dad. Chip dropped the phone, left the kitchen and took a Fronsac bottle by the neck and brought its body down hard on the edge of his dining table. He broke a second bottle. The remaining six he smashed two at a time, a neck in each fist. Anger carried him through the difficult weeks that followed. He borrowed $10,000 from Denise and hired a lawyer to threaten to sue D. College for wrongful termination of his contract. This was a waste of money, but it felt good. He went to New York and ponied up $4,000 in fees and deposits for a sublet on Ninth Street. He bought leather clothes and had his ears pierced. He borrowed more money from Denise and reconnected with a college friend who edited the Warren Street Journal. He conceived revenge in the form of a screenplay that would expose the narcissism and treachery of Melissa Paquette and the hypocrisy of his colleagues. He wanted the people who'd heard him to see the movie recognize themselves and suffer. He flirted with Julia Vrace and asked her on a date, and soon he was spending two or three hundred dollars a week to feed an entertainer. He borrowed more money from Denise. He hung cigarettes on his lower lip and banged out a draft of a script. Julia, in the back seat of cabs, pressed her face against his chest and clutched his collar. He tipped waiters and cabbies thirty and forty percent. He quoted Shakespeare and Byron in funny contexts. He borrowed more money from Denise and decided that she was right, that getting fired was the best thing that had ever happened to him. He wasn't so naive, of course, as to take Eden Procuro's professional effusions at face value. But the more he saw of Eden socially, the more confident he became that his script would get a sympathetic reading. For one thing, Eden was like a mother to Julia. She was only five years older, but she'd undertaken a wholesale recalibration and improvement of her personal assistant. Although Chip never quite shook the feeling that Eden was hoping to cast someone else in the role of Julia's love interest, she habitually referred to Chip as Julia's escort, not her boyfriend, and when she talked about Julia's untapped potential and her lack of confidence, he suspected that mate selection was one area in which she hoped to see improvement in Julia. Julia assured him that Eden thought he was really dear and extremely smart. Certainly, Eden's husband, Doug O'Brien, was on his side. Doug was a mergers and acquisitions specialist at Bragg, Neuter, and Spey. He'd set Chip up with a flex-time proofreading job and had seen to it that Chip was paid the top hourly wage. Whenever Chip tried to thank him for this favor, Doug made shawing motions with his hand. You're the man with the Ph.D., he said. That book of yours is scary, smart stuff. Chip had soon become a frequent guest at the O'Brien Procuro's dinner parties in Tribeca and their weekend house parties in Quag. Drinking their liquor and eating their catered food, he had a foretaste of a success a hundred times sweeter than tenure. He felt that he was really living. Then one night, Julia sat him down and said there was an important fact that she hadn't mentioned earlier, and would he promise not to be too mad at her. The important fact was that she sort of had a husband. The deputy prime minister of Lithuania, a small Baltic country, was a man named Gitanas Misevicius. Well, the fact was that Julia had married him a couple of years ago, and she hoped Chip wouldn't be too mad at her. Her problem with men, she said, was that she'd grown up without. Her father was a manic-depressive boat salesman whom she remembered meeting once and wished she'd never met at all. Her mother, a cosmetics company executive, had fobbed Julia off on her own mother, who'd enrolled her in a Catholic girls' school. Julia's first significant experience with men was at college. Then she moved to New York and embarked on the long process of sleeping with every dishonest, casually sadistic, terminally uncommitted, really gorgeous guy in the borough of Manhattan. By the age of 28, she had little to feel good about except her looks, 
her apartment, and her steady job, which mainly consisted, however, of answering the phone. So when she met Gitanas at a club and Gitanas took her seriously, and by and by produced an actual, not small, diamond in a white gold setting and seemed to love her, and the guy was, after all, an honest-to-God ambassador to the United Nations, she'd gone and heard him do his Baltic thundering at the General Assembly. She did her level best to repay his kindness. She was as agreeable as humanly possible. She refused to disappoint Gitanas, even though, in hindsight, it probably would have been better to disappoint him. Gitanas was quite a bit older and fairly attentive in bed, not like Chip, Julia hastened to say, but not, you know, terrible. And he seemed to know what he was doing with the marriage thing, and so one day she went to City Hall with him. She might even have gone by Mrs. Misevicius if it had sounded less idiotic. Once she was married, she realized that the marble floors and black lacquer furniture and heavy modern smoked glass fixtures of the ambassador's apartment on the East River weren't as entertainingly campy as she'd thought. They were more like unbearably depressing. She made Gitana sell the place, the chief of the Paraguayan delegation was delighted to get it, and buy a smaller, nicer place on Hudson Street near some good clubs. She found a competent hairstylist for Gitanas and taught him how to pick out clothes with natural fibers. Things seemed to be going great. But somewhere she and Gitanas must have misunderstood each other because when his party, the VIPPPAKJRIINPB17, the one true party unswervingly dedicated to the revanchist ideals of Casimiras Yaramaitis and the independent plebiscite of April 17, lost the September election and recalled him to Vilnius to join the parliamentary opposition, he took it for granted that Julia would come along with him. And Julia understood the concept of one flesh, wife, cleaving to husband, and so forth. But Gitanas, in his descriptions of post-Soviet Vilnius, had painted a picture of chronic coal and electricity shortages, freezing drizzles, drive-by shootings, and heavy dietary reliance on horsemeat. And so she did a really terrible thing to Gitanas, definitely the worst thing she'd ever done to anybody. She agreed to go and live in Vilnius, and she sort of got on the plane with Gitanas and sat down in first class, and then sneaked off the plane and sort of changed their home phone number and had Eden tell Gitanas when he called that she had disappeared. Six months later, Gitanas returned to New York for a weekend and made Julia feel really, really guilty. And yes, no argument, she'd disgraced herself. But Gitanas proceeded to call her certain rough names, and he slapped her pretty hard. The upshot of which was that they couldn't be together anymore, but she continued to use their apartment on Hudson Street in exchange for staying married in case Gitanas needed quick asylum in the United States, because apparently things were going from bad to worse in Lithuania. Anyway, that was the story of her and Gitanas, and she hoped that Chip wouldn't be too mad at her. And... Chip was not. Indeed, at first, he not only didn't mind that Julie was married, he adored the fact. He was fascinated by her rings. He talked her into wearing them in bed. Down at the offices of the Warren Street Journal, where he sometimes felt insufficiently transgressive, as if his innermost self were still a nice Midwestern boy, he took pleasure in alluding to the European statesman he was cuckolding. In his doctoral thesis, Doubtful it stood, anxieties of the phallus in Tudor drama. He'd written extensively about cuckolds, and under the cloak of his reproving modern scholarship, he'd been excited by the idea of marriage as a property right, of adultery as theft. Before long, though, the thrill of poaching on the diplomat's preserve gave way to bourgeois fantasies in which Chip himself was Julia's husband, her lord, her liege. He became spasmodically jealous of Gitanas Misevicius, who, though Lithuanian and a slapper, was a successful politician whose name Julia now pronounced with guilt and wistfulness. On New Year's Eve, Chip asked her point-blank if she ever thought about divorce. She replied that she liked her apartment, can't beat the rent, and she didn't want to look for another one right now. After New Year's, Chip returned to his rough draft of the Academy Purple, which he'd completed in a euphoric twenty-page blaze of keyboard pounding and discovered that it had a lot of problems. It looked, in fact, 
like incoherent hackwork. During the month that he'd spent expensively celebrating its completion, he'd imagined that he could remove certain hackneyed plot elements. The conspiracy, the car crash, the evil lesbians, and still tell a good story. Without these hackneyed plot elements, however, he seemed to have no story at all. In order to salvage his artistic and intellectual ambitions, he added a long theoretical opening monologue. But this monologue was so unreadable that every time he turned on his computer he had to go and tinker with it. Soon he was spending the bulk of each work session compulsively honing the monologue. And when he despaired of shortening it any further without sacrificing important thematic material, he started fussing with the margins and hyphenation to make the monologue end at the bottom of page 6 rather than the top of page 7. He replaced the word continue with go on to save three spaces, thus allowing the word transactions to be hyphenated after the second T, which triggered a whole cascade of longer lines and more efficient hyphenations. Then he decided that go on had the wrong rhythm and that transactions should not be hyphenated under any circumstances, and so he scoured the text for other longish words to replace with shorter synonyms, all the while struggling to believe that stars and producers in Prada jackets would enjoy reading six pages, but not seven, of turgid academic theorizing. Once, when he was a boy, there was a total eclipse of the sun in the Midwest, and a girl in one of the pokey towns across the river from St. Jude had sat outside and, in defiance of myriad warnings, studied the dwindling crescent of the sun until her retinas combusted. It didn't hurt at all, the blinded girl had told the St. Jude Chronicle. It felt like nothing. Each day that Chip spent grooming the corpse of a dramatically dead monologue was a day in which his rent and food and entertainment expenses were paid for in large part with his little sister's money. And yet as long as the money lasted, his pain was not acute. One day led to another. He rarely got out of bed before noon. He enjoyed his food. food and his wine, he dressed well enough to persuade himself that he was not a quivering gelatinous mess, and he managed on four out of five evenings to hide the worst of his anxiety and foreboding and enjoy himself with Julia, because the sum he owed Denise was large in comparison to his proofreading wage, but small by Hollywood standards. He worked less and less at Bragg, Neuter, and Spey. His only real complaint was with his health. On a summer day, when his work session consisted of rereading Act One, being struck afresh by its irredeemable badness, and hurrying outside to get some air, he might walk down Broadway and sit on a bench at Battery Park City, and let the breeze off the Hudson flow under his collar, and listen to the ceaseless foot-foot of copter traffic and the distant shouts of millionaire Tribeca toddlers, and be overcome with guilt. To be so vigorous and healthy, and yet... So nothing, neither taking advantage of his good night's sleep and his successful avoidance of a cold to get some work done, nor yet fully entering into the vacation spirit and flirting with strangers and knocking back margaritas. It would have been better, he thought, to do his getting sick and dying now while he was failing and save his health and vitality for some later date when, unimaginable though the prospect was, he would perhaps no longer be failing. Of all the things he was wasting, Denise's money, Julia's goodwill, his own abilities and education, the opportunities afforded by the longest sustained economic boom in American history, his sheer physical well-being, there in the sunlight by the river, hurt the worst. He ran out of money on a Friday in July. Facing a weekend with Julia, who could cost him fifteen dollars at a cinema refreshments counter, he purged the Marxists from his bookshelves and took them to the Strand in two extremely heavy bags. The books were in their original jackets and had an aggregate list price of three thousand nine hundred dollars. A buyer at the Strand appraised them casually and delivered his verdict. Sixty-five. Chip laughed in a breathy way, willing himself not to argue, but his U.K. edition of Jürgen Habermas's Reason and the Rationalization of Society, which he'd found too difficult to read, let alone annotate, 
was in mint condition and had cost him ninety-five pounds. He couldn't help pointing this out by way of example. Try somewhere else if you like, the buyer said, his hand hesitating above the cash register. No, no, you're right, Chip said. Sixty-five is great. It was pathetically obvious that he'd believed his books would fetch him hundreds of dollars. He turned away from their reproachful spines, remembering how each of them had called out in a bookstore with a promise of a radical critique of late capitalist society, and how happy he'd been to take them home. But Jürgen Habermas didn't have Julia's long, cool, pear-tree limbs. Theodore Adorno didn't have Julia's grapey smell of lecherous pliability. Fred Jameson didn't have Julia's artful tongue. By the beginning of October, when Chip sent his finished script to Eden Procuro, he'd sold his feminists, his formalists, his structuralists, his post-structuralists, his Freudians, and his queers. To raise money for lunch for his parents and Denise, all he had left was his beloved cultural historians and his complete hardcover Arden Shakespeare. And because a kind of magic resided in the Shakespeare... The uniform volumes in their pale blue jackets were like an archipelago of safe retreats. He piled his Foucault and Greenblatt and Hooks and Puvi into shopping bags and sold them all for $115. He spent $60 on a haircut, some candy, a stain removal kit, and two drinks at the Cedar Tavern. Back in August, when he'd invited his parents, he'd hoped that Eden Procuro might have read his script and advanced him money before they arrived but now the only accomplishment and the only gift he had to offer was a home-cooked meal. He went to an East Village deli that sold reliably excellent tortellini and crusty bread. He was envisioning a rustic and affordable Italian lunch, but the deli appeared to have gone out of business, and he didn't feel like walking ten blocks to a bakery that he was certain had good bread, and so he wandered the East Village randomly, trudging in and out of meretricious food stores, hefting cheeses, rejecting breads, examining inferior tortellini. Finally, he abandoned the Italian idea altogether and fixed on the only other lunch he could think of, a salad of wild rice, avocado, and smoked turkey breast. The problem then was to find ripe avocados. In store after store he found either no avocados or walnut-hard avocados. He found ripe avocados that were the size of limes and cost $3.89 apiece. He stood holding five of them and considered what to do. He put them down and picked them up and put them down and couldn't pull the trigger. He weathered a spasm of hatred of Denise for having guilted him into inviting his parents to lunch. He had the feeling that he'd never eaten anything in his life but wild rice salad and tortellini. So blank was his culinary imagination. Around eight o'clock, he ended up outside the new Nightmare of Consumption, everything for a price, on Grand Street. A humidity had stolen over the sky, a sulfurous, uneasy wind from Rawway and Bayonne. The super gentry of Soho and Tribeca were streaming through the nightmare's brushed steel portals. The men came in various shapes and sizes, but all the women were slim and thirty-six. Many were both slim and pregnant. Chip had a collar rash from his haircut and felt unready to be seen by so many perfect women. But right inside the nightmare's door he glimpsed a box of greens marked Sorrel from Belize, ninety-nine cents. He entered the nightmare, snagged a basket, and put one bunch of sorrel in it. Ninety-nine cents. Installed above the nightmare's coffee bar was a screen that gave running ironic tallies of today's gross receipts and today's profit and projected quarterly per share dividend, unofficial non-binding estimate based on past quarterly performances. This information provided for entertainment purposes only. And coffee sales, this station. Chip wove among strollers and cell phone antennae to the fish counter where, as in a dream, he found wild Norwegian salmon, line caught, on sale at a reasonable price. He pointed at a mid-sized fillet, and to the fishman's question, what else, he replied in a crisp tone, almost a smug tone, that'll do it. The price on the beautiful paper-wrapped fillet that he was handed was $78.40. 
Luckily, this discovery knocked the wind out of him, otherwise he might have lodged a protest before realizing, as he did now, that the prices at the nightmare were per quarter pound. Two years ago, two months ago, he would not have made a mistake like this. Ha-ha, he said, palming the seventy-eight-dollar fillet like a catcher's mitt. He dropped to one knee and touched his bootlaces and took the salmon right up inside his leather jacket and underneath his sweater and tucked the sweater into his pants and stood up again. Daddy, I want swordfish, a little voice behind him said. Chip took two steps and the salmon, which was quite heavy, escaped from his sweater and covered his groin for one unstable moment like a codpiece. Daddy, swordfish! Chip put his hand to his crotch. The dangling fillet felt like a cool, loaded diaper. He repositioned it against his abs and tucked in the sweater more securely, zipped his jacket to the neck, and strode purposefully toward the whatever, toward the dairy wall. Here he found a selection of French creme fraiche at prices implying transport via SST. The less unaffordable domestic creme fraiche was blocked by a man in a Yankee's cap who was shouting into a cell phone while a child, apparently his, peeled back the foil tops of half liters of French yogurt. She'd peeled back five or six already. Chip leaned to reach behind the man, but his fish belly sagged. Excuse me, he said. Like a sleepwalker, the man on the phone shuffled aside. I said fuck him, fuck him, fuck that asshole. We never closed. There's no ink on the line. I'll take that asshole down another thirty. You watch me. Honey, don't tear those. If we tear those, we have to pay for them. I said it is a fucking buyer's ball as of yesterday. We close on nothing till this thing bottoms out. Nothing, 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 nothing. Chip was approaching the checkout lanes with four plausible items in his basket when he caught sight of a head of hair so new penny bright it could only belong to Eden Procuro who was herself slim and thirty-six, and hectic. Eden's little son, Anthony, was seated on the upper level of a shopping cart with his back to a four-figure avalanche of shellfish, cheeses, meats, and caviars. Eden was leaning over Anthony and letting him pull on the taupe lapels of her Italian suit and suck on her blouse while, behind his back, she turned the pages of a script that Chip could only pray was not his own. The line-caught Norwegian salmon was soaking through its wrapping, his body heat melting the fats that had given the fillet a degree of rigidity. He wanted to escape the nightmare, but he wasn't prepared to discuss the Academy purple under the current circumstances. He veered down a frosty aisle where the gelati came in plain white cartons with small black lettering. A man in a suit was crouching beside a little girl with hair like copper and sunshine. The girl was Eden's daughter, April. The man was Eden's husband, Doug O'Brien. Chip Lambert, what's happening? Doug said. There seemed to be no ways but girly ways for Chip to hold his grocery basket while he shook Doug's square hand. April's picking out her treat for after dinner, Doug said. Three treats, April said. Her three treats, right. What's that one? April said, pointing. That is a grenadine nasturtium sorbetto sugar bunny. Do I like it? That I can't tell you. Doug, who was younger and shorter than Chip, so persistently claimed to be in awe of Chip's intellect and so consistently tested free of any irony or condescension that Chip had finally accepted that Doug really did admire him. This admiration was more grueling than belittlement. Eden tells me you finished the script, Doug said, restacking some gelati that April had upset. Man, I am psyched. This project sounds phenomenal. April was cradling three rhymed cartons against her corduroy jumper. What kind did you get? Chip asked her. April shrugged extremely, a beginner's shrug. Sugar Bunny, run those up to Mommy. I'm going to talk to Chip. As April ran back up the aisle, Chip wondered what it would be like to father a child, to always be needed instead of always needing. Something I wanted to ask you, Doug said. Do you have a second? Say somebody offered you a new personality. Would you take it? Say somebody said to you, I will permanently rewire your mental hardware in whatever way you want. Would you pay to have that done? 
The salmon paper was sweat-bonded to Chip's skin and tearing open at the bottom. This was not the ideal time to be providing Doug with the intellectual companionship he seemed to crave, but Chip wanted Doug to keep thinking highly of him and encourage Eden to buy his script. He asked why Doug asked. A lot of crazy stuff crosses my desk, Doug said. Especially now, with all the money coming home from overseas, all the dot-com issues, of course. We're still trying our very hardest to persuade the average American to happily engineer his own financial ruin. But the biotech is fascinating. I've been reading whole prospectuses about genetically altered squash. Apparently people in this country are eating a lot more squash than I was aware of, and squashes are prone to more diseases than you'd infer from their robust exterior. Either that or Southern Cucum Tech is seriously overvalued at thirty-five a share. Whatever, but chip this brain thing, man, it caught my eye. Bizarre fact number one is that I'm allowed to talk about it. It's all public knowledge. Is this bizarre? Chip was trying to keep his eyes focused on Doug in an interested manner, but his eyes were like children. They wanted to skip up and down the aisles. He was ready, basically, to jump out of his skin. Yeah, bizarre. The idea, Doug said, is your basic gut cerebral rehab. Leave the shell and roof, replace the walls and plumbing, design away that useless dining nook, put a modern circuit breaker in. Uh-huh. You get to keep your handsome facade, Doug said. You still look serious and intellectual, a little Nordic on the outside, sober, bookish, but inside you're more livable. A big family room with an entertainment console, a kitchen that's roomier and handier. You've got your in sink your convection oven, an ice cube dispenser on the refrigerator door. Do I still recognize myself? Do you want to? Everybody else still will, at least the outside of you. The big glowing tally for today's gross receipts paused for a moment at $444,447.41, and then went higher. My furnishings are my personality, Chip said. Say it's a gradual rehab. Say the workmen are very tidy. The brain's cleaned up every night when you get home from work, and nobody can bother you on the weekend per local ordinance and the usual covenantal restrictions. The whole thing happens in stages. You grow into it, or it grows into you, so to speak. Nobody's making you buy new furniture. You're asking hypothetically. Doug raised a finger. The only thing is there might be some metal involved. It's possible you'd set off alarms at the airport. I'm imagining you might get some unwanted talk radio, too, on certain frequencies. Gatorade and other high electrolyte drinks might be a problem. But what do you say? You're joking, right? Check out the website. I'll give you the address. The implications are disturbing, but there's no stopping this powerful new technology. That could be the motto for our age, don't you think? that a salmon fillet was now spreading down into Chip's underpants like a wide, warm slug did seem to have everything to do with his brain and with a number of poor decisions that this brain had made. Rationally, Chip knew that Doug would let him go soon and that eventually he might even escape the nightmare of consumption and find a restaurant bathroom where he could take the fillet out and regain his full critical faculties that there would come a moment when he was no longer standing amid pricey gelati with lukewarm fish in his pants, and that this future moment would be a moment of extraordinary relief. But for now, he still inhabited an earlier, much less pleasant moment from the vantage point of which a new brain looked like just the ticket. The desserts were a foot tall, Enid said, her instincts having told her that Denise didn't care about pyramids of shrimp. It was elegant, elegant. Have you ever seen anything like that? I'm sure it was very nice, Denise said. The driblets really do things super deluxe. I'd never seen a dessert that tall, have you? The subtle signs that Denise was exercising patience, the slightly deeper breaths she took, the soundless way she set her fork down on her plate and took a sip of wine and set the glass back down were more hurtful to Enid than a violent explosion. I've seen tall desserts, Denise said. Are they tremendously difficult to make? 
Denise folded her hands in her lap and exhaled slowly. It sounds like a great party. I'm glad you had fun. Enid had, true enough, had fun at Dean and Trisha's party, and she'd wished that Denise had been there to see for herself how elegant it was. At the same time, she was afraid that Denise would not have found the party elegant at all, that Denise would have picked apart its specialness until there was nothing left but ordinariness. Her daughter's taste was a dark spot in Enid's vision, a hole in her experience through which her own pleasures were forever threatening to leak and dissipate. I guess there's no accounting for tastes, she said. That's true, Denise said, although some tastes are better than others. Alfred had bent low over his plate to ensure that any salmon or aracot vert that fell from his fork would land on China. But he was listening. He said, Enough! That's what everybody thinks, Enid said. Everybody thinks their taste is the best. But most people are wrong, Denise said. Everybody's entitled to their own taste, Enid said. Everybody gets one vote in this country. Unfortunately. Enough, Alfred said to Denise. You'll never win. You sound like a snob, Enid said. Mother, you're always telling me how much you like a good home-cooked meal. Well, that's what I like, too. I think there's a kind of Disney vulgarity in a foot-tall dessert. You are a better cook than... Oh, no, no, Enid shook her head. I'm a nothing cook. That's not true at all. Where do you think I... Not from me, Enid interrupted. I don't know where my children got their talents, but not from me. I'm a nothing as a cook, a big nothing. How strangely good it felt to say this. It was like putting scalding water on a poison ivy rash. Denise straightened her back and raised her glass. Enid, who all her life had been helpless not to observe the goings-on on other people's plates, had watched Denise take a three-bite portion of salmon, a small helping of salad, and a crust of bread. The size of each was a reproach to the size of each of Enid's. Now Denise's plate was empty, and she hadn't taken seconds of anything. Is that all you're going to eat? Enid said. Yes, that was my lunch. You've lost weight. In fact, not. Well, don't lose any more, Enid said with the skimpy laugh with which she tried to hide large feelings. Alfred was guiding a forkful of salmon and sorrel sauce to his mouth. The food dropped off his fork and broke into violently shaped pieces. I think Chip did a good job with this, Enid said. Don't you think? The salmon is very tender and good. Chip has always been a good cook, Denise said. Al, are you enjoying this? Al? Alfred's grip on his fork had slackened. There was a sag in his lower lip, a sullen suspicion in his eyes. Are you enjoying the lunch? Enid said. He took his left hand in his right and squeezed it. The mated hands continued their oscillation together while he stared at the sunflowers in the middle of the table. He seemed to swallow the sour set of his mouth, to choke back the paranoia. Chip made all this? he said. Yes. He shook his head, as though Chip's having cooked, Chip's absence now overwhelmed him. I am increasingly bothered by my affliction, he said. What you have is very mild, Enid said. We just need to get the medication adjusted. He shook his head. Hedgepeth said it's unpredictable. The important thing is to keep doing things, Enid said, to keep active, to always just go. No, you were not listening. Hedgepeth was very careful not to promise anything. According to what I read, I don't give a damn what your magazine article said. I am not well. And Hedgepeth admitted as much. Denise set her wine down with a stiff, fully extended arm. So what do you think about Chip's new job? Enid asked her brightly. His, well, at the Wall Street Journal. Denise studied the tabletop. I have no opinion about it. It's exciting, don't you think? I have no opinion about it. Do you think he works there full time? No. I don't understand what kind of job it is. Mother, I know nothing about it. Is he still doing law? You mean proofreading? Yes. So he's still at the firm? 
He's not a lawyer, mother. I know he's not a lawyer. Well, when you say doing law or at the firm, is that what you tell your friends? I say he works at a law firm, that's all I say. A New York City law firm. And it's the truth, he does work there. It's misleading, and you know it, Alfred said. I guess I should just never say anything. Just say things that are true, Denise said. Well, I think he should be in law, Enid said. I think the law would be perfect for Chip. He needs the stability of a profession. He needs structure in his life. Dad always thought he'd make an excellent lawyer. I used to think doctor because he was interested in science, but Dad always saw him as a lawyer. Didn't you, Al? Didn't you think Chip could be an excellent lawyer? He's so quick with the words. Enid, it's too late. I thought maybe working for the firm, he'd get interested and go back to school. Far too late. The thing is, Denise, there are so many things you can do with law. You can be a company president. You can be a judge. You can teach. You can be a journalist. There are so many directions Chip could go in. Chip will do what he wants to do, Alfred said. I've never understood it, but he is not going to change now. He marched two blocks in the rain before he found a dial tone. At the first twin phone bank he came to, one instrument was castrated, with colored tassels at the end of its cord, and all that remained of the other was four bolt holes. The phone at the next intersection had chewing gum in its coin slot, and the line of its companion was completely dead. The standard way for a man in Chip's position to vent his rage was to smash the handset on the box and leave the plastic shards in the gutter, but Chip was in too much of a hurry for this. At the corner of Fifth Avenue, he tried a phone that had a dial tone but did not respond when he touched the keypad and did not return his quarter when he hung up nicely or when he picked the handset up and slammed it down. The other phone had a dial tone and took his money, but a baby bell voice claimed not to understand what he dialed and did not return the money. He tried a second time and lost his last quarter. He smiled at the SUVs crawling by in ready-to-break-bad-weather automotive postures. The doormen in this neighborhood hosed the sidewalks twice a day, and sanitation trucks with brushes like the mustaches of city cops scoured the streets three times a week. But in New York City, you never had to go far to find filth and rage. A nearby street sign seemed to read, Filth Avenue. Things cellular were killing public phones, but unlike Denise, who considered cell phones the vulgar accessories of vulgar people, and unlike Gary, who not only didn't hate them but had bought one for each of his three boys, Chip hated cell phones mainly because he didn't have one. Under the scant protection of Denise's umbrella, he crossed back to a deli on University Place. Brown cardboard had been laid over the scuffed rug at the door for traction, but the cardboard was soaked and trampled, its shreds resembling washed-up kelp. Headlines in wire baskets by the door reported yesterday's tanking of two more economies in South America and fresh plunges in key Far Eastern markets. Behind the cash register was a lottery poster. It's not about winning, it's about fun. With two of the four dollars in his wallet, Chip bought some of the all-natural licorice that he liked. For his third dollar, the deli clerk gave him four quarters in change. I'll take a lucky leprechaun, too, Chip said. The three-leaf clover, wooden harp, and pot of gold that he uncovered weren't a winning or fun combination. Is there a payphone around here that works? No payphone, the clerk said. I'm saying, is there one close to here that works? No payphone. The clerk reached under the counter and held up a cell phone. This phone. Can I make one quick call with that? Too late for broker now. Should have called yesterday. Should have by American. The clerk laughed in a way that was the more insulting for being good-humored. But then Chip had reason to be sensitive. Since D College had fired him, the market capitalization of publicly traded U.S. companies had increased by 35%. In these same twenty-two months, Chip had liquidated a retirement fund, sold a good car, worked half-time at an eightieth percentile wage, and still ended up on the brink of Chapter 11. These were years in America when it was nearly impossible not to make money, years when receptionists wrote MasterCard checks to their brokers at 13.9% APR and still cleared a profit. 
years of buy, years of call, and Chip had missed the boat. In his bones he knew that if he ever did sell the Academy Purple, the markets would all have peaked the week before, and any money he invested he would lose. Judging from Julia's negative response to his script, the American economy was safe for a while yet. Up the street at the Cedar Tavern, he found a working payphone. Years seemed to have passed since he'd had two drinks here the night before. He dialed Eden Procuro's office and hung up when her voicemail kicked in, but the quarter had already dropped. Directory assistants had a residential listing for Doug O'Brien, and Doug actually answered, but he was changing a diaper. Several minutes passed before Chip was able to ask him if Eden had read the script yet. Phenomenal! Phenomenal sounding project, Doug said. I think she had it with her when she went out. Do you know where she went? Chip, you know I can't tell people where she is, you know that. I think the situation qualifies as urgent. Please deposit eighty cents for the next two minutes. I got a payphone, Doug said. Is that a payphone? Chip fed the phone his last two quarters. I need to get the script back before she reads it. There's a correction. I, This isn't about tits, is it? Eden said Julia had a problem with too many tits. I wouldn't worry about that. Generally, there's no such thing as too many. Julia's having a really intense week. Please deposit an additional thirty cents now. You what, Doug said, for the next two minutes now. Most obvious place you, or your call will be terminated now. Doug, Chip said, Doug, I missed that. We're sorry. Yeah, I'm here. I'm saying, why don't you? Goodbye, the company voice said and the phone went dead, the wasted quarters clanking in its gut. The text on its faceplate had baby bell coloration, but it read, Orphic Telecom, three minutes, twenty-five cents, each additional minute, forty cents. The most obvious place to look for Eden was at her office in Tribeca. Chip stepped up to the bar, wondering if the new bartender a streaky blonde who looked like she might front the kind of band that played at proms, remembered him well enough from the night before to take his driver's license as surety on a twenty-buck loan. She and two unrelated drinkers were watching murky football somewhere, nittany lion action, brown squiggling figures in a chalky pond. And near Chip's arm, oh, not six inches away, was a nest of singles, just lying there. He considered how a tacit transaction, pocketing the cash, never showing his face in here again, anonymously mailing reimbursement to the woman later, might be safer than asking for a loan, might be, indeed, the transgression that saved his sanity. He crumpled the cash into a ball and moved closer to the really rather pretty bartender, but the struggling brown, round-headed men continued to hold her gaze, and so he turned and left the tavern. In the back of the cab, watching the wet businesses drift by, he stuffed licorice into his mouth. If he couldn't get Julia back, he wanted, in the worst way, to have sex with the bartender, who looked about thirty-nine herself. He wanted to fill his hands with her smoky hair. He imagined that she lived in a rehabbed tenement on East Fifth. He imagined that she drank a beer at bedtime and slept in faded sleeveless tops and gym shorts, that her posture was weary, her navel unassumingly pierced, her pussy like a seasoned baseball glove, her toenails painted the plainest basic red. He wanted to feel her legs across his back. He wanted to hear the story of her forty-odd years. He wondered if she really might sing rock and roll at weddings and bar mitzvahs. Through the window of the cab he read Gap Athletic as Gal Pathetic. He read Empire Realty as Vampire Reality. He was half in love with a person he could never see again. He'd stolen nine dollars from a hard-working woman who enjoyed college football. Even if he went back later and reimbursed her and apologized, he would always be the man who ripped her off when her back was turned. She was gone from his life forever. He could never run his fingers through her hair, and it was not a good sign that this latest loss was making him hyperventilate, that he was too wrecked by pain to swallow more licorice. He read cross pens as 
cross penises. He read alterations as altercations. An optometrist's window offered heads examined. The problem was money and the indignities of life without it. Every stroller, cell phone, Yankee's cap, and SUV he saw was a torment. He wasn't covetous. He wasn't envious. But without money, he was hardly a man. How he'd changed since D College fired him. He no longer wanted to live in a different world. He just wanted to be a man with dignity in this world. And maybe Doug was right. Maybe the breasts in his script didn't matter. But he finally understood, he finally got it, that he could simply cut the opening theoretical monologue in its entirety. He could do this correction in ten minutes at Eaton's office. In front of her building, he gave the cabbie all nine stolen dollars. Around the corner, a six-trailer crew was filming on a cobbled street, cleags ablaze, generators stinking in the rain. Chip knew the security codes to Eden's building, and the elevator was unlocked. He prayed that Eden hadn't read the script yet. The newly corrected version in his head was the one true script, but the old opening monologue still unhappily existed on the ivory bond paper of the copy Eden had. Through the glass outer door on the fifth floor, he saw lights in Eden's office. That his socks were soaked and his jacket smelled like a wet cow at the seashore, and he had no way to dry his hands or hair was certainly unpleasant. But he was still enjoying not having two pounds of Norwegian salmon in his pants. By comparison, he felt fairly well put together. He knocked on the glass until Eden emerged from her office and peered out at him. Eden had high cheekbones and big, watery blue eyes and thin, translucent skin. Any extra calories she ate at lunch in L.A. or drank as martinis in Manhattan got burned on her home treadmill or at her private swim club or in the general madness of being Eden Procuro. She was ordinarily electric and flaming, a bundle of hot copper wire. But her expression now, as she approached the door, was tentative or flustered. She kept looking back at her office. Chip gestured that he wanted in. She's not here, Eden said through the glass. Chip gestured again. Eden opened the door and put her hand on her heart. Chip, I'm so sorry about you and Julia. I'm looking for my script. Have you read it? I... very hastily. I need to read it again, need to take some notes. Eden made a scribbling motion near her temple and laughed. That opening monologue, Chip said, I've cut it. Oh, good. I love a willingness to cut. Love it, she looked back at her office. Do you think, though, that without the monologue, Chip, do you need money? Eden smiled up at him with such odd, merry frankness that he felt as if he'd caught her drunk or with her pants down. Well, I'm not flat broke, he said. No, no, of course, but still. Why? And how are you with the web, she said. Do you know any Java, HTML? God, no. Well, just come back to my office for a second, do you mind? Come on back. Chip followed Eden past Julia's desk, where the only visible Julian artifact was a stuffed toy frog on the computer monitor. Now that you two have broken up, Eden said, there's really no reason you can't... Eden, it's not a breakup. No, no, trust me, it's over, Eden said. It is absolutely over. And I'm thinking you might enjoy a little change of scenery so you can start getting over it. Eden, listen, Julia and I are having a momentary... No, Chip, sorry, not momentary, permanent. Eden laughed again. Julia may not be blunt, but I am, and so, when I think about it, there's really no reason for you not to meet... She led Chip into her office. Gitanas, incredible stroke of luck here. I have here the perfect man for the job. Reclining in a chair by Eden's desk was a man about Chip's age in a red-ribbed leather jacket and tight white jeans. His face was broad and baby-cheeked, his hair a sculpted blonde shell. Eden was practically climaxing with enthusiasm. Here I've been racking my brain, Gitanas. I can't think of anyone to help you, and probably the best qualified man in New York City is knocking at the door. Chip Lambert, you know my assistant, Julia? She winked at Chip. Well, this is Julia's husband, Gitanas Misevicius. 
in almost every respect. Coloration, shape of head, height and build, and especially the wary, shame-faced smile that he was wearing, Gitanas looked more like Chip than anybody Chip could remember meeting. He was like Chip with bad posture and crooked teeth. He nodded nervously without standing up or extending a hand. How's it going? he said. It was safe to say, Chip thought, that Julia had a type. Eden patted the seat of an unoccupied chair. Sit, 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 she told him. Her daughter, April, was on the leather sofa by the windows with a mess of crayons and a sheaf of paper. April, hey, Chip said, how are those desserts? The question seemed not to April's liking. She'll try those tonight, Eden said. Somebody was testing limits last night. I was not testing limits, April said. The paper on April's lap was ivory-colored and had text on its reverse. Sit, sit, Eden exhorted as she retreated to her birch laminate desk. The big window behind her was lensed with rain. There was fog on the Hudson, blackish smudges suggestive of New Jersey. Eden's trophies on the walls were movie ad images of Kevin Klein, Chloe Sevigny, Matt Damon, Winona Ryder. Chip Lambert, she told Gitanas, is a brilliant writer with a script in development with me right now, and he's got a Ph.D. in English, and for the last two years he's been working with my husband doing mergers and acquisitions, and he's brilliant with all the Internet stuff. We were just now talking about Java and HTML, and as you see, he cuts a very impressive... Uh... Here Eden, for the first time, actually gave her attention to Chip's appearance. Her eyes widened. It must be raining cats and dogs out there. Chip's not, well, ordinarily quite so wet. My dear, you are very wet. In all honesty, Gitanas, you won't find a better man, and Chip, I'm just... Delighted that you came by, although you are very wet. A man by himself could weather Eden's enthusiasm, but two men together had to gaze at the floor to preserve their dignity in the face of it. I, unfortunately, Eden said, am slightly pressed for time, Gitanas having dropped in somewhat unexpectedly. What I would love is if the two of you could go and use my conference room and work things out and take as long as you like. Gitanas crossed his arms in a wound-up European style, his fists jammed in his armpits. He didn't look at Chip, but asked him, Are you an actor? No. Well, Chip, Eden said, that's not strictly true. Yes, it is. I've never acted in my life. Ha, 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 Eden said. Chip is being modest. Gitanas shook his head and looked at the ceiling. April's sheaf of paper was definitely a screenplay. What are we talking about? Chip said. Gitanas is looking to hire someone, an American actor, Gitanas said with disgust, to do a uh, corporate PR for him. And for more than an hour now, Eden glanced at her watch and let her eyes and mouth distend in exaggerated shock. I've been trying to explain that the actors I work with are more interested in film and stage than in, say, international investment schemes and tend also to have wildly inflated notions of their own literacy. And what I'm trying to explain to Gitanas is that you, Chip, not only have an excellent command of language and jargon, but you don't have to pretend to be an investment expert. You are an investment expert. I'm a part-time legal proofreader, Chip said. An expert in the language, a gifted screenwriter. Chip and Gitanas traded glances. Something about Chip's person, perhaps the shared physical traits, seemed to interest the Lithuanian. Are you looking for work? Gitana said. Possibly. Are you a drug addict? No. I've got to go to the bathroom, Eden said. April, honey, come along, bring your drawings. April obediently hopped off the sofa and went to Eden. Bring your drawings, though, honey. Here, Eden gathered up the ivory pages and led April to the door. You men talk. Gitanas put a hand to his face and squeezed his round cheeks, scratched his blonde stubble. He looked out the window. You're in government, Chip said. Gitanas tilted his head. Yes and no, 
I was for many years, but my party is kaput. I'm an entrepreneur now, sort of a governmental entrepreneur, let's say. One of April's drawings had fallen to the floor between the window and the sofa. Chip extended a toe and pulled the page toward him. We have so many elections, Gitana said. Nobody reports them internationally anymore. We have three or four elections a year. Elections are our biggest industry. We have the highest annual per capita output of elections of any country in the world. Higher than Italy, even. April had drawn a portrait of a man with a regular body of sticks and blobs and oblongs, but for a head he had a black and blue snarled vortex, a ratty scrabble, a scribbled mess. Through the ivory bond, Chip could see faint blocks of dialogue and action on the other side. Do you believe in America? Gitana said. Jesus, where to begin? Chip said. Your country, which saved us, also ruined us. With his toe, Chip lifted one corner of April's drawing and identified the words. Mona, cradling the revolver. What's wrong with being in love with myself? Why is that a problem? But the page had grown very heavy, or his toe very weak. He let the page lie flat again. He pushed it underneath the sofa. His extremities had gone cool and a little bit numb. He couldn't see well. Russia went bankrupt in August, Gitana said. Maybe you heard? Unlike our elections, this was widely reported. This was economic news. This mattered to the investor. It also mattered to Lithuania. Our main trading partner now has crippling hard currency debts and a worthless ruble. One guess which they use, dollars or rubles, to buy our hen's eggs and to buy our truck undercarriages from our truck undercarriage plant, which is the one good plant we have. Well, it would be rubles, but the rest of the truck is made in Volgograd, and that plant closed, so we can't even get rubles. Chip was having trouble feeling disappointed about the Academy, purple, never to look at the script again, never to show it to a soul, this might be a relief even greater than his relief in the men's room of Finelli's where he'd taken the salmon from his pants. From an enchantment of breasts and hyphens and one-inch margins, he felt himself awakening to a rich and varied world to which he'd been dead for who knew how long, years. I'm interested in what you're telling me, he told Gitanas. It's interesting. It is interesting. Gitanas agreed, still hugging himself tensely. Brodsky said, fresh fish always smells, frozen smells only when it thaws. So, and after the big thaw, when all the little fish came out of the freezer, we were passionate about this and that. I was part of it, very much part of it, but the economy was mismanaged. I had my fun in New York, but back home there was a depression, all right. Then, too late, 1995... We pegged the litas to the dollar and started privatizing way too fast. It wasn't my decision, but I might have done the same. The World Bank had money that we wanted, and the World Bank said privatize. So, okay, we sold the port. We sold the airline, sold the phone system. The highest bidder was usually American, sometimes Western European. This wasn't supposed to happen, but it did. Nobody in Vilnius had cash, and the phone company said, OK, we'll have foreign owners with deep pockets, but the port and the airline will still be a hundred percent Lithuanian. Well, the port and the airline were thinking the same. But still it was OK. Capital was flowing, better cuts of meat at the butcher, fewer brownouts. Even the weather seemed milder. Mostly criminals took the hard currency, but that's post-Soviet reality. After the thaw, you get the rot. Brodsky didn't live to see that. So, okay. But then all the world economies started collapsing. Thailand, Brazil, Korea. And this was a problem because all the capital ran home to the U.S. We found out, for example, that our national airline was 64% owned by the Quad Cities Fund, which is a no-load growth fund managed by a young guy named Dale Myers. You never heard of Dale Myers, but every adult citizen of Lithuania knows his name. This tale of failure seemed to amuse Gitanas greatly. It had been a long time since Chip had had such a powerful sensation of liking somebody. 
His queer friends at D College and the Warren Street Journal were so frank and headlong in their confidences that they foreclosed actual closeness, and his responses to straight men had long fallen into one of two categories, fear and resentment of the successes, flight from the contagion of the failures. But something in Gitanus's tone appealed to him. Dale Myers lives in eastern Iowa, Gitanus said. Dale Myers has two assistants, a big computer, and a three billion dollar portfolio. Dale Myers says he didn't mean to acquire a controlling stake in our national airline. Dale says it was program trading. He says one of his assistants misentered data that caused the computer to keep increasing its position in Lithuanian airlines without reporting the overall size of the accumulated stake. Okay, Dale apologizes to all Lithuanians for the oversight. Dale says he understands the importance of an airline to a country's economy and self-esteem. But because of the crisis in Russia and the Baltics, nobody wants tickets on Lithuanian airlines. So, and American investors are pulling money out of Quad Cities. Dale's only way to meet his obligations is liquidate Lithuanian Airlines' biggest asset, which is its fleet. He's going to sell three Yak-40s to a Miami-based air freight company. He's going to sell six Aerospatial turboprops to a startup commuter airline in Nova Scotia. In fact, he already did that yesterday. So, whoops, no airline. Ouch, Chip said. Gitanas nodded fiercely. Yeah, yeah, ouch. Too bad you can't fly a truck undercarriage. Okay, and then? Then an American conglomerate called Orphic Midland liquidates the port of Kaunas. Again, overnight. Whoops, ouch. And then 60% of the Bank of Lithuania gets eaten up by a suburban bank in Atlanta, Georgia. And your suburban bank then liquidates our bank's hard currency reserves. Your bank doubles our country's commercial interest rates overnight. Why? To cover heavy losses in its failed line of Dilbert Affinity Mastercards. Ouch, ouch. But interesting, huh? Lithuania is not being such a successful player, is it? Lithuania really fucked things up. How are you men doing? Eden said, returning to her office with April in tow. Maybe you want to use the conference room? Gitanas put a briefcase on his lap and opened it. I'm explaining to Cheap my gripe with America. April, sweetie, sit down here, Eden said. She had a big pad of newsprint, which she opened on the floor near the door. This is better paper for you. You can make big pictures now, like me, like Mommy. Make a big picture. April crouched in the middle of the newsprint pad and drew a green circle around herself. We've petitioned the IMF and the World Bank for assistance, Gitana said, since they encouraged us to privatize. Maybe they're interested in the fact that our privatized nation-state is now a zone of semi-anarchy, criminal warlords, and subsistence farming. Unfortunately, IMF is handling complaints of bankrupt client states in order of the size of their respective GDPs. Lithuania was 26 on the list last Monday. Now we're 28. Paraguay just beat us. Always Paraguay. Ouch, Chip said. Paraguay being, for some reason, the bane of my existence. Gitanas, I told you Chip is perfect. Eden said, but listen, IMF says expect delays of up to 36 months before any rescue can begin. Eden slumped into her chair. Do you think we can wrap this up fairly soon? Gitanas showed Chip a printout from his briefcase. You see here this web page? A service of the U.S. Department of State, Bureau of European and Canadian Affairs. It says Lithuanian economy severely depressed Unemployment nearly 20%, electricity and running water intermittent in Vilnius, scarce elsewhere. What kind of businessman is going to put money in a country like that? A Lithuanian businessman? Chip said. Yes, funny. Gitanas gave him an appreciative look. But what if I need something different on this web page and others like it? What if I need to erase what's here? and put in good American English that our country escaped the Russian financial plague. Like, say, Lithuania now has an annual inflation rate less than 6% per capita dollar reserves, same as Germany, and a trade surplus of nearly $100 million due to continued strong demand for Lithuania's natural resources. 
Chip, you'd be perfect for this, Eden said. Chip had quietly and firmly resolved never to look at Eden or say a word to her again for as long as he lived. What are Lithuania's natural resources? he asked Gitanas. Chiefly sand and gravel, Gitanas said. Huge strategic reserves of sand and gravel. Okay. Sand and gravel in abundance. Gitanas closed his briefcase. However, so here's a quiz for you. Why the unprecedented demand for these intriguing resources? A construction boom in nearby Latvia and Finland? In sand-starved Latvia? In gravel-starved Finland? And how did these countries escape the contagion of global financial collapse? Latvia has strong, stable democratic institutions, Chip said. It's the financial nerve center of the Baltics. Finland placed strict limits on the outflow of short-term foreign capital and succeeded in saving its world-class furniture industry. The Lithuanian nodded, obviously pleased. Eden pounded her fists on her desk. God, Gitanas, Chip's fantastic. He is so entitled to a signing bonus. Also, first-class accommodations in Vilnius and a per diem in dollars. Vilnius? Chip said. Yeah, we're selling a country, Gitana said. We need a satisfied U.S. customer on site. Also, much, much safer to work on the web over there. Chip laughed. You actually expect American investors to send you money? On the basis of what, of sand shortages in Latvia? They're already sending me money, Gitana said, on the basis of a little joke I played. Not even sand and gravel, just a mean little joke I played. Tens of thousands of dollars already. But I want them to send me millions. Gitanas, Eden said, dear man, this is completely a point incentive moment. There could not be a more perfect situation for an escalator clause. Every time Chip doubles your receipts, you give him another point of the action. Hmm? Hmm? If I see a hundred times increase in receipts, trust me. Cheap will be a wealthy man. But I'm saying let's have this in writing. Gitanas caught Chip's eye and silently conveyed to him his opinion of their host. Eden, this document, he said. What is Cheap's job designation? International wire fraud consultant? First deputy co-conspirator? Vice president for willful, tortious misrepresentation, Chip offered. Eden gave her a scream of pleasure. I love it. Mommy, look, April said. Our agreement is strictly oral, Kitana said. Of course, there's nothing actually illegal about what you're doing, Eden said. Kitana answered her question by staring out the window for a longish while. In his red-ribbed jacket, he looked like a motocross rider. Of course not, he said. So it isn't wire fraud, Eden said. No, no, wire fraud? No. Because, not to be a scaredy cat here, but wire fraud is what this almost sounds like. The collective fungible assets of my country disappeared in yours without a ripple, Kitana said. A rich, powerful country made the rules we Lithuanians are dying by. Why should we respect these rules? This is an essential Foucauldian question, Chip said. It's also a Robin Hood question, Eden said, which doesn't exactly reassure me on the legal front. I'm offering cheap $500 American a week. Also bonuses as I see fit. Cheap, are you interested? I can do better here in town, Chip said. Try a thousand a day, minimum, Eden said. A dollar goes a long way in Vilnius. Oh, I'm sure, Eden said. It goes a long way on the moon, too. What's to buy? Cheap, Gitana said. Tell Eden what dollars can buy in a poor country. I imagine you eat and drink pretty well, Chip said. A country where a young generation grew up in a state of moral anarchy and are hungry. Probably not hard to find a good-looking date, if that's what you mean. If it doesn't break your heart, Gitana said, to see a sweet little girl from the provinces get down on her knees. Ah, Gitanas, Eden said. There's a child in the room. I'm on an island, 
April said. Mommy, look at my island. I'm talking about children, Kitana said. Fifteen-year-olds. You have dollars? Thirteen. Twelve. Twelve years old is not a selling point with me, Chip said. You prefer nineteen? Nineteen comes even cheaper. This, frankly, um, Eden said, flapping her hands, I want Chip to understand why a dollar is a lot of money, why my offer is a valid offer. My problem, Chip said, is I'd be servicing American debts with those very same dollars. Believe me, we're familiar with this problem in Lithuania. Chip wants a base salary of a thousand a day, plus performance incentives, Eden said. One thousand per week, Kitana said, for lending legitimacy to my project, for creative work and reassuring callers. One percent of gross, Eden said, one point minus his twenty thousand dollar monthly salary. Gitanas, ignoring her, took a thick envelope from his jacket and with hands that were stubby and unmanicured began to count out hundreds. April was crouched in a patch of white newsprint surrounded by toothed monsters and cruel scribbles in several colors. Gitanas tossed a stack of hundreds on Eden's desk. Three thousand, he said, for the first three weeks. He gets business class plane fare, too, of course, Eden said. Yes, all right. And first class accommodations in Vilnius. There's a room in the villa, no problem. Also, who protects him from these criminal warlords? Maybe I'm a criminal warlord myself a little bit, Kitana said with a wary, shamefaced smile. Chip considered the mess of green on Eden's desk. Something was giving him a hard-on. Possibly the cash. Possibly the vision of corrupt and sumptuous nineteen-year-olds. Or maybe just the prospect of getting on a plane and putting five thousand miles between himself and the nightmare of his life in New York City. What made drugs perpetually so sexy was the opportunity to be other. Years after he'd figured out that pot only made him paranoid and sleepless, he still got hard-ons at the thought of smoking it, still lusted for that jailbreak. He touched the hundreds. Why don't I get online and make plane reservations for you both? Eden said. You can leave right away. So, you gonna do this thing? Kitana asked. It's a lot of work, a lot of fun, pretty low risk. No such thing as no risk, though. Not where there's money. I... Understand, Chip said, touching the hundreds. In the pageantry of weddings, Enid reliably experienced the paroxysmal love of place, of the Midwest in general and suburban St. Jude in particular. That, for her, was the only true patriotism and the only viable spirituality. Living under presidents as crooked as Nixon and stupid as Reagan and disgusting as Clinton, she'd lost interest in American flag-waving, and not one of the miracles she'd ever prayed to God for had come to pass. But at a Saturday wedding in a lilac season, from a pew of the Paradise Valley Presbyterian Church, she could look around and see two hundred nice people and not a single bad one. All her friends were nice and had nice friends, and since nice people tended to raise nice children, Enid's world was like a lawn in which the blue grass grew so thick that evil was simply choked out, a miracle of niceness. If, for example, it was one of Esther and Kirby Root's girls coming down the Presbyterian aisle on Kirby's arm, Enid would remember how the little Root had trick-or-treated in a ballerina costume, vended Girl Scout cookies, and babysat Denise, and how, even after the Root girls had gone off to good Midwestern colleges, they all still made a point when home on holiday of tapping on Enid's back door and filling her in on the doings Shea Root often sitting and visiting for an hour or more, and not Enid knew because Esther had told them to come over, but just because they were good St. Jude kids who naturally took an interest in other people. And Enid's heart would swell at the sight of yet another sweetly charitable root girl now receiving as her reward the vows of a young man with a neat haircut of the kind you saw in ads for menswear a really super young fellow who had an upbeat attitude and was polite to older people and didn't believe in premarital sex, 
and who had a job that contributed to society, such as electrical engineer or environmental biologist, and who came from a loving, stable, traditional family and wanted to start a loving, stable, traditional family of his own. Unless Enid was very much deceived by appearances, young men of this caliber continued, even as the twentieth century drew to a close, to be the norm in suburban St. Jude. All the young fellows she'd known as Cub Scouts and users of her downstairs bathroom and shovelers of her snow, the many driplet boys, the various persons, the young Schumpert twins, all these clean-cut and handsome young men whom Denise, as a teenager, to Enid's quiet rage, had dismissed with her look of amusement, had marched or would soon be marching down heartland Protestant aisles and exchanging vows with nice, normal girls and settling down, if not in St. Jude itself, then at least in the same time zone. Now, in her secret heart, where she was less different from her daughter than she liked to admit, Enid knew that tuxes came in better colors than powder blue, and that bridesmaids' dresses could be cut from more interesting fabrics than mauve crepe de chine, and yet, although honesty compelled her to withhold the adjective elegant from weddings in this style, there was a louder and happier part of her heart that loved this kind of wedding best of all, because a lack of sophistication assured the assembled guests that for the two families being joined together, there were values that mattered more than style. Enid believed in matching and was happiest at a wedding where the bridesmaids suppressed their selfish individual desires and wore dresses that matched the corsages and cocktail napkins, the icing on the cake, and the ribbons on the party favors. She liked a ceremony at Chiltsville Methodist to be followed by a modest reception at the Chiltsville Sheraton. She liked a more elegant wedding at Paradise Valley Presbyterian to culminate in the clubhouse at Deepmire, where even the complimentary matches, Dean and Trish, June 13, 1987, matched the color scheme. Most important of all was that the bride and groom themselves match, have similar backgrounds and ages and educations. Sometimes at a wedding hosted by less good friends of Enid's, the bride would be heavier or significantly older than the groom, or the groom's family would hail from a farm town upstate and be obviously overawed by Deepmire's elegance. Enid felt sorry for the principals at a reception like that. She just knew the marriage was going to be a struggle from day one. More typically, though, the only discordant note at Deepmire would be an off-color toast, offered by some secondary groomsman, often a college buddy of the groom, often mustached or weak-chinned, invariably flushed with liquor, who sounded as if he didn't come from the Midwest at all, but from some more eastern, urban place, and who tried to show off by making a humorous reference to premarital sex, causing both groom and bride to blush, or to laugh with their eyes closed. Not, Enid felt, because they were amused, but because they were naturally tactful and didn't want the offender to realize how offensive his remark was. While Alfred inclined his head deftly, and Enid cast her eye around the room until she found a friend with whom she could exchange a reassuring frown. Alfred loved weddings, too. They seemed to him the one kind of party that had a real purpose— under their spell, he authorized purchases, a new dress for Enid, a new suit for himself, a top-quality ten-piece teakwood salad bowl set for a gift, that he ordinarily would have vetoed as unreasonable. Enid had looked forward, some day when Denise was older and had finished college, to hosting a really elegant wedding and reception, though not, alas, at Dietmeyer, since almost alone among their better friends the Lamberts could not afford the astronomical Dietmeyer fees, for Denise and a tall, broad-shouldered, possibly Scandinavian young man whose flaxen hair would offset the defect of the two dark and too curly hair Denise had inherited from Enid, but who would otherwise be her match. And so it just about broke Enid's heart when, one October night, not three weeks after Chuck Meisner had given his daughter Cindy the most lavish reception ever undertaken at Dietmeyer, with all the men in tails and a champagne fountain and a helicopter on the 18th fairway and a brass octet playing fanfares, 
Denise called home with the news that she and her boss had driven to Atlantic City and gotten married in a courthouse. Enid, who had a very strong stomach, never got sick, never, had to hand the phone to Alfred and go kneel in the bathroom and take deep breaths. The previous spring in Philadelphia, she and Alfred had eaten a late lunch at the noisy restaurant where Denise was ruining her hands and wasting her youth. After their lunch, which was quite good but much too rich, Denise had made a point of introducing them to the chef under whom she'd studied and for whom she was now boiling and toiling. This chef, Emile Berger, was a short, unsmiling, middle-aged Jew from Montreal whose idea of dressing for work was to wear an old white T-shirt, like a cook, not a chef, Enid thought, no jacket, no toque, and whose idea of shaving was to skip it. Enid would have disliked Emile and snubbed him even if she hadn't gathered, from Denise's way of hanging on his words, that he had an unhealthy degree of influence with her daughter. Those are such rich crab cakes, she accused in the kitchen. One bite and I was stuffed. To which, instead of apologizing and deprecating himself, as any polite St. Judean would have done, Emile responded by agreeing that, yes, if it could be managed and the flavor was good, a light crab cake would be a wonderful thing. But the question, Mrs. Lambert, was how to manage it, eh? How to make crab meat light. Denise was following this exchange hungrily, as if she'd scripted it or were memorizing it. Outside the restaurant, before she returned to her fourteen-hour shift, Enid made sure to say to her, He certainly is a short little man, so Jewish-looking. Her tone was less controlled than she might have wished, a little squeakier and thinner at the edges, and she could tell from the distant look in Denise's eyes and from a bitterness around her mouth that she'd bruised her daughter's feelings. Then again, all she'd done was speak the truth, and she never, not for a second, imagined that Denise, who no matter how immature and romantic she was, and no matter how impractical her career plans, had just turned twenty-three and had a beautiful face and figure and her whole life ahead of her, would actually date a person like Emile. As to what exactly a young woman was supposed to do with her physical charms while she waited for the maturing years to pass, now that girls no longer got married quite so young, Enid was, to be sure, somewhat vague. In a general way, she believed in socializing in groups of three or more, believed, in a word, in parties. The one thing she knew categorically, the principle she embraced, the more passionately the more it was ridiculed in the media and popular entertainments, was that sex before marriage was immoral. And yet, on that October night, as she knelt on the bathroom floor, Enid had the heretical thought that it might after all have been wiser in her maternal homilies to have laid less stress on marriage. It occurred to her that Denise's rash act might even have been prompted, in some tiny part, by her wish to do the moral thing and please her mother like a toothbrush in the toilet bowl, like a dead cricket in a salad, like a diaper on the dinner table, this sickening conundrum confronted Enid, that it might actually have been preferable for Denise to go ahead and commit adultery, better to sully herself with a momentary selfish pleasure, better to waste a purity that every decent young man had the right to expect from a prospective bride, than to marry Emile. Except that Denise should never have been attracted to Emile in the first place. It was the same problem Enid had with Chip and even Gary. Her children didn't match. They didn't want the things that she and all her friends and all her friends' children wanted. Her children wanted radically, shamefully other things. While observing peripherally that the bathroom carpet was more spotted than she'd realized and ought to be replaced before the holidays, Enid listened to Alfred offering to send Denise a pair of plane tickets. She was struck by the seeming calm with which Alfred took the news that his only daughter had made the biggest decision of her life without consulting him. But after he'd hung up the phone and she'd come out of the bathroom and he'd commented simply that life was full of surprises, she noticed how strangely his hands were shaking. The tremor was at once looser and more intense than the one he sometimes got from drinking coffee. And during the week that followed while Enid made the best of the mortifying position in which Denise had placed her by, one, 
calling her best friends, and sounding thrilled to announce that Denise was getting married soon to a very nice Canadian man, yes, but she wanted immediate family only at the ceremony, so, and she was introducing her new husband at a simple, informal open house at Christmas time. None of Enid's friends believed that she was thrilled, but they gave her full credit for trying to hide her suffering. Some were even sensitive enough not to ask where Denise had registered for gifts. And two, ordering, without Denise's permission, two hundred engraved announcements, not only to make the wedding appear more conventional, but also to shake the gift tree a little in hopes of receiving compensation for the dozens and dozens of teakwood salad sets that she and Alfred had given in the last twenty years. During this long week, Enid was so continually aware of Alfred's strange new tremor that when, by and by, he agreed to see his doctor and was referred to Dr. Hedgepeth and diagnosed with Parkinson's, an underground branch of her intelligence persisted in connecting his disease with Denise's announcement, and so in blaming her daughter for the subsequent plummeting of her own quality of life, even though Dr. Hedgepeth had stressed that Parkinson's was somatic in origin and gradual in its onset. By the time the holidays rolled around, and Dr. Hedgepeth had provided her and Alfred with pamphlets and booklets whose drab doctor's office color schemes, dismal line drawings, and frightening medical photos presaged a drab and dismal and frightening future, Enid was pretty well convinced that Denise and Emile had ruined her life. She was under strict orders from Alfred, however, to make Emile feel welcome in the family. So, at the open house for the newlyweds, she painted a smile on her face and accepted over and over the sincere congratulations of old family friends who loved Denise and thought she was darling, because Enid, in raising her, had emphasized the importance of being kind to her elders, although what was her marriage if not an instance of excessive kindness to an elder? Where she would have much preferred condolences. The effort she made to be a good sport and cheerleader, to obey Alfred and receive her middle-aged son-in-law cordially and not say one single word about his religion, only added to the shame and anger she felt five years later when Denise and Emil were divorced, and Enid had to give this news, too, to all her friends. Having attached so much meaning to the marriage, having struggled so hard to accept it, she felt that the least Denise could have done was stay married. Do you ever hear from Emil any more? Enid asked. Denise was drying dishes in Chip's kitchen. Occasionally. Enid had parked herself at the dining table to clip coupons from the magazines she'd taken from her Nordic Pleasure Line's shoulder bag. Rain was coming down erratically in gusts that slapped and fogged the windows. Alfred was sitting on Chip's chaise with his eyes closed. I was just thinking, Enid said, that even if things had worked out and you'd stayed married, you know, Denise, Emile's going to be an old man in not too many years, and that's so much work. You can't imagine what a huge responsibility. In twenty-five years he'll be younger than Dad is now, Denise said. I don't know if I ever told you, Enid said, about my high school friend Norma Green. You tell me about Norma Green literally every time I see you. Well, you know the story, then. Norma met this man, Floyd Voinovich, who was a perfect gentleman, quite a number of years older, with a high-paying job, and he swept her off her feet. He was always taking her to Morelli's and the steamer and the Bazelon room, and the only problem, mother, the only problem, Enid insisted, was that he was married. But Norma wasn't supposed to worry about that. Floyd said the whole arrangement was temporary. He said he'd made a bad mistake. He had a terrible marriage. He'd never loved his wife, mother, and he was going to divorce her. Enid let her eyes fall shut in raconturial pleasure. She was aware that Denise didn't like this story, but there were plenty of things about Denise's life that were disagreeable to Enid, too. So, well, this went on for years. Floyd was very smooth and charming, and he could afford to do things for Norma that a man closer to her own age couldn't have. Norma developed a real taste for luxuries, and then, too, she'd met Floyd at an age when a girl falls head over heels in love, and Floyd had sworn up and down that he was going to divorce his wife and marry Norma. 
Well, by then, Dad and I were married and had Gary. I remember Norma came over once when Gary was a baby, and she just wanted to hold him and hold him. She loved little children. Oh, she just loved holding Gary. And I felt terrible for her, because by then she'd been seeing Floyd for years, and he was still not divorced. I said, Norma, you can't wait forever. She said she'd tried to stop seeing Floyd. She'd gone on dates with other men, but they were younger and they didn't seem mature to her. Floyd was fifteen years older and very mature, and I do understand how an older man has a maturity that can make him attractive to a younger woman. Mother! And, of course, these younger men couldn't always afford to be taking Norma to fancy places or buying her flowers and gifts like Floyd did, because, see, he could really turn on the charm when she got impatient with him. And then, too, a lot of those younger men were interested in starting families, and Norma wasn't so young anymore, Denise said. I brought some dessert. Are you ready for dessert? Well, you know what happened? Yes. It's a heartbreaking story, because Norma... Yes, I know the story. Norma found herself... Mother, I know the story. You seem to think it has some bearing on my own situation. Denise, I don't. You've never even told me what your situation is. Then why do you keep telling me the story of Norma Green? I don't see why it upsets you if it has nothing to do with your own situation. What upsets me is that you seem to think it does. Are you under the impression that I'm involved with a married man? Enid was not only under this impression, but was suddenly so angry about it, so clotted with disapproval, that she had difficulty breathing. Finally, finally going to get rid of some of these magazines, she said, snapping the glossy pages. Mother, it's better not to talk about this. Just like the Navy. Don't ask, don't tell. Denise stood in the kitchen doorway with her arms crossed and a dish towel balled up in her hand. Where did you get the idea that I'm involved with a married man? Enid snapped another page. Did Gary say something to give you that idea? Enid struggled to shake her head. Denise would be furious if she found out that Gary had betrayed a confidence, and though Enid spent much of her own life furious with Gary about one thing or another, she prided herself on keeping secrets. And she didn't want to get him in trouble. It was true that she'd been brooding about Denise's situation for many months and had accumulated large stores of anger. She'd ironed at the ironing board and raked the ivy beds and lain awake at night rehearsing the judgments. That is the kind of grossly selfish behavior that I will never understand and never forgive. And I'm ashamed to be the parent of a person who would live like that. And in a situation like this, Denise, my sympathies are one thousand percent with the wife. One thousand percent. That she yearned to pronounce on Denise's immoral lifestyle. And now she had an opportunity to pronounce these judgments. And yet, if Denise denied the charges... And all of Enid's anger, all of her refining and rehearsal of her judgments, would go wasted. And if, on the other hand, Denise admitted everything, it might still be wiser for Enid to swallow her pent-up judgments than to risk a fight. Enid needed Denise as an ally on the Christmas front. And she didn't want to set off on a luxury cruise with one son having vanished inexplicably, another son blaming her for betraying his trust, and her daughter perhaps confirming her worst fears. With great humbling effort, she therefore shook her head. No, no, no. Gary never said a thing. Denise narrowed her eyes. Never said a thing about what? Denise, Alfred said, let her be. And Denise, who obeyed Enid in nothing, promptly turned and went back into the kitchen. Enid found a coupon offering sixty cents off, I can't believe it's not butter with any purchase of Thomas's English muffins. Her scissors cut the paper, and with it, the silence that had fallen. If I do one thing on this cruise, she said, I'm going to get through all these magazines. No sign of chiff, Alfred said. Denise brought slices of tart on dessert plates to the dining table. I'm afraid we may have seen the last of Chip today. It's very peculiar, Enid said. I don't understand why he doesn't at least call. I've endured worse, Alfred said. Dad, there's dessert. My pastry chef made a pear tart. Do you want to have it at the table? Oh, that's much too big a piece for me, Enid said. Dad? Alfred didn't answer. His mouth had gone slack and sour again in the way that made Enid feel that something terrible was going to happen. 
He turned to the darkening, rain-spotted windows and gazed at them dully, his head hanging low. Dad? Al? There's dessert. Something seemed to melt in him. Still looking at the window, he raised his head with a tentative joy, as if he thought he recognized someone outside, someone he loved. Al? What is it? Dad? They're children, he said, sitting up straighter. You see them? He raised a trembling index finger. There. His finger moved laterally, following the motion of the children he saw. And there, and there. He turned to Enid and Denise, as if he expected them to be overjoyed to hear this news, but Enid was not the least bit overjoyed. She was about to embark on a very elegant fall color cruise on which it would be extremely important that Alfred not make mistakes like this. Al, those are sunflowers, she said, half angry, half beseeching. You're seeing reflections in the window. Well, he shook his head bluffly. I thought I saw children. No, sunflowers, Enid said. You saw sunflowers. After his party was voted out of power and the Russian currency crisis had finished off the Lithuanian economy, Gitana said he'd passed his days alone in the old offices of the VIPPPAKJRIINPD-17, devoting his idle hours to constructing a website whose domain name, Lithuania.com, he'd purchased from an East Prussian speculator for a truckload of mimeograph machines, daisy-wheel printers, 64-kilobyte Commodore computers, and other Gorbachev-era office equipment, the party's last physical vestiges. To publicize the plight of small debtor nations, Gitanus had created a satiric web page offering Democracy for Profit, Buy a Piece of European History, and had seeded links and references in American news groups and chat rooms for investors. Visitors to the site were invited to send cash to the erstwhile VIPPPAKJRIINPB17, one of Lithuania's most venerable political parties, the cornerstone of the country's governing coalition for three of the last seven years, the leading vote-getter in the April 1993 general election, and now a Western-leaning pro-business party reorganized as the Free Market Party Company. Gitanus's website promised that as soon as the Free Market Party Company had bought enough votes to win a national election, its foreign investors would not only become equity shareholders in Lithuania Incorporated, a for-profit nation-state, but would also be rewarded in proportion to the size of their investment with personalized memorials to their heroic contribution to the market liberation of the country. By sending just $100, for example, an American investor could have a street in Vilnius no less than 200 meters in length named after him. For $5,000, the Free Market Party Company would hang a portrait of the investor, minimum size 60 centimeters by 80 centimeters, includes ornate gilt frame, in the Gallery of National Heroes at the historic Schlappelei House. For $25,000, the investor would be awarded perpetual title to an eponymous town of no fewer than 5,000 souls and be granted a modern hygienic form of droit du seigneur that met most of the guidelines established by the Third International Conference on Human Rights. It was a nasty little joke, Gitana said from the corner of the taxicab into which he'd wedged himself. But who laughed? Nobody laughed. They just sent money. I gave an address and the cashier checks started coming in. Email queries by the hundred. What products would Lithuania Incorporated make? Who were the officers in the free market party company? And did they have a strong track record as managers? Did I have records of past earnings? Could the investor alternatively have a Lithuanian street or village named after his children or his children's favorite Pokemon character? Everybody wanted more information. Everybody wanted brochures and prospectuses, and stock certificates, and brokerage information, and are we listed on such and such exchange, and so forth. People want to come and visit, and nobody is laughing. Chip was tapping on the window with a knuckle and checking out the women on 6th Avenue. 
The rain was letting up, umbrellas coming down. Are the proceeds going to you or to the party? Okay, so my philosophy about that is in transition, Gitana said. From his briefcase he took a bottle of aquavit, from which he'd already poured deal-sealing shots in Eden's office. He rolled sideways and handed it to Chip, who took a healthy pull and gave it back. You were an English teacher, Gitana said. I taught college, yeah. And where are your people from, Scandinavia? My dad's Scandinavian, Chip said. My mom's sort of mongrel Eastern European. People in Vilnius will look at you and think you're one of us. Chip was in a hurry to get to his apartment before his parents left. Now that he had cash in his pocket, a roll of thirty hundreds, he didn't care so much what his parents thought of him. In fact, he seemed to recall that a few hours earlier he'd seen his father trembling and pleading in a doorway. As he drank the aquavit and checked out the women on the sidewalk, he could no longer fathom why the old man had seemed like such a killer. It was true that Alfred believed the only thing wrong with the death penalty was that it wasn't used often enough. True as well that the men whose gassing or electrocution he'd called for over dinner in Chip's childhood were usually black men from the slums on St. Jude's north side. Oh, Al, Enid would say, because dinner was the family meal, and she couldn't understand why they had to spend it talking about gas chambers and slaughter in the streets. And one Sunday morning, after he'd stood at a window counting squirrels and assessing the damage to his oak trees and zoysia the way white men in marginal neighborhoods took stock of how many houses had been lost to the blacks, Alfred had performed an experiment in genocide. Incensed that the squirrels in his not-large front yard lacked the discipline to stop reproducing or pick up after themselves, he went to the basement and found a rat trap over which Enid, as he came upstairs with it, shook her head and made small negative noises. Nineteen of them, Alfred said. Nineteen of them! Emotional appeals were no match for the discipline of such an exact and scientific figure. He baited the trap with a piece of the same whole wheat bread that Chip had eaten, toasted for breakfast. Then all five Lamberts went to church. And between the Gloria Patri and the doxology, a young male squirrel, engaging in the high-risk behavior of the economically desperate, helped itself to the bread and had its skull crushed. The family came home to find green flies feasting on the blood and brain matter and chewed whole wheat bread that had erupted through the young squirrel's shattered jaws. Alfred's own mouth and chin... were sewn up in the distaste that special exertions of discipline, the spanking of a child, the eating of rutabaga, always caused him. He was quite unconscious of this distaste he betrayed for discipline. He fetched a shovel from the garage and loaded both the trap and the squirrel corpse into the paper grocery bag that Enid had half filled with pulled crabgrass the day before. Chip was following all this from about twenty steps behind him and so he saw how, when Alfred entered the basement from the garage, his legs buckled a little, sideways, and he pitched into the washing machine, and then he ran past the ping-pong table. It had always scared Chip to see his father run. He seemed too old for it, too disciplined, and disappeared into the basement bathroom. And henceforth the squirrels did whatever they wanted. The cab was approaching University Place. Chip considered returning to the Cedar Tavern and reimbursing the bartender, maybe giving her an even hundred to make everything okay, maybe getting her name and address and writing to her from Lithuania. He was leaning forward to direct the driver to the tavern when a radical new thought arrested him. I stole nine bucks. That's what I did. That's who I am. Tough luck for her. He sat back and extended his hand for the bottle. Outside his building, the cabbie waved away his hundred. Too big, too big. Gitanas dug something smaller out of his red motocross jacket. Why don't I meet you at your hotel? Chip said. Gitanas was amused. You're joking, right? I mean, I trust you a lot. But maybe I'll wait down here. Pack your bag, take your time. Bring a warm coat and hat. Suits and ties. Think financial. The doorman, Zoroaster, was nowhere to be seen. Chip had to use his key to get inside. 
On the elevator, he took deep breaths to quell his excitement. He didn't feel afraid. He felt generous. He felt ready to embrace his father. But his apartment was empty. His family must have left minutes earlier. Body warmth was hanging in the air, faint smells of Enid's white shoulders perfume, and something bathroomy, something old person-y. The kitchen was cleaner than Chip had ever seen it. In the living room, all the scrubbing and stowing he'd done was visible now as it hadn't been the night before. And his bookshelves were denuded. And Julia had taken her shampoos and dryer from the bathroom, and he was drunker than he'd realized. And nobody had left a note for him. There was nothing on the dining table except a slice of tart and a vase of sunflowers. He had to pack his bags, but everything around him and inside him had become so strange that for a moment... He could only stand and look. The leaves of the sunflowers had black spots and were rimmed with pale senescences. The heads were meaty and splendid, heavy as brownies, thick as palms. In the center of a sunflower's Kansan face was a subtly pale button within a subtly darker areola. Nature, Chip thought, could hardly have devised a more inviting bed for a small, winged insect to tumble into. He touched the brown velvet, and ecstasy washed over him. The taxi containing three Lamberts arrived at a midtown pier where a white high-rise of a cruise ship, the Gunnar Myrdal, was blotting out the river and New Jersey and half the sky. A crowd, mostly of old people, had converged on the gate and reattenuated in the long, bright corridor beyond it. There was something netherworldly in their determined migration, something chilling in the cordiality and white raiment of the Nordic Pleasure Line's shore personnel, the rain clouds breaking up too late to save the day, the hush of it all, a throng and twilight by the sticks. Denise paid the cab fare and got the luggage into the hands of handlers. So now, where do you go from here? Enid asked her. Back to work in Philly. You look darling, Enid said spontaneously. I love your hair that length. Alfred seized Denise's hands and thanked her. I just wish it had been a better day for Chip, Denise said. Talk to Gary about Christmas, Enid said. And do think about coming for a whole week. Denise raised a leather cuff and checked the time. I'll come for five days. I don't think Gary will do it, though, and who knows what's up with Chip. Denise, Alfred said impatiently, as if she were speaking nonsense, please talk to Gary. Okay, I will, I will. Alfred's hands bounced in the air. I don't know how much time I have. You and your mother need to get along. You and Gary need to get along. Al, you have plenty of... We all need to get along. Denise had never been a crier but her face was crumpling up. Dad, all right, she said. I'll talk to him. Your mother wants a Christmas in St. Jude. I'll talk to him, I promise. Well, he turned abruptly. That's enough of that. His black raincoat was flapping and whipping in the wind, and still Enid managed to hope that the weather would be perfect for cruising, that the water would be calm. In dry clothes, with a coat bag and a duffel and cigarettes, smooth, lethal Muratis, five bucks a box, Chip rode out to Kennedy with Gitanas Misavicius and boarded the Helsinki flight on which, in violation of his oral contract, Gitanas had bought coach class, not business class tickets. We can drink tonight, sleep tomorrow, he said. Their seats were aisle and window. As Chip sat down, he recalled how Julia had ditched Gitanas. He imagined her walking quickly off the plane and then sprinting down the concourse and throwing herself into the back seat of a good old yellow cab. He felt a spasm of homesickness, terror of the other, love of the familiar, but unlike Julia, he had no desire to bolt. He'd no sooner buckled his seatbelt than he fell asleep. He awoke briefly during takeoff and went under again until the entire population of the plane, as one, lit cigarettes. Gitanas took a computer from its case and booted up. So, 
Julia, he said. For an alarmed, sleep-clouded moment, Chip thought that Gitanas was addressing him as Julia. My wife, Gitanas said. Oh, sure. Yeah, she's on antidepressants. This was Eden's idea, I think. Eden kind of runs her life now, I think. You could see she didn't want me in her office today. Didn't want me in town. I'm inconvenient now. So, but, okay, so Julia started taking the drug, and suddenly she woke up and she didn't want to be with men with cigarette burns anymore. That's what she says. Enough men with cigarette burns. Time to move on. No more men with burns. Gitanas loaded a CD into the computer's CD drive. She wants the flat, though. At least the divorce lawyer wants her to want it, the divorce lawyer that Eden's paying for. Somebody changed the locks on the flat. I had to pay the super to let me in. Chip closed his left hand. Cigarette burns? Yeah, oh yeah, I got a few. Gitanas craned his neck to see if any neighbors were listening, but all the passengers around them, except for two children with their eyes shut tight, were busy smoking. Soviet military prison, he said. I'll show you my memento of a pleasant stay there. He peeled his red leather jacket off one arm and rolled up the sleeve of the yellow T-shirt he was wearing underneath. Epoxy interlocking constellation of scar tissue extended from his armpit down the inside of his arm to his elbow. This was my 1990, he said, eight months in a Red Army barracks in the sovereign state of Lithuania. You were a dissident, Chip said. Yeah, yeah, dissident. He worked his arm back into its sleeve. It was horrible, great, very tiring, but it didn't feel tiring. The tiredness came later. Chip's memories of 1990 were of Tudor dramas, interminable futile fights with Tory Timmerman, a secret unhealthy involvement with certain texts of Tories that illustrated the dehumanizing objectifications of pornography, and little else. So I'm kind of scared to look at this, Kitana said. On his computer screen was a dusky monochrome image of a bed, viewed from above, with a body beneath the blankets. The super says she's got a boyfriend and I retrieved some data. I had my surveillance in there from the previous owner. Motion detector, infrared, digital stills. You can look if you want. Might be interesting. Might be hot. Chip remembered the smoke detector on the ceiling of Julia's bedroom. Often enough, he'd stared up at it until the corners of his mouth were dry and his eyes had rolled back in his head. It had always seemed to him a strangely complicated smoke detector. He sat up straighter in his seat. Maybe you don't want to look at those. Gitanas pointed and clicked intricately. I langle the screen. You don't have to look. Thunderheads of tobacco smoke were gathering in the aisles. Chip decided that he needed to light a Murati, but the difference between taking a drag and taking a breath proved negligible. What I mean, he said, blocking the computer screen with his hand, is maybe you want to eject the CD and not look at it. Gitanas was genuinely startled. Why don't I want to look at it? Well, let's think about why. Maybe you should tell me. No, well, let's just think about it. For a moment, the atmosphere was furiously cheerful. Gitanas considered Chip's shoulder, his knees, and his wrist as though deciding where to bite him. Then he ejected the CD and thrust it in Chip's face. Fuck you. I know. I know. Take it. Fuck you. I don't want to see it again. Take it. Chip put the CD in his shirt pocket. He felt pretty good. He felt all right. The plane had leveled off in altitude, and the noise had the steady, vague, white burning of dry sinuses, the color of scuffed plastic airliner windows, the taste of cold, pale coffee in reusable tray table cups. The North Atlantic night was dark and lonely, but here, on the plain, were lights in the sky. Here was sociability. It was good to be awake, and to feel awakeness all around him. So, what, you got cigarette burns too? 
Itana said. Chip showed his palm. It's nothing. Self-inflicted. You pathetic American. Different kind of prison, Chip said. The more he thought about it, the angrier he got. Gary Lambert's profitable entanglement with the Axon Corporation had begun three weeks earlier on a Sunday afternoon that he'd spent in his new color darkroom trying to enjoy reprinting two old photographs of his parents and, by enjoying it, to reassure himself about his mental health. Gary had been worrying a lot about his mental health, but on that particular afternoon, as he left his big schist-sheathed house on Seminole Street and crossed his big backyard and climbed the outside stairs of his big garage, the weather in his brain was as warm and bright as the weather in northwest Philadelphia. A September sun was shining through a mix of haze and smallish, gray-keeled clouds, and to the extent that Gary was able to understand and track his neurochemistry, and he was a vice president at Centrust Bank, not a shrink, let's remember, his leading indicators all seemed rather healthy. Although in general Gary applauded the modern trend toward individual self-management of retirement funds and long-distance calling plans and private schooling options, he was less than thrilled to be given responsibility for his own personal brain chemistry, especially when certain people in his life, notably his father, refused to take any such responsibility. But Gary was nothing if not conscientious. As he entered the darkroom, he estimated that his levels of neurofactor 3, that is, serotonin, a very, very important factor, were posting 7-day or even 30-day highs, that his factor 2 and factor 7 levels were likewise outperforming expectations, and that his factor 1 had rebounded from an early morning slump related to the glass of Armagnac he'd drunk at bedtime. He had a spring in his step, an agreeable awareness of his above-average height and his late summer suntan. His resentment of his wife, Caroline, was moderate and well-contained. Declines led advances in key indices of paranoia. For example, his persistent suspicion that Caroline and his two older sons were mocking him. And his seasonally adjusted assessment of life's futility and brevity was consistent with the overall robustness of his mental economy. He was not the least bit clinically depressed. He drew the velvet blackout curtains and shut the light-proof shutters, took a box of 8 by 10 paper from the big stainless refrigerator, and fed two strips of celluloid to the motorized negative cleaner, a sexily heavy little gadget. He was printing images from his parents' ill-fated decade of connubial golf. One showed Enid bending over in deep rough, scowling in her sunglasses in the obliterative heartland heat, her left hand squeezing the neck of her long-suffering five-wood, her right arm blurred in the act of underhandedly throwing her ball, a white smear at the image's margin, into the fairway. She and Alfred had only ever played on flat, straight, short, cheap public courses. In the other photo, Alfred was wearing tight shorts and a billed Midland Pacific cap, black socks, and prehistoric golf shoes, and was addressing a white grapefruit-sized tea marker with his prehistoric wooden driver and grinning at the camera as if to say, A ball this big I could hit. After Gary had given the enlargements their sour baths, he raised the lights and discovered that both prints were webbed over with peculiar yellow blotches. He cursed a little, not so much because he cared about the photographs as because he wanted to preserve his good spirits, his serotonin-rich mood. And to do this, he needed a modicum of cooperation from the world of objects. Outside, the weather was curdling. There was a trickle in the gutters, a rooftop percussion of drops from overhanging trees, through the walls of the garage, while he shot a second pair of enlargements, Gary could hear Caroline and the boys playing soccer in the backyard. He heard footfalls and punting sounds, less frequent shouts, the seismic wump of ball colliding with garage. 
When the second set of prints emerged from the fixer with the same yellow blotches, Gary knew he ought to quit. But there came a tapping on the outside door, and his youngest son, Jonah, slipped through the blackout curtain. Are you printing pictures? Jonah said. Gary hastily folded the failed prints into quarters and buried them in the trash. Just starting, he said. He remixed his solutions and opened a fresh box of paper. Jonah sat down by a safe light and whispered as he turned the pages of one of the Narnia books, Prince Caspian, that Gary's sister Denise had given him. Jonah was in second grade, but was already reading at a fifth grade level. Often he spoke aloud the written words in an articulate whisper that was of a piece with his general Narnian dearness as a person. He had shining dark eyes and an oboe voice and mink-soft hair and could seem, even to Gary, more sentient animal than little boy. Caroline did not entirely approve of Narnia. C.S. Lewis was a known Catholic propagandist, and the Narnian hero Aslan was a furry, four-pawed Christ figure. But Gary had enjoyed reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe as a boy, and he had not, it was safe to say, grown up to be a religious nut. In fact, he was a strict materialist. So they kill a bear, Jonah reported, but it's not a talking bear, and Aslan comes back, but only Lucy sees him, and the others don't believe her. Gary tweezed the prince into the stock bath. Why don't they believe her? Because she's the youngest, Jonah said. Outside, in the rain, Caroline laughed and shouted. She had a habit of running herself ragged to keep up with the boys. In the early years of their marriage, she'd worked full-time as a lawyer, but after Caleb was born, she'd come into family money, and now she worked half days only at a philanthropically low salary for the children's defense fund. Her real life centered on the boys. She called them her best friends. Six months ago, on the eve of Gary's 43rd birthday, while he and Jonah were visiting his parents in St. Jude, a pair of local contractors had come and rewired, replumbed, and re-outfitted the second floor of the garage as a surprise birthday gift from Caroline. Gary had occasionally spoken of reprinting his favorite old family photos and collecting them in a leather-bound album, an all-time Lambert 200. But commercial printing would have sufficed for that, and meanwhile the boys were teaching him computer pixel processing and if he'd still needed a lab, he could have rented one by the hour. His impulse on his birthday, therefore, after Caroline had led him out to the garage and presented him with a darkroom that he didn't need or want, was to weep. From certain pop psychology books on Caroline's nightstand, however, he'd learned to recognize the warning signs of clinical depression. And one of these warning signs, the authorities all agreed, was a proclivity to inappropriate weeping. And so he'd swallowed the lump in his throat and bounded around the expensive new darkroom and exclaimed to Caroline, who was experiencing both buyer's remorse and gift-giver's anxiety, that he was utterly delighted with the gift. And then, to reassure himself that he wasn't clinically depressed and to make sure that Caroline never suspected anything of the kind, he'd resolved to work in the darkroom twice a week until the all-time Lambert 200 album was complete. The suspicion that Caroline, consciously or not, had tried to exile him from the house by putting the darkroom in the garage was another key index of paranoia. When the timer peeled, he transferred the third set of prints to the fixer bath and raised the lights again. What are those white blobs? Jonah said, peering into the tray. Jonah, I don't know. They look like clouds, Jonah said. The soccer ball slammed into the side of the garage. Gary left Enid scowling and Alfred grinning in the fixative and opened shutters. His monkey puzzle tree and the bamboo thicket next to it were glossy with rain. In the middle of the backyard, in soaked, soiled jerseys that stuck to their shoulder blades, Caroline and Aaron were gulping air while Caleb tied a shoe. Caroline, at forty-five, had the legs of a college girl. Her hair was nearly as blonde as when Gary had first met her twenty years earlier at a Bob Seeger concert at the Spectrum. Gary was still substantially attracted to his wife, 
still excited by her effortless good looks and by her Quaker bloodlines. By ancient reflex, he reached for a camera and trained the Zoom telephoto on her. The look on Caroline's face dismayed him. There was a pinch in her brow, a groove of distress around her mouth. She was limping as she pursued the ball again. Gary turned the camera on his oldest son, Aaron, who was best photographed unawares before he could position his head at the self-conscious angle that he believed most flattered him. Aaron's face was flushed and mud-flecked in the drizzle, and Gary worked the zoom to frame a handsome shot. But resentment of Caroline was overwhelming his neurochemical defenses. The soccer had stopped now, and she was ringing and limping toward the house. Lucy buried her head in his mane to hide from his face, Jonah whispered. There came a scream from the house. Caleb and Aaron reacted instantly, galloping across the yard like action picture heroes and disappearing inside. A moment later, Aaron re-emerged and shouted in his newly crack-prone voice, Dad! 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 The hysteria of others made Gary methodical and calm. He left the dark room and descended the rain-slick stairway slowly. In the open space above the commuter rail tracks, behind the garage, a kind of spring-shower self-improvement of the light was working through the humid air. Dad, Grandma's on the phone. Gary ambled across the yard, pausing to examine and regret the injuries that the soccer had visited on the grass. The surrounding neighborhood, Chestnut Hill, was not un-Narnian. Century-old maples and ginkgos and sycamores, many of them mutilated to accommodate power lines, grew in giant riot over patched and repatched city streets bearing the names of decimated tribes, Seminole and Cherokee, Navajo and Shawnee. For miles in every direction, despite high population densities and large household incomes, there were no fast roads and few useful stores. The land that time forgot, Gary called it. Most of the houses here, including his own, were made of a schist that resembled raw tin and was exactly the color of his hair. Dad! Thank you, Aaron. I heard you the first time. Grandma's on the phone. I know that, Aaron. You just told me. In the slate-floored kitchen, he found Caroline slumped in a chair with both hands pressed to her lower back. She called this morning, Caroline said. I forgot to tell you. The phone's been ringing every five minutes, and finally I was running. Thank you, Caroline. I was running. Thank you. Gary snagged the cordless and held it at arm's length, as if to keep his mother at bay while he proceeded into the dining room. Here he was waylaid by Caleb, who had a finger buried in the slick leaves of a catalog. Dad, can I talk to you for a second? Not now, Caleb. Your grandmother is on the phone. I just want not now, I said. Caleb shook his head and smiled in disbelief like a much-televised athlete who'd failed to draw a penalty. Gary crossed the marble-floored main hall into his very large living room and said hello into the little phone. I told Caroline, Enid said, that I would call you back if you weren't near the phone. Your calls cost seven cents a minute, Gary said. Or you could have called me back. Mother, we're talking about twenty-five cents. I've been trying to reach you all day, she said. The travel agent needs an answer by tomorrow morning at the latest, and, you know, we're still hoping you'll come for one last Christmas, like I promised Jonah, so hang on a second, Gary said. I'll check with Caroline. Gary, you've had months to discuss this. I'm not going to sit here and wait while you... One second. He blocked the perforations in the phone's mouthpiece with his thumb and returned to the kitchen, where Jonah was standing on a chair with a package of Oreos. Caroline, still slumped at the table, was breathing shallowly. I did something terrible, she said, when I ran to catch the phone. You were out there slipping around in the rain for two hours, Gary said. No, I was fine until I ran to get the phone. Caroline, I saw you limping before you. I was fine, she said, until I ran to get the phone, which was ringing for the fiftieth time. Good. All right, Gary said. It's my mother's fault. Now, tell me what you want me to say about Christmas. Well, whatever. They're welcome to come here. We'd talked about the possibility of going there. Caroline shook her head thoroughly as if erasing something. No, 
You talked about it. I never talked about it. Caroline, I can't discuss this when she's on the phone. Have her call back next week. Jonah was realizing that he could take as many cookies as he wanted and neither parent would notice. She needs to make arrangements now, Gary said. They're trying to decide if they should stop here next month after their cruise. It depends on Christmas. It's like I slipped a disc. If you won't talk about it, he said, I'll tell her we're considering coming to St. Jude. No way, that was not the agreement. I'm proposing a one-time exception to the agreement. No, no! Wet tangles of blonde hair lashed and twisted as Caroline registered refusal. You can't change the rules like that. A one-time exception isn't changing the rules. God, I think I need an x-ray, Caroline said. Gary could feel the buzzing of his mother's voice against his thumb. A yes or no here? Standing up, Caroline leaned into him and buried her face in his sweater. She knocked lightly on his sternum with a little fist. Please, she said, nuzzling his collarbone. Tell her you'll call her later, please. I really hurt my back. Gary held the phone out to one side, his arm rigid as she pressed against him. Caroline, they've come here eight years in a row. It's not extreme of me to propose a one-time exception. Can I at least say we're considering the possibility? Caroline shook her head woefully and sank onto the chair. Okay, fine, Gary said. I'll make my own decision. He strode into the dining room where Aaron, who'd been listening, stared at him as if he were a monster of spousal cruelty. Dad, Caleb said, if you're not talking to Grandma, can I ask you something? No, Caleb, I'm talking to Grandma. Then can I talk to you right afterward? Oh, God, oh, God, Caroline was saying. In the living room, Jonah had settled onto the larger leather sofa with his tower of cookies and Prince Caspian. Mother, I don't understand this, Enid said. If it's not a good time to talk, all right, call me back, but to make me wait ten minutes. Yes, but here I am. Well, so, and what have you decided? Before Gary could answer, there burst from the kitchen a piteous, raw, feline wailing, a cry such as Caroline had produced during intercourse fifteen years ago, before there were boys to hear her. Mom, sorry, one second. This is not right, Enid said. This is not polite. Caroline, Gary called into the kitchen, do you think we can behave like adults for a few minutes? Ah, ah, oh, ah, Caroline cried. Nobody ever died of a backache, Caroline. Please, she cried. Call her later. I tripped on the last step when I was running inside. Gary, it hurts. He turned his back on the kitchen. Sorry, Mom. What on earth is going on there? Caroline hurt her back a little bit, playing soccer. You know, I hate to say this, Enid said, but aches and pains are a part of getting... ...getting older. I could talk about pain all day long if I wanted to. My hip is always hurting. As you get older, though, hopefully you get a little more mature. Oh, ah, ah, Caroline cried out voluptuously. Yeah, that's the hope, Gary said. Anyhow, what did you decide? The jury's still out on Christmas, he said, but maybe you should plan on stopping here. Ow, ow, ow. It's getting awfully late to be making Christmas reservations, Enid said severely. You know, the Schumperts made their Hawaii reservations back in April, because last year, when they waited until September, they couldn't get the seats. They... Aaron came running from the kitchen. Dad! I'm on the phone, Aaron. Dad! I'm on the telephone, Aaron, as you can see. Dave has a colostomy, Enid said. You've got to do something right now, Aaron said. Mom is really hurting. She says you have to drive her to the hospital. Actually, Dad, said Caleb, sidling in with his catalog, there's some place you can drive me to. No, Caleb. No, but there's a store I really actually do need to get to. The affordable seats fill up early, Enid said. Aaron? Caroline shouted from the kitchen. Aaron, where are you? Where's your father? Where's Caleb? It certainly is noisy in here for a person trying to concentrate, Jonah said. Mother, sorry, Gary said. I'm going someplace quieter. It's getting very late, Enid said. In her voice, the panic of a woman for whom each passing day, each hour, signified the booking of more seats on late December flights, and thus the particle-by-particle -particle disintegration of any hope that Gary and Caroline would bring their boys to St. Jude for one last Christmas. Dad, Aaron pleaded, following Gary up the stairs to the second floor, what do I tell her? Tell her to call 911. Use your cell phone. Call an ambulance. Gary raised his voice. Caroline, call 911. Nine years ago, 
after a Midwestern trip whose particular torments had included ice storms in both Philly and St. Jude, a four-hour runway delay with a whining five-year-old and a screaming two-year-old, a night of wild vomiting by Caleb in reaction, according to Caroline, to the butter and bacon fat in Enid's holiday cooking, and a nasty spill that Caroline took on her in-law's ice-covered driveway, her back trouble dated from her field hockey days at Friends Central, but she now spoke of having reactivated the injury on that driveway. Gary had promised his wife that he would never again ask her to go to St. Jude for Christmas. But now his parents had come to Philly eight years in a row, and although he disapproved of his mother's obsession with Christmas, it seemed to him a symptom of a larger malaise, a painful emptiness in Enid's life. He could hardly blame his parents for wanting to stay home this year. Gary also calculated that Enid would be more willing to leave St. Jude and move east if she'd had her one last Christmas. Basically, he was prepared to make the trip, and he expected a modicum of cooperation from his wife, a mature willingness to consider the special circumstances. He shut himself inside his study and locked the door against the shouts and whimpers of his family, the barrage of feet on stairs, the pseudo-emergency. He lifted the receiver of his study phone and turned off the cordless. This is ridiculous, Enid said in a defeated voice. Why don't you call me back? We haven't quite decided about December, he said, but we may very well come to St. Jude, in which case I think you should stop here after the cruise. Enid was breathing rather loudly. We're not making two trips to Philadelphia this fall, she said, and I want to see the boys at Christmas, and so as far as I'm concerned, this means you're coming to St. Jude. No, mother, he said. No, 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 we haven't decided anything. I promised Jonah. Jonah's not buying the tickets. Jonah's not in charge here, so you make your plans, we'll make ours, and hopefully everything will work out. Gary could hear, with strange clarity, the rustle of dissatisfaction from Enid's nostrils. He could hear the seashore of her respiration, and all at once he realized. Caroline, he said. Caroline, are you on the line? The breathing ceased. Caroline, are you eavesdropping? Are you on the line? He heard a faint electronic click, a spot of static. Mom, sorry, he said. What on earth? Unbelievable, unfucking believable Gary dropped the receiver on his desk, unlocked the door, and ran down the hallway past a bedroom in which Aaron was standing at his mirror with his brow wrinkled and his head at the flattering angle, past the main staircase on which Caleb was clutching his catalogue like a Jehovah's Witness with a pamphlet, to the master bedroom where Caroline was curled up fetally on a Persian rug in her muddy clothes, a frosty gel pack pressed into her lower back. Are you eavesdropping on me? Caroline shook her head weakly, perhaps hoping to suggest that she was too infirm to have reached the phone by the bed. Is that a no? You're saying no? You weren't listening? No, Gary, she said in a tiny voice. I heard the click. I heard the breathing. No. Caroline, there are three phones on this line. I've got two of them in my study, and the third one's right here. Hello? I wasn't eavesdropping. I just picked up the phone. She inhaled through gritted teeth to see if the line was free, that's all. And sat and listened. You were eavesdropping, like we've talked and talked and talked about not doing. Gary, she said in a piteous little voice, I swear to you I wasn't. My back is killing me. I couldn't reach to put the phone back for a minute. I put it on the floor. I wasn't eavesdropping. Please, be nice to me. That her face was beautiful, and that the agony in it was mistakable for ecstasy, that the sight of her doubled over and mud-spattered and red-cheeked and vanquished and wild-haired on the Persian rug turned him on, that some part of him believed her denials and was full of tenderness for her only deepened his feeling of betrayal. He stormed back up the hall to his study and slammed the door. Mother, hello, I'm sorry. But the line was dead. He had to dial St. Jude now at his own expense. Through the window overlooking the backyard he could see sunlit, clamshell purple rain clouds, steam rising off the monkey puzzle tree. Because she wasn't paying for the call, Enid sounded happier. She asked Gary if he'd heard of a company called Axon. It's in Schwenksville, Pennsylvania, she said. They want to buy Dad's patent. Here, I'll read you the letter. I'm a little upset about this. At Cent Trust Bank, where Gary now ran the equities division, he'd long specialized in large-cap securities and never much concerned himself with small fry. 
The name Axon was not familiar to him. But as he listened to his mother read the letter from Mr. Joseph K. Prager at Bragg, Neuter, and Spey, he felt he knew these people's game. It was clear that the lawyer, in drafting a letter and sending it to an old man with a Midwestern address, had offered Alfred no more than a tiny percentage of the patent's actual value. Gary knew the way these shysters worked. In Exxon's position, he would have done the same. I'm thinking we should ask for 10,000, not 5,000, Enid said. When does that patent expire, Gary said? In about six years. They must be looking at big money, otherwise they'd just go ahead and infringe. The letter says it's experimental and uncertain. Mother, exactly, that's exactly what they want you to think, but if it's so experimental, why are they bothering with this at all? Why not just wait six years? Oh, I see. It's very, very good that you told me about this, Mother. What you need to do now is write back to these guys and ask them for a $200,000 licensing fee up front. Enid gasped as she'd done long ago on family car trips when Alfred swung into oncoming traffic to pass a truck. Two hundred thousand? Oh, my, Gary! And a one percent royalty on gross revenues from their process. Tell them you're fully prepared to defend your legitimate claim in court. But what if they say no? Trust me, these guys have no desire to litigate. There's no downside to being aggressive here. Well, but it's Dad's patent, and you know how he thinks. Put him on the phone, Gary said. His parents were cowed by authority of all kinds. When Gary wanted to reassure himself that he'd escaped their fate when he needed to measure his distance from St. Jude, he considered his own fearlessness in the face of authority, including the authority of his father. Yes, Alfred said. Dad, he said, I think you should go after these guys. They're in a very weak position, and you could make some real money. In St. Jude, the old man said nothing. You're not telling me you're going to take that offer, Gary said, because that's not even an option. Dad, that's not even on the menu. I have made my decision, Alfred said. What I do is not your business. Yes, it is, though. I have a legitimate interest in this. Gary, you do not. I have a legitimate interest, Gary insisted. If Enid and Alfred ever ran out of money, it would fall to him and Caroline, not to his undercapitalized sister, not to his feckless brother, to pay for their care. But he had enough self-control not to spell this out for Alfred. Will you at least tell me what you're going to do? Will you pay me that courtesy? You could pay me the courtesy of not asking, Alfred said. However, since you ask, I will tell you. I'm going to take what they offer and give half of the money to Orphic Midland. The universe was mechanistic. The father spoke. The son reacted. Well, now, Dad, Gary said in the low, slow voice he reserved for situations in which he was very angry and very certain he was right. You can't do that. I can and I will, Alfred said. No, Really, Dad, you have to listen to me. There is absolutely no legal or moral reason for you to split the money with Orphic Midland. I was using the railroad's materials and equipment, Alfred said. It was understood that I would share any income from the patents, and Mark Jamberetz put me in touch with the patent lawyer. I suspect I was given a courtesy rate. That was fifteen years ago. The company no longer exists. The people you had the understanding with are dead. Not all of them are. Mark Jamberetz is not. Dad, it's a nice sentiment. I understand the feeling, but I doubt you do. That railroad was raped and eviscerated by the Roth brothers. I will not discuss it any further. This is sick. This is sick, Gary said. You're being loyal to a corporation that screwed you and the city of St. Jude in every conceivable way. It's screwing you again right now with your health insurance. You have your opinion? I have mine. And I'm saying you're being irresponsible. You're being selfish. If you want to eat peanut butter and pinch pennies, that's your business. But it's not fair to Mom, and it's not fair to... I don't give a damn what you and your mother think. It's not fair to me. Who's going to pay your bills if you get in trouble? Who's your fallback? I will endure what I have to endure, Alfred said. Yes, and I'll eat peanut butter if I have to. I like peanut butter. It's a good food. And if that's what Mom has to eat, she'll eat it too, right? She can eat dog food if she has to. Who cares what she wants? Gary, I know what the right 
thing to do is. I don't expect you to understand. I don't understand the decisions you make, but I know what's fair. So let that be the end of it. I mean, give Orphic Midland twenty-five hundred dollars if you absolutely have to, Gary said. But that patent is worth. Let that be the end of it. I said. Your mother wants to talk to you again. Gary, Enid cried. The Saint Jude Symphony is doing the Nutcracker in December. They do a beautiful job with the regional ballet, and it sells out so fast. Tell me, do you think I should get nine tickets for the day of Christmas Eve? They have a two o'clock matinee, or we can go on the night of the twenty-third if you think that's better. You decide. Mother, listen to me. Do not let Dad accept that offer. Don't let him do anything until I've seen the letter. I want you to put a copy of it in the mail to me tomorrow. Okay, I will. But I'm thinking the important thing right now is the Nutcracker to get nine tickets altogether because it sells out so fast, Gary. You wouldn't believe. When he finally got off the phone, Gary pressed his hands to his eyes and saw. Engraved in false colors on the darkness of his mental movie screen, two images of golf. Enid improving her lie from the rough. Cheating was the word for this, and Alfred making light of his badness at the game. The old man had pulled the same kind of self-defeating stunt fourteen years ago after the Roth brothers bought the Midland Pacific. Alfred was a few months shy of his sixty-fifth birthday when Fenton Creel, the Midpac's new president, took him to lunch at Morelli's in St. Jude. The top echelon of Midpac executives had been purged by the Roths for having resisted the takeover, but Alfred, as chief engineer, had not been a part of this palace guard. In the chaos of shutting down the St. Jude office and moving operations to Little Rock, the Roths needed somebody to keep the railroad running while the new crew, headed by Creel, learned the ropes. Creel offered Alfred a fifty percent raise and a block of Orphic stock if he would stay on for two extra years, oversee the move to Little Rock, and provide continuity. Alfred hated the Roths and was inclined to say no, but that night at home. Enid went to work on him. She pointed out that the Orphic stock alone was worth seventy-eight thousand dollars, that his pension would be based on his last three full years' salary, and that here was a chance to increase their retirement income by fifty percent. These irresistible arguments appeared to sway Alfred, but three nights later he came home and announced to Enid that he'd tendered his resignation that afternoon, and that Creel had accepted it. Alfred was then seven weeks short of a full year at his last largest salary. It made no sense at all to quit, but he gave no explanation then or ever to Enid or to anyone else for his sudden turnabout. He simply said, "I have made my decision." At the Christmas table in St. Jude that year, moments after Enid had sneaked onto Baby Aaron's little plate a bite of hazelnut goose stuffing. And Caroline had grabbed the stuffing from the plate and marched into the kitchen and flung it in the trash like a wad of goose crap, saying, "This is pure grease, yuck!" Gary lost his temper and shouted, "You couldn't wait seven weeks? You couldn't wait till you were sixty-five?" Gary, I worked hard all my life. My retirement is my business, not yours. And the man so keen to retire that he couldn't wait those last seven weeks. What had he done with his retirement? He'd sat in his blue chair. Gary knew nothing of Axon, but Orphic Midland was the sort of conglomerate whose holdings and management structure he was paid to stay abreast of. He happened to know that the Roth brothers had sold their controlling stake to cover losses in a Canadian gold mining venture. Orphic Midland had joined the ranks of the indistinguishable bland mega firms whose headquarters dotted the American exurbs. Its executives had been replaced like the cells of a living organism, or like the letters in a game of substitution in which shit turned to shot and soot and foot and food. So that by the time Gary had okayed the latest bulk purchase of Orphic M for Centrust's portfolio. No blamable human trace remained of the company that had shut down St. Jude's third largest employer and eliminated train service to much of rural Kansas. Orphic Midland was out of the transportation business altogether now. What survived of the Midpac's trunk lines had been sold off to enable the company to concentrate on prison building, prison management, gourmet coffee, and financial services. 
a new 144-strand fiber-optic cable system lay buried in the railroad's old right-of-way. This was the company to which Alfred felt loyal? The more Gary thought about it, the angrier he got. He sat by himself in his study, unable to stem his rising agitation or to slow the steam locomotive pace at which his breaths were coming. He was blind to the pretty pumpkin-yellow sunset unfolding in the tulip trees beyond the commuter tracks. He saw nothing but the principles at stake. He might have sat there obsessing indefinitely, marshalling evidence against his father had he not heard a rustling outside the study door. He jumped to his feet and pulled the door open. Caleb was cross-legged on the floor, studying his catalogue. Can I talk to you now? Were you sitting out here listening to me? No, Caleb said. You said we could talk when you were done. I had a question. I was wondering what room I could put under surveillance. Even upside down, Gary could see that the prices for the equipment in Caleb's catalogue, items with brushed aluminum cases, color LCD screens, were three and four figures. It's my new hobby, Caleb said. I want to put a room under surveillance. Mom says I can do the kitchen if it's okay with you. You want to put the kitchen under surveillance as a hobby? Yeah. Gary shook his head. He'd had many hobbies when he was a boy, and for a long time it had pained him that his own boys seemed to have none at all. Eventually Caleb had figured out that if he used the word hobby... Gary would green light expenditures he otherwise might have forbidden Caroline to make. Thus, Caleb's hobby had been photography until Caroline had bought him an autofocus camera, an SLR with a better zoom telephoto lens than Gary's own, and a digital point and shoot camera. His hobby had been computers until Caroline had bought him a palm top and a notebook. But now Caleb was nearly twelve and Gary had been around the block one too many times. His guard was up regarding hobbies. He'd extracted from Caroline a promise not to buy Caleb more equipment of any kind without consulting with him first. Surveillance is not a hobby, he said. Dad, yes it is. Mom was the one who suggested it. She said I could start with the kitchen. It seemed to Gary another warning sign of depression that his thought was... The liquor cabinet is in the kitchen. Better let me talk about this with Mom, all right? But the store's only open till six, Caleb said. You can wait a few days. Don't tell me you can't. But I've been waiting all afternoon. You said you'd talk to me, and now it's almost night. That it was almost night gave Gary clear title to a drink. The liquor cabinet was in the kitchen. He took a step in its direction. What equipment exactly are we talking about? Just a camera and a microphone and servo controls. Caleb thrust the catalog at Gary. See, I don't even need the expensive kind. This one's just six fifty. Mom said it was okay. Time and again, Gary had the feeling that there was something disagreeable that his family wanted to forget, something only he insisted on remembering, something requiring only his nod, his go-ahead, to be forgotten. This feeling, too, was a warning sign. Caleb, he said, this sounds like something you're going to get bored with very soon. It sounds expensive and like you won't stay interested. No, no, Caleb said, anguished. I'm totally interested. Dad, it's a hobby. You've gotten bored, though, pretty quickly with some of the other things we've gotten you, things you also said you were very interested in at the time. This is different, Caleb pleaded. This time I'm really, truly interested. Clearly the boy was prepared to spend any amount of devalued verbal currency to buy his father's acquiescence. Do you see what I'm saying, though? Gary said. Do you see the pattern that things look one way before you buy them and another way afterward? Your feelings change after you buy things. Do you see that? Caleb opened his mouth, but before he could utter another plea or complaint, a craftiness flickered in his face. I guess he said, with seeming humility. I guess I see that. Well, do you think it's going to happen with this new equipment? Gary said. Caleb gave every appearance of giving the question serious thought. I think this is different, he said finally. Well, okay, Gary said, but I want you to remember we had this conversation. 
I don't want to see this become just another expensive toy you play with for a week or two and then neglect. You're going to be a teenager pretty soon, and I want to start seeing a little longer attention span. Gary, that isn't fair, Caroline said hotly. She was hobbling from the doorway of the master bedroom, one shoulder hunched and her hand behind her back, applying pressure to the soothing gel pack. Hello, Caroline. Didn't realize you were listening. Caleb is not neglecting things. Right, I'm not, Caleb said. What you don't understand, Caroline told Gary, is that everything's getting used in this new hobby. That's what's so brilliant about it. He's figured out a way to use all that equipment together in one... Good. Well, I'm glad to hear it. He does something creative, and you make him feel guilty. Once, when Gary had wondered aloud if giving Caleb so many gadgets might be stunting his imagination, Caroline had all but accused him of slandering his son. Among her favorite parenting books was The Technological Imagination. What Today's Children Have to Teach Their Parents, in which Nancy Claymore, Ph.D., contrasting the tired paradigm of gifted child as socially isolated genius with the wired paradigm of gifted child as creatively connected consumer, argued that electronic toys would soon be so cheap and widespread that a child's imagination would no longer be exercised in crayon drawings and made-up stories, but in the synthesis and exploitation of existing technologies, an idea that Gary found both persuasive and depressing. When he was a boy not much younger than Caleb, his hobby had been building models with popsicle sticks. Does this mean we can go to the store now? Caleb said. No, Caleb, not tonight. It's almost six, Caroline said. Caleb stamped his foot. This always happens. I wait and wait, and then it gets too late. We'll rent a movie, Caroline said. We'll get whatever movie you want. I don't want a movie. I want to do surveillance. It's not going to happen, Gary said. So start dealing with it. Caleb went to his room and slammed the door. Gary followed and flung it open. That's enough now, he said. We don't slam doors in this house. You slam doors. I don't want to hear another word from you. You slam doors. Do you want to spend the whole week in your room? Caleb replied by crossing his eyes and sucking his lips into his mouth. Not another word. Gary let his gaze drift into corners of the boy's room that he ordinarily took care not to look at. Neglected in piles, like the loot in a thief's apartment, was new photographic and computer and video equipment with an aggregate retail value possibly exceeding the annual salary of Gary's secretary at Cent Trust. Such a riot of luxury in the lair of an eleven-year-old. Various chemicals that molecular floodgates had been holding back all afternoon burst loose and flooded Gary's neural pathways. A cascade of reactions initiated by Factor VI relaxed his tear valves and sent a wave of nausea down his vagus, a sense that he survived from day to day by distracting himself from underground truths that day by day grew more compelling and decisive, the truth that he was going to die, that heaping your tomb with treasure wouldn't save you. The light in the windows was failing rapidly. You're really going to use all this equipment? He said with a tightness in his chest. Caleb, his lips still involuted, gave a shrug. Nobody should be slamming doors, Gary said. Me included. All right? Yeah, Dad. Whatever. Emerging from Caleb's room into the shadowed hallway, he nearly collided with Caroline, who was hurrying on tiptoe in her stockinged feet back in the direction of their bedroom. Again? Again? I say, don't eavesdrop, and what do you do? I wasn't eavesdropping. I've got to go lie down. And she hurried, limping into the bedroom. You can run, but you can't hide, Gary said, following her. I want to know why you're eavesdropping on me. It is your paranoia, not my eavesdropping. My paranoia? Caroline slumped on the oaken king-size bed. After she and Gary were married... She'd undergone five years of twice-weekly therapy, which the therapist at the final session had declared an unqualified success, and which had given her a lifelong advantage over Gary in the race for mental health. "'You seem to think everybody except you has a problem,' she said. "'Which is what your mother thinks, too, without ever—' "'Caroline, answer me one question. 
Look me in the eye and answer me one question. This afternoon, when you were... God, Gary, not this again. Listen to yourself. When you were horsing around in the rain, running yourself ragged, trying to keep up with an eleven-year-old and a fourteen-year-old, you're obsessed. You're obsessed with that, running and sliding and kicking in the rain. You talk to your parents, and then you take your anger out on us. Were you limping before you came inside? Gary shook his finger in his wife's face. Look me in the eye, Caroline. Look me right in the eye. Come on, do it. Look me in the eye and tell me you weren't already limping. Caroline was rocking in pain. You're on the phone with them for the better part of an hour. You can't do it. Gary crowed in bitter triumph. You're lying to me and you will not admit you're lying. Dad, Dad, came a cry outside the door. Gary turned and saw Aaron shaking his head wildly beside himself, his beautiful face twisted and tear slick. Stop shouting at her. The remorse neurofactor, factor 26, flooded the sights in Gary's brain, specially tailored by evolution to respond to it. Aaron, all right, he said. Aaron turned away and turned back and marched in place, taking big steps nowhere as though trying to force the shameful tears out of his eyes and into his body, down through his legs and stamp them out. God, please, Dad, do not shout at her. Okay, Aaron, Gary said. Shouting's over. He reached to touch his son's shoulder, but Aaron fled back up the hall. Gary left Caroline and followed him. His sense of isolation deepened by this demonstration that his wife had strong allies in the house. Her sons would protect her from her husband. Her husband, who was a shouter, like his father before him. His father before him, who was now depressed, but who, in his prime, as a shouter, had so frightened young Gary that it never occurred to him to intercede on his mother's behalf. Aaron was lying face down on his bed. In the tornado aftermath of laundry and magazines on the floor of his room, the two nodes of order were his Bundy trumpet with mutes and a music stand, and his enormous alphabetized collection of compact discs, including boxed set complete editions of Dizzy and Satchmo and Miles Davis, plus great miscellaneous quantities of Chet Baker and Wynton Marsalis and Chuck Mangione and Herb Alpert and Al Hurt, all of which Gary had given him to encourage his interest in music. Gary perched on the edge of the bed. I'm sorry I upset you, he said. As you know, I can be a mean old judgmental bastard, and sometimes your mother has trouble admitting she's wrong, especially when her back is hurt, came Aaron's voice, muffled by a Ralph Lauren duvet. She is not lying. I know her back hurts, Aaron. I love your mother very much. Then don't shout at her. Okay. Shouting's over. Let's have some dinner. Gary lightly judo-chopped Aaron's shoulder. What do you say? Aaron didn't move. Further cheering words appeared to be called for, but Gary couldn't think of any. He was experiencing... experiencing a critical shortage of factors one and three. He'd had the sense moments earlier that Caroline was on the verge of accusing him of being depressed, and he was afraid that if the idea that he was depressed gained currency, he would forfeit his right to his opinions. He would forfeit his moral certainties. Every word he spoke would become a symptom of disease. He would never again win an argument. It was therefore all the more important now to resist depression, to fight it with the truth. Listen, he said, you were out there with Mom playing soccer. Tell me if I'm right about this. Was she limping before she went inside? For a moment, as Aaron roused himself from the bed, Gary believed that the truth would prevail. But the face Aaron showed him was a reddish-white raisin of revulsion and disbelief. You're horrible, he said. You're horrible! And he ran from the room. Ordinarily, Gary wouldn't have let Aaron get away with this. Ordinarily, he would have battled his son all evening if that was what it took to extract an apology from him. But his mental markets, glycemic, endocrine, over the synapse, were crashing. He was feeling ugly, and to battle Aaron now would only make him uglier, and the sensation of ugliness was perhaps the leading warning sign. He saw that he'd made two critical mistakes. He should never have promised Caroline 
that there would be no more Christmases in St. Jude. And today, when she was limping and grimacing in the backyard, he should have snapped at least one picture of her. He mourned the moral advantages these mistakes had cost him. I am not clinically depressed, he told his reflection in the nearly dark bedroom window. With a great marrow-taxing exertion of will, he stood up from Aaron's bed and sallied forth to prove himself capable of having an ordinary evening. Jonah was climbing the dark stairs with Prince Caspian. I finished the book, he said. Did you like it? I loved it, Jonah said. This is outstanding children's literature. Aslan made a door in the air that people walked through and disappeared. They went out of Narnia and back into the real world. Gary dropped into a crouch. Give me a hug. Jonah draped his arms on him. Gary could feel the looseness of his youthful joints, the cub-like pliancy, the heat radiating through his scalp and cheeks. He would have slit his own throat if the boy had needed blood. His love was immense in that way, and yet he wondered if it was only love he wanted now or whether he was also coalition-building, securing a tactical ally for his team. What this stagnating economy needs, thought Federal Reserve Board Chairman Gary R. Lambert, is a massive infusion of Bombay Sapphire Gin. In the kitchen, Caroline and Caleb were slouched at the table, drinking Coke and eating potato chips. Caroline had her feet up on another chair and pillows beneath her knees. What should we do for dinner? Gary said. His wife and middle son traded glances as if this were the stick-in-the-mud sort of question he was famous for. From the density of potato chip crumbs, he could see they were well on their way to spoiled appetites. Mixed grill, I guess, said Caroline. Oh, yeah, Dad, do a mixed grill, Caleb said, in a tone mistakable for either irony or enthusiasm. Gary asked if there was meat. Caroline stuffed chips into her mouth and shrugged. Jonah asked permission to build a fire. Gary, taking ice from the freezer, granted it. Ordinary evening. Ordinary evening. If I put the camera over the table, Caleb said, I'll get part of the dining room, too. You miss the whole nook, though, Caroline said. If it's over the back door, you can sweep both ways. Gary shielded himself with the door of the liquor cabinet while he poured four ounces of gin onto ice. Alt 85, Caleb read from his catalogue. That means the camera can look almost straight down. Still shielded by the cabinet door, Gary took a hefty, warmish gulp. Then, closing the cabinet, he held up the glass in case anyone cared to see what a relatively modest drink he'd poured himself. Hate to break it to you, he said, but surveillance is out. It's not appropriate as a hobby. Dad, you said it was okay as long as I stayed interested. I said I would think about it. Caleb shook his head vehemently. No, you didn't. You said I could do it as long as I didn't get bored. That is exactly what you said, Caroline confirmed with an unpleasant smile. Yes, Caroline, I'm sure you heard every word, but we're not putting this kitchen under surveillance. Caleb, you do not have my permission to make those purchases. Dad! That's my decision. It's final. Caleb, it doesn't matter, though, Caroline said. Gary, it doesn't matter, because he's got his own money. He can spend it however he wants, right, Caleb? Out of Gary's sight, below the level of the table, she gave Caleb some kind of hand signal. Right, I've got my own savings. Caleb's tone again, ironic or enthusiastic or, somehow, both. You and I will talk about this later, Carol, Gary said. Warmth and perversion and stupidity, all deriving from the gin, were descending from behind his ears and down his arms and torso. Jonah came back inside, smelling like mesquite. Caroline had opened a second large bag of potato chips. Don't spoil your appetite, guys, Gary said in a strained voice, taking food from plastic compartments. Again, mother and son traded glances. Yeah, right, Caleb said. Gotta save room for mixed grill. Gary energetically sliced meats and skewered vegetables. Jonah set the table, spacing the flatware with the precision that he liked. The rain had stopped, but the deck was still slippery when Gary went outside. It had started as a family joke. 
Dad always orders the mixed grill in restaurants. Dad only wants to go to restaurants with mixed grill on the menu. To Gary there was indeed something endlessly delicious, something irresistibly luxurious, about a bit of lamb, a bit of pork, a bit of veal, and a lean and tender modern-style sausage or two, a classic mixed grill, in short. It was such a treat that he began to do his own mixed grills at home. Along with pizza and Chinese takeout and one-pot pasta meals, mixed grill became a family staple. Caroline helped out by bringing home multiple heavy, blood-damp bags of meat and sausage every Saturday, and before long Gary was doing mixed grill two or even three times a week, braving all but the foulest weather on the deck and loving it. He did partridge breasts, chicken livers, filet mignons, and Mexican-flavored turkey sausage. He did zucchini and red peppers. He did eggplant, yellow peppers, baby lamb chops, Italian sausage. He came up with a wonderful bratwurst ribeye bok choy combo. He loved it and loved it and loved it, and then, all at once, he didn't. The clinical term anhedonia had introduced itself to him in a nightstand book of Caroline's called Feeling Great, Ashley Trowpiss, M.D., Ph.D., He'd read the dictionary entry for anhedonia with a shiver of recognition, a kind of malignant, yes, yes, a psychological condition characterized by inability to experience pleasure in normally pleasurable acts. Anhedonia was more than a warning sign. It was an out-and-out -out symptom, a dry rot spreading from pleasure to pleasure, a fungus spoiling the delight and luxury and joy and leisure which for so many years had fueled Gary's resistance to the poor think of his parents. The previous March in St. Jude, Enid had observed that for a bank vice president married to a woman who worked only part-time pro bono for the Children's Defense Fund, Gary seemed to do an awful lot of cooking. Gary had shut his mother up easily enough. She was married to a man who couldn't boil an egg, and obviously she was jealous. But on Gary's birthday, after he'd flown back from St. Jude with Jonah and received the expensive surprise of a color photo lab, after he'd mustered the will to exclaim, A dark room! Fantastic! I love it! I love it! Caroline handed him a platter of raw prawns and brutal swordfish steaks to grill, and he wondered if his mother had a point. On the deck... In the radiant heat, as he blackened the prawns and seared the swordfish, a weariness overtook him. The aspects of his life not related to grilling now seemed like mere blips of extraneity between the poundingly recurrent moments when he ignited the mesquite and paced the deck, avoiding smoke. Shutting his eyes, he saw twisted boogers of browning meats on a grill of chrome and hellish coals the eternal broiling, broiling of the damned, the parching torments of compulsive repetition. On the inner walls of the grill, a deep-piled carpet of phenolic black greases had accumulated. The ground behind the garage where he dumped the ashes resembled a moonscape or the yard of a cement plant. He was very, very, very sick of mixed grill. And the next morning he told Caroline, I'm doing too much cooking. So do less, she said. We'll eat out. I want to eat at home, and I want to do less cooking. So order in, she said. It's not the same. You're the one who's bent on having these sit-down dinners. The boys couldn't care less. I care about it. It's important to me. Fine, but, Gary, it's not important to me. It's not important to the boys, and we're supposed to cook for you? He couldn't entirely blame Caroline. In the years when she'd worked full-time, he'd never complained about frozen or takeout or pre-prepared dinners. To Caroline it probably seemed that he was changing the rules on her, but to Gary it seemed that the nature of family life itself was changing, that togetherness and filiality and fraternity weren't valued the way they were when he was young. And so, here he was, still grilling. Through the kitchen windows he could see Caroline thumb-wrestling Jonah. He could see her taking Aaron's headphones to listen to music, could see her nodding to the beat. It sure looked like family life. Was there really anything amiss here but the clinical depression of the man peering in? 
Caroline seemed to have forgotten how much her back hurt, but she remembered as soon as he went inside with the steaming, smoking platter of vulcanized animal protein. She seated herself sideways at the table, nudged her food with a fork, and whimpered softly. Caleb and Aaron regarded her with grave concern. Doesn't anyone else want to know how Prince Caspian ends? Jonas said. Isn't anyone curious at all? Caroline's eyelids were fluttering, her mouth hanging open miserably to let air trickle in and out. Gary struggled to think of something undepressed to say, something reasonably unhostile, but he was rather drunk. Jesus, Caroline, he said, we know your back hurts. We know you're miserable, but if you can't even sit up straight at the table. Without a word, she slid off her chair, hobbled to the sink with her plate, scraped her dinner into the garbage grinder, and hobbled upstairs. Caleb and Aaron excused themselves and ground up their own dinners and followed her. Altogether, maybe thirty dollars' worth of meat went into the sewer. But Gary, trying to keep his factor three levels off the floor, succeeded pretty well in forgetting about the animals that had died for this purpose. He sat in the leaden twilight of his buzz, ate without tasting, and listened to Jonah's impervious bright chatter. This is an excellent skirt steak, Dad, and I would love another piece of that grilled zucchini, please. From the entertainment room upstairs came the woofing of prime time. Gary felt briefly sorry for Aaron and Caleb. It was a burden to have a mother need you so extremely to be responsible for her bliss. Gary knew this. He also understood that Caroline was more alone in the world than he was. Her father had been a handsome, charismatic anthropologist who died in a plane crash in Mali when she was eleven. Her father's parents, old Quakers who intermittently said thee, had left her half of their estate, including a well-regarded Andrew Wyeth, three Winslow Homer watercolors, and forty sylvan acres near Kennett Square, for which a developer had paid an incredible sum. Caroline's mother, now seventy-six, and in scarily good health, lived with her second husband in Laguna Beach and was a major benefactor of the California Democratic Party. She came east every April and bragged about not being one of those old women who were obsessed with their grandkids. Caroline's only sibling, a brother named Philip, was a patronizing, pocket-protected bachelor and solid-state physicist on whom her mother doted somewhat creepily. Gary hadn't known this kind of family in St. Jude. From the start he'd loved and pitied Caroline for the misfortune and neglect she'd suffered growing up he'd undertaken to provide a better family for her. But after dinner, while he and Jonah were loading the dishwasher, he began to hear female laughter upstairs, actual loud laughter, and he decided that Caroline was doing something very bad to him. He was tempted to go up and crash the party. As the buzzing of the gin faded from his head, however, the clanging of an earlier anxiety was becoming audible, an Exxon-related anxiety. He wondered why a small company with a highly experimental process was bothering to offer his father money. That the letter to Alfred had come from Bragg, Neuter, and Spey, a firm that often worked closely with investment bankers, suggested due diligence, a dotting of I's and crossing of T's on the eve of something big. Do you want to go and be with your brothers? Gary said to Jonah. It sounds like fun up there. No, thank you, Jonah said. I'm going to read the next Narnia book, and I thought I might go to the basement where it's quiet. Will you come with me? The old playroom in the basement, still dehumidified and carpeted and pine-paneled, still nice, was afflicted with the necrosis of clutter that sooner or later kills a living space. Stereo boxes, geometric styrofoam packing solids, outdated ski and beach gear and random drifts. Aaron and Caleb's old toys were in five big bins and a dozen smaller bins. Nobody but Jonah ever touched them, and in the face of such a glut even Jonah, alone or with a playdate pal, took an essentially archaeological approach. He might devote an afternoon to unpacking half of one large bin, patiently sorting action figures and related props, vehicles, and model buildings by scale and manufacturer, toys that matched nothing he flung behind the sofa, 
but he rarely reached the bottom of even one bin before his play date ended or dinner was served and he reburied everything he'd excavated. And so the toys, whose profusion ought to have been a seven-year-old's heaven, went basically unplayed with. Another lesson in anhedonia for Gary to ignore as well as he could. While Jonah settled down to read, Gary booted up Caleb's old laptop and went online. He typed the words Axon and Schwenksville in the search field. One of the two resulting site matches was the Axon Corporation homepage, but this site, when Gary tried to reach it, turned out to be under renovation. The other match led him to a deeply nested page in the website of West Portfolio Biofunds, whose listing of privately held corporations to watch was a cyber backwater of drab graphics and misspellings. The Axon page had last been updated a year earlier. Axon Corporation, 24 East Industrial Serpentine, Schwenksville, Pennsylvania, a limited liability corporation registered in the state of Delaware, holds worldwide rights to the Eberly process of directed neurochemotaxis. The Eberly process is protected by United States patents 5,101,239, 5,103,628, and 5,105,996, for which the Axon Corporation is the sole and exclusive grantor of license. Axon engages in refinement, marketing and sales of the Eberly process to hospitals and clinics worldwide and in research and development of related technologies. Its founder and chairman is Dr. Earl H. Eberly, former distinguished lecturer in applied neurobiology at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. The Eberly process of directed neurochemotaxis, also known as Eberly reverse tomographic chemotherapy, have revolutionized the treatment of inoperable neuroblastomas and a variety of other morphologic defects of the brain. The Eberly process utilizes computer-orchestrated RF radiation to direct powerful carcinocides, mutagens, and certain nonspecific toxins to diseased cerebral tissues and locally activate them without harm to surrounding healthy tissue. At present, due to limitations in computing power, the Eberly process requires sedating and immobilizing the patient in an Eberly cylinder for up to 36 hours, while minutely orchestrated fields direct therapeutically active ligands and their inert piggyback carriers to the site of disease. The next generation of Eberly cylinders is expected to reduce maximum total treatment time to less than two hours. The Eberly process received full FDA approval as a safe and effective therapy in October 1996. Widespread clinical use throughout the world in the years since then, as detailed in the numerous publications listed below, have only confirmed its safety and effectiveness. Gary's hopes of extracting quick megabucks from Axon were withering in the absence of online hype. Feeling a bit e-weary, fighting an e-headache, he ran a word search for Earl Eberly. The several hundred matches included articles with titles like New Hope for Neuroblastoma and A Giant Leap Forward and This Cure Really May Be a Miracle. Eberly and collaborators were also represented in professional journals with Remote Computer-Aided Stimulation of Receptor Sites 14, 16A, and 21, A Practical Demonstration. Four low toxicity ferroacetate complexes that cross the BBB. In vitro RF stimulation of colloidal microtubules and a dozen other papers. The reference that most interested Gary, however, had appeared in Forbes ASAP six months earlier. Some of these developments, such as the Fogarty balloon catheter and LASIK corneal surgery, are cash cows for their respective corporate patent holders. Others, with esoteric names like the Eberly process of directed neurochemotaxis, enrich their inventors the old-fashioned way, one man, one fortune. The Eberly process, which as late as 1996 lacked regulatory approval, but today is recognized as the gold standard for the treatment of a large class of cerebral tumors and lesions, is estimated to net its inventor, Johns Hopkins neurobiologist Earl H., 
Curly, Eberly as much as $40 million annually in licensing fees and other revenues worldwide. $40 million annually was more like it. $40 million annually restored Gary's hopes and pissed him off all over again. Earl Eberly earned $40 million annually, while Alfred Lambert, also an inventor, but let's face it, a loser by temperament, one of the meek of the earth, was offered 5000 for his trouble, and planned to split this pea with Orphic Midland. I'm loving this book, Jonah reported. This may be my favorite book yet. So why, Gary wondered, why the rush-rush to get Dad's patent, eh, Curly? Why the big push-push? Financial intuition, a warm tingling in his loins, told him that perhaps, after all, a piece of inside information had fallen into his lap. A piece of inside information from an accidental and therefore perfectly lawful source. A juicy piece of private meat. It's like they're on a luxury cruise, Jonah said, except they're trying to sail to the end of the world. See, that's where Aslan lives, at the end of the world. In the SEC's Edgar database, Gary found an unapproved prospectus, a so-called red herring prospectus for an initial public offering of Axon stock. The offering was scheduled for December 15th, three-plus months away. The lead underwriter was Heavy and Hodap, one of the elite investment banks. Gary checked certain vital signs, cash flow, size of issue, size of float, and loins tingling, hit the download later button. Jonah, nine o'clock, he said. Run up and take your bath. I would love to go on a luxury cruise, Dad, Jonah said, climbing the stairs, if that could ever be arranged. In a different search field, his hands a little Parkinsonian, Gary entered the words beautiful, nude, and blonde. Shut the door, please, Jonah. On the screen, an image of a beautiful nude blonde appeared. Gary pointed and clicked, and a nude tan man, photographed mainly from the rear, but also in close-up from his knees to his navel, could be seen giving his fully tumid attention to the beautiful nude blonde. There was something of the assembly line in these images. The beautiful nude blonde was like fresh raw material that the nude tan man was extremely keen to process with his tool. First, the material's colorful fabric casing was removed, then the material was placed on its knees, and the semi-skilled worker fitted his tool into its mouth, then the material was placed on its back while the worker orally calibrated it, then the worker clamped the material into a series of horizontal and vertical positions, crimping and bending the material as necessary, and very vigorously processed it with his tool. The pictures were softening rather than hardening Gary. He wondered if he'd reached the age where money excited him more than a beautiful nude blonde engaging in sex acts, or whether anhedonia, the solitary father's depression in a basement, might be encroaching even here. Upstairs the doorbell rang. Adolescent feet came pounding down from the second floor to answer it. Gary hastily cleansed the computer screen and went upstairs in time to see Caleb returning to the second floor with a large pizza box. Gary followed him and stood for a moment outside the entertainment room, smelling pepperoni and listening to the wordless munching of his sons and wife. On TV, something military, a tank or a truck, was roaring to the accompaniment of war movie music. They increase the pressure, Lieutenant. Now you will talk. Now... In hands-off parenting, skills for the next millennium, Dr. Harriet L. Schachtman warned, all too often today's anxious parents protect their children from the so-called ravages of TV and computer games only to expose them to the far more damaging ravages of social ostracization by their peers. To Gary, who as a boy had been allowed half an hour of TV a day and had not felt ostracized, Schachtman's theory seemed a recipe for letting a community's most permissive parents set standards that other parents were forced to lower their own to meet. But Caroline subscribed to the theory wholeheartedly, and since she was the sole trustee of Gary's ambition not to be like his father, and since she believed that kids learned more from peer interaction than from parental instruction, 
Gary deferred to her judgment and let the boys watch nearly unlimited TV. What he hadn't foreseen was that he himself would be the ostracized. He retreated to his study and dialed St. Jude again. The kitchen cordless was still on his desk, a reminder of earlier unpleasantness and a fight still to come. He was hoping to speak to Enid, but Alfred answered the telephone and said that she was over at the Roots' house, socializing. We had a street association meeting tonight, he said. Gary considered calling back later, but he refused to be cowed by his father. Dad, he said, I've done some research on Axon. We're looking at a company with a lot of money. Gary, I said I didn't want you monkeying with this, Alfred replied. It is moot now anyway. What do you mean moot? I mean moot. It's taken care of. The documents are notarized. I'm recouping my lawyer's fees, and that's the end of it. Gary pressed two fingers into his forehead. My God, Dad, you had it notarized? On a Sunday? I will tell your mother that you called. Do not put those documents in the mail, do you hear me? Gary, I've had about enough of this. Well, too bad, because I'm just getting started. I've asked you not to speak of it. If you will not behave like a decent, civilized person, then I have no choice. Your decency is bullshit. Your civilization is bullshit. It's weakness. It's fear. It's bullshit. I have no wish to discuss this. Then forget it. I intend to. We'll not speak of it again. Your mother and I will visit for two days next month, and we will hope to see you here in December. It's my wish that we can all be civil. Never mind what's going on underneath, as long as we're all civil. That is the essence of my philosophy. Yes. Well, it ain't mine, Gary said. I'm aware of that, and that's why we will spend 48 hours and no more. Gary hung up angrier than ever. He'd hoped his parents would stay for an entire week in October. He'd wanted them to eat pie in Lancaster County, see a production at the Annenberg Center drive in the Poconos, pick apples in Westchester, hear Aaron play the trumpet, watch Caleb play soccer, take delight in Jonah's company, and generally see how good Gary's life was, how worthy of their admiration and respect. And forty-eight hours was not enough time. He left his study and kissed Jonah goodnight. Then he took a shower and lay down on the big oaken bed and tried to interest himself in the latest ink. But he couldn't stop arguing with Alfred in his head. During his visit home in March, he'd been appalled by how much his father had deteriorated in the few weeks since Christmas. Alfred seemed forever on the verge of derailing as he lurched down hallways or half-slid downstairs or wolfed at a sandwich from which lettuce and meatloaf reigned. Checking his watch incessantly, his eyes wandering whenever a conversation didn't engage him directly, the old iron horse was careering toward a crash, and Gary could hardly stand to look. But who else, if not Gary, was going to take responsibility? Enid was hysterical and moralizing, Denise lived in fantasy land, and Chip hadn't been to St. Jude in three years. Who else but Gary was going to say, this train should not be running on these tracks? The First Order of Business As Gary saw it, was to sell the house get top dollar for it, move his parents into someplace smaller, newer, safer, cheaper, and invest the difference aggressively. The house was Enid and Alfred's only large asset, and Gary took a morning to inspect the whole property slowly, inside and out. He found cracks in the grouting, rust lines in the bathroom sinks, and a softness in the master bedroom ceiling. He noticed rain stains on the inner wall of the back porch, a beard of dried suds on the chin of the old dishwasher, an alarming thump in the forced air blower, pustules and ridges in the driveway's asphalt, termites in the woodpile, a Damoclean oak limb dangling above a dormer, finger-wide cracks in the foundation, retaining walls that listed, white caps of peeling paint on window jams, big emboldened spiders in the basement, fields of dried sow bug and cricket husks, unfamiliar fungal and enteric smells everywhere he looked, the sag of entropy. Even in a rising market, the house was beginning to lose value, and Gary thought, we've got to sell this fucker now. We can't lose another day. On the last morning of his visit, 
While Jonah helped Enid bake a birthday cake, Gary took Alfred to the hardware store. As soon as they were on the road, Gary said it was time to put the house on the market. Alfred, in the passenger seat of the Gerontic Olds, stared straight ahead. Why? If you miss the spring season, Gary said, you'll have to wait another year. And you can't afford another year. You can't count on good health, and the house is losing value. Alfred shook his head. I've agitated for a long time. One bedroom and a kitchen is all we need. Somewhere your mother can cook and we have a place to sit. But it's no use. She doesn't want to leave. Dad, if you don't put yourself someplace manageable, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to wind up in a nursing home. I have no intention of going to a nursing home. So, just because you don't intend to doesn't mean it won't happen. Alfred looked, in passing, at Gary's old elementary school. Where are we going? You fall down the stairs, you slip on the ice and break your hip, you're going to end up in a nursing home. Caroline's grandmother... I didn't hear where we were going. We're going to the hardware store, Gary said. Mom wants a dimmer switch for the kitchen. Alfred shook his head. She and her romantic lighting. She gets pleasure from it, Gary said. What do you get pleasure from? What do you mean? I mean, you've just about worn her out. Alfred's active hands on his lap were gathering nothing, raking in a poker pot that did not exist. I'll ask you again not to meddle, he said. The mid-morning light of a late winter thaw, the stillness of a weekday non-hour in St. Jude, Gary wondered how his parents stood it. The oak trees were the same oily black as the crows perching in them. The sky was the same color as the salt-white pavement on which elderly St. Judean drivers obeying barbiturate speed limits were crawling to their destinations, to malls with pools of meltwater on their papered roofs, to the arterial that overlooked puddled steel yards and the state mental hospital and transmission towers feeding soaps and game shows to the ether to the beltways and beyond them to a million acres of thawing hinterland where pickups were axle-deep in clay, and twenty-twos were fired in the woods and only gospel and pedal steel guitars were on the radio, to residential blocks with the same pallid glare in every window, besquirreled yellow lawns with a random plastic toy or two embedded in the dirt, a mailman whistling something Celtic and slamming mailboxes harder than he had to because the deadness of these streets at such a non-hour in such a non-season could honestly kill you. Are you happy with your life? Gary said, waiting for a left-turn arrow. Can you say you're ever happy? Gary, I have an affliction. A lot of people have afflictions. If that's your excuse, fine. If you want to feel sorry for yourself, fine. But why drag Mom down? Well, you'll be leaving tomorrow. Meaning what? Gary said. That you'll sit in your chair and Mom will cook and clean for you? There are things in life that simply have to be endured. Why bother staying alive if that's your attitude? What do you have to look forward to? I ask myself that question every day. Well, and what's your answer? Gary said. What's your answer? What do you think I should look forward to? Travel. I've traveled enough. I spent thirty years traveling. Time with family. Time with people you love. No comment. What do you mean, no comment? Just that. No comment. You're still sore about Christmas. You may interpret it however you like. If you're sore about Christmas, you might have the consideration to say so. No comment. Instead of insinuating. We should have come two days later and left two days earlier, Alfred said. That's all I have to say on the topic of Christmas. We should have stayed forty-eight hours. It's because you're depressed, Dad. You are clinically depressed. And so are you. And the responsible thing would be to get some treatment. Did you hear me? I said... So are you. What are you talking about? Figure it out. Dad, really, no, what are you talking about? I'm not the one who sits in a chair all day and sleeps. Underneath you are, Alfred pronounced. That's simply false, 
One day you will see. I will not, Gary said. My life is on a fundamentally different basis than yours. Mark my words. I look at your marriage, I see what I see. Someday you'll see it too. That's empty talk and you know it. You just pissed off with me and you have no way to deal with it. I've told you I don't want to discuss this. And I have no respect for that. Well, there are things in your life that I have no respect for either. It shouldn't have hurt to hear that Alfred, who was wrong about almost everything, did not respect things in Gary's life. And yet it did hurt. At the hardware store, he let Alfred pay for the dimmer switch. The old man's careful plucking of bills from his slender wallet and his faint hesitation before he offered them were signs of his respect for a dollar, of his maddening belief that each one mattered. Back at the house, while Gary and Jonah kicked a soccer ball, Alfred gathered tools and killed the power to the kitchen and set about installing the dimmer. Even at this late date, it didn't occur to Gary not to let Alfred handle wiring. But when he came inside for lunch, he found that his father had done no more than remove the old switchplate. He was holding the dimmer switch like a detonator that made him shake with fear. My affliction makes this difficult, he explained. You've got to sell this house, Gary said. After lunch, he took his mother and his son to the St. Jude Museum of Transport. While Jonah climbed into old locomotives and toured the dry-docked submarine and Enid sat and nursed her sore hip, Gary compiled a mental list of the museum's exhibits, hoping the list would give him a feeling of accomplishment. He couldn't deal with the exhibits themselves, their exhausting informativeness, their cheerful prose for the masses. The golden age of steam power, the dawn of flight, a century of automotive safety. Block after block of taxing text. What Gary hated most about the Midwest was how unpampered and unprivileged he felt in it. St. Jude, in its optimistic egalitarianism, consistently failed to accord him the respect to which his gifts and attainments entitled him. Oh, the sadness of this place! The earnest St. Judean rubes all around him seemed curious and undepressed, happily filling their misshapen heads with facts, as if facts were going to save them. Not one woman half as pretty or as well-dressed as Caroline. Not one other man with a decent haircut or an abdomen as flat as Gary's. But, like Alfred, like Enid, they were all extremely deferential. They didn't jostle Gary or cut in front of him, but waited until he drifted to the next exhibit. Then they gathered round and read and learned. God, he hated the Midwest. He could hardly breathe or hold his head up. He thought he might be getting sick. He took refuge in the museum's gift shop and bought a silver belt buckle, two engravings of old Midland Pacific trestles, and a pewter hip flask, all for himself, a deerskin wallet for Aaron, and a CD-ROM Civil War game for Caleb. Dad? Jonah said. Grandma says she'll buy me two books that cost less than ten dollars each or one book for less than twenty dollars. Is that okay? Enid and Jonah were a love fest. Enid had always preferred little kids to big kids, and Jonah's adaptive niche in the family ecosystem was to be the perfect grandchild, eager to scramble up on laps, unafraid of bitter vegetables, underexcited by television and computer games, and skilled at cheerfully answering questions like, Are you loving school? In St. Jude he was luxuriating in the undivided attention of three adults. He declared St. Jude the nicest place he'd ever been. From the back seat of the old folksmobile, his elfin eyes wide, he marveled at everything Enid showed him. It's so easy to park here. No traffic. The transport museum is better than any museums we have, Dad, don't you agree? I love the legroom in this car. I think this is the nicest car I've ever ridden in. All the stores are so close and handy. That night, after they'd returned from the museum and Gary had gone out and done more shopping, Enid served stuffed pork chops and a chocolate birthday cake. Jonah was dreamily eating ice cream when she asked him if he might like to come and have Christmas in St. Jude. I would love that, 
Jonah said, his eyelids drooping with satiety. You could have sugar cookies and eggnog and help us decorate the tree, Enid said. It'll probably snow, so you can go sledding. And, Jonah, there's a wonderful light show every year at Waynedell Park. It's called Christmas Land. They have the whole park lit up. Mother, it's March, Gary said. Can we come at Christmas? Jonah asked him. We'll come again very soon, Gary said. I don't know about Christmas. I think Jonah would love it, Enid said. I would completely love it. Jonah said, hoisting another spoonload of ice cream. I think it might turn out to be the best Christmas I ever had. I think so, too, Enid said. It's March, Gary said. We don't talk about Christmas in March, remember? We don't talk about it in June or August, either, remember? Well, Alfred said, standing up from the table, I am going to bed. St. Jude gets my vote for Christmas, Jonah said enlisting Jonah directly in her campaign. Exploiting a little boy for leverage seemed to Gary a low trick on Enid's part. After he'd put Jonah to bed, he told his mother that Christmas ought to be the last of her worries. Dad can't even install a light switch, he said. And now you've got a leak upstairs, you've got water coming in around the chimney. I love this house, Enid said from the kitchen sink where she was scrubbing the pork chop pan. Dad just needs to work a little on his attitude. He needs shock treatments or medication, Gary said. And if you want to dedicate your life to being his servant, that's your choice. If you want to live in an old house with a lot of problems and try to keep everything just the way you like it, that's fine, too. If you want to wear yourself out trying to do both, be my guest. Just don't ask me to make Christmas plans in March so you can feel okay about it all. Enid upended the pork chop pan on the counter beside the overloaded drainer. Gary knew he ought to pick up a towel, but the jumble of wet pans and platters and utensils from his birthday dinner made him weary. To dry them seemed a task as Sisyphean as to repair the things wrong with his parents' house. The only way to avoid despair was not to involve himself at all. He poured a smallish brandy nightcap while Enid, with unhappy stabbing motions, scraped waterlogged food scraps from the bottom of the sink. What do you think I should do? she said. Sell the house, Gary said. Call a realtor tomorrow. And move into some cramped, modern condominium? Enid shook the repulsive wet scraps from her hand into the trash. When I have to go out for the day, Dave and Mary Beth invite Dad over for lunch. He loves that, and I feel so comfortable knowing he's with them. Last fall he was out planting a new yew, and he couldn't get the old stump out, and Joe Person came over with a pickaxe, and the two of them worked all afternoon together. He shouldn't be planting yews, Gary said, regretting already the smallness of his initial pour. He shouldn't be using a pickaxe. The man can hardly stand up. Gary, I know we can't be here forever, but I want to have one last, really nice family Christmas here, and I want... Would you consider moving if we had that Christmas? New hope sweetened Enid's expression. Would you and Caroline consider coming? I can't make any promises. Gary said. But if you'd feel more comfortable about putting the house on the market, we would certainly consider... I would adore it if you came. Adore it. Mother, though, you have to be realistic. Let's get through this year, Enid said. Let's think about having Christmas here, like Jonah wants, and then we'll see. Gary's anhedonia had worsened when he returned to Chestnut Hill. As a winter project... He'd been distilling hundreds of hours of home videos into a watchable two-hour Greatest Lambert Hits compilation that he could make quality copies of and maybe send out as a video Christmas card. In the final edit, as he repeatedly reviewed his favorite family scenes and re his favorite songs, Wild Horses, Time After Time, etc., he began to hate these scenes and hate these songs. And when, in the new darkroom, he turned his attention to the all-time Lambert 200, he found that he no longer enjoyed looking at still photographs either. For years he'd mentally tinkered with the all-time 200 as with an ideally balanced mutual fund, listing with great satisfaction the images that he was sure belonged in it. Now he wondered whom, besides himself, he was trying to impress with these pictures. Whom was he trying to persuade, and of what? 
he had a weird impulse to burn his old favorites. But his entire life was set up as a correction of his father's life, and he and Caroline had long agreed that Alfred was clinically depressed. And clinical depression was known to have genetic bases and to be substantially heritable. And so Gary had no choice but to keep resisting anhedonia, keep gritting his teeth, keep doing his best to have fun. He came awake with an itching hard on, and Caroline beside him in the sheets. His nightstand light was still burning, but otherwise the room was dark. Caroline lay in sarcophagal posture, her back flat on the mattress and the pillow beneath her knees. Through the screens on the bedroom windows came seeping the coolish, humid air of a summer grown tired. No wind stirred the leaves of the sycamore whose lowest branches hung outside the windows. On Caroline's nightstand was a hardcover copy of Middle Ground, How to Spare Your Child, the Adolescence You Had, Karen Tamkin, Ph.D., 1998. She seemed to be asleep. Her long arm, kept flabless by thrice weekly swims at the cricket club, rested at her side. Gary gazed at her little nose, her wide red mouth, the blonde down and the dull sheen of sweat on her upper lip the tapering strip of exposed blonde skin between the hem of her T-shirt and the elastic of her old Swarthmore College gym shorts. Her nearer breast pushed out against the inside of the T-shirt, the carmine definition of its nipple faintly visible through the fabric's stretched weave. When he reached out and smoothed her hair, her entire body jerked as if the hand were a defibrillator paddle. "'What's going on here?' he said. My back is killing me. An hour ago you were laughing and feeling great. Now you're sore again? The Motrin's wearing off. The mysterious resurgence of the pain. You haven't said a sympathetic word since I hurt my back. Because you're lying about how you hurt it, Gary said. My God, again? Two hours of soccer and horseplay in the rain. That's not the problem. It's the ringing phone. Yes, Caroline said, because your mother won't spend ten cents to leave a message. She has to let it ring three times and then hang up, ring three times and then hang up. It has nothing to do with anything you did, Gary said. It's my mom. She magically flew here and kicked you in the back because she wants to hurt you. After listening to it ring and stop and ring and stop all afternoon, I'm a nervous wreck. Caroline, I saw you limping before you ran inside. I saw the look on your face. Don't tell me you weren't in pain already. She shook her head. You know what this is? And then the eavesdropping. Do you know what this is? You're listening on the only other free phone in the house, and you have the gall to tell me, Gary, you're depressed. Do you realize that? He laughed. I don't think so. You're brooding and suspicious and obsessive. You walk around with a black look on your face. You don't sleep well. You don't seem to get pleasure out of anything. You're changing the subject, he said. My mother called because she had a reasonable request regarding Christmas. Reasonable? Now Caroline laughed. Gary, she is bonkers on the topic of Christmas. She is a lunatic. Oh, Caroline, really. I mean it. Really, Caroline. They're going to be selling that house soon. They want us all to visit one more time before they die, Caroline. Before my parents die... We've always agreed about this. We agreed that five people with busy lives should not have to fly at the peak holiday season so that two people with nothing in their lives wouldn't have to come here. And I've been more than happy to have them. The hell you have! Until suddenly the rules change. You have not been happy to have them here, Caroline. They're at the point where they won't even stay for more than 48 hours. And this is my fault? She was directing her gestures and facial expressions somewhat eerily at the ceiling. What you don't understand, Gary, is that this is an emotionally healthy family. I am a loving and deeply involved mother. I have three intelligent, creative, and emotionally healthy children. If you think there's a problem in this house, you better take a look at yourself. I'm making a reasonable proposal, Gary said, and you're calling me depressed. So it's never occurred to you? The minute I bring up Christmas, I'm depressed. Seriously, are you telling me it's never occurred to you in the last six months that you might have a clinical problem? It is extremely hostile, Caroline, to call another person crazy. 
not if the person potentially has a clinical problem. I'm proposing that we go to St. Jude. He said, if you won't talk about it like an adult, I'll make my own decision. Oh, yeah? Caroline made a contemptuous noise. I guess Jonah might go with you, but see if you can get Aaron and Caleb on the plane with you. Just ask them where they'd rather be for Christmas. Just ask them whose team they're on. I was under the impression that we're a family, Gary said, and that we do things together. You're the one deciding unilaterally. Tell me this is not a marriage-ending problem. You're the one who's changed. Because no, Caroline, that is, no, that is ridiculous. There are good reasons to make a one-time exception this year. You're depressed, she said, and I want you back. I'm tired of living with a depressed old man. Gary, for his part, wanted back the Caroline, who just a few nights ago had clutched him in bed when there was heavy thunder. The Caroline who came skipping toward him when he walked into a room. The semi-orphaned girl whose most fervent wish was to be on his team. But he'd also always loved how tough she was, how unlike a Lambert, how fundamentally unsympathetic to his family. Over the years he'd collected certain remarks of hers into a kind of personal decalogue, an all-time Caroline Ten, to which he privately referred for strength and sustenance. One, you're nothing at all like your father. Two, you don't have to apologize for buying the BMW. Three, your dad emotionally abuses your mom. Four, I love the taste of your cum. Five, work was the drug that ruined your father's life. Six, let's buy both. Seven, your family has a diseased relationship with food. Eight, you're an incredibly good-looking man. Nine, Denise is jealous of what you have. Ten, there's absolutely nothing useful about suffering. He'd subscribed to this credo for years and years, had felt deeply indebted to Caroline for each remark. And now he wondered how much of it was true. Maybe none of it. I'm calling the travel agent tomorrow morning, he said. And I'm telling you, Caroline replied immediately, call Dr. Pierce instead. You need to talk to somebody. I need somebody who tells the truth. You want the truth? You want me to tell you why I'm not going? Caroline sat up and leaned forward at the funny angle that her backache dictated. You really want to know? Gary's eyes fell shut. The crickets outside sounded like water running interminably in pipes. From the distance came a rhythmic canine barking like the down thrusts of a handsaw. The truth, Caroline said, is that forty-eight hours sounds just about right to me. I don't want my children looking back on Christmas as the time when everybody screamed at each other, which basically seems to be unavoidable now. Your mother walks in the door with 360 days' worth of Christmas mania she's been obsessing since the previous January. And then, of course, where's that Austrian reindeer figurine? Don't you like it? Don't you use it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is the Austrian reindeer figurine? She's got her food obsessions, her money obsessions, her clothes obsessions. She's got the whole ten-piece set of baggage, which my husband used to agree is kind of a problem. But now, suddenly, out of the blue, he's taking her side. We're going to turn the house inside out, looking for a piece of thirteen-dollar gift store kitsch, because it has sentimental value to your mother, Caroline. And when it turns out that Caleb... This is not an honest version. Please, Gary, let me finish. When it turns out that Caleb did the kind of thing that any normal boy might do to a piece of gift store crap that he found in the basement, I can't listen to this. No, no, the problem is not that your eagle-eyed mother is obsessed with some garbagey piece of Austrian kitsch. No, that's not the problem. It was a hundred dollar hand carved. I don't care if it's a thousand dollars. Since when do you punish him, your own son, for your mother's craziness? It's like you're suddenly trying to make us act like it's 1964 and we're all living in Peoria. Clean your plate, wear a necktie, no TV tonight, and you wonder why we're fighting? You wonder why Aaron rolls his eyes when your mom walks in the room? It's like you're embarrassed to let her see us. It's like for as long as she's here, you're trying to pretend we live somewhere that she approves of. But I'm telling you, Gary, we have nothing to be ashamed of. Your mother's the one who should be embarrassed. She follows me around the kitchen, scrutinizing me like as if I roast a turkey every week, and if I turn my back for one second, she's going to pour a quart of oil into whatever I'm making, and as soon as I leave the room, she's going to root through the trash like some fucking food police. She's going to take food from the trash and feed it to my children. The potato was in the sink, not the trash, Caroline. 
and you defend her. She goes outside to the trash barrels to see what other dirt she can dig up and disapprove of, and she's asking me literally every ten minutes, how's your back, how's your back, how's your back? Is your back any better? How'd you hurt it? Is your back any better? How's your back? She goes looking for things to disapprove of, and then she tries to tell my children how to dress for dinner in my house, and you don't back me up. You don't back me up, Gary. You start apologizing, and I don't get it, but I'm not doing it again. Basically, I think your brother's got the right idea. Here's a sweet, smart, funny man who's honest enough to say what he can and can't tolerate in the way of get-togethers, and your mother acts like he's this huge embarrassment and failure. Well, you wanted the truth. The truth is, I cannot stand another Christmas like that. If we absolutely have to see your parents, we're doing it on our own turf, just like you promised we always would. A pillow of blue blackness lay on Gary's brain. He'd reached the point on the post-Martini evening downslope where a sense of complication weighed on his cheeks, his forehead, his eyelids, his mouth. He understood how much his mother infuriated Caroline, and at the same time he found fault with almost everything that Caroline had said. The rather beautiful wooden reindeer, for example, had been stored in a well-marked box. Caleb had broken two of its legs, and hammered a roofing nail through its skull. Enid had taken an uneaten baked potato from the sink and sliced it and fried it for Jonah. And Caroline hadn't bothered to wait until her in-laws had left town before depositing in a trash barrel the pink polyester bathrobe that Enid had given her for Christmas. When I said I wanted the truth, he said, not opening his eyes, I meant I saw you limping, before you ran inside. Oh, my God, Caroline said. My mother didn't hurt your back. You hurt your back. Please, Gary, do me a favor and call Dr. Pierce. Admit that you're lying, and I'll talk about anything you want, but nothing's going to change until you admit that. I don't even recognize your voice. Five days in St. Jude. You can't do that for a woman who, like you say, has nothing else in her life? Please, come back to me. A jolt of rage forced Gary's eyes open. He kicked the sheet aside and jumped out of bed. This is a marriage ender. I can't believe it. Gary, please, we're going to split up over a trip to St. Jude. And then a visionary in a warm-up jacket was lecturing to pretty college students. Behind the visionary, in a pixelated middle distance, were sterilizers and chromatography cartridges and tissue stains and weak solution, long-necked medico-scientific faucets, pinups of spread-eagled chromosomes, and diagrams of tuna-red brains sliced up like sashimi. The visionary was Earl Curly Eberly, a small-mouthed fifty-year-old in dime-store glasses whom the creators of the Axon Corporation's promotional video had done their best to make glamorous. The camera work was nervous. The lab floor pitched and lurched. Blurry zooms zeroed in on female student faces aglow with fascination. Curiously obsessive attention was paid to the back of the visionary head. It was indeed purely. Of course, chemistry, too, even brain chemistry. Eberly was saying, is basically just manipulation of electrons in their shells, but compare this, if you will, to an electronics that consists of little two- and three-pole switches. The diode, the transistor, the brain, by contrast, has several dozen kinds of switches. The neuron either fires or it doesn't, but this decision is regulated by receptor sites that often have shades of offness and onness between plane off and plane on. Even if you could build an artificial neuron out of molecular transistors, the conventional wisdom is that you can still never translate all that chemistry into the language of yes, no, without running out of space. If we conservatively estimate twenty neuroactive ligands, of which as many as eight can operate simultaneously, and each of these eight switches has five different settings, not to bore you with the combinatorics, but unless you're living in a world of Mr. Potato Heads, you're going to be a pretty funny-looking android. Close-up of a turnip-headed male student laughing. Now, these are facts so basic 
Eberly said, that we ordinarily wouldn't even bother spelling them out. It's just the way things are. The only workable connection we have with the electrophysiology of cognition and volition is chemical. That's the received wisdom, part of the gospel of our science. Nobody in their right mind would try to connect the world of neurons with the world of printed circuits. Eberly paused dramatically. Nobody, that is, but the Axon Corporation. Ripples of buzz crossed the sea of institutional investors who'd come to Ballroom B of the Four Seasons Hotel in central Philadelphia for the road show promoting Axon's initial public offering. A giant video screen had been set up on the dais. On each of the twenty round tables in the semi-dark ballroom were platters of satay and sushi appetizers with the appropriate dipping sauces. Gary was sitting with his sister, Denise, at a table near the door. He had hopes of transacting business at this road show, and he would rather have come alone. But Denise had insisted on having lunch, today being Monday and Monday being her one day off, and had invited herself along. Gary had figured that she would find political or moral or aesthetic reasons to deplore the proceedings, and, sure enough, she was watching the video with her eyes narrowed in suspicion and her arms crossed tightly. She was wearing a yellow shift, with a red floral print, black sandals, and a pair of Trotskyish round plastic glasses. But what really set her apart from the other women in Ballroom B was the bareness of her legs. Nobody who dealt in money did not wear stockings. What is the correctal process? Correctal, said the cut-out image of Curly Eberly, whose young audience had been digitally pureed into a uniform backdrop of tuna-red brain matter, is a revolutionary neurobiological therapy. Eberly was seated on an ergonomic desk chair in which, it now developed, he could float and swerve vertiginously through a graphical space representing the inner sea world of the intracranium. Kelpie ganglia and squid-like neurons and eel-like capillaries began to flash by. Originally conceived as a therapy for sufferers of PD and AD and other degenerative neurological diseases, Eberly said, Correctol has proved so powerful and versatile that its promise extends not only to therapy but to an outright cure and to a cure not only of these terrible degenerative afflictions, but also of a host of ailments typically considered psychiatric or even psychological. Simply put, Correctol offers, for the first time, the possibility of renewing and improving the hard wiring of an adult human brain. Ew, Denise said, wrinkling her nose. Gary by now was quite familiar with the Correctol process. He'd scrutinized Axon's red herring prospectus and read every analysis of the company he could find on the Internet and through the private services that Centrust subscribed to. Bearish analysts, mindful of recent gut-wrenching corrections in the biotech sector, were cautioning against investing in an untested medical technology that was at least six years from market. Certainly, a bank like Centrust with its fiduciary duty to be conservative, wasn't going to touch this IPO. But Axon's fundamentals were a lot healthier than those of most biotech startups, and to Gary, the fact that the company had bothered to buy his father's patent at such an early stage in Correctol's development was a sign of great corporate confidence. He saw an opportunity here to make some money and avenge Axon's screwing of his father and, more generally, be bold where Alfred had been timid. It happened that in June, as the first dominoes of the overseas currency crises were toppling, Gary had pulled most of his playing-around money out of Euro and Far Eastern growth funds. This money was available now for investment in Axon. And since the IPO was still three months away, and since the big sales push for it had not begun, and since the red herring contained such dubieties as give non-insiders pause, Gary should have had no trouble getting a commitment for 5,000 shares. But trouble was pretty much all he'd had. His own discount broker, who had barely heard of Axon, belatedly did his homework and called Gary back, with the news that his firm's allocation was a token 2,500 shares. 
Normally, a brokerage wouldn't commit more than 5% of its allocation to a single customer this early in the game. But since Gary had been the first to call, his man was willing to set aside 500 shares. Gary pushed for more, but the sad fact was that he was not a big-time customer. He typically invested in multiples of a hundred, and to save on commissions, he executed smaller trades himself online. Now, Caroline was a big investor. With Gary's guidance, she often bought in multiples of a thousand. Her broker worked for the largest house in Philadelphia, and there was no doubt that 4,500 shares of Axon's new issue could be found for a truly valued customer. This was how the game was played. Unfortunately, since the Sunday afternoon when she'd hurt her back, Gary and Caroline had been as close to not speaking as a couple could be and still function as parents. Gary was keen to get his full 5,000 shares of Axon, but he refused to sacrifice his principles and crawl back to his wife and beg her to invest for him. So, instead, he'd phoned his large-cap contact at Heavy and Hodap, a man named Pudge Portley, and asked to be put down for 5,000 shares of the offering on his own account. Over the years, in his fiduciary role at Cent Trust, Gary had bought a lot of stock from Portley, including some certifiable turkeys. Gary hinted now to Portley that Cent Trust might give him an even larger portion of its business in the future. But Portley, with weird hedginess, had agreed only to pass along Gary's request to Daffy Anderson, who was Heavy and Hodap's deal manager for the IPO. There had then ensued two maddening weeks during which Pudge Portley failed to call Gary back and confirm an allocation. Online buzz about Axon was building from a whisper to a roar. Two related major papers by Earl Eberly's team, Reverse Tomographic Stimulation of Synaptogenesis in Selected Neural Pathways and Transitory Positive Reinforcement in Dopamine-Deprived Limbic Circuits, Recent Clinical Progress, appeared in Nature and the New England Journal of Medicine within days of each other. The two papers received heavy coverage in the financial press, including a front-page notice in the Wall Street Journal. Analyst after analyst began to flash strong buys for Axon, and still Portly did not return Gary's messages, and Gary could feel the advantages of his insiderly head start disappearing hour by hour. 1. Have a Cocktail of ferrocitrates and ferroacetates specially formulated to cross the blood-brain barrier and accumulate interstitially, said the unseen pitchman whose voice had joined Earl Eberly's on the video soundtrack. We also stir in a mild, non-habit-forming sedative and a generous squirt of hazelnut mochaccino syrup, courtesy of the country's most popular chain of coffee bars. A female extra from the earlier lecture scene a girl with whose neurological functions there was clearly nothing in the slightest wrong, drank with great relish and sexily pulsing throat muscles a tall, frosty glass of correctol electrolytes. What was Dad's patent? Denise whispered to Gary. Ferroacetate gel something something? Gary nodded grimly. Electropolymerization. From his correspondence files at home, which contained, among other things, every letter he'd ever received from either of his parents, Gary had dug out an old copy of Alfred's patent. He wasn't sure he'd ever really looked at it. So impressed was he now by the old man's clear account of electrical anisotropy in certain ferro-organic gels and his proposal that these gels be used to minutely image living human tissues and create direct electrical contact with fine morphologic structures. Comparing the wording of the patent with the description of Correctol at Axon's newly renovated website, Gary was struck by the depth of similarity. Evidently, Alfred's $5,000 process was at the center of a process for which Axon now hoped to raise upward of $200 million. As if a man didn't have enough in his life to lie awake at night and fume about. Yo, Kelsey, yeah, Kelsey, give me 12,000 Exxon at 104 max, the young man sitting to Gary's left said suddenly and too loudly. 
The kid had a palm-top stock quarter, a wire in his ear, and the schizophrenic eyes of the cellularly occupied. Twelve thousand Exxon, upper limit one zero four, he said. Exxon. Axon? Better be careful, Gary thought. Two. Put on a headset and turn on the radio. You won't hear a thing, not unless your dental fillings pick up ball games on the AM dial, the pitchman joked as the smiling girl lowered onto her camera-friendly head a metal dome reminiscent of a hairdryer. But radio waves are penetrating the innermost recesses of your skull. Imagine a kind of global positioning system for the brain, RF radiation pinpointing and selectively stimulating the neural pathways associated with particular skills, like signing your name, climbing stairs, remembering your anniversary, thinking positively, clinically tested at scores of hospitals across America, Dr. Eberly's reverse tomographic methods have now been further refined to make this stage of the correct-all process as simple and painless as a visit to your hairstylist. Until recently, Eberly broke in, he and his chair still drifting through a sea of simulated blood and gray matter, my process required overnight hospitalization and the physical screwing of a calibrated steel ring into the patient's cranium. Many patients found this inconvenient. Some also experienced discomfort. Now, however, enormous increases in computing power have made possible a process that is instantaneously self-correcting as to the location of the individual neural pathways under stimulation. Kelsey, you the man, young Mr. Twelve Thousand Shares of Exxon said loudly. In the first hours and days following Gary's big Sunday blowout with Caroline, three weeks ago, both he and she had made overtures of peace. Very late on that Sunday night, she'd reached across the demilitarized zone of the mattress and touched his hip. The next night, he'd offered an almost complete apology in which Although he refused to concede the central issue, he conveyed sorrow and regret for the collateral damage he'd caused. The bruised feelings and willful misrepresentations and hurtful imputations, and thus gave Caroline a foretaste of the rush of tenderness that awaited her if she would only admit that, regarding the central issue, he was in the right. On Tuesday morning, She'd made an actual breakfast for him, cinnamon toast, sausage links, and a bowl of oatmeal topped with raisins, arranged to resemble a face with a comically downturned mouth. On Wednesday morning, he'd given her a compliment, a simple statement of fact, You're beautiful, which, although it fell short of an outright avowal of love, did serve as a reminder of an objective basis, physical attraction, on which love could be restored if she would only admit that regarding the central issue he was in the right. But each hopeful overture, each exploratory sally, came to naught. When he squeezed the hand she offered him, and he whispered that he was sorry that her back hurt, she was unable to take the next step and allow that possibly, a simple possibly, would have sufficed. Her two hours of soccer in the rain had contributed to her injury. And when she thanked him for his compliment, and asked him how he'd slept, he was powerless to ignore a tendentious, critical edge in her voice. He understood her to be saying, Prolonged disturbance of sleep is a common symptom of clinical depression. Oh, and by the way, how did you sleep, dear? And so he didn't dare admit that, as a matter of fact, He'd slept atrociously. He averred that he'd slept extremely well, thank you, Caroline. Extremely well, extremely well. Each failed overture of peace made the next overture less likely to succeed. Before long, what at first glance had seemed to Gary an absurd possibility, that the till of their marriage no longer contained sufficient funds of love and goodwill to cover the emotional costs that going to St. Jude entailed for Caroline, or that not going to St. Jude entailed for him, assumed the contours of something terribly actual. He began to hate Caroline simply for continuing to fight with him. He hated the newfound reserves of independence she tapped in order to resist him. Especially devastatingly hateful, was her hatred of him. He could have ended the crisis in a minute if all he'd had to do was forgive her. But to see mirrored in her eyes how repellent she found him, it made him crazy. 
it poisoned his hope. Fortunately, the shadows cast by her accusation of depression, long and dark though they were, did not yet extend to his corner office at Centrust and to the pleasure he took in managing his managers, analysts, and traders. Gary's forty hours at the bank had become the only hours he could count on enjoying in a week. He'd even begun to toy with the idea of working a fifty-hour week, but this was easier said than done, because at the end of his eight-hour day there was often literally no work left on his desk. And he was all too aware, besides, that spending long hours at the office to escape unhappiness at home was exactly the trap his father had fallen into. It was undoubtedly how Alfred had begun to self-medicate. When he married Caroline... Gary had silently vowed never to work later than five o'clock and never to bring a briefcase home at night. By signing on with a mid-sized regional bank, he'd chosen one of the least ambitious career paths that a Wharton School MBA could take. At first, his intention was simply to avoid his father's mistakes, to give himself time to enjoy life, cherish his wife, play with his kids. But before long... Even as he was proving to be an outstanding portfolio manager, he became more specifically allergic to ambition. Colleagues far less capable than he were moving on to work for mutual funds, to be freelance money managers, or to start their own funds. But they were also working twelve or fourteen-hour days, and every single one of them had the perspiring, manic style of a striver. Gary, cushioned by Caroline's inheritance, was free to cultivate non-ambition and to be, as a boss, the perfect, strict, and loving father that he could only halfway be at home. He demanded honesty and excellence from his workers. In return, he offered patient instruction, absolute loyalty, and the assurance that he would never blame them for his own mistakes. If his large-cap manager, Virginia Lynn, recommended upping the percentage of energy stocks in the bank's boilerplate trust portfolio from 6% to 9%, and Gary, as was his wont, decided to leave the mix alone, and if the energy sector then proceeded to enjoy a couple of banner quarters, he pulled his big ironic, I'm a jerk, grimace, and publicly apologized to Lynn. Fortunately, for each of his bad decisions, he made two or three good ones, and in the history of the universe... There had never been a better six years for equities investment than the six years he'd run Centrust's equities division. Only a fool or a crook could have failed. With success guaranteed, Gary could then make a game of being unawed by his boss, Marvin Coster, and by Coster's boss, Marty Breitenfeld, the chairman of Centrust. Gary never, ever kowtowed or flattered. Indeed, both Coster and Breitenfeld had begun to defer to him in matters of taste and protocol. Coster, all but asking Gary's permission to enroll his eldest daughter in Abington Friends instead of Friends Select. Breitenfeld, buttonholing Gary outside the senior executive pissoir to inquire if he and Caroline were planning to attend the free library benefit ball or if Gary had spun off his tickets to a secretary. Three, relax, it's all in your head. Curly Eberly had reappeared in his intracranial desk chair with a plastic model of an electrolyte molecule in each hand. A remarkable property of ferrocitrate ferroacetate gels, he said, is that under low-level radio stimulation at certain resonant frequencies, the molecules may spontaneously polymerize. More remarkably yet, these polymers turn out to be fine conductors of electrical impulses. The virtual Eberly looked on with a benign smile as, in the bloody animated moil around him, eager waveforms came squiggling through. As if these waves were the opening strains of a minuet or reel, all the ferrous molecules paired off and arranged themselves in long, twinned lines. These transient conductive microtubules, Eberly said, make thinkable the previously unthinkable, direct quasi-real-time digital chemical interface. But this is good, Denise whispered to Gary. This is what Dad's always wanted. What, to screw himself out of a fortune? 
to help other people, Denise said, to make a difference. Gary could have pointed out that if the old man really felt like helping somebody, he might start with his wife. But Denise had bizarre and unshakable notions of Alfred. There was no point in rising to her bait. 4. The Rich Get Richer Yes, an idle corner of the brain may be the devil's workshop, the pitchman said, but every idle neural pathway gets ignored by the correctol process. Wherever there's action, though, correctol is there to make it stronger, to help the rich get richer. From all over Ballroom B came laughter and applause and whoops of appreciation. Gary sensed that his grinning, clapping left-hand neighbor, Mr. Twelve Thousand Shares of Exxon, was looking in his direction. Possibly the guy was wondering why Gary wasn't clapping. Or possibly he was intimidated by the casual elegance of Gary's clothes. For Gary, a key element of not being a striver, a perspirer, was to dress as if he didn't have to work at all as if he were a gentleman who just happened to enjoy coming to the office and helping other people, as if noblesse oblige. Today he was wearing a caper green half-silk sport coat, an ecru linen button-down, and pleatless black dress pants. His own cell phone was turned off, deaf to all incoming calls. He tipped his chair back and scanned the ballroom to confirm that indeed he was the only male guest without a necktie. But the contrast between self and crowd today left much to be desired. Just a few years ago, the room would have been a jungle of blue pinstripe, ventless mafia wear, two-tone power shirts, and tasseled loafers. But now, in the late maturing years of the long, long boom, even young suburban galoots from New Jersey were buying hand-tailored Italian suits and high-end eyewear. So much money had flooded the system that twenty-six-year-olds who thought Andrew Wyeth was a furniture company and Winslow Homer a cartoon character were able to dress like Hollywood aristocracy. Oh, misanthropy and sourness. Gary wanted to enjoy being a man of wealth and leisure, but the country was making it none too easy. All around him, millions of newly minted American millionaires were engaged in the identical pursuit of feeling extraordinary of buying the perfect Victorian, of skiing the virgin slope, of knowing the chef personally, of locating the beach that had no footprints. There were further tens of millions of young Americans who didn't have money but were nonetheless chasing the perfect cool. And meanwhile, the sad truth was that not everyone could be extraordinary, not everyone could be extremely cool. Because whom would this leave to be ordinary? Who would perform the thankless work of being comparatively uncool. Well, there was still the citizenry of America's heartland, St. Judean minivan drivers, thirty and forty pounds overweight and sporting pastel sweats, pro-life bumper stickers, Prussian hair. But Gary in recent years had observed, with plate tectonically cumulative anxiety, that population was continuing to flow out of the Midwest and toward the cooler coasts. He was part of this exodus himself, of course, but he'd made his escape early. And, frankly, priority had its privileges. At the same time, all the restaurants in St. Jude were suddenly coming up to European speed. Suddenly, cleaning ladies knew from sun-dried tomatoes. Suddenly, hog farmers knew from creme brulee. And shoppers at the mall near his parents' house had an air of entitlement off-puttingly similar to his own. And the electronic consumer goods for sale in St. Jude were every bit as powerful and cool as those in Chestnut Hill. Gary wished that all further migration to the coasts could be banned, and all Midwesterners encouraged to revert to eating pasty foods and wearing dowdy clothes and playing board games, in order that a strategic national reserve of cluelessness might be maintained, a wilderness of taste which would enable people of privilege like himself to feel extremely civilized in perpetuity. But enough, he told himself. A too annihilating will to specialness, a wish to reign supreme in his superiority, was yet another warning sign of clinical D. And Mr. Twelve Thousand Shares of Exxon wasn't looking at him anyway, he was looking at Denise's naked legs. The polymer strands, Eberly explained, 
chemotactically associate with active neural pathways and so facilitate the discharge of electrical potential. We don't yet fully understand the mechanism, but the effect is to make any action the patient is performing easier and more enjoyable to repeat and to sustain. Producing this effect, even transiently, would be an exciting clinical achievement. Here at Axon, however, we have found a way to render that effect permanent. Just watch. The pitchman purred. Five. Now it's your turn to work a little. As a cartoon human figure shakily raised a teacup to its mouth, certain shaky neural pathways lit up inside its cartoon head. Then the figure drank correct all electrolytes, donned an Eberly helmet, and raised the cup again. Little glowing microtubules hewed to the active pathways, which began to blaze with light and strength. Steady as a rock, the cartoon hand that lowered the teacup to its saucer. We've got to get Dad signed up for testing, the niece whispered. What do you mean, Gary said. Well, this is for Parkinson's. It could help him. Gary sighed like a tire losing air. How could it be that such an incredibly obvious idea had never occurred to him? He felt ashamed of himself and, at the same time, obscurely resentful of Denise. He aimed a bland smile at the video screen as if he hadn't heard her. Once the pathways have been identified and stimulated, Eberly said, we are only a short step away from actual morphologic correction. And here, as everywhere in medicine today, the secret is in the genes. Six. Remember those pills you took last month? Three days ago, on Friday afternoon, Gary had finally got through to Pudge Portley at Heavy and Hodap. Portly had sounded harried in the extreme. Gare, sorry, it's a rave scene here, Portly said. But listen, my friend, I did talk to Daffy Anderson per your request. Daffy says, sure, no problem, we will definitely allocate 500 shares for a good customer at Centrust. So, are we okay, my friend? Are we good? No, Gary said. We said 5,000, not 500. Portly was silent for a moment. Shit, Gare. Big mix-up. I thought you said five hundred. You repeated it back to me. You said five thousand. You said you were writing it down. Remind me, this is on your own account or Centrust's? My account? Look, Gary, here's what you do. Call Daffy yourself. Explain the situation. Explain the mix-up. And see if he can rustle up another five hundred. I can back you up that far. I mean, it was my mistake. I had no idea how hot this thing would be. But you got to realize, Daffy's taking food from somebody else's mouth to feed you. It's the nature channel, Gare. All the little birdies with their beaks open wide. Me, me, me. I can back you up for another five hundred, but you've got to do your own squawking. All right, my friend, are we good? No, Pudge, we aren't good, Gary said. Do you remember I took twenty thousand shares of refinanced Adelson Lee off your hands? We also took... Gare, Gare, don't do this to me, Pudge said. I'm aware. Have I forgotten Adelson Lee? Christ, please, it haunts my every waking hour. All I'm trying to say to you is that 500 shares of Axon, it may sound like a diss, but it's not a diss. It's the best Daffy's going to do for you. A refreshing breath of honesty, Gary said. Now tell me again if you forgot I said 5,000. Okay, I'm an asshole. Thank you for letting me know. But I can't get you more than a thousand total without going all the way upstairs. If you want five thousand, Daffy needs a direct order from Dick Heavy. And since you mention Adelson Lee, Dick's going to point out to me that core states took forty thousand. First Delaware took thirty thousand, TIAA Kreft took fifty, and so on down the line. The calculus is that crude, Gar. You helped us to the tune of twenty, we help you to the tune of five hundred. I mean, I'll try, Dick, if you want. I can also probably get another 500 out of Daffy just by telling him you'd never guess he used to be shiny on top to see him now. Woof, the miracle of Rogaine. But basically, this is the kind of deal where Daffy gets to play Santa Claus. He knows if you've been bad or good. In particular, he knows for whom you work. To be honest, for the kind of consideration you're looking for, what you really need to do is triple the size of your institution. Size. Oh, did it matter. 
short of promising to buy some errant turkeys with Centrust money at a later date, and he could lose his job for this, Gary had no further leverage with Pudge Portley. However, he still had moral leverage in the form of Axon's underpayment for Alfred's patent. Lying awake last night, he'd honed the wording of the clear, measured lecture that he intended to deliver to Axon's brass this afternoon. I want you to look me in the eye and tell me that your offer to my father was reasonable and fair. My father had personal reasons for accepting that offer, but I know what you did to him. Do you understand me? I'm not an old man in the Midwest. I know what you did. And I think you realize that it is not an option for me to leave this room without a firm commitment for 5,000 shares. I could also insist on an apology, but I'm simply proposing a straightforward transaction between adults, which, by the way, costs you nothing. Zero. Nada. Niente. Synaptogenesis! Axon's video pitchman exulted. 7. No, it's not a book of the Bible. The professional investors in Ballroom B laughed and laughed. Could this possibly be a hoax? Denise asked Gary. Why license Dad's patent for a hoax? Gary said. She shook her head. This makes me want to... Like, go back to bed. Gary understood the feeling. He hadn't had a good night's sleep in three weeks. His circadian schedule was 180 degrees out of phase. He was revved all night and sandy-eyed all day. And he found it ever more arduous to believe that his problem wasn't neurochemical, but personal. How right he'd been all those months to conceal the many warning signs from Caroline, how accurate his intuition that a putative deficit of neurofactor three would sap the legitimacy of his moral arguments. Caroline was now able to camouflage her animosity toward him as concern about his health. His lumbering forces of conventional domestic warfare were no match for this biological weaponry. He cruelly attacked her person. She heroically attacked his disease. Building on this strategic advantage, Caroline had then made a series of brilliant tactical moves. When Gary drew up his battle plans for the first full weekend of hostilities, he assumed that Caroline would circle the wagons as she'd done on the previous weekend, would adolescently pal around with Aaron and Caleb and incite them to make fun of clueless old Dad. Therefore, on Thursday night, he ambushed her. He proposed out of the blue that he and Aaron and Caleb go mountain biking in the Poconos on Sunday, leaving at dawn for a long day of older male bonding in which Caroline could not participate because her back hurt. Caroline's countermove was to endorse his proposal enthusiastically. She urged Caleb and Aaron to go and enjoy the time with their father. She laid curious stress on this phrase, causing Aaron and Caleb to pipe up as if on cue, Mountain biking, yeah, Dad, great! And all at once Gary realized what was going on. He realized why on Monday night Aaron had come and unilaterally apologized for having called him horrible, and why Caleb on Tuesday, for the first time in months, had invited him to play football and why Jonah on Wednesday had brought him unbidden on a cork-lined tray a second martini that Caroline had poured. He saw why his children had turned agreeable and solicitous, because Caroline had told them that their father was struggling with clinical depression. What a brilliant gambit! And not for a second did he doubt that a gambit was what it was, that Caroline's concern was purely bogus, a wartime tactic, a way to avoid spending Christmas in St. Jude. Because there continued to be no warmth or fondness for him, not the faintest ember in her eyes. Did you tell the boys that I'm depressed? Gary asked her in the darkness from the far margin of their quarter-acre bed. Caroline? Did you lie to them about my mental state? Is that why everybody's suddenly being so agreeable? Gary, she said, they're being agreeable because they want you to take them mountain biking in the Poconos. Something about this doesn't smell right. You know, you are getting seriously paranoid. Fuck, 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 
Gary, this is frightening. You're fucking with my head. And there is no lower trick than that. There's no meaner trick in the book. Please, please listen to yourself. Answer my question, he said. Did you tell them I'm depressed, having a hard time? Well, aren't you? Answer my question. She didn't answer his question. She said nothing more at all that night, although he repeated his question for half an hour, pausing for a minute or two each time so that she could answer, but she didn't answer. By the morning of the bike trip, he was so destroyed by lack of sleep that his ambition was simply to function physically. He loaded three bikes onto Caroline's extremely large and safe Ford Stomper vehicle and drove for two hours, unloaded the bikes, and pedaled mile after mile on rutted trails. The boys raced on far ahead. By the time he caught up with them, they'd taken their rest and were ready to move again. They volunteered nothing but wore expressions of friendly expectation, as if Gary might have a confession to make. His situation was neurochemically somewhat dire, however. He had nothing to say except, let's eat our sandwiches, and one more ridge and then we turn around. At dusk, he loaded the bikes back onto the stomper, drove two hours, and unloaded them in an excess of Hanidonia. Caroline came out of the house and told the older boys what great fun she and Jonah had had. She declared herself a convert to the Narnia books. All evening then, she and Jonah chattered about Aslan and Care Paravel and Reaper Cheap and the online kids-only Narnia chat room that she'd located on the Internet and the C.S. Lewis website that had cool online games to play and tons of cool Narnian products to order. There's a Prince Caspian CD-ROM, Jonah told Gary, that I'm very much looking forward to playing with. It looks like a really interesting and well-designed game, Caroline said. I showed Jonah how to order it. There's a wardrobe, Jonah said, and you point and click and go through the wardrobe into Narnia, and then there's all this cool stuff inside. Profound was Gary's relief the next morning as he bumped and glided like a storm-battered yacht into the safe harbor of his work week. There was nothing to do but patch himself up as well as he could, stay the course, not be depressed. Despite serious losses, he remained confident of victory. Since his very first fight with Caroline, twenty years earlier, when he'd sat alone in his apartment and watched an eleven-inning Phillies game and listened to his phone ring every ten minutes, every five minutes, every two minutes, he'd understood that at the ticking heart of Caroline was a desperate insecurity. Sooner or later, if he withheld his love, she came knocking on his chest with her little fist and let him have his way. Caroline showed no sign of weakening, however. Late at night, when Gary was too freaked out and angry to shut his eyes, let alone sleep, she politely but firmly declined to fight with him. She was particularly adamant in her refusal to discuss Christmas. She said that listening to Gary on the topic was like watching an alcoholic drink. "'What do you need from me?' Gary asked her. "'Tell me what you need to hear from me.' "'I need you to take responsibility for your mental health.' "'Jesus, Caroline! Wrong, wrong, wrong answer!' Meanwhile, Discordia, the goddess of marital strife, had pulled strings with the airline industry. There appeared in the Inquirer a full-page ad for a slasheroo sale on Midland Airlines tickets, including a $198 round-trip fare between Philly and St. Jude. Only four dates in late December were blacked out. By staying just one extra day at Christmas time, Gary could take the whole family to and from St. Jude non-stop for under a thousand bucks. He had his travel agent hold five tickets for him, renewing the option daily. Finally, on Friday morning, with the sale due to end at midnight, he'd announced to Caroline that he was buying tickets. In accordance with her strict no-Christmas policy, Caroline turned to Aaron and asked him if he'd studied for his Spanish test. From his office at Centrust, in a spirit of trench warfare, Gary called his travel agent and authorized the purchase. Then he called his doctor and requested a sleep aid, a short-term prescription, something a little more potent than the non-prescription stuff. 
Dr. Pierce replied that a sleep aid didn't sound like such a good idea. Caroline, Pierce said, had mentioned that Gary might be depressed, and a sleep aid certainly wasn't going to help with that. Maybe, instead, Gary would like to come in and talk about how he was feeling. For a moment after he hung up, Gary let himself imagine being divorced. But three glowing and idealized mental portraits of his children, shadowed by a bat-like horde of fears regarding finances, chased the notion from his head. At a dinner party on Saturday, he'd rifled the medicine chest of his friends, Drew and Jamie, hoping to find a bottle of something in the Valium class. But no such luck. Yesterday Denise had called him and insisted, with ominous steeliness, that he have lunch with her. She said she'd seen Enid and Alfred in New York on Saturday. She said that Chip and his girlfriend had flaked on her and vanished. Gary, lying awake last night, had wondered if stunts like this were what Caroline meant when she described Chip as a man honest enough to say what he could and couldn't tolerate. The cells are genetically reprogrammed to release nerve growth factor only when locally activated, Earl Eberly's video facsimile said cheerfully. A fetching young model, her skull in an Eberly helmet, was strapped into a machine that retrained her brain to instruct her legs to walk. A model wearing a wintry look, a look of misanthropy and sourness pushed up the corners of her mouth with her fingers while magnified cutaway animation revealed within her brain the flowering of dendrites, the forging of new synaptic links. In a moment, she was able to smile tentatively without using her fingers. In another moment, her smile was dazzling. Correct all. It's the future. The Exxon Corporation is fortunate to hold five U.S. patents protecting this powerful platform technology, Earl Eberly told the camera. These patents and eight others that are pending form an insurmountable firewall protecting the $150 million that we have spent to date on research and development. Exxon is the recognized world leader in this field. We have a six-year track record of positive cash flows and a revenue stream that we expect to top $80 million in the coming year. Potential investors may rest assured that every penny of every dollar we raise on December 15th will be spent on developing this marvelous and potentially historic product. Correct all. It's the future, Eberly said. It's the future, intoned the pitchman. It's the future, chorused the crowd of really good-looking students in nerdy glasses. I liked the past, Denise said, uptilting her complimentary half-liter of imported water. In Gary's opinion, too many people were breathing the air in Ballroom B. A ventilation problem, somehow. As the lights came up to full strength, silent wait personnel fanned in among the tables, bearing luncheon entrees under chafing lids. My first guess is salmon, Denise said. No, my only guess is salmon. Rising from talk show chairs and moving to the front of the dais now were three figures who reminded Gary, oddly, of his honeymoon in Italy. He and Caroline had visited a cathedral somewhere in Tuscany, maybe Siena, in the museum of which were big medieval statues of saints that had once stood on the roof of the cathedral, each with an arm raised like a waving presidential candidate and each wearing a saintly grin of certainty. The eldest of the three beatific greeters, a pink-faced man with rimless glasses, extended a hand as if to bless the crowd. All right, he said. All right, everybody, my name is Joe Prager. I'm the lead deal attorney at Bragg Neuter. To my left is Merrily Finch, CEO of Axon. To my right, Daffy Anderson, the all-important deal manager at Heavy and Hodap. We were hoping Curly himself might deign to join us today, but he is the man of the hour. He is being interviewed by CNN as we speak. So let me do a little caveating here, wink, 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 and then turn the floor over to Daffy and Merrily. Yo, Kelsey, talk to me, baby, talk to me, Gary's young neighbor shouted. Caveat A, Prager said, is please, everyone, take note that I'm stressing that Curly's results are extremely preliminary. This is all phase one research, folks. Anybody not hear me? Anybody in the back? 
Prager craned his neck and waved both arms at the most distant tables, including Gary's. Full disclosure, this is phase one research. Exxon does not yet have, in no way is it representing that it has FDA approval for phase two testing. And what comes after phase two? Phase three. And after phase three, a multi-stage review process that can delay the product launch by as much as three more years. Folks, hello, we are dealing with clinical results that are extremely interesting but extremely preliminary. So caveat emptor, all righty? Wink, wink, wink. All righty? Prager was struggling to keep his face straight. Merrily Finch and Daffy Anderson were sucking on smiles as if they, too, had guilty secrets or religion. Caveat B, Prager said. An inspirational video presentation is not a prospectus. Daffy's representations here today, likewise Merrilee's representations, are impromptu and, again, not a prospectus. The waitstaff descended on Gary's table and gave him salmon on a bed of lentils. Denise waved away her entree. Aren't you going to eat? Gary whispered. She shook her head. Denise, really? He felt inexplicably wounded. You can surely have a couple of bites with me. Denise looked him square in the face with an unreadable expression. I'm a little sick to my stomach. Do you want to leave? No, I just don't want to eat. Denise, at thirty-two, was still beautiful. But long hours at the stove had begun to cook her youthful skin into a kind of terracotta mask that made Gary a little more anxious each time he saw her. She was his baby sister, after all. Her years of fertility and marriageability were passing with a swiftness to which he was attuned, and she, he suspected, was not. Her career seemed to him an evil spell under the influence of which she worked sixteen-hour days and had no social life. Gary was afraid, he claimed as her oldest brother the right to be afraid, that by the time Denise awakened from this spell, she would be too old to start a family. He ate his salmon quickly while she drank her imported water. On the dais, the CEO of Axon, a fortyish blonde with the intelligent pugnacity of a college dean, was talking about side effects. Apart from headaches and nausea, which are to be expected, said Merrily Finch, we haven't tracked anything yet. Remember, too, that our platform technology has been widely used for several years now, with no significant deleterious effects reported. Finch pointed into the ballroom. Yes, Grey Armani. Isn't correct all the name of a laxative? Ah, well, Finch said, nodding violently. Different spelling, but yes, Curly and I considered approximately ten thousand different names before we realized that branding isn't really an issue for the Alzheimer's patient or the Parkinson's sufferer or the massively depressed individual. We could call it carcino asbesto. They'd still knock doors down to get it. Curly's big vision here, though, and the reason he's willing to risk the poopy jokes and so forth, is that twenty years from now there's not going to be a prison left standing in the United States because of this process. I mean, realistically, we live in the age of medical breakthroughs. There's no question we'll have competing therapies for AD and PD. Some of these therapies will probably come online before Correctol. So, for most disorders of the brain, our product will be just one weapon in the arsenal. Clearly the best weapon, but still just one among many. On the other hand, when it comes to social disease, the brain of the criminal, there's no other option on the horizon. It's correct all or prison. So it's a forward-looking name. We're laying claim to a whole new hemisphere. We're planting the Spanish flag right on the beach here. There was a murmur at a distant table where a tweedy, homely contingent was seated, maybe union fund managers, maybe the endowment crowd from Penn or Temple. One stork-shaped woman stood up from this table and shouted, So what's the idea? You reprogram the repeat offender to enjoy pushing a broom? That is within the realm of the feasible, yes, Finch said. That is one potential fix, although possibly not the best. The heckler couldn't believe it. Not the best? It's an ethical nightmare. So, free country, go invest in alternative energy, 
Finch said, for a laugh, because most of the guests were on her side. Buy some geothermal penny stocks. Solar electricity futures. Very cheap, very righteous. Yes, next, please. Pink shirt. You guys are dreaming, the heckler persisted at a shout. If you think the American people... Honey, Finch interrupted with the advantage of her lapel mic and amplification. The American people support the death penalty. Do you think they'll have a problem with a socially constructive alternative like this? Ten years from now, we'll see which of us is dreaming. Yes, pink shirt at table three, yes? Excuse me, the heckler persisted. I'm trying to remind your potential investors of the Eighth Amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Finch said, her MC's smile tightening. Since you bring up cruel and unusual punishment, let me suggest that you walk a few blocks north of here to Fairmount Avenue. Go take a look at the Eastern State Penitentiary. World's first modern prison opened in 1829. Solitary confinement for up to 20 years. Astonishing suicide rate. Zero corrective benefit. And just to keep this in mind, still the basic model for corrections in the United States today. Curley's not talking about this on CNN, folks. He's talking about the million Americans with Parkinson's and the four million with Alzheimer's. What I'm telling you now is not for general consumption. But the fact is, a 100% voluntary alternative to incarceration is the opposite of cruel and unusual. Of all the potential applications of Correctol, this is the most humane. This is the liberal vision, genuine, permanent, voluntary self-melioration. The heckler, shaking her head with the emphasis of the unconvincible, was already exiting the ballroom. Mr. 12,000 shares of Exxon, at Gary's left shoulder, cupped his hands to his mouth and booed her. Young men at other tables followed suit, booing and smirking, having their sports fan fun and lending support, Gary feared, to Denise's disdain for the world he moved in. Denise had leaned forward and was staring at 12,000 shares of Exxon in open-mouthed amazement. Daffy Anderson, a linebacker type, with thick, glossy sideburns and a texturally distinct stubble field of hair higher up, had stepped forward to answer money questions. He spoke of being gratifyingly oversubscribed. He compared the heat of this IPO to Vindaloo Curry and Dallas in July. He refused to divulge the price that Heavy and Hodap planned to ask for a share of Exxon. He spoke of pricing it fairly and, wink, wink, letting the market do its job. Denise touched Gary's shoulder and pointed to a table behind the dais where Merrily Finch was standing by herself and putting salmon in her mouth. Our prey is feeding, I say we pounce. What for? Gary said. To get Dad signed up for testing. Nothing about the idea of Alfred's participation in a Phase two study appealed to Gary, but it occurred to him that by letting Denise broach the topic of Alfred's affliction, by letting her create sympathy for the Lamberts and establish their moral claim on Axon's favors, he could increase his chances of getting his 5,000 shares. You do the talking, he said, standing up. Then I'll have a question for her, too. As he and Denise moved toward the dais, heads turned to admire Denise's legs. What part of no comment didn't you understand? Daffy Anderson asked a questioner for a laugh. The cheeks of Axon CEO were puffed out like a squirrel's. Merrily Finch put a napkin to her mouth and regarded the accosting Lamberts warily. I'm so starving, she said. It was a thin woman's apology for being corporeal. We'll be setting up some tables in a couple of minutes if you don't mind waiting. This is a semi-private question, Denise said. Finch swallowed with difficulty, maybe self-consciousness, maybe insufficient chewing. Yeah? Denise and Gary introduced themselves, and Denise mentioned the letter that Alfred had been sent. I had to eat something, Finch explained, shoveling up lentils. I think Joe was the one who wrote to your father. I'm assuming we're all square there now. He'd be happy to talk to you if you still had questions. Our question is more for you, Denise said. Sorry, one more bite here. Finch chewed her salmon with labored jaw strokes, swallowed again, and dropped her napkin on the plate. 
As far as that patent goes, I'll tell you frankly, we consider it just infringing. That's what everybody else does. But Curley's an inventor himself. He wanted to do the right thing. Frankly, Gary said, the right thing might have been to offer more. Finch's tongue was probing beneath her upper lip like a cat beneath blankets. You may have a somewhat inflated idea of your father's achievement, she said. A lot of researchers were studying those gels in the 60s. The discovery of electrical anisotropy is generally, I believe, credited to a team at Cornell. Plus, I understand from Joe that the wording of that patent is unspecific. It doesn't even refer to the brain. It's just human tissues. Justice is the right of the stronger when it comes to patent law. I think our offer was rather generous. Gary made his I'm-a-jerk face and looked at the dais where Daffy Anderson was being mobbed by well-wishers and supplicants. Our father was fine with the offer, Denise assured Finch, and he'll be happy to know what you guys are doing. Female bonding, the making of nice, faintly nauseated Gary. I forget which hospital he's with, Finch said. He's not, Denise said. He was a railroad engineer. He had a lab in our basement. Finch was surprised. He did that work as an amateur? Gary didn't know which version of Alfred made him angrier. The spiteful old tyrant who'd made a brilliant discovery in the basement and cheated himself out of a fortune? Or the clueless basement amateur who'd unwittingly replicated the work of real chemists, spent scarce family money to file and maintain a vaguely worded patent, and was now being tossed a scrap from the table of Earl Eberly? Both versions incensed him. Perhaps it was best, after all, that the old man had ignored Gary's advice and taken the money. My dad has Parkinson's, Denise said. Oh, I'm very sorry. Well, and we were wondering if you might include him in the testing of your product. Conceivably, Finch said. We'd have to ask Curly. I do like the human interest aspect. Does your dad live around here? He's in St. Jude, Finch frowned. It won't work if you can't get him to Schwanksville twice a week for at least six months. Not a problem, Denise said, turning to Gary. Right? Gary was hating everything about this conversation. Health, health, female, female, nice, nice, easy, easy. He didn't answer. How is he mentally, Finch said. Denise opened her mouth, but at first no words came out. He's fine, she said, rallying. Just fine. No dementia? Denise pursed her lips and shook her head. No, he gets a little confused sometimes, but no. The confusion could be from his meds, Finch said, in which case it's fixable, but Louis body dementia is beyond the purview of phase two testing, so is Alzheimer's. He's pretty sharp, Denise said. Well, if he's able to follow basic instructions and he's willing to travel east in January, Curly might try to include him. It would make a good story. Finch produced a business card, warmly shook Denise's hand, less warmly shook Gary's, and moved into the mob surrounding Daffy Anderson. Gary followed her and caught her by the elbow. She turned around, startled. Listen, Merrily, he said in a low voice, as if to say, let's be realistic now. We adults can dispense with the nicey-nice crap. I'm glad you think my dad's a good story, and it's very generous of you to give him $5,000, but I believe you need us more than we need you. Finch waved to somebody and held up one finger. She would be there in one second. Actually, she said to Gary, we don't need you at all, so I'm not sure what you're saying. My family wants to buy 5,000 shares of your offering. Finch laughed like an executive with an 80-hour work week. So does everybody in his room, she said. That's why we have investment bankers. If you'll excuse me. She broke free and got away. Gary in the crush of bodies, was having trouble breathing. He was furious with himself for having begged, furious for having let Denise attend this room. Road show, furious for being a Lambert. He strode toward the nearest exit without waiting for Denise, who hurried after him. Between the Four Seasons and the neighboring office tower was a corporate courtyard so lavishly planted and flawlessly maintained that it might have been pixels in a cyber-shopping paradise. The two Lamberts were crossing the courtyard when Gary's anger found a fault through which to vent itself. He said, 
I don't know where the hell you think Dad's going to stay if he comes out here. Partly with you, partly with me, Denise said. You're never home, he said, and Dad's on record as not wanting to be at my house for more than 48 hours. This wouldn't be like last Christmas, Denise said. Trust me, the impression I got on Saturday. Plus, how's he going to get out to Schwenksville twice a week? Gary, what are you saying? Do you not want this to happen? Two office workers, seeing angry parties bearing down, stood up and vacated a marble bench. Denise perched on the bench and folded her arms intransigently. Gary paced in a tight circle, his hands on his hips. For the last ten years, he said, Dad has done nothing to take care of himself. He sat in that fucking blue chair and wallowed in self-pity. I don't know why you think he's suddenly going to start, well, but if he thought there might actually be a cure, what? so he can be depressed for an extra five years and die miserable at eighty-five instead of eighty? That's going to make all the difference? Maybe he's depressed because he's sick. I'm sorry, but that is bullshit, Denise. That is a crock. The man has been depressed since before he even retired. He was depressed when he was still in perfect health. A low fountain was murmuring nearby, generating medium-strength privacy. A small, unaffiliated cloud had wandered into the quadrant of private sphere sky defined by the encompassing roof lines. The light was coastal and diffuse. What would you do, Denise said, if you had Mom nagging you seven days a week, telling you to get out of the house, watching every move you make, and acting like the kind of chair you sit in is a moral issue? The more she tells him to get up, the more he sits there. The more he sits there, the more she... Denise, you're living in fantasy land. She looked at Gary with hatred. Don't patronize me. It's just as much a fantasy to act like Dad's some worn-out old machine. He's a person, Gary. He has an interior life, and he's nice to me, at least... Well, he ain't so nice to me, Gary said. And he's an abusive, selfish bully to Mom. And I say if he wants to sit in that chair and sleep his life away, that's just fine. I love that idea. I'm 1,000% a fan of that idea, but first, let's yank that chair out of a three-floor house that's falling apart and losing value. Let's get Mom some kind of quality of life. Just do that, and he can sit in his chair and feel sorry for himself until the cows come home. She loves that house. That house is her quality of life. Well, she's in a fantasy land, too. A lot of good it does her to love the house when she's got to keep an eye on the old man 24 hours a day. Denise crossed her eyes and blew a wisp of hair off her forehead. You're the one in a fantasy, she said. You seem to think they're going to be happy living in a two-room apartment in a city where the only people they know are you and me, and do you know who that's convenient for? For you. He threw his hands in the air. So it's convenient for me. I'm sick of worrying about that house in St. Jude. I'm sick of making trips out there. I'm sick of hearing how miserable Mom is. The situation that's convenient for you and me is better than a situation that's convenient for nobody. Mom's living with a guy who's a physical wreck. He's had it. He's through. Finito. End of story. Take a charge against earnings. And still she's got this idea that if he would only try harder, everything would be fine and life would be just like it used to be. Well, I got news for everybody. It ain't ever going to be the way it used to be. You don't even want him to get better. Denise. Gary clutched his eyes. They had five years before he even got sick. And what did he do? He watched the local news and waited for Mom to cook his meals. This is the real world we're living in, and I want them out of that house. Gary, I want them in a retirement community out here, and I'm not afraid to say it. Gary, listen to me. Denise leaned forward with an urgent goodwill that only irritated him the more. Dad can come and stay with me for six months. They can both come and stay. I can bring home meals. It's not that big a deal. If he gets better, they'll go back home. If he doesn't get better, they'll have had six months to decide if they like living in Philly. I mean, what is wrong with this? Gary didn't know what was wrong with it. But he could already hear Enid's invidious descants on the topic of Denise's wonderfulness. And since it was impossible to imagine Caroline and Enid amicably sharing a house for six days, never mind six weeks, never mind six months, Gary could not even ceremonially offer to put his parents up himself. He raised his eyes to the intensity of whiteness that marked the sun's proximity to a corner of the office tower. 
The beds of mums and begonias and liriope all around him were like bikinied extras in a music video planted in full blush of perfection and fated to be yanked again before they had a chance to lose petals, acquire brown spots, drop leaves. Gary had always enjoyed corporate gardens as backdrops for the pageant of privilege, as metonymies of pamperment. But it was vital not to ask too much of them. It was vital not to come to them in need. You know, I don't even care, he said. It's a great plan, and if you want to do the legwork, that would be great. Okay, I'll do the legwork, Denise said quickly. Now, what about Christmas? Dad really wants you guys to come. Gary laughed. So he's involved now, too. He wants it for Mom's sake. And she really, really wants it. Of course she wants it. She's Enid Lambert. What does Enid Lambert want if not Christmas and St. Jude? Well, I'm going to go there, Denise said. And I'm going to try to get Chip to go. And I think the five of you should go. I think we should all just get together and do that for them. The faint tremor of virtue in her voice set Gary's teeth on edge. A lecture about Christmas was the last thing he needed on this October afternoon with the needle of his Factor Three gauge bumping on the bright red E. Dad said a strange thing on Saturday, Denise continued. He said, I don't know how much time I have. Both of them were talking like this was their last chance for a Christmas. It was kind of intense. Well, count on Mom, Gary said a little wildly, to phrase the thing for maximum emotional coercion. Right, but I also think she means it. I'm sure she means it, Gary said. And I will give it some thought. But, Denise, it is not so easy getting all five of us out there. It is not so easy, not when it makes so much sense for us all to be here, right? Right? I know. I agree, Denise persisted quietly. But remember, this would be a strictly one-time-only thing. I said I'd think about it. That's all I can do, right? I'll think about it. I'll think about it, all right? Denise seemed puzzled by his outburst. Okay, good. Thank you. But the thing is... Yeah, what's the thing? Gary said, taking three steps away from her and suddenly turning back. Tell me what the thing is. Well, I was just thinking... You know, I'm half an hour late already. I really need to get back to the office. Denise rolled her eyes up at him and let her mouth hang open in mid-sentence. Let's just finish this conversation, Gary said. Okay, well, not to sound like Mom, but a little too late for that, huh? Huh? He found himself shouting with crazy joviality, his hands in the air. Not to sound like Mom, but you don't want to wait too long before you decide to buy tickets. There, I said it. Gary began to laugh, but checked the laugh before it got away from him. Good plan, he said. You're right. Gotta decide soon. Gotta buy those tickets. Good plan. He clapped his hands like a coach. Is something wrong? No, you're right. We should all go to St. Jude for one last Christmas before they sell the house or Dad falls apart or somebody dies. It's a no-brainer. We should all be there. It is so obvious. You're absolutely right. Then I don't understand what you're upset about. Nothing. Not upset about anything. Okay. Good. Denise gazed up at him levelly. Then let me ask you one other thing. I want to know why Mom is under the impression that I'm having an affair with a married man. A pulse of guilt, a shock wave, passed through Gary. No idea, he said. Did you tell her I'm involved with a married man? How could I tell her that? I don't know the first thing about your private life. Well, did you suggest it to her? Did you drop a hint? Denise, really? Gary was regaining his parental composure, his aura of big brotherly indulgence. You're the most reticent person I know. On the basis of what could I say anything? Did you drop a hint? She said, because somebody did. Somebody put that idea in her head, and it occurs to me that I said one little thing to you once, which you might have misinterpreted and passed on to her, and Gary, she and I have enough problems without your giving her ideas. You know, if you weren't so mysterious... I'm not mysterious. If you weren't so secretive, Gary said, maybe you wouldn't have this problem. It's almost like you want people whispering about you. It's pretty interesting that you're not answering my question. 
He exhaled slowly through his teeth. I have no idea where Mom got that idea. I didn't tell her anything. All right, Denise said, standing up. So I'll do that legwork. You think about Christmas, and we'll get together when Mom and Dad are in town. I'll see you later. With breathtaking decision, she headed toward the nearest exit, not moving so fast as to betray anger, but fast enough that Gary couldn't have caught up with her without running. He waited for a minute to see if she would return. When she didn't, he left the courtyard and bent his steps toward his office. Gary had been flattered when his little sister had chosen a college in the very city where he and Caroline had lately bought their dream house. He'd looked forward to introducing Denise, showing her off, really, to all his friends and colleagues. He'd imagined that she would come to Seminole Street for dinner every month and that she and Caroline would be like sisters. He'd imagined that his whole family, even Chip, would eventually settle in Philadelphia. He'd imagined nieces and nephews, house parties and parlor games, long, snowy Christmases on Seminole Street, and now he and Denise had lived in the same city for fifteen years, and he felt as if he hardly knew her. She never asked him for anything. No matter how tired she was, she never came to Seminole Street without flowers or dessert for Caroline, shark's teeth or comic books for the boys, a lawyer joke or a light bulb joke for Gary. There was no way around her properness, no way to convey to her the depth of his disappointment that of the rich, family-filled future that he'd imagined. Almost nothing had come to pass. A year ago, over lunch, Gary had told her about a married friend of his, actually a colleague, Jay Pasco, who was having an affair with his daughter's piano teacher. Gary said that he could understand his friend's recreational interest in the affair. Pasco had no intention of leaving his wife but that he didn't see why the piano teacher was bothering. So you can't imagine, Denise said, why a woman would want to have an affair with you? I'm not talking about me, Gary said. But you're married and you have kids. I'm saying I don't understand what the woman sees in a guy she knows to be a liar and a sneak. Probably she disapproves of liars and sneaks in general, Denise said, but she makes an exception for the guy she's in love with. So it's a kind of self-deception. No, Gary, it's the way love works. Well, and I guess there's always a chance she'll get lucky and marry into instant money. This puncturing of Denise's liberal innocence with a sharp economic truth seemed to sadden her. You see a person with kids, she said, and you see how happy they are to be a parent, and you're attracted to their happiness. Impossibility is attractive. You know, the safety of dead-ended things. You sound like you know something about it, Gary said. Emil is the only man I've ever been attracted to who didn't have kids. This interested Gary. Under cover of fraternal obtuseness, he risked asking, So, and who are you seeing now? Nobody. You're not into some married guy, he joked. Denise's face went a shade paler and two shades redder as she reached for her water glass. I'm seeing nobody, she said. I'm working very hard. Well, just remember, Gary said, there's more to life than cooking. You're at a stage now where you need to start thinking about what you really want and how you're going to get it. Denise twisted in her seat and signaled to the waiter for the check. Maybe I'll marry him to instant money, she said. The more Gary thought about his sister's involvement with married men, the angrier he got. Nevertheless, he should never have mentioned the matter to Enid. The disclosure had come of drinking gin on an empty stomach while listening to his mother sing Denise's praises at Christmas time, a few hours after the mutilated Austrian reindeer had come to light and Enid's gift to Caroline had turned up in a trash can like a murdered baby. Enid extolled the generous multimillionaire who was bankrolling Denise's new restaurant and had sent her on a luxury two-month tasting tour of France and Central Europe. She extolled Denise's long hours and her dedication and her thrift. And in her backhandedly comparative way, she carped about Gary's materialism and ostentation and obsession with money, as if she herself weren't dollar-sign-headed. 
as if she herself, given the opportunity, wouldn't have bought a house like Gary's and furnished it very much the same way he had. He wanted to say to her, Of your three children, my life looks by far the most like yours. I have what you taught me to want, and now that I have it, you disapprove of it. But what he actually said, when the juniper spirits finally boiled over, was, Why don't you ask Denise who she's sleeping with? Ask her if the guy's married and if he has any kids. I don't think she's dating anybody, Enid said. I'm telling you, the juniper spirits said, ask her if she's ever been involved with somebody married. I think honesty compels you to ask that question before you hold her up as a paragon of Midwestern values. Enid covered her ears. I don't want to know about this. Fine, go ahead, stick your head in the sand, the sloppy spirits raged. I just don't want to hear any more crap about what an angel she is. Gary knew that he'd broken the sibling code of honor. But he was glad he'd broken it. He was glad Denise was taking heat again from Enid. He felt surrounded, imprisoned by disapproving women. There was, of course, one obvious way of breaking free. He could say yes instead of no to one of the dozen secretaries and female pedestrians and sales clerks who in any given week took note of his height and his schist gray hair, his calfskin jacket, and his French mountaineering pants, and looked him in the eye as if to say, The key's under the doormat. But there was still no pussy on earth he'd rather lick, no hair he'd rather gather in his fist like a golden silk bell pull, no gaze with which he'd rather lock his own at climax than Caroline's. The only guaranteed result of having an affair would be to add yet another disapproving woman to his life. In the lobby of the Centrust Tower on Market Street, he joined a crowd of human beings by the elevators. Clerical staff and software specialists, auditors and key punch engineers returning from late lunches. The lion, he ascendant now, said the woman standing closest to Gary. Very good time to shop now. The lion, he often preside over bargains in the store. Where is our savior in this? asked the woman to whom the woman had spoken. This also a good time to remember the savior, the first woman answered calmly. Time of the lion, very good time for that. Lutetium supplements combined with megadoses of partially hydrogenated vitamin E, the third person said. He's programmed his clock radio, a fourth person said, which it says something about something. I don't know that you can even do this, but he's programmed it to wake him up to WMIA at eleven past the hour every hour, whole night through. Finally an elevator came. As the mass of humanity moved on to it, Gary considered waiting for a less populated car, a ride less pollulating with mediocrity and body smells. But coming in from Market Street now was a young female estate planner who in recent months had been giving him talk-to-me smiles, touch-me smiles. To avoid contact with her, he darted through the elevator's closing doors. But the doors bumped his trailing foot and reopened. The young estate planner crowded on next to him. The prophet Jeremiah girl, he speak of the lion to tell about it in the pamphlet here. Like it's 3.11 in the morning and the Clippers lead the Grizzlies 146 to 145 with 12 seconds left in triple overtime. Absolutely no reverb on a full elevator. Every sound was deadened by clothes and flesh and hairdos. The air pre-breathed, the crypt overwarm. This pamphlet is the devil's work. Read it over, coffee break, girl. What the harm in that? Both last-place teams looking to improve their odds in the college draft lottery by losing this otherwise meaningless late-season game. Lutetium is a rare earth element, very rare and from the earth, and it's pure because it's elemental. Like, and if he set the clock for 4.11, he could hear all the late scores and only have to wake up once. But there's Davis Cup action in Sydney, and it's updated hourly. Can't miss that. The young estate planner was short and had a pretty face and hennaed hair. She smiled up at Gary as if inviting him to speak. She looked Midwestern and happy to be standing next to him. Gary fixed his gaze on nothing and attempted not to breathe. He was chronically bothered by the T erupting in the middle of the word centrust. He wanted to push the T down hard like a nipple, but when he pushed it down he got no satisfaction. He got scent rust, a corroded penny. Girl, this ain't replacement faith, this supplemental. Isaiah mentioned that lion too, call it the Lion of Judah. 
A pro-am thing in Malaysia with an early leader in the clubhouse, but that could change between 2.11 and 3.11. Can't miss that. My faith don't need no replacing. Sherry girl, you got a wax deposit in your ear. Listen what I'm saying. This ain't no replacement faith. This supplemental. It guarantees silky, vibrant skin plus an 18% reduction in panic attacks. Like I'm wondering how Samantha feels about the alarm clock going off next to her pillow eight times a night every night. All I'm saying is now's the time to shop is all I'm saying. It occurred to Gary, as the young estate planner leaned into him to let a raft of sweltering humanity leave the elevator, as she pressed her hennaed head against his ribs more intimately than seemed strictly necessary, that another reason he'd remained faithful to Caroline through twenty years of marriage was his steadily growing aversion to physical contact with other human beings. Certainly he was in love with fidelity. Certainly he got an erotic kick out of adhering to principle, but somewhere between his brain and his balls a wire was also perhaps coming loose. Because when he mentally undressed and violated this little red-haired girl, his main thought, was how stuffy and undisinfected he would find the site of his infidelity, a coliform bacterial supply closet, a courtyard by Marriott with dried semen on the walls and bedspreads, the cat-scratch feverish backseat of whatever adorable VW or Plymouth she no doubt drove, the spore-laden wall-to-wall of her box-like starter apartment in Montgomeryville or Conchahokan, each site overwarm and underventilated and suggestive of genital warts and chlamydia in its own unpleasant way, and what a struggle it would be to breathe, how smothering her flesh, how squalid and foredoomed his efforts not to condescend. He bounded out of the elevator on 16, taking big, cool lungfuls of centrally processed air. Your wife's been calling, said his secretary, Maggie. She wants you to call her right away. Gary retrieved a stack of messages from his box on Maggie's desk. Did she say what it is? No, but she sounds upset. Even when I told her you weren't here, she kept calling. Gary shut himself inside his office and flipped through the messages. Caroline had called at 135, 140, 150, 155, and 210. It was now 225. He pumped his fist in triumph. Finally, finally, some evidence of desperation. He dialed home and said, What's up? Caroline's voice was shaking. Gary, something's wrong with your cell phone. I've been trying your cell phone, and it doesn't answer. What's wrong with it? I turned it off. How long has it been off? I've been trying you for an hour, and now I've got to go get the boys, but I don't want to leave the house. I don't know what to do. Caro, tell me what's wrong. There's somebody across the street. Who is it? I don't know. Somebody in the car. I don't know. They've been sitting there for an hour. The tip of Gary's dick was melting like the flame end of a candle. Well, he said, did you go see who it is? I'm afraid to, Caroline said, and the cops say it's a city street. They're right. It is a city street. Gary, somebody stole the Neverest sign again. She was practically sobbing. I came home at noon, and it was gone, and then I looked out, and this car was there, and there's somebody in the front seat right now. What kind of car? Big station wagon. It's old. I've never seen it before. Was it there when you came home? I don't know, but now I've got to go get Jonah, and I don't want to leave the house with the sign missing and the car out there. The alarm system is working, though, right? But if I come home, and they're still in the house, and I surprise them, Caroline, honey, calm down. You'd hear the alarm. Broken glass, an alarm going off, somebody cornered. These people have guns. Look, 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 Caroline. Here's what you do, Caroline. The fear in her voice and the need the fear suggested were making him so hot that he had to give himself a squeeze through the fabric of his pants, a pinch of reality. Call me back on your cell phone, he said. Keep me on the line, go out and get in the stomper, and drive down the driveway. You can talk to whoever through the window. I'll be there with you the whole time, all right? Okay, okay. I'm calling you right back. As Gary waited, he thought of the heat and the saltiness and the peach bruised softness of Caroline's face when she'd been crying, the sound of her swallowing her lacrimal mucus, and the wide open readiness of her mouth, then for his. To feel nothing, not the feeblest pulse in the dead mouse from which his urine issued for three weeks, to believe that she would never again need him and that he would never again want her, and then, on a moment's notice, to become light-headed with lust. This was marriage as he knew it. 
His telephone rang. I'm in the car, Caroline said from the cockpit-like oral space of mobile phoning. I'm backing up. You can get his license number, too. Write it down before you pull up next to him. Let him see you getting it. Okay, okay. In tinny miniature, he heard the big animal breathing of her SUV, the rising om of its automatic transmission. Oh, fuck, Gary, she wailed. He's gone. I don't see him. He must have seen me coming and driven away. Good, though. That's good. That's what you wanted. No, because he'll circle the block and come back when I'm not here. Gary calmed her down and told her how to approach the house safely when she returned with the boys. He promised to keep his cell phone on and come home early. He refrained from comparing her mental health with his. Depressed? He was not depressed. Vital signs of the rambunctious American economy streamed numerically across his many-windowed television screen. Orphic Midland up a point and three-eighths for the day, the U.S. dollar laughing at the euro, buggering the yen. Virginia Lynn dropped in and proposed selling a block of Exxon at 104. Gary could see out across the river to the floodplain landscape of Camden, New Jersey, whose deep ruination from this height and distance gave the impression of a kitchen floor with a linoleum scraped off. The sun was proud in the south, a source of relief. Gary couldn't stand it when his parents came east and the eastern seaboard's weather stank. The same sun was shining on their cruise ship now somewhere north of Maine. In the corner of his TV screen was the talking head of Curly Eberly. Gary upsized the picture and raised the sound as Eberly concluded, A bodybuilding machine for the brain, that's not a bad image, Cindy. The all-business-all-the-time anchors, for whom financial risk was merely the boon companion of upside potential, nodded sagely in response. Bodybuilding machine for the brain. Okay, the female anchor segued. And coming up, then, a toy that's all the rage in Belgium, and its maker says this product could be bigger than the Beanie Babies. Jay Pascoe dropped in to fetch about the bond market. Jay's little girls had a new piano teacher now, and the same old mother. Gary caught about one word of every three Jay spoke. His nerves were jangling as on a long-ago afternoon before his fifth date with Caroline, when they were so ready to finally be unchased that each intervening hour was like a granite block to be broken by a shackled prisoner. He left work at 4.30. In his Swedish sedan he wound his way up Kelly Drive and Lincoln Drive, out of the valley of the Skullkill and its haze and expressway, its bright flat realities, up through tunnels of shadow and gothic arches of early autumn leaves along the Wissahickon Creek, and back into the enchanted arboreality of Chestnut Hill. Caroline's fevered imaginings notwithstanding, the house appeared to be intact. Gary eased the car up the driveway, past the bed of hostas and euonymus from which, just as she'd said, another security by Neverest's sign had been stolen. Since the beginning of the year, Gary had planted and lost five security by Neverest signs. It galled him to be flooding the market with worthless signage, thereby diluting the value of security by Neverest as a burglary deterrent. Here, in the heart of Chestnut Hill, needless to say, the sheet metal currency of the Neverest and Western Civil Defense and pro tech signs in every front yard was backed by the full faith and credit of floodlights and retinal scanners, emergency batteries, buried hotlines, and remotely securable doors. But elsewhere in northwest Philly, down through Mount Airy into Germantown and Nicetown, where the sociopaths had their dealings and their dwellings, there existed a class of bleeding-heart homeowners who hated what it might say about their values to buy their own home security systems, but whose liberal values did not preclude stealing Gary's security by Neverest signs on an almost weekly basis and planting them in their own front yards. In the garage, he was overcome by an Alfred-like urge to recline in the car seat and shut his eyes. Turning off the engine, he seemed to switch off something in his brain as well. Where had his lust and energy disappeared to? This, too, was marriage as he knew it. He made himself leave the car. A constrictive band... ...of tiredness ran from his eyes and sinuses to his brainstem. 
even if Caroline was ready to forgive him, even if he and she could somehow slip away from the kids and fool around, and realistically there was no way that they could do this, he was probably too tired to perform now anyway. Stretching out ahead of him were five kid-filled hours before he could be alone with her in bed. Simply to regain the energy he'd had until five minutes ago would require sleep. Eight hours of it, maybe ten. The back door was locked and chained. He gave it the firmest, merriest knock he could manage. Through the window he saw Jonah come trotting over in flip-flops and a swimsuit, enter security code, and unbolt and unchain the door. Hello there, Dad. I'm making a sauna in the bathroom, Jonah said as he trotted away again. The object of Gary's desire, the tear-softened blonde female whom he'd reassured on the phone, was sitting next to Caleb and watching a galactic rerun on the kitchen TV. Earnest humanoids in unisex pajamas. Hello, Gary said. Looks like everything's okay here. Caroline and Caleb nodded, their eyes on a different planet. I guess I'll go put another sign out, Gary said. You should nail it to a tree, Caroline said. Take it off its stick and nail it to a tree. Nearly unmanned by disappointed expectation, Gary filled his chest with air and coughed. The idea, Caroline, is that there be a certain classiness and subtlety to the message we're projecting. A certain word-to-the-wise quality. When you have to chain your sign to a tree to keep it from getting stolen, I said, nail. It's like announcing to the sociopaths, we're whipped, come and get us, come and get us. I didn't say chain, I said nail. Caleb reached for the remote and raised the TV volume. Gary went to the basement, and from a flat cardboard carton took the last of the six signs that a Neverest representative had sold to him in bulk. Considering the cost of a Neverest home security system, the signs were unbelievably shoddy. The placards were unevenly painted and attached by fragile aluminum rivets to posts of rolled sheet metal too thin to be hammered into the ground. You had to dig a hole. Caroline didn't look up when he returned to the kitchen. He might have wondered if he'd hallucinated her panicked calls to him if there were not a lingering humidity in his boxer shorts, and if, during his thirty seconds in the basement, she hadn't thrown the deadbolt on the back door, engaged the chain, and reset the alarm. He, of course, was mentally ill, whereas she, she... Good Christ, he said as he punched their wedding date into the numeric keypad. Leaving the door wide open, he went to the front yard and planted the new Neverest sign in the old sterile hole. When he came back a minute later, the door was locked again. He took his keys out and turned the deadbolt and pushed the door open to the extent the chain permitted, triggering the excuse-me-please alarm inside. He shoved on the door, stressing its hinges. He considered putting his shoulder to it and ripping out the chain. With a grimace and a shout, Caroline jumped up and clutched her back and stumbled over to enter code within the thirty-second limit. Gary, she said, just knock. I was in the front yard, he said. I was fifty feet away. Why are you setting the alarm? You don't understand what it was like here today, she muttered as, limping, she returned to interstellar space. I'm feeling pretty alone here, Gary. Pretty alone. Here I am, though, right? I'm home now. Yes. You're home. Hey, Dad, what's for dinner? Caleb said. Can we have mixed grill? Yes, Gary said. I will make dinner and I will do the dishes and I may also trim the hedge because I, for one, am feeling good. All right, Caroline, does that sound okay to you? Yes, please, sure, make dinner, she murmured, staring at the TV. Good, I will make dinner. Gary clapped his hands and coughed. He felt as if, in his chest and his head, worn-out gears were falling off their axles, chewing into other parts of his internal machinery as he demanded of his body a bravado and undepressed energy that it was simply not equipped to give. He needed to sleep well tonight for at least six hours. To accomplish this, he planned to drink two vodka martinis and hit the sack before ten. 
He upended the vodka bottle over a shaker of ice and brazenly let it glug and glug because he, a veep at scent trust, had nothing to be ashamed of in relaxing after a hard day's work. He started a mesquite fire and drank the martini down. Like a thrown coin, in a wide, teetering orbit of decay, he circled back into the kitchen and managed to get the meat ready, but he felt too tired to cook it. Because Caroline and Caleb had paid no attention to him when he made the first martini, he now made a second, for energy and general bolsterment, and officially considered it his first. Battling the vitreous lensing effects of a vodka buzz, he went out and threw meat on the grill. Again the weariness, again the deficit of every friendly neurofactor overtook him. In plain view of his entire family, he made a third, officially a second, martini, and drank it down. Through the window, he observed that the grill was in flames. He filled a Teflon skillet with water and spilled only some of it as he rushed out to pour it on the fire. A cloud of steam and smoke and aerosol grease went up. He flipped all the meat scraps, exposing their charred, glossy undersides. There was a smell of wet burnedness, such as firemen leave behind. Not enough life remained in the coals to do more than faintly color the raw sides of the meat scraps, though he left them on for another ten minutes. His miraculously considerate son Jonah had meanwhile set the table and put out bread and butter. Gary served the less burned and less raw bits of meat to his wife and children. Wielding his knife and fork clumsily, he filled his mouth with cinders and bloody chicken that he was too tired to chew and swallow, and also too tired to get up and spit out. He sat with the unchewed bird flesh in his mouth until he realized that saliva was trickling down his chin. A poor way indeed to demonstrate good mental health. He swallowed the bolus whole. It felt like a tennis ball going down. His family was looking at him. Dad, are you feeling okay? Aaron said. Gary wiped his chin. Fine, Aaron, thank you. Tickens a little chuff, a little tough. He coughed, his esophagus a column of flame. Maybe you want to go lie down, Caroline said, as to a child. I think I'll trim that hedge, Gary said. You seem pretty tired, Caroline said. Maybe you should lie down instead. Not tired, Caroline, just got some smoke in my eyes. Gary, I know you're telling everybody I'm depressed, but as it happens, I'm not. Gary. Right, Aaron? Am I right? She told you I'm clinically depressed, right? Aaron, caught off guard, looked to Caroline, who shook her head at him slowly and significantly. Well, did she? Gary said. Aaron lowered his eyes to his plate, blushing. The spasm of love that Gary felt then for his oldest son, his sweet, honest, vain, blushing son, was intimately connected to the rage that was now propelling him before he understood what was happening away from the table. He was cursing in front of his kids. He was saying, Fuck this, Caroline. Fuck your whispering. I'm going to fucking go trim that fucking hedge. Jonah and Caleb lowered their heads, ducking as if under fire. Aaron seemed to be reading the story of his life, in particular his future, on his grease-smeared dinner plate. Caroline spoke in the calm, low, quavering voice of the patently abused. Okay, Gary. Good, she said. Just please, then, let us enjoy our dinner. Please, just go. Gary went. He stormed outside and crossed the backyard. All the foliage near the house was chalky now, with outpouring indoor light, but there was still enough twilight in the western trees to make them silhouettes. In the garage he took the eight-foot stepladder down from its brackets and danced and spun with it, nearly knocking out the windshield of the stomper before he got control. He hauled the ladder around to the front of the house, turned on lights, and came back for the electric trimmer and the hundred-foot extension cord. To keep the dirty cord from contact with his expensive linen shirt, which he belatedly realized he was still wearing, he let the cord drag behind him and get destructively tangled up in flowers. He stripped down to his T-shirt, but didn't stop to change his pants for fear of losing momentum and lying down on the day-heat radiating lawn and listening to the crickets and the ratcheting cicadas and nodding off. Sustained physical exertion cleared his head to some extent. He mounted the ladder and lopped the lime-green lolling tops off ewes, leaning out as far as he dared, probably 
Finding himself unable to reach the twelve inches of hedge nearest the house, he should have turned off the clipper and come down and moved the ladder closer. But since it was a matter of twelve inches, and he didn't have infinite reserves of energy and patience, he tried to walk the ladder toward the house, to kind of swing its legs and hop with it while continuing to grip in his left hand the running clipper the gentle blow, the almost stingless brush or bump that he then delivered to the meaty palm part of his right thumb proved, on inspection, to have made a deep and heavily bleeding hole that in the best of all possible worlds an emergency physician would have looked at. But Gary was nothing if not conscientious. He knew he was too drunk to drive himself to Chestnut Hill Hospital and he couldn't ask Caroline to drive him there without raising awkward questions regarding his decision to climb a ladder and operate a power tool while intoxicated, which would collaterally entail admitting how much vodka he'd drunk before dinner and in general paint the opposite of the picture of good mental health that he'd intended to create by coming out to trim the hedge. So while a swarm of skin-biting and fabric-eating insects, attracted by the porch lights, flew into the house through the front door that Gary, as he hurried inside with his strangely cool blood pooling in the cup of both hands, had neglected to kick shut behind him, he closeted himself in the downstairs bathroom and released the blood into the sink, seeing pomegranate juice or chocolate syrup or dirty motor oil in its ferric swirls. He ran cold water on the gash, from outside the unlocked bathroom door, Jonah asked if he had hurt himself. Gary assembled with his left hand an absorptive pad of toilet paper and pressed it to the wound and one-handedly applied plastic surgical tape that the blood and water immediately made unsticky. There was blood on the toilet seat, blood on the floor, blood on the door. Dad, bugs are coming in, Jonah said. Yes, Jonah, why don't you shut the door and then go up and take a bath. I'll come up soon and play checkers. Can we play chess instead? Yes. You have to give me a queen, a bishop, a horse, and a rook, though. Yes, go take a bath. Will you come up soon? Yes. Gary tore fresh tape from the fanged dispenser and laughed at himself in the mirror to be sure he could still do it. Blood was soaking through the toilet paper, trickling down around his wrist and loosening the tape. He wrapped the hand in a guest towel, and with a second guest towel well dampened, he wiped the bathroom clean of blood. He opened the door a crack and listened to Caroline's voice upstairs, to the dishwasher in the kitchen, to Jonah's bathwater running. A trail of blood receded up the central hall toward the front door. Crouching and moving sideways in crab fashion, with his injured hand pressed to his belly, Gary swabbed up the blood with the guest towel. Further blood was spattered on the gray wooden floor of the front porch. Gary walked on the sides of his feet for quiet. He went to the kitchen for a bucket and a mop, and there, in the kitchen, was the liquor cabinet. Well, he opened it. By holding the vodka bottle in his right armpit, he was able to unscrew the cap with his left hand. And as he was raising the bottle, as he was tilting his head to make a late, small withdrawal from the rather tiny balance that remained, his gaze drifted over the top of the cabinet door, and he saw the camera. The camera was the size of a deck of cards. It was mounted on an altazimuth bracket above the back door. Its casing was of brushed aluminum. It had a purplish gleam in its eye. Gary returned the bottle to the cabinet, moved to the sink, and ran water in a bucket. The camera swept thirty degrees to follow him. He wanted to rip the camera off the ceiling, and, failing that, he wanted to go upstairs and explain to Caleb the dubious morality of spying, and, failing that, he at least wanted to know how long the camera had been in place. But since he had something to hide now, any action he took against the camera, any objection he made to its presence in his kitchen, was bound to strike Caleb as self-serving. He dropped the bloody, dusty guest towel in the bucket and approached the back door. The camera reared up in its bracket to keep him centered in its field. He stood directly below it and looked into its eye. He shook his head and mouthed the words, No, Caleb. Naturally, the camera made no response. Gary realized now that the room was probably miked for sound as well. He could speak to Caleb directly, but he was afraid that if he looked up into Caleb's proxy eye and heard his own voice and let it be heard in Caleb's room, the result would be an intolerably strong upsurge in the reality of what was happening. He therefore shook his head again and made a sweeping motion with his left hand, a film director's cut. 
Then he took the bucket from the sink and swabbed the front porch. Because he was drunk, the problem of the camera and Caleb's witnessing of his injury and his furtive involvement with the liquor cabinet didn't stay in Gary's head as an ensemble of conscious thoughts and anxieties, but turned in on itself and became a kind of physical presence inside him a hard, tumorous mass descending through his stomach and coming to rest in his lower gut. The problem wasn't going anywhere, of course, but for the moment it was impervious to thought. "'Dad?' came Jonah's voice through an upstairs window. "'I'm ready to play chess now.' By the time Gary went inside, having left the hedge half-clipped and the ladder in an ivy bed, his blood had soaked through three layers of toweling and bloomed on the surface as a pinkish spot of plasma filtered of its corpuscles. He was afraid of meeting somebody in the hallway, Caleb or Caroline certainly, but especially Aaron, because Aaron had asked him if he was feeling all right. And Aaron had not been able to lie to him, and these small demonstrations of Aaron's love were, in a way, the scariest part of the whole evening. "'Why is there a towel on your hand?' Jonah asked as he removed half of Gary's forces from the chessboard. I cut myself, Jonah. I'm keeping some ice on the cut. You smell like alcohol, Jonah's voice was lilting. Alcohol is a powerful disinfectant, Gary said. Jonah moved a pawn to King Four. I'm talking about the alcohol you drank, though. By ten o'clock, Gary was in bed and thus arguably still in compliance with his original plan, arguably still on track to... What? Well, he didn't exactly know, but if he got some sleep, he might be able to see his way forward. In order not to bleed on the sheets, he'd put his injured hand, towel and all, inside a branola bread bag. He turned out the nightstand light and faced the wall, his bagged hand cradled against his chest, the sheet and the summer blanket pulled up over his shoulder. He slept hard for a while, and was awakened in the darkened room by the throbbing of his hand. The flesh on either side of the gash was twitching as if it had worms in it, pain fanning out along five carpi. Caroline breathed evenly, asleep. Gary got up to empty his bladder and take four Advils. When he returned to bed, his last pathetic plan fell apart because he could not get back to sleep. He had the sensation that blood was running out of the Branola bag. He considered getting up and sneaking out to the garage and driving to the emergency room. He added up the hours this would take him and the amount of wakefulness he would have to burn off upon returning, and he subtracted the total from the hours of night remaining until he had to get up and go to work, and he concluded that he was better off just sleeping until six, and then, if need be, stopping at the ER on his way to work. But this was all contingent on his ability to fall back asleep. And since he couldn't do this, he reconsidered and recalculated. But now there were fewer minutes remaining of the night than when he'd first considered getting up and sneaking out. The calculus was cruel in its regression. He got up again to piss. The problem of Caleb's surveillance lay indigestible in his gut. He was mad to wake up Caroline and fuck her. His hurt hand pulsed. It felt elephantine. He had a hand the size and weight of an armchair, each finger a soft log of exquisite sensitivity. And Denise kept looking at him with hatred, and his mother kept yearning for her Christmas, and he slipped briefly into a room in which his father had been strapped into an electric chair and fitted with a metal helmet, and Gary's own hand was on the old-fashioned stirrup-like power switch which he'd evidently already thrown, because Alfred came leaping from the chair, fantastically galvanized, horribly smiling, a travesty of enthusiasm, dancing around with rigid, jerking limbs and circling the room at double speed and then falling hard, face down, wham, like a ladder with its legs together, and lying prone there on the execution room floor with every muscle in his body galvanically twitching and boiling. Gray light was in the windows when Gary got up to piss for the fourth or fifth time. The morning's humidity and warmth felt more like July than October. A haze or fog on Seminole Street confused or disembodied or refracted the cawing of crows as they worked their way up the hill over Navajo Road and Shawnee Street like local teenagers heading to the Wawa Food Market parking lot, Club Wa, they called it, according to Aaron, to smoke their cigarettes. 
He lay down again and waited for sleep. Day the 5th of October, among the top news stories we're following this morning, with his execution now less than 24 hours away, lawyers for Kelly, said Caroline's clock radio before she swatted it silent. In the next hour, while he listened to the rising of his sons and the sound of their breakfasts and the blowing of a trumpet line by John Philip Sousa, courtesy of Aaron, a radical new plan took shape in Gary's brain. He lay fetally on his side, very still, facing the wall with his granola-bagged hand against his chest. His radical new plan was to do absolutely nothing. "'Gary, are you awake?' Caroline said from a medium distance, the doorway, presumably. Gary? He did nothing. Didn't answer. Gary? He wondered if she might be curious about why he was doing nothing, but already her footsteps were receding up the hall, and she was calling, Jonah, come on, you're going to be late. Where's Dad? Jonah said. He's still in bed. Let's go. There was a patter of little feet, and now came the first real challenge to Gary's radical new plan. From somewhere closer than the doorway, Jonah spoke. Dad? We're leaving now. Dad? And Gary had to do nothing. He had to pretend he couldn't hear or wouldn't hear. He had to inflict his general strike, his clinical depression, on the one creature he wished he could have spared. If Jonah came any closer, if, for example, he came and gave him a hug... Gary doubted he would be able to stay silent and unmoving. But Caroline was calling from downstairs again, and Jonah hurried out. Distantly, Gary heard the beeping of his anniversary date being entered to arm the perimeter. Then the toast-smelling house was silent, and he shaped his face into the expression of bottomless suffering and self-pity that Caroline wore when her back was hurting. He understood as he never had before, how much comfort this expression yielded. He thought about getting up, but he didn't need anything. He didn't know when Caroline was coming back. If she was working at the CDF today, she might not return until three. It didn't matter. He would be here. As it happened, Caroline came back in half an hour. The sounds of her departure were reversed. He heard the approaching stomper, the disarming code, the footsteps on the stairs. He sensed his wife in the doorway, silent, watching him. Gary? She said in a lower, more tender voice. He did nothing. He lay. She came over to him and knelt by the bed. What is it? Are you sick? He didn't answer. What is this bag for? My God, what did you do? He said nothing. Gary, say something. Are you depressed? Yes. She sighed then. Weeks of accumulated tension were draining from the room. I surrender, Gary said. What do you mean? You don't have to go to St. Jude, he said. Nobody who doesn't want to go has to go. It cost him a lot to say this, but there was a reward. He felt Caroline's warmth approaching its radiance before she touched him. The sun rising, the first brush of her hair on his neck as she leaned over him, the approach of her breath, the gentle touching down of her lips on his cheek. She said, Thank you. I may have to go for Christmas Eve but I'll come back for Christmas. Thank you. I'm extremely depressed. Thank you. I surrender, Gary said. An irony, of course, was that as soon as he'd surrendered, possibly as soon as he'd confessed to his depression, almost certainly by the time he showed her his hand and she put a proper bandage on it, and absolutely no later than the moment at which, with a locomotive as long and hard and heavy as an O-gauge model railroad engine, he tunneled up into wet and gently corrugated recesses that even after twenty years of traveling through them still felt unexplored. His approach 
was spoon-style from behind, so that Caroline could keep her lower back arched outward, and he could harmlessly drape his bandaged hand across her flank, the screwing wounded the two of them were. He not only no longer felt depressed, he felt euphoric. The thought came to him, inappropriately, perhaps, considering the tender conjugal act that he was now engaged in, but he was who he was. He was Gary Lambert. He had inappropriate thoughts, and he was sick of apologizing. That he could now safely ask Caroline to buy him forty-five hundred shares of Exxon, and that she would gladly do it. She rose and dipped like a top on a tiny point of contact, her entire sexual being almost weightless on the moistened tip of his middle finger. He spent himself gloriously, spent and spent and spent. They were still lying naked at the hooky-playing hour of nine-thirty on a Tuesday when the phone on Caroline's nightstand rang. Gary, answering, was shocked to hear his mother's voice. He was shocked by the reality of her existence. "'I'm calling from the ship,' Enid said. For one guilty instant, before it registered with him that phoning from a ship was expensive and that his mother's news could therefore not be good, Gary believed that she was calling because she knew that he'd betrayed her. At Sea Two hundred hours, darkness, the Gunnar Myrdal, all around the old man running water, sighing mysteriously in metal pipes. As the ship sliced open the Black Sea east of Nova Scotia, the horizontal faintly pitched bow to stern, as if despite its great steel competence, the ship were uneasy and could solve the problem of a liquid hill only by cutting through it quickly as if its stability depended on such a glossing over of flotation's terrors. There was another world below. This was the problem. Another world below that had volume, but no form. By day the sea was blue surface and whitecaps, a realistic navigational challenge, and the problem could be overlooked. By night, though, the mind went forth and dove down through the yielding, the violently lonely nothingness on which the heavy steel ship traveled, and in every moving swell you saw a travesty of grids. You saw how truly and forever lost a man would be, six fathoms under. Dry land lacked this z-axis. Dry land was like being awake, even in chartless desert you could drop to your knees and pound land with your fist, and land didn't give. Of course the ocean, too, had a skin of wakefulness. But every point on this skin was a point where you could sink, and by sinking, disappear. As things pitched, so they trembled. There was a shivering in the Gunnar Myrdal's framework, an endless shudder in the floor and bed and birch-paneled walls, a syncopated tremor so fundamental to the ship and so similar to Parkinson's in the way it constantly waxed without seeming ever to wane, that Alfred had located the problem within himself until he overheard younger, healthier passengers remarking on it. He lay approximately awake in stateroom B-11. Awake in a metal box that pitched and trembled, a dark metal box moving somewhere in the night. There was no porthole. A room with a view would have cost hundreds of dollars more, and Enid had reasoned that since a stateroom was mainly used for sleeping, who needed a porthole at that price? She might look through it six times on the voyage. That was fifty dollars a look. She was sleeping now, silently, like a person feigning sleep. Alfred asleep was a symphony of snoring and whistling and choking, an epic of Z's. Enid was a haiku. She lay still for hours and then blinked awake like a light switched on. Sometimes at dawn in St. Jude, in the long minute it took the clock radio to flip a digit, the only moving thing in the house was the eye of Enid. 
On the morning of Chip's conception, she'd merely looked like she was shamming sleep, but on the morning of Denise's, seven years later, she really was pretending. Alfred, in middle age, had invited such venial deceptions. A decade-plus of marriage had turned him into one of the overly civilized predators you hear about in zoos. The Bengal tiger that forgets how to kill. The lion lazy with depression. To exert attraction, Enid had to be a still unbloody carcass. If she actively reached out, actively threw a thigh over his, he braced himself against her and withheld his face. If she so much as stepped from the bathroom naked, he averted his eyes, as the golden rule enjoined the man who hated to be seen himself. Only early in the morning, waking to the sight of her small white shoulder, did he venture from his lair. Her stillness and self-containment, the slow sips of air she took, her purely vulnerable objecthood made him pounce. And feeling his padded paw on her ribs and his meat-seeking breath on her neck, she went limp, as if with praise, instinctive resignation, let's get this dying over with. Although in truth, her passivity was calculated, because she knew passivity inflamed him. He had her, and to some extent she wanted to be had, like an animal in a mute, mutual privacy of violence. She, too, kept her eyes shut. Often didn't even roll from the side she'd been lying on, but simply flared her hip, brought her knee up in a vaguely proctologic reflex. Then, without showing her his face, he departed for the bathroom, where he washed and shaved, and emerged to see the bed already made, and to hear downstairs the percolator gulping. From Enid's perspective in the kitchen, maybe a lion, not her husband, had voluptuously mauled her, or maybe one of the men in uniform she ought to have married had slipped into her bed. It wasn't a wonderful life, but a woman could subsist on self-deceptions like these and on her memories, which also now, curiously, seemed like self-deceptions, of the early years when he'd been mad for her and had looked into her eyes. The important thing was to keep it all tacit. If the act was never spoken of, there would be no reason to discontinue it until she was definitely pregnant again, and even after pregnancy, no reason not to resume it, as long as it was never mentioned. She'd always wanted three children. The longer nature denied her a third, the less fulfilled she felt in comparison to her neighbors. B. Meisner, though fatter and dumber than Enid, publicly smooched with her husband, Chuck. Twice a month, the Meisners hired a sitter and went dancing. Every October, without fail, Dale Driblet took his wife, Honey, someplace extravagant and out of state for their anniversary, and the many young Driblets all had birthdays in July. Even Esther and Kirby Root could be seen at barbecues patting each other's well-marbled bottoms. It frightened and shamed Enid the loving kindness of other couples. She was a bright girl with good business skills who had gone directly from ironing sheets and tablecloths at her mother's boarding house to ironing sheets and shirts Shea Lambert. In every neighbor woman's eyes she saw the tacit question, did Al at least make her feel super special in that special way? As soon as she was visibly pregnant again, she had a tacit answer. The changes in her body were incontrovertible, and she imagined so vividly the flattering inferences about her love life that B and Esther and Honey might draw from these changes that soon enough she drew the inferences herself. Made happy in this way by pregnancy, she got sloppy and talked about the wrong thing to Alfred. Not, needless to say, about sex or fulfillment or fairness, but there were other topics scarcely less forbidden, and Enid, in her giddiness one morning, overstepped. She suggested he buy shares of a certain stock. Alfred said the stock market was a lot of dangerous nonsense, best left to wealthy men and idle speculators. Enid suggested he nonetheless buy shares of a certain stock. Alfred said he remembered Black Tuesday as if it were yesterday. 
Enid suggested he nonetheless buy shares of a certain stock. Alfred said it would be highly improper to buy that stock. Enid suggested he nonetheless buy it. Alfred said they had no money to spare, and now a third child coming. Enid suggested that money could be borrowed. Alfred said no. He said no in a much louder voice and stood up from the breakfast table. He said no so loudly that a decorative copper plate bowl on the kitchen wall briefly hummed, and without kissing her goodbye, he left the house for eleven days and ten nights. Who would have guessed that such a little mistake on her part could change everything? In August... The Midland Pacific had made Alfred its assistant chief engineer for track and structures. And now he'd been sent east to inspect every mile of the Erie Belt Railroad. Erie Belt district managers shuttled him around in dinky gas-powered motor cars, darting in bug fashion onto sidings while Erie Belt megalosaurs thundered past. The Erie Belt was a regional system whose freight business trucks had damaged, and whose passenger business private automobiles had driven into the red. Although its trunk lines were still generally hale, its branches and spurs were rotting like you couldn't believe. Trains poked along at ten miles per hour on rails no straighter than limp string, mile upon mile of hopelessly buckled belt. Alfred saw cross ties better suited to mulching than to gripping spikes. Rail anchors that had lost their heads to rust, bodies wasting inside a crust of corrosion like shrimps in a shell of deep fry. Ballast so badly washed out that ties were hanging from the rail rather than supporting it. Girders peeling and corrupted like German chocolate cake, the dark shavings, the miscellaneous crumble. How modest compared to the furious locomotive a stretch of weedy track could seem skirting a field of late sorghum. But without this track, a train was ten thousand tons of ungovernable nothing. The will was in the track. Everywhere Alfred went in the Erie Belt hinterland, he heard young Erie Belt employees telling one another, Take it easy. See you later, Sam. Don't work too hard now. Take it easy. You too, pal. Take it easy. The phrase seemed to Alfred an eastern blight, a fitting epitaph, for a once great state, Ohio, that parasitic teamsters had sucked nearly dry. Nobody in St. Jude would dare tell him to take it easy. On the high prairie where he'd grown up, a person who took it easy wasn't much of a man. Now came a new, effeminate generation for whom easy-going was a compliment. Alfred heard eerie belt-track gangs yucking it up on company time. He saw flashily-dressed clerks taking ten-minute breaks for coffee. He watched callow draftsmen smoke cigarettes with insinuating relish while a once-solid railroad fell to pieces all around them. Take it easy was the watchword of these super-friendly young men, the token of their over-familiarity, the false reassurance that enabled them to ignore the filth they worked in. The Midland Pacific, by contrast, was clean steel and white concrete. Cross ties so new that blue creosote pooled in their grain. The applied science of vibratory tamping and pre-stressed rebar, motion detectors and welded rail. The midpack was based in St. Jude and served a harder-working, less eastern region of the country. Unlike the Erie Belt, it took pride in its commitment to maintaining quality service on its branch lines. A thousand towns and small cities across the central tiers of states depended on the midpack. The more Alfred saw of the Erie Belt, the more distinctly he felt the Midland Pacific's superior size, strength, and moral vitality in his own limbs and carriage. In his shirt and tie and wingtips, he nimbly took the catwalk over the Maumee River, forty feet above slag barges and turbid water, grabbed the truss's lower cord, and leaned out upside down to whack the span's principal girder with his favorite whacking hammer, which he carried everywhere in his briefcase. Scabs of paint and rust as big as sycamore leaves spiraled down into the river. A yard engine ringing its bell crept onto the span, and Alfred, who had no fear of heights, leaned into a hanger brace and planted his feet in the matchstick ties sticking out over the river. While the ties waggled and jumped, 
he jotted on his clipboard a damning assessment of the bridge's competence. Maybe some of the women drivers crossing the Maumee on the neighboring Cherry Street Bridge saw him perched there, flat of belly and broad of shoulder, the wind winding his cuffs around his ankles, and maybe they felt, as Enid had felt the first time she'd laid eyes on him, that here was a man. Although he was oblivious to their glances, Alfred experienced from within what they saw from without. By day he felt like a man, and he showed this, you might even say flaunted it, by standing no-handedly on high narrow ledges, and working ten and twelve hours without a break, and cataloguing an eastern railroad's effeminacies. Nighttime was a different matter. By night he lay awake on mattresses that felt made of cardboard, and cataloged the faults of humanity. It seemed as if in every motel he stayed in, he had neighbors who fornicated like there was no tomorrow, men of ill-breeding and poor discipline, women who chuckled and screamed. At 1 a.m. in Erie, Pennsylvania, a girl in the next room ranted and panted like a strumpet, some slick, worthless fellow having his way with her. Alfred blamed the girl for taking it easy. He blamed the man for his easy-going confidence. He blamed both of them for lacking the consideration to keep their voices down. How could they never once stop to think of their neighbor lying awake in the next room? He blamed God for allowing such people to exist. He blamed democracy for inflicting them on him. He blamed the motel's architect for trusting a single layer of cinder block to preserve the repose of paying customers. He blamed the motel management for not keeping in reserve a room for guests who suffered. He blamed the frivolous, easy-going townspeople of Washington, Pennsylvania, who had driven 150 miles for a high school football championship game and filled every motel room in northwest Pennsylvania. He blamed his fellow guests for their indifference to the fornication. He blamed all of humanity for its insensitivity. And it was so unfair. It was unfair that the world could be so inconsiderate to a man who was so considerate to the world. No man worked harder than he. No man made a quieter motel neighbor. No man was more of a man, and yet the phonies of the world were allowed to rob him of sleep with their lewd transactions. He refused to weep. He believed that if he heard himself weeping at two in the morning in a smoke-smelling motel room, the world might end. If nothing else, he had discipline the power to refuse. He had this. But his exercising of it went unthanked. The bed in the next room thudded against the wall, the man groaning like a ham, the girl gasping in her ululations. And every waitress in every town had spherical mammaries insufficiently buttoned into a monogrammed blouse and made a point of leaning over him. More coffee, good-looking? Ah, yes, please. You blushing, sweetheart, or is that the sun coming up? I will take the check now, thank you. And in the Olmstead Hotel in Cleveland, he surprised a porter and a maid lasciviously osculating in a stairwell. And the tracks he saw when he closed his eyes were a zipper that he endlessly unzipped, and the signals behind him turned from forbidding red to willing green the instant he passed them, and in a saggy bed in Fort Wayne, awful succubuses descended on him, women whose entire bodies, their very clothes and smiles, the crossings of their legs, exuded invitation like vaginas, and up to the surface of his consciousness, do not soil the bed, he raced the welling embolus of spunk, his eyes opening to Fort Wayne at sunrise as a scalding nothing drained into his pajamas. A victory, all things considered, for he denied the succubuses his satisfaction. But in Buffalo the trainmaster had a pinup of Bridget Bardot on his office door, and in Youngstown Alfred found a filthy magazine beneath the motel telephone book, and in Hammond, Indiana he was trapped on a siding while a freight train slid past him and varsity cheerleaders did splits on the ball field directly to his left the blondest girl actually bouncing a little at the very bottom of her split, as if she had to kiss the cleat-chewed sod with her cotton-clad vulva, and the caboose rocking saucily as the train finally receded up the tracks. How the world seemed bent on torturing a man of virtue. 
He returned to St. Jude in an executive car appended to an intercity freight run, and from Union Station he took the commuter local to the suburbs. In the blocks between the station and his house, the last leaves were coming down. It was the season of hurtling, hurtling toward winter. Cavalries of leaf wheeled across the bitten lawns. He stopped in the street and looked at the house that he and a bank owned. The gutters were plugged with twigs and acorns. The mum beds were blasted. It occurred to him that his wife was pregnant again. Months were rushing him forward on their rigid track, carrying him closer to the day he'd be the father of three, the year he'd pay off his mortgage, the season of his death. "'I like your suitcase,' Chuck Meisner said through the window of his commuter fare lane, breaking in the street alongside him. "'For a second I thought you were the photo brush man.' "'Chuck,' said Alfred, startled. "'Hello. Planning a conquest. The husband's out of town forever.' Alfred laughed because there was nothing else for it. He and Chuck met in the street often, the engineer standing at attention, the banker relaxing at the wheel. Alfred in a suit, and Chuck in golf wear. Alfred lean and flat-topped, Chuck shiny-pated, saggy-breasted. Chuck worked easy hours at the branch he managed, but Alfred nonetheless considered him a friend. Chuck actually listened to what he said, seemed impressed with the work he did, and recognized him as a person of singular abilities. So I ain't it in church on Sunday, Chuck said. She told me you'd been gone a week already. Eleven days I was on the road. Emergency somewhere? Not exactly, Alfred spoke with pride. I was inspecting every mile of track on the Erie Belt Railroad. Erie Belt? Huh? Chuck hooked his thumbs over the steering wheel, resting his hands on his lap. He was the most easy-going driver Alfred knew, yet also the most alert. "'You do your job well, Al,' he said. "'You're a fantastic engineer, so there's got to be a reason why the Erie Belt.' "'There is indeed,' Alfred said. "'Midpack's buying it.' The fair lane's engine sneezed once in a canine way. Chuck had grown up on a farm near Cedar Rapids, and the optimism of his nature was rooted in the deep, well-watered topsoil of eastern Iowa. Farmers in eastern Iowa never learned not to trust the world, whereas any soil that might have nurtured hope in Alfred had blown away in one or another West Kansan drought. So, Chuck said, I imagine there's been a public announcement. No, no announcement. Chuck nodded looking past Alfred at the Lambert house. Enid'll be happy to see you. I think she's had a hard week. The boys have been sick. You'll keep that information quiet. Ow, ow, ow. I wouldn't mention it to anyone but you. Appreciate it. You're a good friend and a good Christian. And I've got about four holes worth of daylight if I'm going to get that hedge pruned back. The fair lane inched into motion, Chuck steering it into his driveway with one index finger, as if dialing his broker. Alfred picked up his suitcase and briefcase. It had been both spontaneous and the opposite of spontaneous, his disclosure. A spasm of goodwill and gratitude to Chuck, a calculated emission of the fury that had been building inside him for eleven days. A man travels two thousand miles, but he can't take the last twenty steps without doing something. And it did seem unlikely that Chuck would actually use the information. Entering the house through the kitchen door, Alfred saw chunks of raw rutabaga in a pot of water, a rubber-banded bunch of beet greens, and some mystery meat in brown butcher paper. Also, a casual onion that looked destined to be fried and served with... liver... On the floor by the basement stairs was a nest of magazines and jelly glasses. Hal? Enid called from the basement. He set down his suitcase and briefcase, gathered the magazines and jelly glasses in his arms, and carried them down the steps. Enid parked her iron on the ironing board, and emerged from the laundry room with butterflies in her stomach, whether from lust or from fear of Al's rage, or from fear that she might become enraged herself, she didn't know. He set her straight in a hurry. What did I ask you to do before I left? You're home early, she said. The boys are still at the Y. 
What is the one thing I asked you to do while I was gone? I'm catching up on laundry. The boys have been sick. Do you remember, he said, that I asked you to take care of the mess at the top of the stairs? That was the one thing, the one thing I asked you to do while I was gone. Without waiting for an answer, he went into his metallurgy lab and dumped the magazines and jelly glasses into a heavy-duty trash can. From the hammer shelf, he took a badly balanced hammer, a crudely forged Neanderthal club that he hated and kept only for purposes of demolition, and methodically broke each jelly glass. A splinter hit his cheek, and he swung more furiously, smashing the shards into smaller shards. But nothing could eradicate his transgression with Chuck Meisner, or the grass-damp triangles of cheerleading leotard, no matter how he hammered. Enid listened from her station at the ironing board. She didn't care much for the reality of this moment. That her husband had left town eleven days ago without kissing her goodbye was a thing she'd halfway succeeded in forgetting. With the living Al absent, she'd alchemically transmuted her base resentments into the gold of longing and remorse. Her swelling womb, the pleasures of the fourth month, the time alone with her handsome boys, the envy of her neighbors all were colorful filters over which she'd waved the wand of her imagination. Even as Al had come down the stairs, she'd still imagined apologies, homecoming kisses, a bouquet of flowers, maybe. Now she heard the ricochet of broken glass and glancing hammer blows on heavy-gauge galvanized iron, the frustrated shrieks of hard materials in conflict. The filters may have been colorful, but unfortunately, she saw now, they were chemically inert. Nothing had really changed. It was true that Al had asked her to move the jars and magazines, and there was probably a word for the way she'd stepped around those jars and magazines for the last eleven days, often nearly stumbling on them. Maybe a psychiatric word with many syllables, or maybe a simple word like spite. But it seemed to her that he'd asked her to do more than one thing while he was gone. He'd also asked her to make the boys three meals a day, and clothe them, and read to them, and nurse them in sickness, and scrub the kitchen floor, and wash the sheets, and iron his shirts, and do it all without a husband's kisses or kind words. If she tried to get credit for these labors of hers, however, Al simply asked her whose labors had paid for the house and food and linens. Never mind that his work so satisfied him that he didn't need her love, while her chores so bored her that she needed his love doubly. In any rational accounting, his work cancelled her work. Perhaps in strict fairness, since he'd asked her to do one thing extra, she might have asked him to do one thing extra too. She might have asked him to telephone her once from the road, for example but he could argue that someone's going to trip on those magazines and hurt themselves, whereas no one was going to trip over his not calling her from the road. No one was going to hurt themselves over that. And charging long-distance calls to the company was an abuse of his expense account. You have my office number if there's an emergency. And so a phone call cost the household quite a bit of money, whereas carrying junk into the basement cost it no money. And so she was always wrong and it was demoralizing to dwell perpetually in the cellar of your wrongness, to wait perpetually for someone to take pity on you in your wrongness, and so it was no wonder, really, that she'd shopped for the dinner of revenge. Halfway up the basement stairs, on her way to preparing this dinner, she paused and gave a sigh. Alfred heard the sigh, and suspected it had to do with laundry, and four months pregnant. However, his own mother had driven a team of plow horses around a twenty-acre field when she was eight months pregnant, so he was not exactly sympathetic. He gave his bleeding cheek a styptic dusting of ammonium aluminum sulfate. From the front door of the house came a thumping of little feet and a mittened knocking, B. Meisner dropping off her human cargo. Enid hurried on up the stairs to accept delivery. Gary and Chipper, her fifth grader and her first grader, had the chlorination of the Y about them. 
With their damp hair they looked riparian, muskratty, beaverish. She called thanks to Bee's taillights. As fast as they could without running, forbidden indoors, the boys proceeded to the basement, dropped their logs of sodden terry cloth in the laundry room, and found their father in his laboratory. It was in their nature to throw their arms around him, but this nature had been corrected out of them. They stood and waited, like company subordinates, for the boss to speak. So, he said, you've been swimming. I'm a dolphin, Gary cried. He was an unaccountably cheerful boy. I got my dolphin clip. The dolphin, well, well. To Chipper, whom life had offered mainly tragic perspectives since he was about two years old, the boss more gently said, You, lad? We used kickboards, Chipper said. He's a tadpole, Gary said. So, a dolphin and a tadpole. And what special skills do you bring to the workplace now that you're a dolphin? Scissors kick. I wish I'd had a nice big swimming pool like that when I was growing up, the boss said, although for all he knew the pool at the Y was neither nice nor big. Except for some muddy water in a cow pond, I don't recall seeing water deeper than three feet until I saw the Platte River. I must have been nearly ten. His youthful subordinates weren't following they shifted on their feet, Gary still smiling tentatively, as though hopeful of an upturn in the conversation, Chipper frankly gaping at the laboratory which was forbidden territory except when the boss was in it. The air here tasted like steel wool. Alfred regarded his two subordinates gravely. Fraternizing had always been a struggle for him. "'Have you been helping your mother in the kitchen?' he said. When a subject didn't interest Chipper, as this one didn't, he thought about girls. And when he thought about girls, he felt a surge of hope. On the wings of this hope, he floated from the laboratory and up the stairs. Ask me nine times twenty-three, Gary told the boss. All right, Alfred said. What is nine times twenty-three? Two hundred seven. Ask me another. What's twenty-three squared? In the kitchen, Enid dredged the Promethean meat in flour and laid it in a Westinghouse electric pan large enough to fry nine eggs in tic-tac-toe formation. A cast aluminum lid clattered as the rutabaga water came abruptly to a boil. Earlier in the day, a half package of bacon in the refrigerator had suggested liver to her, the drab liver had suggested a complement of bright yellow, and so the dinner had taken shape. Unfortunately, when she went to cook the bacon, she discovered there were only three strips, not the six or eight she'd imagined. She was now struggling to believe that three strips would suffice for the entire family. "'What's that?' said Chipper with alarm. "'Liver and bacon!' Chipper backed out of the kitchen, shaking his head in violent denial. Some days were ghastly from the outset. The breakfast oatmeal was studded with chunks of date like chopped-up cockroach, bluish swirls of inhomogeneity in his milk, a doctor's appointment after breakfast. Other days like this one did not reveal their full ghastliness till they were nearly over. He reeled through the house repeating, Ugh, horrible, ugh, horrible, ugh, horrible, ugh, horrible. Dinner in five minutes, wash your hands, Enid called. Cauterized liver had the odor of fingers that had handled dirty coins. Chipper came to rest in the living room and pressed his face against the window, hoping for a glimpse of Cindy Meisner in her dining room. He had sat next to Cindy returning from the Y and smelled the chlorine on her. A sodden band-aid had clung by a few lingering bits of stickum to her knee. Thuckety, 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 went Enid's masher around the pot of sweet, bitter, watery rutabaga. Alfred washed his hands in the bathroom, gave the soap to Gary, and employed a small towel. Picture a square, he said to Gary. Enid knew that Alfred hated liver, but the meat was full of health-bringing iron, and whatever Alfred's shortcomings as a husband, no one could say he didn't play by the rules. The kitchen was her domain, and he never meddled. Chipper, have you washed your hands? It seemed to Chipper that if he could only see Cindy again for one moment, he might be rescued from the dinner. 
He imagined being with her in her house and following her to her room. He imagined her room as a haven from danger and responsibility. Chipper? You square... A, you square B, and you add twice the product of A and B, Alfred told Gary as they sat down at the table. Chipper, you better wash your hands, Gary warned. I'm sorry, I'm a little short on bacon, Enid said. I thought I had more. In the bathroom, Chipper was reluctant to wet his hands because he was afraid he would never get them dry again. He let the water run audibly while he rubbed his hands with a towel. His failure to glimpse Cindy through the window had wrecked his composure. We had high fevers, Gary reported. Chipper had an earache, too. Brown, grease-soaked flakes of flour were impastoed on the ferrous lobes of liver like corrosion. The bacon also, what little there was of it, had the color of rust. Chipper trembled in the bathroom doorway. You encountered a misery near the end of the day, and it took a while to gauge its full extent. Some miseries had sharp curvature and could be negotiated readily. Others had almost no curvature, and you knew you'd be spending hours turning the corner. Great, whopping, big, planet-sized miseries. The dinner of revenge was one of these. How was your trip? Enid asked Alfred, because she had to sometime. Tiring. Chipper, sweetie, we're all sitting down. I'm counting to five, Alfred said. There's bacon, you like bacon, Enid sang. This was a cynical, expedient fraud, one of her hundred daily conscious failures as a mother. Two, three, four, Alfred said. Chipper ran to take his place at the table. No point in getting spanked. Bless the Lord, this food we use in use to thy service, make us air mindful, neither others, Jesus' name, amen, Gary said. A dollop of mashed rutabaga at rest on a plate expressed a clear yellowish liquid similar to plasma on the matter in a blister. Boiled beet greens leaked something cupric, greenish. Capillary action and a thirsty crust of flour drew both liquids under the liver. When the liver was lifted, a faint suction could be heard. The sodden lower crust was unspeakable. Chipper considered the life of a girl. To go through life softly. To be a misner. To play in that house and be loved like a girl. You want to see my jail I made with popsicle sticks? Gary said. A jail? Well, well, Alfred said. The provident young person neither ate his bacon immediately nor let it be soaked by the vegetable juices. The provident young person evacuated his bacon to the higher ground at the plate's edge and stored it there as an incentive. The provident young person ate his bite of fried onions, which weren't good but also weren't bad if he needed a preliminary treat. We had a den meeting yesterday, Enid said. Gary, honey, we can look at your jail after dinner. He made an electric chair, Chipper said, to go in his jail. I helped. Ah, well, well. Mom got these huge boxes of popsicle sticks, Gary said. It's the pack, Enid said. The pack gets a discount. Alfred didn't think much of the pack. A bunch of fathers, taking it easy, ran the pack. Pack-sponsored activities were lightweight. Contests involving airplanes of balsa or cars of pinewood or trains of paper whose boxcars were books read. Schopenhauer. If you want a safe compass to guide you through life, you cannot do better than accustom yourself to regard this world as a penitentiary, a sort of penal colony. Gary, say again what you are, said Chipper, for whom Gary was the glass of fashion. Are you a wolf? One more achievement and I'm a bear. What are you now, though, a wolf? I'm a wolf, but basically I'm a bear. All I have to do now is conversation. Conservation, Enid corrected. All I have to do now is conservation. It's not conversation? Steve Driblet made a guillotine, but it didn't work, Chipper said. Driblet's a wolf. Brent Person made a plane, but it busted in half. Person is a bear. Say broke, sweetie, not busted. Gary, what's the biggest firecracker? Chipper said. M-80, then cherry bombs. Wouldn't it be neat 
to get an M-80 and put it in your jail and blow it up? Lad, Alfred said, I don't see you eating your dinner. Chipper was growing MC-ishly expansive. For the moment, the dinner had no reality. Or seven M-80s, he said, and you blew them all at once or one after another. Wouldn't it be neat? I'd put a charge in every corner and then put extra fuse, Gary said. I'd wind the fuses together and detonate them all at once. That's the best way to do it, isn't it, Dad? Separate the charges and put an extra fuse, isn't it, Dad? Seven thousand hundred million M-80s, Chipper cried. He made explosive noises to suggest the megatonnage he had in mind. Chipper, Enid said with smooth deflection, tell Dad where we're all going next week. The den's going to the Museum of Transport, and I get to come, too, Chipper recited. Oh, Enid, Alfred made a sour face. What are you taking them there for? B says it's very interesting and fun for kids. Alfred shook his head, disgusted. What does B. Meisner know about transportation? It's perfect for a den meeting, Enid said. There's a real steam engine the boys can sit in. What they have... Alfred said, is a thirty-year-old mohawk from the New York Central. It's not an antique. It's not rare. It's a piece of junk. If the boys want to see what a real railroad is, put a battery and two electrodes on the electric chair, Gary said. Put an M-80. Chipper, no. You run a current, and the current kills the prisoner. What's a current? The current flowed when you stuck electrodes of zinc and copper in a lemon and connected them. What a sour world Alfred lived in. When he caught himself in mirrors, it shocked him how young he still looked. The set of mouth of hemorrhoidal schoolteachers, the bitter permanent lip-pursing of arthritic men, he could taste these expressions in his own mouth sometimes, though he was physically in his prime, the souring of life. He did therefore enjoy a rich dessert, pecan pie, apple brown Betty, a little sweetness in the world. They have two locomotives and a real caboose, Enid said. Alfred believed that the real and the true were a minority that the world was bent on exterminating. It galled him that romantics like Enid could not distinguish the false from the authentic, a poor quality, flimsily stocked, profit-making museum from a real honest railroad. You have to at least be a fish. The boys are all excited. I could be a fish. The mohawk that was the new museum's pride was evidently a romantic symbol. People nowadays seemed to resent the railroads for abandoning romantic steam power in favor of diesel. People didn't understand the first goddamned thing about running a railroad. A diesel locomotive was versatile, efficient, and low maintenance. People thought the railroad owed them romantic favors, and then they belly ached if a train was slow. That was the way most people were. Stupid. Schopenhauer, amongst the evils of a penal colony, is the company of those imprisoned in it. At the same time, Alfred himself hated to see the old steam engine pass into oblivion. It was a beautiful iron horse, and by putting the Mohawk on display, the museum allowed the easy-going leisure-seekers of suburban St. Jude to dance on its grave. City people had no right to patronize the Iron Horse. They didn't know it intimately as Alfred did. They hadn't fallen in love with it out in the northwest corner of Kansas, where it was the only link to the greater world as Alfred had. He despised the museum and its goers for everything they didn't know. They have a model railroad that takes up a whole room, Enid said relentlessly. And the goddamned model railroaders, yes, the goddamned hobbyists, Enid knew perfectly well how he felt about these dilettantes and their pointless and implausible model layouts. A whole room? Gary said with skepticism. How big? Wouldn't it be neat to put some M-80s on, um, on, um, on a model railroad bridge? Kapersht! Pakow! Pakow! Chipper, eat your dinner now, Alfred said. Big, 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 Enid said. The model is much, 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 much bigger than the one your father bought you. Now, Alfred said. Are you listening to me? Now. Two sides of the square table were happy and two were not. 
Gary told a pointless, genial story about this kid in his class who had three rabbits, while Chipper and Alfred, twin studies in bleakness, lowered their eyes to their plates. Enid visited the kitchen for more rutabaga. I know who not to ask if they want seconds, she said when she returned. Alfred shot her a warning look. They had agreed for the sake of the boy's welfare never to allude to his own dislike of vegetables and certain meats. I'll take some, Gary said. Chipper had a lump in his throat, a desolation so obstructive that he couldn't have swallowed much in any case. But when he saw his brother happily devouring seconds of revenge, he became angry and for a moment understood how his entire dinner might be scoffable in no time. His duties discharged and his freedom regained, and he actually picked up his fork and made a pass at the craggy wad of rutabaga, tangling a morsel of it in his tines and bringing it near his mouth. But the rutabaga smelled carious and was already cold. It had the texture and temperature of wet dog crap on a cool morning, and his guts convulsed in a spine-bending gag reflex. I love rutabaga, said Gary inconceivably. I could live on nothing but vegetables, Enid averred. More milk, Chipper said, breathing hard. Chipper, just hold your nose if you don't like it, Gary said. Alfred put bite after bite of vile revenge in his mouth, chewing quickly and swallowing mechanically, telling himself he had endured worse than this. Chip, he said, take one bite of each thing. You're not leaving this table till you do. More milk. You will eat some dinner first. Do you understand? Milk. Does it count if he holds his nose? Gary said. More milk, please. That is just about enough, Alfred said. Chipper fell silent. His eyes went around and around his plate, but he had not been provident, and there was nothing on the plate but woe. He raised his glass and silently urged a very small drop of warm milk down the slope to his mouth. He stretched his tongue out to welcome it. Chip put the glass down. Maybe he could hold his nose, but then he has to eat two bites of things. There's the phone. Gary, you may answer it. What's for dessert? Chipper said. I have some nice, fresh pineapple. Oh, for God's sake, Enid. What? She blinked innocently, or faux innocently. You can at least give him a cookie or an Eskimo pie if he eats his dinner. It's such sweet pineapple, it melts in your mouth. Dad, it's Mr. Meisner. Alfred leaned over Chipper's plate, and in a single action of fork removed all but one bite of the rutabaga. He loved this boy, and he put the cold, poisonous mash into his own mouth and jerked it down his throat with a shudder. Eat that last bite, he said. Take one bite of the other, and you can have dessert. He stood up. I will buy the dessert if necessary. As he passed Enid on his way to the kitchen, she flinched and leaned away. Yes, he said into the phone. Through the receiver came the humidity and household clutter, the warmth and fuzziness of Meisnerdom. Al, Chuck said, just looking in the paper here, you know, Erie Belt stock, uh, five and five-eighths seems awfully low. You sure about this mid-pack thing? Mr. Reflogel rode the motor car with me out of Cleveland. He indicated that the board of managers is simply waiting for a final report on track and structures. I'm going to give them that report on Monday. Midpacks kept this very quiet. Chuck, I can't recommend any particular course of action, and you're right. There are some unanswered questions here. Al, Al, Chuck said. You have a mighty conscience, and we all appreciate that. I'll let you get back to your dinner. Alfred hung up hating Chuck as he would have hated a girl he'd been undisciplined enough to have relations with. Chuck was a banker and a thriver. You wanted to spend your innocence on someone worthy of it, and who better than a good neighbor? But no one could be worthy of it. There was excrement all over his hands. Gary, pineapple? Enid said. Yes, please. The virtual disappearance of Chipper's root vegetable had made him a tad manic. Things were looking up. He expertly paved one quadrant of his plate with the remaining bite of rutabaga, grading the yellow asphalt with his fork. 
Why dwell in the nasty reality of liver and beet greens when there was constructible a future in which your father had gobbled these up too? Bring on the cookies, saith Chipper, bring on the Eskimo pie. Enid carried three empty plates into the kitchen. Alfred, by the phone, was studying the clock above the sink. The time was that malignant fivishness to which the flu sufferer awakens after late afternoon fever dreams. A time shortly after five which was a mockery of five. To the face of clocks, the relief of order, two hands pointing squarely at whole numbers, came only once an hour. As every other moment failed to square, so every moment held the potential for fluish misery. And to suffer like this for no reason, to know there was no moral order in the flu, no justice in the juices of pain his brain produced, the world nothing but a materialization of blind, eternal will. Schopenhauer, no little part of the torment of existence is that time is continually pressing upon us, never letting us catch our breath, but always coming after us, like a taskmaster with a whip. I guess you don't want pineapple, Enid said. I guess you're buying your own dessert. Enid, drop it. I wish once in your life you would let something drop. Cradling the pineapple, she asked why Chuck had called. We will talk about it later, Alfred said, returning to the dining room. Daddy? Chipper began. Lad, I just did you a favor. Now you do me a favor and stop playing with your food and finish your dinner right now. Do you understand me? You will finish it right now, or there will be no dessert and no other privileges tonight or tomorrow night, and you will sit here until you do finish it. Daddy, though, can you... Right now, do you understand me, or do you need a spanking? Tonsils release an ammoniac mucus when serious tears gather behind them. Chipper's mouth twisted this way and that. He saw the plate in front of him in a new light. It was as if the food were an unbearable companion whose company he had been sure that his connections higher up, the strings pullable on his behalf, would spare him. Now came the realization that he and the food were in it for the long haul. Now he mourned the passing of his bacon, paltry though it had been, with a deep and true grief. Curiously, though, he didn't outright cry. Alfred retired to the basement with stamping and a slam. Gary sat very quietly multiplying small whole numbers in his head. Enid plunged a knife into the pineapple's jaundiced belly. She decided that Chipper was exactly like his father, at once hungry and impossible to feed. He turned food into shame. To prepare a square meal, and then to see it greeted with elaborate disgust, to see the boy actually gag on his breakfast oatmeal, this stuck in the mother's craw. All Chipper wanted was milk and cookies, milk and cookies. Pediatrician said, don't give in, he'll get hungry eventually and eat something else. So Enid tried to be patient, but Chipper sat down to lunch and declared, this smells like vomit. You could slap his wrist for saying it, but then he said it with his face, and you could spank him for making faces, but then he said it with his eyes, and there were limits to correction. No way, in the end, to penetrate behind the blue irises and eradicate a boy's disgust. Lately, she had taken to feeding him grilled cheese sandwiches all day long, holding back for dinner the yellow and leafy green vegetables required for a balanced diet and letting Alfred fight her battles. There was something almost tasty and almost sexy in letting the annoying boy be punished by her husband, in standing blamelessly aside while the boy suffered for having hurt her. What you discovered about yourself in raising children wasn't always agreeable or attractive. She carried two dishes of pineapple into the dining room. Chipper's head was bowed, but the son who loved to eat reached eagerly for his dish. Gary slurped and aerated, wordlessly consuming pineapple. The dog-shit yellow field of rutabaga, the liver warped by frying and so unable to lie flush with the plate, the ball of woody beet leaves collapsed and contorted but still entire like a wetly compressed bird in an eggshell, or an ancient corpse 
folded over in a bog. The spatial relations among these foods no longer seemed to chipper haphazard, but were approaching permanence, finality. The foods receded, or a new melancholy shadowed them. Chipper became less immediately disgusted. He ceased even to think about eating. Deeper sources of refusal were caking in. Soon the table was cleared of everything but his placemat and his plate. The light grew harsher. He heard Gary and his mother conversing on trivial topics as she washed and Gary dried. Then Gary's footsteps on the basement stairs, metronomic thock of ping-pong ball, more desolate peals of large pots being handled and submerged. His mother reappeared. Chipper, just eat that up. Be a big boy now. He had arrived in a place where she couldn't touch him. He felt nearly cheerful, all head, no emotion. Even his butt was numb from pressing on the chair. Dad means for you to sit there till you eat that. Finish it up now, then your whole evening's free. If his evening had been truly free, he might have spent it entirely at a window watching Cindy Meisner. Now an adjective, his mother said. Contraction, possessive noun. Conjunction, conjunction, stressed pronoun, counterfactual verb, pronoun. I'd just gobble that up. And temporal adverb, pronoun, conditional, auxiliary, infinitive. Peculiar how unconstrained he felt to understand the words that were spoken to him. Peculiar his sense of freedom from even that minimal burden of decoding spoken English. She tormented him no further, but went to the basement, where Alfred had shut himself inside his lab, and Gary was amassing thirty-seven, thirty-eight consecutive bounces on his paddle. Talk, talk, she said, wagging her head in invitation. She was hampered by pregnancy, or at least the idea of it, and Gary could have trounced her, but her pleasure at being played with was so extremely evident that he simply disengaged himself, mentally multiplying their scores or setting himself small challenges, like returning the ball to alternating quadrants. Every night after dinner he honed this skill of enduring a dull thing that brought apparent pleasure. It seemed to him a life-saving skill. He believed that terrible harm would come to him, when he could no longer preserve his mother's illusions. And she looked so vulnerable tonight. The exertions of dinner and dishes had relaxed her hair's rollered curls. Little blotches of sweat were blooming through the cotton bodice of her dress. Her hands had been in latex gloves and were as red as tongues. He sliced a winner down the line and passed her, the ball running all the way to the shut door of the metallurgy lab. It bounced up and knocked on this door before subsiding. Enid pursued it carefully. What silence, what darkness there was behind that door. Al seemed not to have a light on. There existed foods that even Gary hated. Brussels sprouts, boiled okra. And Chipper had watched his pragmatic sibling palm them and fling them into dense shrubbery from the back doorway if it was summer or secrete them on his person and dump them in the toilet if it was winter. Now that Chipper was alone on the first floor, he could easily have disappeared his liver and his beet greens. The difficulty? His father would think that he had eaten them, and eating them was exactly what he was refusing now to do. Food on the plate was necessary to prove refusal. He minutely peeled and scraped the flour crust off the top of the liver and ate it. This took ten minutes. The denuded surface of the liver was a thing you didn't want to see. He unfolded the beet greens somewhat and rearranged them. He examined the weave of the placemat. He listened to the bouncing ball, his mother's exaggerated groans and her nerve-grating cries of encouragement. Ooh, good one, Gary! Worse than spanking, or even liver, was the sound of someone else's ping-pong. Only silence was acceptable in its potential to be endless. The score in ping-pong bounced along toward twenty-one, and then the game was over, and then two games were over, and then three were over. And to the people inside the game, 
This was all right because fun had been had, but to the boy at the table upstairs, it was not all right. He'd involved himself in the sounds of the game, investing them with hope to the extent of wishing they might never stop. But they did stop, and he was still at the table, only it was half an hour later. The evening devouring itself in futility. Even at the age of seven, Chipper intuited that this feeling of futility would be a fixture of his life. A dull waiting and then a broken promise. A panicked realization of how late it was. This futility had, let's call it, a flavor. After he scratched his head or rubbed his nose, his fingers harbored something. The smell of self. Or again, the taste of incipient tears. Imagine the olfactory nerves sampling themselves, receptors registering their own configuration. The taste of self-inflicted suffering, of an evening trashed in spite, brought curious satisfactions. Other people stopped being real enough to carry blame for how you felt. Only you and your refusal remained. And like self-pity, or like the blood that filled your mouth when a tooth was pulled, the salty ferric juices that you swallowed and allowed yourself to savor, refusal had a flavor for which a taste could be acquired. In the lab below the dining room, Alfred sat with his head bowed in the darkness and his eyes closed. Interesting how eager he'd been to be alone, how hatefully clear he'd made this to everyone around him. And now, having finally closeted himself, he sat hoping that someone would come and disturb him. He wanted this someone to see how much he hurt. Though he was cold to her, it seemed unfair that she was cold in turn to him. Unfair that she could happily play ping-pong, shuffle around outside his door, and never knock and ask how he was doing. Three common measures of a material's strength were its resistance to pressure, to tension, and to shearing. Every time his wife's footsteps approached the lab, he braced himself to accept her comforts. Then he heard the game ending, and he thought surely she would take pity on him now. It was the one thing he asked of her, the one thing. Schopenhauer. Woman pays the debt of life, not by what she does, but by what she suffers by the pains of childbearing and care for the child, and by submission to her husband, to whom she should be a patient and cheering companion. But no rescue was forthcoming. Through the closed door he heard her retreat to the laundry room. He heard the mild buzz of a transformer, Gary playing with the O-gauge train beneath the ping-pong table. A fourth measure of strength important to manufacturers of rail stock and machine parts, was hardness. With unspeakable expenditure of will, Alfred turned on a light and opened his lab notebook. Even the most extreme boredom had merciful limits. The dinner table, for example, possessed an underside that Chipper explored by resting his chin on the surface and stretching his arms out below. At his farthest reach were baffles pierced by taut wire leading to pullable rings. Complicated intersections of roughly finished blocks and angles were punctuated here and there by deeply countersunk screws, little cylindrical wells with scratchy turnings of wood fiber around their mouths, irresistible to the probing finger. Even more rewarding were the patches of booger he'd left behind during previous vigils. The dried patches had the texture of rice paper or fly wings. They were agreeably dislodgeable and pulverizable. The longer Chipper felt his little kingdom of the underside, the more reluctant he became to lay eyes on it. Instinctively, he knew that the visible reality would be puny. He'd see crannies he hadn't yet discovered with his fingers, and the mystery of the realms beyond his reach would be dispelled. The screw holes would lose their abstract sensuality, and the boogers would shame him. And one evening, then, with nothing left to relish or discover, he just might die of boredom. Elective ignorance 
was a great survival skill, perhaps the greatest. Enid's alchemical lab beneath the kitchen contained a Maytag with a ringer that swung over it twinned rubber rollers like enormous black lips. Bleach bluing, distilled water, starch, a bulky locomotive of an iron. It its power cord clad in a patterned knit fabric, mounds of white shirts in three sizes. To prepare a shirt for pressing, she sprinkled it with water and left it rolled up in a towel. When it was thoroughly redampened, she ironed the collar first and then the shoulders working down. During and after the Depression, she'd learned many survival skills. Her mother ran a boarding house in the basin between downtown St. Jude and the university. Enid had a gift for math, and so she not only washed sheets, and cleaned toilets and served meals, but also handled numbers for her mother. By the time she'd finished high school and the war had ended, she was keeping all the house's books, billing the borders, and figuring the taxes. With the quarters and dollars she picked up on the side, wages from babysitting, tips from college boys and other long-term boarders, she paid for classes at night school, inching toward a degree in accounting which she hoped she would never have to use. Already two men in uniform had proposed to her, each of them a rather good dancer, but neither was clearly an earner, and both still risked getting shot at. Her mother had married a man who didn't earn and died young. Avoiding such a husband was a priority with Enid. She intended to be comfortable in life, as well as happy. To the boarding house a few years after the war, came a young steel engineer, newly transferred to St. Jude, to manage a foundry. He was a full-lipped, thick-haired, well-muscled boy in a man's shape and a man's suits. The suits were themselves luxuriantly pleated wool beauties. Once or twice every night, serving dinner at the big round table, Enid glanced over her shoulder and caught him looking and made him blush. Al was Kansan. After two months, he found courage to take her skating. They drank cocoa, and he told her that human beings were born to suffer. He took her to a steel company Christmas party and told her that the intelligent were doomed to be tormented by the stupid. He was a good dancer and a good earner, however, and she kissed him in the elevator. Soon they were engaged, and they chastely rode a night train to McCook, Nebraska, to visit his aged parents. His father kept a slave whom he was married to. Cleaning Al's room in St. Jude, she found a much-handled volume of Schopenhauer with certain passages underlined. For example, the pleasure in this world, it has been said, outweighs the pain, or, at any rate, there is an even balance between the two. If the reader wishes to see shortly whether this statement is true, let him compare the respective feelings of two animals, one of which is engaged in eating the other. What to believe about Al Lambert? There were the old man things he said about himself and the young man way he looked. Enid had chosen to believe the promise of his looks. Life, then, became a matter of waiting for his personality to change. While she waited, she ironed twenty shirts a week, plus her own skirts and blouses nosed in around the buttons with the iron's tip, flattened the wrinkles, worked out the kinks. Her life would have been easier if she hadn't loved him so much. But she couldn't help loving him. Just to look at him was to love him. Every day she endeavored to cleanse the boys' diction, smooth out their manners, whiten their morals, brighten their attitudes, and every day she faced another pile of dirty, crumpled laundry. Even Gary was anarchic sometimes. He liked best to send the electric engine barreling into curves and derail it, see the black chunk of metal skid awkwardly and roll and spark in frustration. Second best was to place plastic cows and cars on the rail and engineer little tragedies. What gave him the real techno boner, however, was a radio-controlled toy automobile much advertised on television lately that went anywhere. 
To avoid ambiguity, he planned to make it the only item on his Christmas list. From the street, if you paid attention, you could see the light in the windows dimming as Gary's train or Enid's iron or Alfred's experiments drained power off the grid. But how lifeless the house looked otherwise. In the lighted houses of the Meisners, of the Schumperts, and the Persons, and the Roots, people were clearly at home, whole families grouped around tables, young heads bent over homework, dens a flicker with TV, toddlers careening, a grandparent testing a tea bag's virtue with a third soaking. These were spirited, unself-conscious houses. Whether anybody was home meant everything to a house. It was more than a major fact. It was the only fact. The family was the house's soul. The waking mind was like the light in a house. The soul was like the gopher in his hole. Consciousness was to brain as family was to house. Aristotle, suppose the eye were an animal. Sight would be its soul. To understand the mind, you pictured domestic activity, the hum of related lives on varied tracks, the hearth's fundamental glow. You spoke of presence and clutter and occupation, or conversely of vacancy and shutting down, of disturbance. Maybe the futile light in a house with three people separately absorbed in the basement and only one upstairs, a little boy staring at a plate of cold food, was like the mind of a depressed person. Gary was the first to tire of the basement. He surfaced and skirted the too bright dining room as if it held the victim of a sickening disfigurement and went up to the second floor to brush his teeth. Enid followed soon with seven warm white shirts. She, too, skirted the dining room. She reasoned that if the problem in the dining room was her responsibility, then she was horrendously derelict in not resolving it, and a loving mother could never be so derelict, and she was a loving mother. So the responsibility must not have been hers. Eventually Alfred would surface and see what a beast he'd been and be very, very sorry. If he had the nerve to blame her for the problem, she could say, you're the one who said he had to sit there till he ate it. While she ran a bath, she tucked Gary into bed. Always be my little lion, she said. Okay. Is he ferocious? Is he wishes? Is he my wishes widow lion? Gary didn't answer these questions. Mom, he said, Chipper is still at the table and it's almost nine. That's between Dad and Chipper. Mom, he really doesn't like those foods. He's not just pretending. I'm so glad you're a good eater, Enid said. Mom, it's not really fair. Sweetie, this is a phase your brother's going through. It's wonderful you're so concerned, though. It's wonderful to be so loving. Always be so loving. She hurried to stop the water and immerse herself. In a dark bedroom next door, Chuck Meisner imagined, going inside her, that B was Enid. As he chugged to ejaculation, he was trading. He wondered if any exchange had a market in Erie Belt options. Buy 5,000 shares? Outright, with 30 puts for a downside hedge. Or better, if someone offered him a rate, a hundred naked calls. She was pregnant and trading up in cup size, A to B, and eventually even C, Chuck guessed, by the time the baby came. Like some municipality's bond rating in a tailspin. One by one, the lights of St. Jude were going out. And if you sat at the dinner table long enough, whether in punishment or in refusal or simply in boredom, you never stopped sitting there. Some part of you sat there all your life. As if sustained and too direct contact with time's raw passage could scar the nerves permanently like staring at the sun as if too intimate knowledge of any interior were necessarily harmful knowledge, were knowledge that could never be washed off. How weary, how worn a house lived into excess. Chipper heard things and saw things, but they were all in his head. 
After three hours, the objects surrounding him were as drained of flavor as old bubblegum. His mental states were strong by comparison and overwhelmed them. It would have taken an effort of will, a reawakening, to summon the term placemat and apply it to the visual field that he had observed so intensely that its reality had dissolved in the observing. Or to apply the word furnace to the rustle in the ducts which in its recurrence had assumed the character of an emotional state or an actor in his imagination, an embodiment of evil time. The faint fluctuations in the light as someone ironed and someone played and someone experimented and the refrigerator cycled on and off had been part of the dream. This changefulness, though barely noticeable, had been a torment. But it had stopped now. Now only Alfred remained in the basement. He probed a gel of ferroacetates with the electrodes of an ammeter. A late frontier in metallurgy, custom formation of metals at room temperature. The grail was a substance which could be poured or molded, but which after treatment, perhaps with an electrical current, had steel's superior strength and conductivity and resistance to fatigue. A substance easy like plastic and hard like metal. The problem was urgent. A cultural war was being waged and the forces of plastic were winning. Alfred had seen jam and jelly jars with plastic lids, cars with plastic roofs. Unfortunately, metal in its free state, a nice steel stake or a solid brass candlestick, represented a high level of order, and nature was slatternly and preferred disorder. The crumble of rust, the promiscuity of molecules in solution. The chaos of warm things, states of disorder, were vastly more likely to arise spontaneously than were cubes of perfect iron. According to the second law of thermodynamics, much work was required to resist this tyranny of the probable, to force the atoms of a metal to behave themselves. Alfred was sure that electricity was equal to this work. The current that came through the grid amounted to a borrowing of order from a distance. At power plants, an organized piece of coal became a flatulence of useless warm gases. An elevated and self-possessed reservoir of water became entropic runoff, wandering toward a delta. Such sacrifices of order produced the useful segregation of electrical charges that he put to work at home. He was seeking a material that could, in effect, electroplate itself. He was growing crystals in unusual materials in the presence of electrical currents. It wasn't hard science, but the brute probabilism of trial and error, a groping for accidents that he might profit from. One college classmate of his had already made his first million with the results of a chance discovery. That he might some day not have to worry about money. It was a dream identical to the dream of being comforted by a woman, truly comforted when the misery overcame him. The dream of radical transformation of one day waking up and finding himself a wholly different, more confident, more serene kind of person, of escaping that prison of the given, of feeling divinely capable. He had clays and gels of silicate. He had silicon putties. He had slushy ferric salts succumbing to their own deliquescence. Ambivalent acetylacetonates and tetracarbonyls with low melting points, a chunk of gallium the size of a damson plum. The head chemist at the Midland Pacific, a Swiss Ph.D., bored into melancholy by a million measurements of engine oil viscosity and Brunel hardness, kept Alfred in supplies. Their superiors were aware of the arrangement. Alfred would never have risked getting caught in something underhanded, and it was informally understood that if he ever came up with a patentable process, the mid-pack would get a share of any proceeds. Tonight, something unusual was happening in the ferroacetate gel. His conductivity readings varied widely, depending on where exactly he stuck the ammeter's probe. Thinking the probe might be dirty, he switched to a narrow needle with which he again poked the gel. He got a reading of no conductivity at all. Then he stuck the gel in a different place and got a high reading. What was going on? The question absorbed and comforted him and held the taskmaster at bay until, at ten o'clock, he extinguished the microscope's illuminator and wrote in his notebook, 
stain blue chromate 2%. Very, very interesting. The moment he stepped from the lab, exhaustion hammered him. He fumbled to secure the lock, his analytic fingers suddenly thick and stupid. He had boundless energy for work, but as soon as he quit, he could barely stand up. His exhaustion deepened when he went upstairs. The kitchen and dining room were ablaze in light, and there appeared to be a small boy slumped over the dining room table, his face on his placemat. The scene was so wrong, so sick with revenge, that for a moment Alfred honestly thought the boy at the table was a ghost from his own childhood. He groped for switches, as if the light were a poison gas he had to stop the flow of. In less hazardous dimness, he gathered the boy in his arms and carried him upstairs. The boy had the weave of the placemat engraved on one cheek. He murmured nonsense. He was half awake but resisting full consciousness, keeping his head down as Alfred undressed him and found pajamas in the closet. Once the boy was in bed, in receipt of a kiss and fast asleep, an unguessable amount of time trickled through the legs of the bedside chair in which Alfred sat, conscious of little but the misery between his temples. His tiredness hurt so much it kept him awake. Or maybe he did sleep, for suddenly he was standing up and feeling marginally refreshed. He left Chipper's room and went to check on Gary. Just inside Gary's door, reeking of Elmer's glue, was a jail of popsicle sticks. The jail bore no relation to the elaborate house of correction that Alfred had imagined. It was a crude, roofless square, crudely bisected. Its floor plan, in fact, was exactly the binomial square he'd evoked before dinner. And this, this here in the jail's largest room, this bollocksed knot of semi-soft glue and broken popsicle sticks, was a doll's wheelbarrow, miniature step stool, electric chair. In a mind-altering haze of exhaustion, Alfred knelt and examined it. He found himself susceptible to the poignancy of the chairs having been made, to the pathos of Gary's impulse to fashion an object and seek his father's approval, and more disturbingly, to the impossibility of squaring this crude object with the precise mental picture of an electric chair that he had formed at the dinner table. Like an illogical woman in a dream who was both Enid and not Enid, the chair he'd pictured had been at once completely an electric chair and completely popsicle sticks. It came to him now, more forcefully than ever, that maybe every real thing in the world was as shabbily protean underneath as this electric chair. Maybe his mind was even now doing to the seemingly real hardwood floor on which he knelt exactly what it had done hours earlier to the unseen chair. Maybe a floor became truly a floor only in his mental reconstruction of it. The floor's nature was to some extent inarguable, of course. The wood definitely existed and had measurable properties, but there was a second floor. The floor as mirrored in his head. And he worried that the beleaguered reality that he championed was not the reality of an actual floor in an actual bedroom, but the reality of a floor in his head, which was idealized and no more worthy, therefore, than one of Enid's silly fantasies. The suspicion that everything was relative, that the real and authentic might not be simply doomed, but fictive to begin with that his feeling of righteousness, of uniquely championing the real, was just a feeling. These were the suspicions that had lain in ambush in all those motel rooms. These were the deep terrors beneath the flimsy beds. And if the world refused to square with his version of reality, then it was necessarily an uncaring world, a sour and sickening world, a penal colony. And he was doomed to be violently lonely in it. He bowed his head at the thought of how much strength a man would need to survive an entire life so lonely. He returned the pitiful, unbalanced electric chair to the floor of the prison's largest room. 
As soon as he let go of the chair, it fell on its side. Images of hammering the jail to bits passed through his head, flashes of hiked-up skirts and torn-down underpants, images of shredded bras and outthrust hips, but came to nothing. Gary was sleeping in perfect silence, the way his mother did. There was no hope that he'd forgotten his father's implicit promise to look at the jail after dinner. Gary never forgot anything. Still, I am doing my best, Alfred thought. Returning to the dining room, he noticed the change in the food on Chipper's plate. The well-browned margins of the liver had been carefully pared off and eaten, as had every scrap of crust. There was evidence as well that Rudebaker had been swallowed. The small speck that remained was scored with tiny tine marks. And several beet greens had been dissected, the softer leaves removed and eaten, the woody reddish stems laid aside. It appeared that Chipper had taken the contractual one bite of each food after all, presumably at great personal cost, and had been put to bed without being given the dessert he'd earned. On a November morning thirty-five years earlier, Alfred had found a coyote's bloody foreleg in the teeth of a steel trap, evidence of certain desperate hours in the previous night. There came an upwelling of pain, so intense that he had to clench his jaw and refer to his philosophy to prevent its turning into tears. Schopenhauer, only one consideration may serve to explain the sufferings of animals, that the will to live, which underlies the entire world of phenomena, must in their case satisfy its cravings by feeding upon itself. He turned off the last lights downstairs, visited the bathroom, and put on fresh pajamas. He had to open his suitcase to retrieve his toothbrush. Into the bed, the Museum of Antique Transports, he slipped beside Enid, settling as close to the far edge as he could. She was asleep in her sleep-feigning way. He looked once at the alarm clock, the radium jewelry on its two pointing hands, closer to twelve now than to eleven, and shut his eyes. Came the question in a voice like noon. What were you talking about with Chuck? His exhaustion redoubled. With his closed eyes he saw beakers and probes and the trembling needle of the ammeter. It sounded like the eerie belt, Enid said. Does Chuck know about that? Did you tell him? Enid. I am very tired. I'm just surprised, that's all, considering. It was an accident, and I regret it. I just think it's interesting, Enid said, that Chuck is allowed to make an investment that we're not allowed to make. If Chuck chooses to take unfair advantage of other investors, that's his business. A lot of Erie Belt shareholders would be happy to get five and three quarters tomorrow. What's unfair about that? Her words had the sound of an argument rehearsed for hours, a grievance nursed in darkness. Those shares will be worth nine and a half dollars three weeks from now, Alfred said. I know it, and most people don't. That's unfair. You're smarter than other people, Enid said, and you did better in school, and now you have a better job. That's unfair, too, isn't it? Shouldn't you make yourself stupid to be completely fair? Chewing your own leg off was not an act to be undertaken lightly or performed halfway. At what point and by what process did the coyote make the decision to sink its teeth into its own flesh? Presumably there first came a period of waiting and weighing. But after that? I'm not going to argue with you, Alfred said. Since you are awake, however, I want to know why Chip wasn't put to bed. You were the one who said he... You came upstairs long before I did. It was not my intention that he sit there for five hours. You're using him against me, and I don't care for it one bit. He should have been put to bed at eight. Enid simmered in her wrongness. Can we agree that this will not happen again? Alfred said. We can agree. Well, then, let's sleep. When it was very, very dark in the house, the unborn child 
could see as clearly as anyone. She had ears and eyes, fingers, and a forebrain, and a cerebellum, and she floated in a central place. She already knew the main hungers. Day after day the mother walked around in a stew of desire and guilt. And now the object of the mother's desire lay three feet away from her. Everything in the mother was poised to melt and shut down at a loving touch anywhere on her body. There was a lot of breathing going on. A lot of breathing, but no touching. Sleep eluded even Alfred. Each sinusy gasp of Enid's seemed to pierce his ear the instant he was poised afresh to drop off. After an interval that he judged to have lasted twenty minutes, the bed began to shake with poorly rained sobs. He broke his silence, almost wailing, What is it now? Nothing. Enid, it is very, very late, and the alarm is set for six, and I am bone-weary. She wept stormily. You never kissed me goodbye. I am aware of that. Well, don't I have a right? A husband leaves his wife at home alone for two weeks. This is water under the bridge, and frankly, I've endured a lot worse. And then he comes home and doesn't even say hello. He just attacks me. Enid, I have had a terrible week, and leaves the dinner table before dinner's over. A terrible week, and I am extraordinarily tired and locks himself in the basement for five hours, even though he's supposedly very tired. If you had had the week I had, you didn't kiss me goodbye. Grow up, for God's sake. Grow up. Keep your voice down. Keep your voice down, or the baby might hear. Indeed, did hear, and was soaking up every word. Do you think I was on a pleasure cruise? Alfred demanded in a whisper. Everything I do, I do for you and the boys. It's been two weeks since I had a minute to myself. I believe I'm entitled to a few hours in the laboratory. You would not understand it, and you would not believe me if you did, but I have found something very interesting. Oh, very interesting, Enid said, hardly the first time she'd heard this. Well, it is very interesting. Something with commercial applications? You never know. Look what happened to Jack Callahan. This could end up paying for the boys' education. I thought you said Jack Callahan's discovery was an accident. My God, listen to yourself. You tell me I'm negative, but when it's work that matters to me, who's negative? I just don't understand why you won't even consider enough. If the object is to make money, enough. Enough. I don't give a damn what other people do. I'm not that kind of person. Twice in church the previous Sunday, Enid had turned her head and caught Chuck Meisner staring. She was a little fuller in the bust than usual, probably that was all. But Chuck had blushed, both times. What is the reason you're so cold to me? she said. There are reasons, Alfred said, but I will not tell you. Why are you so unhappy? Why won't you tell me? I will go to the grave before I tell you, to the grave. Oh, oh, oh. This was a bad husband she had landed, a bad, bad, bad husband who would never give her what she needed. Anything that might have satisfied her, he found a reason to withhold. And so she lay, a tantala, beside the inert illusion of a feast. The merest finger anywhere would have, to say nothing of his split plum lips. But he was useless. A wad of money stashed in a mattress and moldering and devaluing was what he was. A depression in the heartland had shriveled him the way it had shriveled her mother, who didn't understand that interest-bearing bank accounts were federally insured now, or that blue-chip stocks held for the long term with reinvested dividends might help provide for her old age. He was a bad investor. But she was not. She'd even been known, when a room was very dark, to take a real risk or two. And she took one now, rolled over, and tickled his thigh with breasts that a certain neighbor had admired, rested her cheek on her husband's ribs. She could feel him waiting for her to go away, but first she had to stroke the plane of his muscled belly, hover gliding, touching hair but no skin. To her mild surprise, she felt his 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 coming to life at the approach of her fingers. His groin tried to dodge her, but the fingers were more nimble. 
she could feel him growing to manhood through the fly of his pajamas. And in an access of pent-up hunger, she did a thing he'd never let her do before. She bent sideways and took it into her mouth. It, the rapidly growing boy, the faintly urinary dumpling. In the skill of her hands and the swelling of her breasts, she felt desirable and capable of anything. The man beneath her shook with resistance. She freed her mouth momentarily. Oh, sweetie? Enid, what are you... Again her open mouth descended on the cylinder of flesh. She held still for a moment, long enough to feel the flesh harden pulse by pulse against her palate. Then she raised her head. We could have a little extra money in the bank, you think? Take the boys to Disneyland, you think? Back under she went. Tongue and penis were approaching an understanding, and he tasted like the inside of her mouth now, like a chore and all the word implied. Perhaps... Involuntarily, he kneed her in the ribs, and she shifted, still feeling desirable. She stuffed her mouth and the top of her throat, surfaced for air, and took another big gulp. Even just to invest two thousand, she murmured, with a four-dollar differential, Ack! Alfred had come to his senses and forced the succubus away from him. Schopenhauer. The people who make money are men, not women. And from this it follows that women are neither justified in having unconditional possession of it, nor fit persons to be entrusted with its administration. The succubus reached for him again, but he grabbed her wrist, and with his other hand pulled her nightgown up. Maybe the pleasures of a swing set, likewise of sky and scuba diving, were tastes from a time when the uterus held you harmless from the claims of up and down a time when you hadn't acquired the mechanics even to experience vertigo, still luxuriated safely in a warm inland sea. Only this tumble was scary. This tumble came accompanied by a rush of blood-borne adrenaline as the mother appeared to be in some distress. Al, not sure it's a good idea, isn't I don't think the book says there is nothing wrong. Uneasy about this, though. Ooh, really, Al... He was a man having lawful sexual intercourse with his lawful wife. Al, though maybe not, so... Fighting the image of the leotarded teenaged twat and all the other cunts with their tits and their asses that a man might want to fuck, fighting it although the room was very dark and much was allowed in the dark. Oh, I'm so unhappy about this, he had quietly wailed. Worst was the image of the little girl curled up inside her a girl not much larger than a large bug, but already a witness to such harm, witness to a tautly engorged little brain that dipped in and out beyond the cervix and then, with a quick double spasm that could hardly be considered adequate warning, spat thick alkaline webs of spunk into her private room, not even born, and already drenched in sticky knowledge. Alfred lay catching his breath and repenting his defiling of the baby. A last child was a last opportunity to learn from one's mistakes and make corrections, and he resolved to seize this opportunity. From the day she was born, he would treat her more gently than he treated Gary or Chipper, relax the law for her, indulge her outright even, and never once force her to sit at the table after everyone was gone. But he'd squirted such filth on her when she was helpless. She'd witnessed such scenes of marriage, and so, of course, when she was older, she betrayed him. What made correction possible also doomed it. The sensitive probe that had given him readings at the top end of the red zone now read zero. He pulled away and squared his shoulders to his wife. Under the spell of the sexual instinct, as Arthur Schopenhauer called it, He'd lost sight of how cruelly soon he had to shave and catch the train. But now the instinct was discharged, and consciousness of the remaining night's brevity weighed on his chest like number 140 rail stock. And Enid had begun to cry again, as wives did, when the hour was psychotically late and tampering with the alarm clock was not an option. Years ago, when they were first married... She'd sometimes cried in the wee hours, but then Alfred had felt such gratitude for the pleasure he'd stolen and the stabbing she'd endured that he never failed to ask why she was crying. 
Tonight, notably, he felt neither gratitude nor the remotest obligation to quiz her. He felt sleepy. Why did wives choose night to cry in? Crying at night was all very well if you didn't have to catch a train to work in four hours, and if you hadn't, moments ago, committed a defilement in pursuit of a satisfaction whose importance now entirely escaped you. Maybe it took all this. Ten nights of wakefulness and bad motels, followed by an evening on the emotional roller coaster, and finally the run outside and put a bullet through the roof of your mouth, sucking and mewling noises of a wife trying to cry herself to sleep at two in the goddamn morning to open his eyes to the fact that A. Sleep was a woman, and B. Hers were comforts that he was under no obligation to refuse. For a man who all his life had fought off extracurricular napping like any other unwholesome delight, the discovery was life-altering, no less momentous in its way than his discovery hours earlier of electrical anisotropism in a gel of networked ferroacetates. More than thirty years would pass before the discovery in the basement bore financial fruit. The discovery in the bedroom made existence, Shea Lambert, more bearable immediately. A pox somnus is descended on the household. Alfred's new lover soothed whatever beast was left in him. How much easier than raging or sulking he found it to simply close his eyes. Soon everybody understood that he had an invisible mistress whom he entertained in the family room on Saturday afternoon when his work week at the mid-pack ended, a mistress he took along with him on every business trip and fell into the arms of in beds that no longer seemed uncomfortable in motel rooms that no longer seemed so noisy. A mistress he never failed to visit in the course of an evening's paperwork. A mistress with whom he shared a travel pillow after lunch on family summer trips while Enid lurchingly piloted the car and the kids in the back seat hushed. Sleep was the ideally work-compatible girl he ought to have married in the first place. Perfectly submissive, infinitely forgiving, and so respectable you could take her to church and the symphony and the St. Jude Repertory Theater. She never kept him awake with her tears. She demanded nothing and in return for nothing gave him everything he needed to do a long day's work. There was no mess in their affair, no romantic osculation, no leakages or secretions, no shame. He could cheat on Enid in Enid's own bed without giving her a shred of legally admissible proof. And as long as he kept the affair private, to the extent of not dozing at dinner parties, Enid tolerated it, as sensible wives had always done. And so it was an infidelity for which, as the decades passed, there never seemed to come a reckoning. Psst! Asshole! With a jolt, Alfred awakened to the tremor and slow pitching of the Gunnar Myrdal. Someone else was in the stateroom? Asshole. Who's there? He asked, half in challenge, half in fear. Thin Scandinavian blankets fell away as he sat up and peered into the semi-darkness, straining to hear past the boundaries of his self. The partially deaf know, like cellmates, the frequencies at which their heads ring. His oldest companion was a contralto like a pipe organ's middle A, a clarion blare vaguely localized in his left ear. He'd known this tone at growing volumes for thirty years. It was such a fixture that it seemed it should outlive him. It had the pristine meaninglessness of eternal or infinite things, was as real as a heartbeat but corresponded to no real thing outside him, was a sound that nothing made. Underneath it, the fainter and more fugitive tones were active, cirrus-like clusterings of very high frequencies off in deep stratosphere behind his ears. Meandering notes of almost ghostly faintness as from a remote calliope. A jangly set of mid-range tones that waxed and waned like crickets in the center of his skull. A low, almost rumbling drone like a dilution of a diesel engine's blanket all deafeningness a sound he'd never quite believed was real, that is, unreal, until he'd retired from the mid-pack and lost touch with locomotives. These were the sounds his brain both created and listened to, was friendly with. 
outside of himself. He could hear the psh, psh of two hands gently swinging on their hinges in the sheets. And the mysterious rush of water all around him in the Gunnar Myrdal's secret capillaries. And someone snickering down in the dubious space below the horizon of the bedding. And the alarm clock pinching off each tick. It was three in the morning, and his mistress had abandoned him. Now, when he needed her comforts more than ever, she went off whoring with younger sleepers. For thirty years she'd obliged him, spread her arms and opened her legs every night at ten-fifteen. She'd been the nook he sought, the womb. He could still find her in the afternoon or early evening, but not in a bed at night. As soon as he lay down, he groped in the sheets and sometimes for a few hours found some bony extremity of hers to clutch. But reliably, at one or two or three, she vanished beyond any pretending that she still belonged to him. He peered fearfully across the rust-orange carpeting to the Nordic blonde wood lines of Enid's bed. Enid appeared to be dead. The rushing water in the million pipes. And the tremor. He had a guess about this tremor, that it came from the engines that when you built a luxury cruise ship, you damped or masked every sound the engines made, one after another, right down to the lowest audible frequency and even lower. But you couldn't go all the way to zero. You were left with this subaudible two hertz shaking, the irreducible remainder and reminder of a silence imposed on something powerful. A small animal, a mouse, scurried in the layered shadows at the foot of Enid's bed. For a moment it seemed to Alfred that the whole floor consisted of scurrying corpuscles. Then the mice resolved themselves into a single, more forward mouse, horrible mouse, squishable pellets of excreta, habits of gnawing, heedless peeings, asshole, asshole, the visitor taunted, stepping from the darkness into a bedside dusk. With dismay, Alfred recognized the visitor. First he saw the droppings slumped outline, and then he caught a whiff of bacterial decay. This was not a mouse. This was the turd. You're in trouble now, <laughs> the turd said. It was a sociopathic turd, a loose stool, a motor mouth. It had introduced itself to Alfred the night before, and so agitated him that only Enid's ministrations, a blaze of electric light, and Enid's soothing touch on his shoulder had saved the night. Leave, Alfred commanded sternly. But the turd scurried up the side of the clean Nordic bed and relaxed like a brie or a leafy and manure-smelling cabrales on the covers. Splat chance of that fella! And dissolved, literally, in a gale of hilarious fart sounds. To fear encountering the turd on his pillow was to summon the turd to the pillow, where it flopped in postures of glistening well-being. Get away, get away, Alfred said, planting an elbow in the carpeting as he exited the bed headfirst. No way, Jose, the turd said. First I'm going to get in your clothes. No, sure am, fella. Going to get in your clothes and touch the upholstery. Going to smear and leave a trail. Going to stink so bad. Why, why, why would you do such a thing? Because it's right for me, the turd croaked. It's who I am. Put somebody else's comfort ahead of my own? Go hop in a toilet to spare somebody else's feelings? That's the kind of thing you do, fella. You get everything bass backwards, and look where it's landed you. Other people ought to have more consideration. You ought to have less. Me, personally, I am opposed to all strictures. If you feel it, let it rip. If you want it, go for it. Dude's got to put his own interests first. Civilization depends upon restraint, Alfred said. Civilization? Overrated. I ask you, what's it ever done for me? Flush me down the toilet. Treated me like shit. But that's what you are, Alfred pleaded, hoping the turd might see the logic. That's what a toilet is for. Who are you calling shit here, asshole? I got the same rights as everybody else, don't I? Life, liberty, the pursuit of hot pussiness. That's what it says in the Constitution of the United... That's not right, Alfred said. You're thinking of the Declaration of Independence. Some old yellow piece of paper somewhere. What the rat-ass fuck do I care what exact paper? Tight asses like you've been correcting every fucking word out of my mouth since I was yay big. 
You and all the constipated fascist school teachers and Nazi cops. For all I care, the words are printed on a piece of fucking toilet paper. I say it's a free country. I am in the majority, and you, fella, are a minority. And so, fuck you. The turd had an attitude. A tone of voice that Alfred found eerily familiar, but couldn't quite place. It began to roll and tumble on his pillow, spreading a shiny, greenish-brown film with little lumps and fibers in it, leaving white creases and hollows where the fabric was bunched. Alfred, on the floor by the bed, covered his nose and mouth with his hands to mitigate the stench and horror. Then the turd ran up the leg of his pajamas. He felt its tickling, mouse-like feet. Enid, he called with all the strength he had. The turd was somewhere in the neighborhood of his upper thighs. Struggling to bend his rigid legs and hook his semi-functional thumbs on the waistband, he pulled the pajamas down to trap the turd inside the fabric. He suddenly understood that the turd was an escaped convict, a piece of human refuse that belonged in jail, that this was what jail was for, people who believed that they, rather than society, made the rules. And if jail did not deter them, they deserved death, death, Drawing strength from his rage, Alfred succeeded in pulling the ball of pajamas from his feet, and with oscillating arms he wrestled the ball to the carpeting, hammering it with his forearms, and then wedged it deep between the firm Nordic mattress and the Nordic box spring. He knelt, catching his breath, in his pajama top and adult diaper. Enid continued to sleep. Something distinctly fairy tale like in her attitude tonight. Blast! The turd taunted. It had reappeared on the wall above Alfred's bed and hung precariously as if flung there beside a framed etching of the Oslo waterfront. God damn you, Alfred said. You belong in jail. The turd wheezed with laughter as it slid very slowly down the wall, its viscous pseudopods threatening to drip on the sheets below. Seems to me... It said, you anal retentive type personalities want everything in jail, like little kids. Bad news, man. They pull your tchotchkes off your shelves. They drop food on the carpet. They cry in theaters. They miss the pot. Put them in the slammer. And Polynesians, man, they track sand in the house, get fish juice on the furniture, and all those pubescent chickies with their honkers exposed, jail them. And how about ten to twenty while we're at it for every horny little teenager? I mean, talk about insolence. Talk about no restraint. And Negroes, sore topic, Fred? I'm hearing rambunctious shouting and interesting grammar. I'm smelling liquor of the malt variety and sweat that's very rich and scalpy. And all that dancing and whoopee making and singers that coo like body parts wetted with saliva and special jellies. What's a jail for if not to toss a Negro in it? And your Caribbeans, with their spliffs and their pot-bellied toddlers and their, like, daily barbecues and rat-born hantaviruses and sugary drinks with pig blood at the bottom? Slam the cell door, eat the key. And the Chinese, man, those creepy-ass weird-named vegetables, like homegrown dildos somebody forgot to wash after using. One dollar, one dollar. And those slimy carps and skinned alive songbirds and come on, like puppy dog soup and putty tat dumplings and female infants are national delicacies and pork bung, by which we're referring here to the anus of a swine, presumably a sort of chewy and bristly type item. Pork bung's a thing chinks pay money for to eat? What say we just nuke all billion point two of them, hey? Clean that part of the world up already. And let's not forget about women generally. Nothing but a trail of Kleenexes and Tampaxes everywhere they go. And your fairies with their doctor's office lubricants. And your Mediterraneans with their whiskers and their garlic. And your French with their garter belts and raunchy cheeses. And your blue-collar ball scratchers with their hot rods and beer belches. And your Jews with their circumcised putzes and gefilte fish like pickled turds. And your wasps with their cigarette boats and runny-assed polo horses and go-to-hell cigars. Hey, funny thing, Fred. The only people that don't belong in your jail are upper-middle-class northern European men. And you're on my case for wanting things my way? What will it take to make you leave this room? Alfred said. Loosen up the old sphincter, fella. Let it fly. I will never. In that case, I might pay a visit to your shaving kit. Have me a little episode of diarrhea on your toothbrush. Drop a couple nice globbits in your shave cream, and tomorrow a.m. you can lather up a rich brown foam. Enid, Alfred said in a strained voice, not taking his eyes off the crafty turd. 
I am having difficulties. I would appreciate your assistance. His voice ought to have awakened her, but her sleep was snow-white-like in its depth. Enid, darling, the turd mocked in a David Niven accent, I should most appreciate some assistance at your earliest possible convenience. Unconfirmed reports from nerves in the small of Alfred's back and behind his knees indicated that additional turd units were in the vicinity. Turdish rebels, snuffling stealthily about, spending themselves in trails of fetor. Food and pussy, fella, said the leader of the turds, now barely clinging to the wall by one pseudopod of fecal moose, is what it all comes down to. Everything else, and I say this in all modesty, is pure shit. Then the pseudopod ruptured, and the leader of the turds, leaving behind on the wall a small clump of putrescence, plunged with a cry of glee onto a bed that belonged to Nordic pleasure lines and was due to be made in a few hours by a lovely young Finnish woman. Imagining this clean, pleasant housekeeper finding lumps of personal excrement spattered on the bedspread was almost more than Alfred could bear. His peripheral vision was alive with writhing stool now. He had to hold things together, hold things together. Suspecting that a leak in the toilet might be the source of his trouble, he made his way on hands and knees into the bathroom and kicked the door shut behind him. Rotated with relative ease on the smooth tiles, braced his back against the door and pushed his feet against the sink opposite him. He laughed for a moment at the absurdity of his situation. Here he was, an American executive, sitting in diapers on the floor of a floating bathroom under siege by a squadron of feces. A person got the strangest notions late at night. The light was better in the bathroom. There was a science of cleanliness, a science of looks, a science even of excretion as evidenced by the outsized Swiss porcelain egg cup of a toilet, a regally pedestaled thing with finely knurled levers of control. In these more congenial surroundings, Alfred was able to collect himself to the point of understanding that the Turdish rebels were figments, that to some extent he had been dreaming, and that the source of his anxiety was simply a drainage problem. Unfortunately, operations were shut down for the night. There was no way to have a look personally at the rupture, nor any way to put a plumber's snake or video cam down there, Highly unlikely as well that a contractor could get a rig out to the site under conditions like these. Alfred wasn't even sure he could pinpoint his location on a map himself. There was nothing for it but to wait until morning. Absent a full solution, two half-solutions were better than no solution at all. You tackled the problem with whatever you had in hand. Couple of extra diapers, that ought to hold for a few hours, and here were the diapers right by the toilet in a bag. It was nearly four o'clock. There would be hell to pay if the district manager wasn't at his desk by seven. Alfred couldn't recollect the fellow's exact name, not that it mattered, just call the office and whoever picked up the phone. It was characteristic of the modern world, though, wasn't it, how slippery they made the goddamn tape on the diapers. Would you look at that, he said, hoping to pass off as philosophical amusement his rage with a treacherous modernity. The adhesive strips might as well have been covered with Teflon. Between his dry skin and his shakes, peeling the backing off a strip was like picking up a marble with two peacock feathers. Well, for goodness sake! He persisted in the attempt for five minutes, and another five minutes. He simply couldn't get the backing off. Well, for goodness sake! Grinning at his own incapacity, grinning in frustration and the overwhelming sense of being watched. Well, for goodness sake, he said once more. This phrase often proved useful in dissipating the shame of small failures. How changeful a room was in the night. By the time Alfred had given up on the adhesive strips and simply yanked a third diaper up his thigh as far as it would go, which regrettably wasn't far, he was no longer in the same bathroom. The light had a new clinical intensity. He felt the heavy hand of a more extremely late hour. Enid, he called, can you help me? With fifty years of experience as an engineer, he could see at a glance that the emergency contractor had botched the job. 
one of the diapers was twisted nearly inside out, and a second had a mildly spastic leg sticking through two of its plies, leaving most of its absorptive capacity unrealized in a folded mass, its adhesive stickers adhering to nothing. Alfred shook his head. He couldn't blame the contractor. The fault was his own. Never should have undertaken a job like this under conditions like these. Poor judgment on his part. Trying to do damage control, blundering around in the dark, often created more problems than it solved. Yes, now we are in a fine mess, he said with a bitter smile. And could this be liquid on the floor? Oh, my lord, there appeared to be some liquid on the floor. Also liquid running in the Gunnar Myrdal's myriad pipes. Enid, please, for God's sake, I am asking you for help. No answer from the district office. Some kind of vacation everybody was on. Something about the color of a fall. Liquid on the floor. Liquid on the floor. So all right, though, they paid him to take responsibility. They paid him to make the hard calls. He took a deep, bolstering breath. In a crisis like this, the first order of business was obviously to clear a path for the runoff. Forget about track repair. First you had to have a gradient, or you risked a really major washout. He noted grimly that he had nothing like the surveyor's transit, not even a simple plumb line. He'd have to eyeball it. How the hell had he got stranded out here anyway? Probably not even five in the morning yet. Remind me to call the district manager at seven, he said. Somewhere, of course, a dispatcher had to be on duty. But then the problem was to find a telephone, and here a curious reluctance to raise his eyes above the level of the toilet made itself felt. Conditions in these parts were impossible. It could be mid-morning by the time he found a telephone, and by that point. Oh, such a lot of work, he said. There appeared to be a slight depression in the shower stall. Yes, in fact, a pre-existing culvert, maybe some old Department of Transportation road-building project that never got off the ground. Maybe the Army Corps was involved somehow. One of those midnight serendipities, a real culvert. Still, he was looking at a hell of an engineering problem to relocate the operation to take advantage of the culvert. Not much choice, though, I'm afraid. Might as well get at it. He wasn't getting any less tired. Think of the Dutch with their Delta project. Forty years of battling the sea. Put things in perspective a little. One bad night. He'd endured worse. Try to build some redundancy into the fix. That was the plan. No way he'd trust one little culvert to handle all the runoff. There could be a backup farther down the line. And then we're in trouble, he said. Then we are in real trouble. Could be a hell of a lot worse, in fact. They were lucky an engineer was right on sight when the water broke through. Imagine if he hadn't been here. What a mess. Could have been a real disaster. First order of business was to slap some sort of temporary patch on the leak, then tackle the logistical nightmare of rerouting the whole operation over the culvert, and then hope to hold things together until the sun came up. And see what we got. In the faulty light, he saw the liquid running one way across the floor, and then reversing itself slowly, as if the horizontal had lost its mind. Enid he called, with little hope, as he commenced the sick-making work of stopping the leakage and getting himself back on track. And the ship sailed on. Thanks to Aslan, registered trademark, and to young Dr. Hibbard, an outstanding high-caliber young man, Enid was having her first solid night's sleep in many months. There were a thousand things she wanted from life, and since few were available at home with Alfred and St. Jude, she had forcibly channeled all her wanting into the numbered days, the mayfly lifetime, that the luxury cruise would last. For months the cruise had been her mind's safe parking space, the future that made her present bearable. And after her afternoon in New York had proved deficient in the fun department, she boarded the Gunnar Myrdal with her hungers redoubled. Fun was being had buoyantly on every deck by cliques of seniors enjoying their retirement the way she wished Alfred would enjoy his. Although Nordic Pleasure Lines was emphatically not a discount line, this cruise had been booked almost entirely by large groups such as the University of Rhode Island Alumni Association, 
American Hadassah of Chevy Chase, Maryland, the 85th Airborne Sky Devil Division Reunion, and the Dade County, Florida Duplicate Bridge League Senior Flight. Widows in excellent health guided one another by the elbow to special mustering places where name tags and information packets were distributed, and the preferred token of mutual recognition was the glass-shattering scream. Already seniors intent on savoring every minute of precious cruise time were drinking the frozen cocktail du jour, a lingonberry lap frap, from schooners that took two hands to handle safely. Others crowded the rails of lower decks, the ones sheltered from the rain, and scanned Manhattan for a face to wave goodbye to. A combo in the ABBA show lounge was playing heavy metal polka. While Alfred had a final pre-dinner session in the bathroom,